Hey, this is Andrew Brown over here at FreeCodeCamp bringing you another free cloud certification study course. And this time it's the Azure Solutions Architect Expert, also known as the AZ305. And the way we're going to achieve uh, Azure certification is through lecture content, hands-on labs. And as always, I provide you a free practice exam. That way you can go get that certification to put it on your resume or LinkedIn to go get that solutions architecture role. If you like these kind of free cloud study courses, the best way to support more of these materials is by purchasing the optional paid materials over on the exam pro platform, exampro.co. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm Andrew Brown, and I've taught a lot of different cloud certification study courses here, Azure, AWS, GCP, Kubernetes, Terraform, uh, you name it, I've taught it. So you're in great hands, and I will see you in class uh, in a moment. Ciao. Hey everyone, it's Andrew Brown, and we're at the start of our journey asking the most important question first, which is, what is the AZ-305? So the AZ-305 um, is a certification or an exam uh, to get the certification Microsoft Azure Solution Architect Expert. I use a uh, funny wording there because um, uh, previously you had to take two separate exams, the 303 and the 304, and then that would get you the certification. But uh, Microsoft has seen the light, and now we just have one exam for a certification. It looks like it's mostly like that now, but just understand in the future, they might change that. But yeah, the AZ-305 more or less means Microsoft Azure Solutions Architect Expert. Gonna get off screen here now, but uh, yeah, it is an expert level certification and it's focusing on comprehensive strategies for designing solutions on Azure. It has a deeper dive into advanced networking configurations. You don't see me doing this, but I'm doing quotations air quotations here, sorry, air quotations <laughs> for the word advanced because it's not as in depth as something like the, um, uh, the AZ-700 advanced networking, but yes, you do need to know your networking, your cloud networking very well for the certification. It has a broad examination of data and security solutions in Azure. Uh, the SC-900 is a great recommendation for that, but we'll talk about that when we look at the roadmap here. And this has extensive hands-on knowledge. You should know how to do things in the Azure portal, ARM templates, and other uh, uh, resilient architectural tools. All Azure exams are very code and script driven. So having great developer experience is a must. Make sure you do things in the, um, the portal. Um, now this one, the 305, is not as um, technically heavy, like the 104 in terms of hands-on, but it still is a great challenge because of how broad uh, the information is being covered in the 305. Who is the certification for? Well, consider the certification if you're uh, looking to get an Azure Solutions Architect Expert role, uh, you're designing solutions using Microsoft Azure, you're implementing and monitoring Azure infrastructure, you're creating and configuring resources for Azure applications, uh, enjoy crafting resilient and scalable cloud architectures. I want to warn you, this is a hard exam. Um, it is very common to fail this exam, even if you practice a lot and you do your best job, uh, it may just come down to the type of questions you get. So, you know, we do the best to give you practice exams and all the information here. Just understand when you get to expert level or professional level certifications, it's not you, it's just the questions and you might have to try multiple times. So don't get discouraged if you, uh, if you take an exam and you're just like one point shy away. That is what it's like doing these professional or expert certifications. Let's take a look at our Azure roadmap. Um, and I'm right away, I'm already noticing that this is a bit buggy. This is supposed to just say 305, but just, you know, ignore that one little bug there. That says 305. But anyway, uh, we have a bunch of uh, Azure certifications, Microsoft certifications. This isn't the full list. Um, in fact, there are some that I probably would even recommend uh, on route there, but definitely before you go for expert, you should have your AZ-900. AZ Gives you a good broad view of all services. Uh, the AZ-104 is generally what is uh, or absolutely recommended uh, on path to the 305. I would also pick up the 204 on the way. Um, in fact, in this course, a lot of the content, not a lot of the content, but a good chunk of the content came from our 104 and our 204, and then we had to round it out with other things. So understand that these two are uh, part of the course. If you've done the 104, 204, you're going to be in really good shape 
or well aligned for the 305, and then you can spend time trying to figure out case studies and things like that. I would probably also add the SC900 on here. Uh, that is a uh, fundamental certification. The DP900 would be also a good one. Um, I'm just kind of running out of space for all these things. That's why I don't have them all listed. Like here you can see I have the networking ones shoved down in here, um, but Azure just has a lot, a lot of certifications, okay? Um, but anyway, how long would it take to uh, pass uh, for studying? Well, if you're a beginner, don't do this exam. It is not a beginner certification. It would take you uh, well over a month if you're a beginner. Start in the fundamentals, do the associates, um, and work your way up to it. If you're experienced, you already have that 204 that, that, or, and the 104, and you already have multiple uh, years working experience, it might not take you that long to study. But you know, on average, I think 50 hours is for somebody in the mid-tier area. We're looking at 50% lecture, 50% uh, practice, or sorry, 50% lecture and labs, 50% practice exams. I actually probably would even bump this up a bit more. Try to get your hands on as many practice exams as you can. The huge challenge with um, uh, Microsoft certifications is they have a rich uh, type of exam questions and not everyone can emulate those questions. So a lot of times you are uh, needing to overstudy uh, with simpler exam type questions in order to try to be able to tackle the harder exam. So just understand that that is something you have to consider. Um, 30 days, absolutely you need a whole month for this exam uh, for, for, uh, for studying. A recommended study, one to two hours. Really max your time out and, so that you are in the best shape possible. Um, what other things should we consider? Well, make sure you watch the video lecture content. Do the hands-on labs, absolutely do all of them and do the best that you can. In fact, there are labs that we wanted to record, but they were so hard to do. And this course was already so long that we didn't even record them and put them in here. But we actually do have, um, I believe, additional labs with the instructions on our platform. So, you know, max out as many labs as you can to make sure, or, or hands-on work, so, uh, make sure you're in good shape. Absolutely do paid online practice exams. We have our own sets here. Um, just ignore these numbers here. I just did not feel like taking a new screenshot. Um, but uh, yeah, just the, the times are a little bit different here because you actually get 120 minutes and it's uh, more around 60 questions. So 57 makes sense. Um, but anyway, yeah, you definitely want to look into that. In terms of the actual exam guide outline, there are four domains and each domain has its own weighting. This determines how many questions in a domain that will show up. Uh, Microsoft exams, they like to do a range of questions, which it's not great for the test taker, but I guess it makes the exam harder. <laughs> I, you know, I don't personally like this. I don't like that they do ranges like this, but uh, you know, I guess they think that makes it, if it's more, more confusing, then therefore the exam must be more worth it for the end result, I don't know. So the first domain um, or section, whatever you want to call it, it's between 25 and 30% of the exam. So this design, uh, design identity governance monitoring solutions. The next one is 20 to 25% for design data storage solutions. The next one is 12 to 20%, so design business continuity solutions. And then 30 to 35% to design infrastructure solutions. Where are you gonna take this exam? It's gonna be with Pearson View. Um, previously, Microsoft, I think they offered it, I think it had PSI online before. Um, even eight of us is doing the same thing. They're just doing Pearson. So Pearson and Pearson view. Um, so, uh, you can do it at an in-person test center or online from the convenience of your home, uh, from your own home. So what we're talking about is Pearson view online. This is the online product exam system. And then you have the Pearson view, uh, network of test centers. This is where you do it in person. The word proctor means a supervisor. So someone is going to monitor you during this exam. Um, sometimes when you, uh, go for your exam, they're uh, uh, like online, they will go and actually call and talk to you and ask you to show the room and it can be very involved. So just understand that uh, there is somebody watching while you take these exams. Uh, the grading for this one is um, 700 out of a thousand points. So basically it's around 70%. I say around 70% because Azure uses scaled scoring. So um, technically it's not exactly 70%, it's 700 out of a thousand. I know that's confusing, but generally uh, what you wanna do is aim to go get 80, 80% 80 
I always think if you have a margin of 10% above that you're passing for practice exams, then you're giving yourself a buffer. You might even want to go higher and try to target 85%. Um, and in the result, you will actually probably get 70%. Um, in terms of the amount of questions, there's between 40 and 60. So you should be able to get 12 and 18 questions wrong. Though the thing is, is that when we save 12 to 18, that's not exactly true because you have to understand the format of the questions for Microsoft Azure exams. And they have a lot of different kinds of formatted questions. You got multiple choice, you got multiple answer, you got drag and drop, you got build list reorder, you have active screen, you got hot areas, you have case studies, you'll absolutely see case studies in this exam. And then questions can have exhibits. So it can get really complex. Um, in terms of what you will see will be different from other folks. You definitely will see multiple choice, multiple answer. You'll definitely see case studies. And some of these other ones might show up. Some questions are worth more than one points. There is no penalty for wrong questions. So do not, uh, do not leave any questions blank. Some questions cannot be skipped and you have to fill them in. Um, so yeah, there's a lot going on there. The duration is two hours. Um, I could have swore that the 204 was three hours, but uh, I looked it up and maybe they changed the time, but I really thought they would have given you more time for this exam. But yeah, it's just two hours, so it is still a stressor. Um, you get two minutes per question, basically. So we're looking at an exam time of 120 minutes, but your seat time is 150 minutes. All we do is we add 30 minutes to, to uh, make the seat time. The so seat time refers to the amount uh, uh, that you should allocate for the exam. Um, so this includes time to review instructions, show online proctor your workspace, read and accept the NDA, complete the exam, provide feedback at the end of the exam. The reason I, I include this here is just to remind you that uh, when, you're, when you are planning this, you have to plan for all of the time, not just the exam, but also the time around the exam. This exam is only valid for 12 months. Uh, this is something different. So Azure used to have two years and then you'd have to pay every time. Now they're doing every 12 months, so every year you recertify. Um, however, the recertification process supposedly isn't as hard because renewals are free. Um, and I think you can even check in like six months into it if you want to do it, uh, uh, if you want to do it sooner. Uh, but we'll take a look at that because again, those are new things to me and I want to uh, share those with you. But yeah, hopefully that gives you an idea of the exam guide itself, but we'll see you in the next one, okay? Ciao. Hey, this is Andrew Brown and welcome to the marketing site on Microsoft for the AZ305. And you'll notice the name of this is actually called Designing Microsoft Azure Infrastructure Solutions. And it gets you that badge, the uh, solutions expert. But the uh, strange thing is that Microsoft does not name the badge the same thing as the exam. Uh, it's not that strange if you understand the history of their certifications. They like to sometimes have more than one exam that you have to pass in order to get a badge. And so they don't name them the same as the badge. So that's just what's there. And the old exam used to have two, the 304 and the 303. But we'll go down here below because the reason I'm on this page is I want to show you the sandbox. If you go here to the sandbox and we'll open this up we can see the formatting of the questions. Now it's not example questions. Um, we have example ones on our platform and we have we should have a free set. But what we'll do is we'll go ahead and click next. And this is just like if you were to take it online or at a test center and we'll click through and we'll go here and there's just 10 questions. And the purpose of the sandbox is to show you the formatting of the questions. I'm gonna get out of the way. There we go. And so the first one we have is a multiple choice, pretty straightforward says, what is your favorite sound? We'll say a bell, we'll click next. This one is multiple choice. So here we can check box two things, we'll do that. The next one here is drag and drop. So you have these things, you drag and then you drop them into the area on the right here. Notice that um, I can actually fill in multiple. So, uh, you know, just, it can vary based on the type of question. So it might not just be one to one, these things might still remain in here. Then we have um, build order, build list reorder. So which five tasks should you do in the correct order? So you say making a sandwich, we'll add the pickles, the mayo, the ketchup, this, that, this, uh, whoops, <laughs> this and that. Okay, and then you can move them around. Notice that this actually has more than five questions. These are draggable here. You'll notice these everywhere. We'll go ahead and hit next. 
Um, this question is an active screen. So which option should you uh, choose to achieve this goal? So we'll scroll on down here. Um, to answer, select the appropriate setting in the applications example properties window in the answer area. So notice here, if we hover over, it might be hard to see, but there is a blue line. So it's showing like, where do you click, right? So here, that's the only one. We drop it down, then we choose an option here. So it's kind of like simulating um, a components without actually having the environment. We'll go to the next one here. So this one is an active screen. So you need to implement self-serving provisions of virtual machines. This actually kind of sounds like a proper question. The solution must ensure that the user can start the virtual machines, etc. What do you choose? So we'll go here and we'll choose option one and then option two. Notice that these are relaying to this table here, but this is just, you know, another way that we could be working with stuff. Here we have a hot area. So it says, which services should you configure? So we'll go take a look here and notice that we can select something from the hot area. So it's very similar to that other one, um, active screen. Again, you're just like clicking on stuff. We'll go to the next one here. And so this is a case study. So uh, case studies are uh, pretty complex. The idea is you can click around here and read all of this stuff. Okay, so you read through all of this stuff. And then what you're gonna do is go back to your question at the top. I know it's confusing, but that's where it is. And then you can go ahead and answer uh, the question. We'll go back and hit next. Then you have exhibits. So exhibits are basically just tabs. The idea is that you read the question and then you can go look at an exhibit. There can also be multiple exhibits. So I think in this one, here's an example where you have multiples and then you go back to your question and then you answer it, okay? So, you know, hopefully that uh, makes things really clear. Um, but you can see that they really do have a, a lot of different formatted questions and uh, that can make this uh, quite challenging. If we wanna read about the specifics of the exam, we can go to the uh, study guide. Now, I remember there being, at least in previous exams um, or um, in other exams, you used to have a PDF you can download. I can't seem to find that anymore. All there is is the marketing site here. Maybe that's what they want to do but you can go through here and read about like the certification renewals, the scoring, all the stuff here. We we're mentioning about certification renewals. So if you wanna read a bit more about that, uh, where they talk about how renewals are free and you have a six month renewal window and things like that, you can read all about it. Um, but yeah, there you go. And uh, we'll see you in the next one. Hey, this is Andrew Brown, and before we get into Azure AD, I need to point something out. It's not called Azure AD anymore, it's called Microsoft Entre ID. Microsoft decided to change the name of Azure AD. Why? Nobody knows, but I can tell you no customer likes this particular change. Um, somebody who just had a lot of time on their hands over at Microsoft. But we do need to address this, and I need to point out that I'm not refilming all of the content that I made just to change the name because that's crazy. I will at some point when the, when the content is stale, but the content's not stale, they just changed the name on us. Um, but I wanted to just go over that quickly here. So uh, the names here, we have Azure AD is now Microsoft Entre ID. Then the Azure AD tiers is uh, from P1, P2, still P1, P2. The Azure AD external identities is now called Microsoft Entre uh, external identities. If we scroll on down, we have a logo change. So instead of this, which by the way, I really like the old logo. They didn't need to muck with it. But anyway, we have uh, the older ones here. And so this is the new one here. And so there are some name changes here. Azure AD single sign-ons now, Microsoft Entre, Entre uh, single sign-on. And we'll go down below here and you can see well, more name changes, okay? So um, anyway, yeah, they renamed it and you know, customers are just gonna take a while to get used to it. I still like calling Azure AD. I know a lot of other people that like still calling it Azure AD, but it's at some point we'll get moved over to it and we're just gonna use both names, okay? Now coming over to uh, the, uh, the portal, I need to show you that if you type in Azure AD, it's still going to pull up Microsoft Entre ID, okay? Uh, now you don't want Azure AD B2C, which is interesting they didn't rename that. Uh, which is a, it is part of Azure AD kind of in a sense, but it's more for um, if you're building applications and you want to um, have uh, authentication into it. So 
just understand that there's not consistency all over the place, especially even their documentation. The marketplace still says Azure AD all over the place. Um, even down below, uh, you know, Azure AD notification. So, you know, there's just going to be that legacy of Azure AD. But anyway, yeah, what you want to do is go, go over to Microsoft Azure ID. It all looks the same. It's just some name changes, okay? But yeah, there you go. See you in the next one. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at Azure Active Directory, and this is a cloud-based identity and access management service to manage users, sign-ins, and access to AD-related resources. So Azure Active Directory is Microsoft's cloud-based identity and access management service, which helps you, your employees sign in and access resources. So that could be external resources like Microsoft Office 365, Azure Portal, SaaS applications, or internal resources. So applications within your internal networking or access to workstations on-premise. And you can use Azure AD to implement single sign-on. So you can see that Azure AD is basically like the, the, the one solution to log into everything. And uh, we actually use it at Exam Pro, we use it with Microsoft Teams, or uh, you know, for the Exam Pro, Pro platform, our mid panels tied to it. So when we want to log into the mid panel with credentials, we have it there. Uh, we use it with AWS to log into there, and we use it to log into Azure. So it has a lot of flexibility. And if you're building out applications for enterprises, they're likely using AD, and so this is the reason why everybody adopts it or needs to understand it. So it's a service I really, really do want you to understand and know. Azure Active Directory comes in four editions. We have the free tier. And by the way, each uh, 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 tier that goes up has the features before it. But uh, free has MFA, SSO, basic security, usage reports, and user management. Then you have the Office 365 apps, which is uh, revolves around if you're using that suite. So you have company branding, SLA, two sync between on-premise and cloud. And then the premium tiers, which really comes into enterprise or, or, or on-premise hybrid architecture. So hybrid architectures, advanced group access, uh, conditional access, premium two, identity pr protection, and identity governance. Only thing I don't like about Azure AD is that uh, you can't really create your uh, custom access controls unless you have premium one or premium two, but that's just how they do it. So there you go. So let's take a look at the use case for Azure AD. And we basically covered it in the introduction, but I just want to reiterate it in a different way with a bit of a visual uh, so that it really helps uh, it sink into your uh, brain there. So Azure AD can authorize and authenticate to multiple sources. So it can authenticate to your on-premise AD, to your web application, allow users to log in with uh, IPDs. Uh, so identity providers could be like use Facebook or Google login. Uh, you can use it with Office 365 or Azure Microsoft. And so just a visual here, uh, notice that uh, we have Azure AD and using Azure Azure AD Connect, we can connect to on-premise. Through uh, app registrations, we're able to uh, connect our web application to Azure AD. With external identities, we can um, uh, use Facebook or Google uh, 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 login. And then for cloud applications, we can connect to Office 365 or Microsoft Azure. So Active Directory existed way before Azure, and so let's just do a quick uh, uh, rundown of the history so we have an idea uh, what we're looking at. So um, Microsoft introduced Active Directory domain services in Windows 2000 to give organizations the ability to manage multiple on-premise infrastructure components and systems using a single identity per user. So it's been around for 20 years, and Azure AD takes this approach to the next level by providing organizations with the identity as a service, so IDAAS, solution for their apps across across uh, cloud and on-premise. And both versions are still used today because they just have different utility. And so we have Active Directory, which is for on-premise. And then you have Azure AD, which is just the cloud-hosted version. And in many regards, these can also be connected together. Uh, but there you go. So remember that the domain controller is the server that users are going to be using to authenticate to the directory service. Uh, and so when you create an Active Directory, Azure sets one up for you, but there's some cases where you might want to set one up yourself. And the reason why is that you could be like an, on, uh, like an enterprise where you already have your own Active Directory on premise, but you've decided that you want to move it over to uh, Azure AD uh, because you just want a fully managed Active Directory and uh, you want to tap into the cloud. 
But uh, the thing is that some domain services, those are features on your domain controller, just might not be available. And that's where you're going to need to set up your own domain controller. And that's where Azure Active Directory domain services uh, come into play because these provide managed domain services. And so they have managed domain services such as domain joins, uh, group policies, uh, LDAPs, uh, uh, <laughs> curb. B Ross, I never can say that properly, NTLM authentication. And so the great thing is here is you can have these domain services, but you're not going to have to deploy them, manage them, patch them. They're just going to work. So there you go. So let's talk about um, uh, the term tenant. And a tenant represents an organization in an active directory. And a tenant is dedicated to the Azure AD service instance. A tenant is automatically created when you sign up for either Microsoft Azure or Microsoft Intune or Microsoft 365. And each Azure AD tenant is distinct and separate from other Azure AD tenants. And so if you uh, if you were in um, uh, Azure AD and you clicked on your tenant information, that's, that's basically what that is, right? So that's my exam pro one and it has its own special tenant ID. And we can see that it's licensed for Office 365. And so that tells you that I'm using the Office 365 uh, tier of um, Azure AD. So now let's take a look at some of the AD objects, starting with users. So users represent an identity for a person or employee in your domain, and a user has login credentials and can use them to log into the Azure portal. So here I am, a user, and you can see it shows how many times I've logged in, and I'm part of different AD groups. Uh, and so you can assign roles and administrative uh, roles uh, to users. You can add users to groups. You can enforce uh, authentication by uh, lo like with MFA. You can track user sign-ins, as you can see on the right-hand side. You can track device uh, devices, users log in, and, uh, and allow or deny devices. Uh, you can assign Microsoft licenses. Azure AD has two kinds of users. We have users, that's a user that belongs to an organization, and guest users. This is a guest, uh, is a user that belongs from another organization. And we'll cover uh, Azure AD roles uh, in the role section here, uh, because that is what you're going to be using to apply to these users. <laughs> So groups in Azure AD lets resource owners assign a set of access permissions to all members of the group instead of having to uh, provide the rights one by one. And so on the right hand side here, you can see I have a bunch of groups in Exam Pro, and groups can contain owners, and owners have permissions to add or remove members, and then the members have rights to do things, okay? And so for assignment, you can assign roles directly to a group. You can assign applications directly to a group. And to request join groups, so uh, the group owner can let users find their own groups to join instead of assigning them to them. And the owner can set up uh, the group to automatically accept all users that join or require approval. This is really great when uh, you just want people to do the work themselves as opposed to having to do all that manual labor of adding them to groups. <laughs> Let's talk about how we're going to uh, give users rights to access uh, resources. And there are four different ways to do that. The first is direct assignment. And this is where the resource owner is going to directly assign the user to the resource. Then you have group assignment. This is where the resource owner assigns an, a, a group to the resource, which automatically gives all group members access to the resource. Then you have rule-based assignment. This is resource owner. Uh, this is where the resource owner creates a group and uses a rule to define which users are assigned to a specific resource. And then you have external uh, authority assignment. This is this access comes from an external source, such as an on-premise directory or SaaS application. And I just want you to know that there's four different ways to do it. So. Uh, to get access to resources. All right, let's take a look at managed identities for Microsoft Enter ID or Azure AD. Managed identities is a concept in Microsoft Enter ID that associates identities with internal resources, where these identities have their own roles and tokens. Managed identities increases security by allowing you to link directly resources to other resources without having to share any security information over the network. Those resources will be authenticated against Enter ID to see if they have the necessary permissions to manipulate other resources. For example, we can allow our applications to access Azure Key Vault in order to retrieve a secret without exposing any passwords. Managed identities is available in two types. System assigned identities are created and managed by Enter ID when you create a managed identity in a service instance. Only the Azure resource can use this identity to request tokens from Enter ID. User-assigned identities are created and managed manually. 
The identity is managed separately from the resources that use it. The table provides a comparison between system assigned and user assigned features in the context of Azure creation. For system assigned, the identity is created as part of an Azure resource, whereas user assigned, the identity is created as a standalone Azure resource. Lifecycle. For system assigned, the identity shares its lifecycle with the Azure resource it's associated with, while user assigned, the identity has an independent lifecycle. Deletion. For system assigned, when the associated Azure resource is deleted, the identity is also deleted, whereas user assigned, the identity must be deleted explicitly. Sharing across Azure resources. For system assigned, the identity cannot be shared and is associated with only a single Azure resource, whereas user assigned, the identity can be shared and can be associated with more than one Azure resource. Managed identity is under the identity blade for an Azure resource. You assign roles to provide permissions to a managed identity. In summary, managed identities enhance security through seamless resource integration, eliminating exposed credentials. With system assigned and user assigned options, Azure bolsters efficient, flexible resource management. Let's talk about external identities. So external identities in Azure AD allows people outside your organization to access your apps and resources while letting them sign in uh, and use whatever identity they prefer. So your partners, distributors, suppliers, vendors, or other guests can bring their own identities, such as uh, Google or Facebook. Uh, you can share apps with external users, so that's for B2B stuff. Uh, if you develop apps intended for Azure AD tenants, uh, for single tenant or multi-tenant, you can do that as well. Uh, you can develop white label apps for consumers and customers. So this would be like Azure AD uh, B2C. Uh, so there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and the next topic will be exploring or access reviews in Microsoft Enter ID or Azure AD. Access reviews in Microsoft Enter ID allow you to regularly review and manage access to resources in your organization. With access reviews, you can review who has access to resources and determine whether their access is still necessary. Access reviews are useful in maintaining security and compliance by ensuring that only authorized individuals have access to sensitive resources. Access reviews can be conducted for various types of resources, such as applications, groups, and SharePoint online sites. You can configure access reviews to occur on a regular schedule and select reviewers to conduct the reviews. Reviewers can be internal or external to your organization. During an access review, the reviewer will be presented with a list of people who have access to the resource being reviewed. They can choose to approve or revoke access for each individual. Access can be revoked immediately or scheduled for a later date. Reviewers can also provide a reason for their decision, which can be useful for auditing purposes. Access reviews are crucial in large organizations to regularly identify and resolve access issues. They ensure resources are accessed only by necessary users and that access is revoked when no longer needed. Overall, access reviews maintain security by assessing user access, ensuring compliance, preventing breaches, and safeguarding data, promoting a security-aware culture. Make sure to know access reviews because it did show up a few times on the exam. The next topic we'll be covering is single sign-on and enter ID. Single sign-on and enter ID is a feature that allows users to authenticate once with enter ID and then access multiple applications and services without having to authenticate again. When a user signs into enter ID with their credentials, enter ID creates a security token that can be used to access other resources within the same organization. This token can be used to authenticate the user to other cloud-based or on-premises applications that have been integrated with enter ID. SSO supports a wide range of applications, including cloud-based applications such as Microsoft 365, Salesforce, and Dropbox, as well as on-premises applications such as SharePoint and SAP. SSO can also be used with custom-built applications using industry-standard protocols such as SAML, OpenID Connect, and OAuth. There are several ways you can configure an application for SSO. Choosing an SSO method depends on how the application is configured for authentication. Cloud applications can use OpenID Connect, OAuth, SAML, password-based, or linked for SSO. Single sign-on can also be disabled. On-premises applications can use password-based, integrated Windows authentication, header-based, or linked for SSO. The on-premises choices work when applications are configured for application proxy. This flowchart can help you decide which SSO method is best for your situation. The main SSO protocols supported in Azure include 
OpenID Connect and OAuth. OpenID Connect is an identity layer built on top of OAuth 2.0. It allows for authentication and authorization of users in a secure and standardized manner. It is SAML. SAML is an XML-based protocol used for exchanging authentication and authorization data between an identity provider and a service provider. It is commonly used for federated authentication scenarios. Password-based authentication. This refers to the traditional username password authentication method where users provide their credentials directly to authenticate. Linked authentication. Azure provides the ability to link multiple accounts from different identity providers to a single user identity. This allows users to authenticate using any of their linked accounts. Integrated Windows Authentication. It will let users access applications using their Windows domain credentials, utilizing their current Windows session for authentication. Header-based authentication. In this method, the application accepts an authentication token in the form of a header in each request. The token is validated by the application to authenticate the user. You'll need to be familiar with these SSO protocols as there will be questions asking you which SSO protocol is best suited for a specific application. What is multi-factor authentication? As security control where after you fill in your username, email, and password, you have to use a second device such as a phone to confirm that it's you logging in. MFA protects against people who have stolen your password. MFA is an option in most cloud providers and even social media websites such as Facebook. So that's an overview of single sign-on and enter ID. The next topic we'll be going over is conditional access. Conditional access provides an extra layer of security before allowing authenticated users to access data or other assets. Conditional access is implemented via conditional access policies, which are a set of rules that specify the conditions under which sign-ins are evaluated and allowed. For example, you can create a conditional access policy that states, if the user account name is a member of a group for users that are assigned the exchange, user, password, security, SharePoint, or global administrator roles require MFA before allowing access. This policy enables MFA enforcement based on group membership, simplifying the process compared to configuring MFA for individual users when roles change. Conditional access policy analyzes signals, including user and location, device, application, and real-time risk, and verifies every access attempt via access controls. This requires MFA, block access, and allow access. Signals are metadata associated with an identity attempting to gain access. User or group membership policies target specific users and groups, giving admins fine-grained control over access. Named location information, IP location information, IP address ranges are used to permit or deny access based on geographical locations. Device policies can be applied based on the platform or status of a user's device. Application users attempting to access specific applications can trigger different conditional access policies. Real-time sign-in risk detection signals in Azure Ad Identity Protection detect risky sign-ins. If risks emerge, policies can prompt actions such as password resets, multi-factor authentication, or block access pending admin intervention. Cloud apps or actions can include or exclude cloud applications or user actions that will be subject to the policy. User risk for customers with identity protection, user risk can be evaluated as part of a conditional access policy. User risk represents the probability that a given identity or account is compromised. Common decisions define the access controls that decide what level of access based on signal information. Block access, most restrictive decision. Grant access, least restrictive decision, still require one or more of the following options. Require multi-factor authentication, require device to be marked as compliant, require hybrid enter ID join device, require approved client app, and require app protection policy. Conditional access policies are available and can be utilized with the following licensing plans, Microsoft 365 Business Premium, Microsoft 365 E3 and E5, enter ID Premium P1 and enter ID Premium P2 licenses. Overall, Conditional Access acts as a robust security measure in Azure, ensuring that authenticated users can only access data under specific conditions. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and in this section, we'll be going over the types of Azure roles. Roles can be a bit confusing. This is because Azure has three types of roles that can serve the same purpose. The first type of role are classic subscription administrator roles. This is the original role system. 
Next, we have Azure Roles. This is an authorization system that's also known as Role-Based Access Controls and is built on top of Azure Resource Manager. Then we have Azure Active Directory Roles. Azure AD Roles are used to manage Azure AD resources in a directory. Azure Active Directory Roles are used to manage Azure AD resources in a directory such as creating or editing users, assigning administrative roles to others, resetting user passwords, managing user licenses, and managing domains, among other tasks. The roles follow a similar RBAC model and include several built-in roles like Global Admin, Application Admin, Application Developer, and Billing Admin, but also allow the creation of custom roles for more specific control. Azure Roles, specifically Azure Role-Based Access Control, is a system that provides fine-grained access management for Azure resources, allowing administrators to grant users specific rights to resources. There are several predefined roles in Azure, like Owner, Contributor, Reader, and User Access Administrator, each providing specific levels of access to Azure resources, and custom roles can be defined as well. Classic Subscription Administrator roles refer to the older model of Azure Access Control and include three types, Account Administrator, Service Administrator, and Co-Administrator. Azure roles and Classic Subscription Administrator roles can have overlapping responsibilities. For example, the Service Administrator in the Classic model has a similar role to the Owner role in the Azure RBAC, where both can manage resources in the subscription. However, Azure RBAC roles provide a more granular level of control compared to classic roles, offering more specific access management. They allow administrators to delegate specific tasks and grant specific permissions, reducing the need to give full administrative privileges and therefore enhancing security. The next topic we'll be covering are the access controls. So, identity access management essentially allows you to create and assign roles to users. For the Azure Roles, or the RBAC system, roles restrict access to resource actions, which are also known as operations. There are two types of roles. The first type are built-in roles. These roles refer to the set of predefined roles offered by Microsoft and Azure. The roles are read-only and cannot be altered, cover a wide array of standard scenarios to facilitate efficient and secure access management for Azure resources. The second type of role are custom roles. These roles represent user-defined roles in Azure, tailored to incorporate unique permissions and logic based on specific requirements that aren't satisfied by the available built-in roles. A role assignment is when you apply a role to a service principle, which could be a user, grouped, service principle, or managed identity. Deny assignments lock users from performing specific actions even if a role assignment grants them access. The only way to apply deny assignments is through Azure Blueprints. So that's the access controls for Azure. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and in this section, we'll be covering classic administrators. Classic administrators refer to the original role system in Azure. Despite the legacy status of classic administrators, understanding these roles can still be beneficial, like when working with older Azure setups. However, it's recommended to use the new RBAC system for managing access to resources, given its enhanced granularity and flexibility. Classic administrators have three types of roles. The first type is account administrator. This role is essentially the billing owner of the Azure subscription. It's responsible for managing subscriptions, making payments, and changing the billing details. The account admin has no access to the Azure portal, meaning they can't manage resources directly. The second type is service administrator. This role shares the same level of access as a user assigned the owner role at the subscription scope in the RBAC model. They have full access to the Azure portal, meaning they can manage all resources within the subscription. The third type is co-administrator. This has the same access level of a user who is assigned the owner role at the subscription scope. It's similar to a service admin, but the main difference is that there can be multiple co-administrators offering shared management capabilities. You shouldn't have to worry much about the classic admin roles because I don't think I encountered any exam questions on it. It'll mostly be focused on the RBAC and Azure Ad roles. Also, note that classic resources and classic administrators will be retired on August 31st, 2024. The next topic we'll be covering is the Azure Role-Based Access Control. So, Azure Role-Based Access Control helps you manage who has access to Azure resources, what actions they can perform on resources, and in what scope, which are the areas they have access to. Role assignments are the way you control access to resources. By assigning a role to a security principle, like a user, group, service principle, or managed identity at a particular scope, you define who can perform what actions on which resources. A role assignment consists of these three elements, scope, role definition, and security principle. 
There are four fundamental Azure roles, which include owner, contributor, reader, and user access administrator. Azure RBAC includes over 70 built-in roles. These roles are designed to serve many common use cases and range from broad to very specific permissions, such as virtual machine contributor or network contributor. Scope is the set of resources that access for the role assignment applies to. Scope access controls at the management, subscription, resource group, and resource level. Assigning a role at the management group level inherits it across all associated subscriptions and resources. At the subscription level, it applies to all resource groups and resources within the specific subscription. A role assigned at the resource group level affects all resources within that group. At the resource level, a role assignment applies only to that specific resource. A role definition is a set of permissions that determines what actions can be performed such as read, write, or delete on various resources. Roles range from broad, such as owner, with extensive management permissions, to specific, such as virtual machine reader, with more targeted permissions. Azure has built-in roles, and you can define custom roles. This table shows the four fundamental built-in roles. The owner role has full access to all resources, including the right to delegate access to others. The contributor role can manage all types of Azure resources, including the ability to create, update, and delete, but can't grant access to others. The reader role has the ability to view existing Azure resources, but can't make changes or grant access to others. The user access administrator role has the ability to manage user access to Azure resources, including granting and revoking access, but can't create, update, or delete resources. A security principle represents the identities requesting access to an Azure resource such as a user, which is an individual who has a profile in Azure Active Directory, a group, which is a set of users created in Azure Active Directory, a service principle, which is a security identity used by applications or services to access specific Azure resources, or a managed identity, which is an identity in Azure Active Directory that is automatically managed by Azure. So that's an overview of Azure role-based access control. The last type of role we'll be covering are Azure AD roles. Azure AD roles are used to manage Azure AD resources in a directory such as create or edit users, assign administrative roles to others, reset user passwords, manage user licenses, and manage domains. We'll go over a few important built-in Azure AD roles, so here are some that you should know. The first one is Global Administrator. This grants you full access to everything, all the features in Azure AD. Another important role is User Administrator. This grants you full access to create and manage users. For the Billing Administrator role, this role can make purchases, manage subscriptions, and support tickets, including monitor service health. Not all organizations' needs can be satisfied by these predefined roles. Therefore, you can create custom roles, which are very flexible and can define the exact set of permissions that you need. Keep in mind that you'll need to purchase either Azure AD Premium P1 or P2 to create custom roles. So that's a short overview of Azure AD roles. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and in this section, we'll be covering the anatomy of an Azure role. So it's important to know that the property names in an Azure role definition can vary depending on whether you're using Azure PowerShell or Azure CLI. The two different interfaces use different syntax and terminology. We have an example here on the right, and we'll go through the properties together. A role definition in Azure consists of these properties. Name, this is the display name of the custom role. Also, note that the ones highlighted in blue is the syntax for Azure PowerShell, and bold black is for Azure CLI. So, it's name for Azure PowerShell, and role name is for Azure CLI. The next property is ID. This is the unique ID of the custom role, and it is auto-generated for you. It is custom. This indicates whether this is a custom role. It can be either true or false. Description, this property describes the role. Actions. This is an array of strings that specify the management operations that the role is allowed to perform. Not actions. An array of strings that specify the management operations that are excluded from the allowed actions. Data actions. This is an array of strings that specify data operations the role is allowed to perform to your data within that object. Not data actions. This is an array of strings that specify the data operations that are excluded from the allowed data actions. Assignable scopes. This is an array of strings that specify the scopes that the custom role is available for assignment. You can only define one management group in assignable scopes of a custom role. So in this example, we see that there is an asterisk symbol that's used in the specific actions in the actions property, like storage, network, compute, etc. 
This is called the wildcard permission symbol represented as an asterisk. This is used in the actions, not actions, data actions, and not data actions properties to represent all or any operations. And wildcard allows you to apply to match everything. In the example of actions, Microsoft.storage slash asterisk slash read in a role definition, this means that the role is granted the permission to perform read operations on all resource types under the Microsoft storage resource provider. So the wildcard essentially allows you to either grant or deny a wide range of permissions with a single statement. However, it should be used with caution because it can grant or deny more permissions than intended if not properly managed. It can be a bit confusing to distinguish between Azure policies and Azure roles, so we'll do a little comparison to help you understand the key differences. For the Azure policies, they are used to ensure compliance of resources. They evaluate the state by examining properties on resources that are represented in Resource Manager and properties of some resource provider. It doesn't restrict actions, which are also called operations. They ensure that resource state is compliant to your business rules without concern for who made the change or who has permission to make a change. Even if an individual has access to perform an action, if the result is a non-compliant resource, Azure policy still blocks the create or update. As for the Azure roles, they are used to control access to Azure resources. They focus on managing user actions at different levels of scopes. And Azure roles do restriction on Azure resources. Another thing people tend to get confused between are Azure AD roles versus Azure roles. For Azure AD roles, they are used for managing Azure AD resources. For Azure roles, they are used for fine-grained access control to Azure resources. Active Directory resources include users, groups, billing, licensing, application registration, etc. Azure resources include virtual machines, databases, cloud storage, cloud networking, etc. By default, Azure roles and Azure AD roles are separate and do not span Azure and Azure AD. By default, the global administrator doesn't have permissions to manage Azure resources. Global administrator can gain access to Azure resource if granted the user access administrator role. So Azure AD roles are specifically for managing Azure AD resources, while Azure roles focus on access control to Azure resources. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and in this section, we'll be covering Azure policies. Azure policies enforce organizational standards and assess compliance at scale. Policies do not restrict access, they only observe for compliance. Here is an image with a list of built-in policies that you can use right away from Azure. Let's go over a few key aspects of Azure policies. The first one are policy definitions, which is a JSON file used to describe business rules to control access to resources. Then we have policy assignment. This is the scope of a policy's effect. It can be assigned to a user, a resource group, or management group. Next, we have policy parameters. These are the values you can pass into your policy definition, which makes your policies more flexible for reuse. And we have initiative definitions. This is a collection of policy definitions that you can assign. For example, a group of policies to enforce PCI DSS compliance. Next, we'll look at viewing non-compliant resources. Once a policy is assigned, it will periodically evaluate the compliance state. You can see how compliant we are on the Compliance tab. According to the example in the image, it shows that we are non-compliant. It can occur due to many factors, but it's most likely because virtual machines should have disaster recovery enabled. So let's look at some of the main use cases for Azure Policy. Organizational compliance, Azure Policy enforces standards and assesses compliance at scale, such as enforcing compliance labels on all resources. Cost control, policies can prevent over-provisioning to save costs, like limiting the creation of high-cost VNs. Security enhancements, policies can improve security by enforcing configurations, for example, requiring secure transfer for all storage accounts. Resource consistency, policies can enforce consistent configurations, like a specific naming convention or tag structure. Regulatory compliance, policies can ensure specific configurations for regulatory compliance, such as data hosting in specific regions for data sovereignty. So that's a brief overview of Azure policies. The scope of an Azure policy is the set of resources that the policy is applied to. When you assign a policy, you define the scope at which the policy is enforced. This could be as broad as a management group or as specific as a single resource. 
The hierarchy of scopes in Azure are like other scopes, like Azure Resource Manager or RBAC. It moves from broad to specific in the following order, management group greater than subscription greater than resource group greater than resource. At each level, you can apply different policies as per your requirements. Policies applied at higher levels of the hierarchy are inherited by all the lower levels. This structure provides a powerful mechanism for applying broad organizational policies while still allowing for flexibility and customization at lower levels. It's a key part of how Azure enables you to manage and control your resources effectively and in a way that suits your organizational needs. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and we'll go over the anatomy of an Azure policy definition file. Display name. This serves as an identifier for the policy and has a 128 character limit. Type this field, which is read only, indicates the source of the policy. It could be built in, maintained by Microsoft, custom, created by you, or static, Microsoft owned, and typically pertains to regulatory compliance. Description This provides the context of the policy. Metadata This optional field is used to store key value information on the policy. Though this determines which resource types are evaluated and changes whether resource provider or Azure resource manager is used. Resource manager modes include all. This includes resource groups, subscriptions, and all resource types. And indexed. This only includes resource types that support tags and location. Resource provider modes were used in deprecated services like Microsoft Container Service Data and are now primarily utilized in services like Microsoft Kubernetes Data and Microsoft Key Vault Data. Moving on to parameters, parameters are values passed into the policy to improve its flexibility. A parameter has the following properties. Name, the identifier for the parameter. Type, could be a string, array, object, boolean, integer, float, or date time. Metadata, utilized by Azure to display user-friendly information, such as description, display name, strong type, assign permissions. Default value, an optional field to set a default parameter value. Allowed values, an optional field for setting accepted parameter values. You reference parameters by using field and in. Next, let's go over the policy rule. So this consists of if and then blocks. In the if block, you define one or more conditions that specify when the policy is enforced. You can apply logical operators to these conditions to precisely define the scenario for a policy. The next concept we'll look into is the policy rule and policy effect, which is important in determining the impact of the policy. So we'll go over a list of common policy effects. Deny, if a resource's creation or update doesn't adhere to the policy, it fails. Audit, this creates a warning event in the activity log when evaluating a non-compliant resource, but it doesn't stop the request. Append, this effect adds extra parameters or fields to the resource during its creation or update. For example, it could append tags on resources like cost center or specify allowed IP addresses for a storage resource. Audit if not exists. Similarly to the audit effect, this creates a warning event in the activity log when a resource doesn't comply with the policy, but it doesn't stop the request. Audit is used to audit the properties of a resource, while audit if not exists is used to audit the existence of a related resource. Deploy if not exists, this effect executes a template deployment when a specific condition is met. For example, if SQL encryption is enabled on a database, a template can be executed after the database creation to configure it in a specific way. And the last one is disabled. This effect turns off the policy rule often used for testing purposes. These policy effects provide a range of responses to non-compliance, enabling you to manage your resources according to your organization's specific requirements. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we're going to take a look at how to keep things compliant within our Azure account with Azure Policy. So let's make our way over to the Azure Policy portal by typing policy at the top here. And right away, you can see already that I have a policy assigned. I didn't sign this. Azure did this for me by default, and it's a great way to start understanding how this is useful. So I'm going to go ahead and just click into that one there. And this is an initiative uh, policy, meaning that it's made up of a bunch of policies. We'll go over that over in a moment. But you can see here that's saying, hey, you should turn on all these things. They're not turned on by default, so you should turn them on. And these are ones that you have not turned on. You might not want to consider turning some of these on uh, if you have to consider costs, but I think most of these are free. Um, but that's something that you'll have to decide on your own. Uh, but that gives you a general idea there. So let's go back to policy at the top. 
On the left hand side here, we can see our assignments. And here I have that initiative type there. If I click into it, it allows me to edit it there. Uh, and what's really nice is if I want to disable it, I could just disable it. Uh, but I think this is the default one. So, oh no, I can disable it. Okay, great. And you can see it was assigned by who. Uh, and then you can also uh, take remediation actions uh, here. So by default, this assignment will only take effect on newly created uh, resources. Existing resources can be updated via a remediation task after the policy is assigned. So if you need this applied to uh, ones that are created or, or uh, prior uh, or updated, that's something you might want to do. But anyway, we'll get out of there. And we'll go take a look at all the big list of predefined uh, definitions uh, that Azure gives us. So this is a great way for us to get started. Um, you'll notice on the right-hand side, we have initiative and we have policy. Again, initiative is a collection of policies down below, and these are individual ones. But let's just go take a look at some uh, policies, and maybe we can go apply one to like a virtual machine. Um, so what I'm going to do is just drop down um, uh, this here, and we can just unselect here and let's just go take a look. Do we have one called virtual machines? Not really, um, but we, we can go for compute here and we can just take a look here. So uh, audit virtual machine without disaster recovery. Let's take a look at that one. And I just wanna see the full description here. Audit virtual machine without disaster recovery configured. I think that sounds really good to me. So I'm gonna go ahead and assign that and we can choose a scope. And so I'm gonna choose my subscription here and then we can choose a resource group. And you're gonna notice that I don't actually have any resources so uh, to scope that within. So what we'll go do is launch ourselves a virtual machine. So make our way over to the virtual machine um, a portal here. We'll add a virtual machine. And I want something really cheap. And so here it's set to a more expensive one because I was launching a Windows server uh, previously but I want the cheapest server I can get. Actually, before I do that, I'm just gonna go back and, oh yeah, it's on Ubuntu, just making sure. And the one I had that was really cheap is the B1LS. And so I'm just gonna go up here to the top. We'll name this Bajor. And uh, we'll put it in the Bajor group there. Uh, this size does not support Azure Spot. That's totally fine. I don't need Spot. Did I turn that on by accident? Oh, I did. And this all looks fine to me. I'm not gonna be logging into this machine. We just want to launch it up as an example. I'm gonna to move to standard SSD because I don't need premium here. And this looks fine to me. We'll go ahead and hit review and create. So uh, we'll go ahead and create that. And I guess we have to download that private key. Probably a good idea. We're not gonna use it for anything, but that's okay. And now that it's deploying, let's see if we can select the scope as it's creating. I'm not sure if it'll let us do that. I'm just gonna hit cancel here and reopen here. And let's see if it shows up now. It doesn't. So uh, we'll just wait a moment here. Uh, I'll go back to my policy here. And I'm just gonna wait for this server to create. And once that is created, um, what we'll do is we'll just come back here and see if we can now scope that. All right, so after a short little wait, um, our server is ready here. So let's make our way back to our policy here. And uh, well, I guess I lost it. So I'll have to go back to definitions. And we'll drop down categories, deselect, we'll go to compute. And we'll go ahead and uh, click on disaster recovery again. Here you can see the policy in its entirety. So that's kind of nice. Uh, and we'll go ahead and assign that and we'll choose our scope. So we'll go back here to subscription one. Now we should have Bajor and I'll go ahead and hit select. Uh, we can assign exclusions, not something I'm gonna do today. Um, there is the name of it, that's totally fine. Then we can hit enabled and I'm the one who's enabling it. So that sounds like a good idea. We'll go next. Uh, we're gonna leave remedi remediation off. We don't need to do that today. We'll hit create. Uh, and so now this policy is assigned. It says here, please note that the assignment takes around 30 minutes to take effect. So if we work our way back here and look at assignments. Um, I don't see it here yet, so there it is. And um, it's probably not gonna show us on there. So we'll go back to our overview. And so I wanna see, it hasn't started yet. So we'll just wait for a while here. Might take 30 minutes, might take 10, I'm not sure. And we'll just see what happens. This should show up as non-compliant, but let's see that actually happen. All right, so after waiting a little while here, I think it was about 15, 20 minutes, we can now see that it's saying that it's non-compliant. So we'll go ahead and click into there. And we can see what exactly it is complaining about. And we click over to that resource. 
So there you go. It's not too uh, complicated there. Uh, we'll go ahead and just uh, delete that assignment. And uh, if you're wondering where blueprints are, they're all the way over here. We talked about blueprints in the actual course, not something we actually have to do because it is probably a better way of uh, doing things. I just wanted to point that out uh, to you. Um, but yeah, there you go. So it's as simple as that. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. And in this section, we'll be covering Azure Resource Manager. Azure Resource Manager is a service that allows you to manage Azure resources. Azure Resource Manager is a collection of services in the Azure portal, so you can't simply type in Azure Resource Manager in the search tab. It is a management layer that allows you to create, update, or delete resources, apply management features such as access controls, locks, or tags, and write infrastructure as code using JSON templates. We will be examining the following key components that form the Azure Resource Manager layer. We have subscriptions, management groups, resource groups, resource providers, resource locks, Azure Blueprints, as well as resource tags, access control, role-based access controls, Azure policies, and ARM templates. You can think of Azure Resource Manager as a gatekeeper. All of the requests flow through ARM, and it decides whether that request can be performed on a resource, such as the creation, updating, and deletion of a virtual machine, and it's ARM's responsibility to authenticate and authorize these requests. ARM uses Azure's role-based access control to determine whether a user has the necessary permissions to carry out a request. When a request is made, ARM checks the user's assigned roles and the permissions associated with those roles. If the user has the necessary permissions, the request is allowed, otherwise it is denied. The next concept we'll go over is the scope for Azure Resource Manager. We've briefly covered scope in Azure Policy and Azure RBAC, but we'll go into more detail with them in the following sections for ARM. So, scope is a boundary of control for Azure resources. It is a way to govern your resource by placing resources within a logical grouping and applying logical restrictions in the form of rules. Management groups are a logical grouping of multiple subscriptions. Subscriptions grant you access to Azure services based on a billing and support agreement. Resource groups are a logical grouping of multiple resources. And resources can be a specific Azure service such as Azure VMs. So, that's an overview of Azure Resource Manager. Azure management groups provide a way to manage multiple subscriptions by organizing them into a hierarchical structure. Every directory is assigned a single top-level management group, known as the root management group. This root group forms the base of the hierarchy and can have multiple management groups or subscriptions nested under it. One of the key benefits of using management groups is that all subscriptions within a management group automatically inherit the conditions applied to the management group. Some important facts about management groups you should know are a single directory can support up to 10,000 management groups. The hierarchy of a management group tree can be up to six levels deep, not including the root level or the subscription level. Each management group and subscription can have only one parent. Each management group could have multiple children. All subscriptions and management groups exist within a single hierarchy in each directory. So that's a short overview of Azure management groups. Before you can do anything in your Azure account, you'll need to have a subscription. An Azure account can have multiple subscriptions, and the most commonly used ones are free trial, pay as you go, and Azure for students. For example, if you wanted developer support, you would add a developer support subscription to your account. Once a subscription is set up, it provides you with the ability to configure various settings and features, such as resource tags. These allow you to categorize your resources according to your organizational needs. Access controls helps manage access and permissions for your Azure resources. Resources groups are logical containers in which Azure resources are deployed and managed. Cost management and billing provides tools to track and manage your cloud spending and more. These features provide you with a high degree of flexibility and control over your Azure resources, allowing you to manage your resources effectively and securely. The next topic we'll be covering are resource groups. So a resource group is a container that holds related resources for an Azure solution. For example, you might have a resource group that contains multiple virtual machines for a specific project or application. As for resources, these are manageable items available through Azure. A resource could be an individual entity like a virtual machine. 
Next, we have resource providers. These are services that supply Azure resources. An example of a resource provider is Microsoft. Compute, which provides compute resources like VMs. In order to use Azure resources, you have to register resource providers. Many resource providers are registered by default for you with your subscription. However, for certain resources, you may need to manually register the resource provider. This image shows a list of resource providers available in Azure, and in the status, you can see if they are either registered or not registered. You can register resource providers under your subscription in the Azure portal through Azure PowerShell or Azure CLI. This ensures you have access to the latest resources and features provided by that service. The next topic we'll explore are resource tags. So, a tag is a pair consisting of a key and a value that you can assign to Azure resources. These tags can be used to categorize resources based on different criteria relevant to your organization. Here are some examples of tags. Department equals finance. Status equals approved. Team equals compliance. Environment equals production. Project equals enterprise. Location equals West US. Tags allow you to organize your resources in the following ways. Resource management tags can help you sort and manage resources based on specific workloads or environments, such as developer environments. Cost management and optimization tags can be used for cost tracking, setting budgets, and creating alerts. Operations management tags can be used to manage business commitments and service level agreement operations, such as mission critical services. Security tags can be used for classifying data and assessing security impact, helping you manage your security posture. Other helpful ways include governance and regulatory compliance, automation, and workload optimization. All in all, tags provide a flexible, customizable method for managing your Azure resources according to your specific needs. The next topic we'll be covering are resource locks. Resource locks are a critical feature in Azure that help safeguard important resources from accidental modifications or deletions. As an admin, you may need to lock a subscription, resource group, or resource to prevent other users from accidentally deleting or modifying critical resources, especially in environments with multiple administrators or automated processes. In the Azure portal, you can set the following lock levels. Cannot delete. This lock ensures authorized users can still read and modify a resource, but they can't delete the resource. Read only. This lock ensures authorized users can read a resource, but they can't delete or update the resource. There are a number of ways to manage locks. Here are some of them. Azure Portal, you can easily create, view, and delete locks through the Azure Portal. Azure PowerShell, use CMD lets like new as resource lock to manage locks. Azure CLI, commands like as lock create help manage locks. Azure Resource Manager templates, you can also define locks in your ARM templates. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and in this section, we'll be covering Azure Blueprints. Azure Blueprints enable quick creation of governed subscriptions. The key term here is governed. While one can easily create a subscription in their account, a governed subscription indicates there's a process and set expectations for how the subscription should be configured. Azure Blueprints allow you to compose artifacts based on common patterns or those specific to an organization into reusable blueprints. The service is designed to help with environment setup. The service is designed to help with environment setup. Blueprints are a declarative way to orchestrate the deployment of various resource templates and other artifacts such as role assignments, policy assignments, Azure Resource Manager templates, resource groups. Azure Blueprint service is powered by the globally distributed Azure Cosmos DB, ensuring Blueprint objects are replicated across multiple regions, providing redundancy and resilience. A common query is the difference between an ARM template and an Azure Blueprint. Nearly everything that you want to include for deployment in Azure Blueprints can be accomplished with an ARM template. With ARM templates, you can store them either locally or in source control. There isn't an active connection or relationship to the ARM template post-deployment. On the other hand, Azure Blueprints maintain a connection between the Blueprint definition, what should be deployed, and the Blueprint assignment, what has been deployed. Azure Blueprints can upgrade multiple subscriptions simultaneously if they're governed by the same Blueprint. This means Azure Blueprint supports improved tracking and auditing of deployments. So that's an overview of Azure Blueprints. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and what we're gonna be doing is moving resources from one resource group to another and understanding the limitations around that. Uh, so I just have this page pulled up here because I just wanna emphasize that I've seen exam questions on this stuff, 
And there's a lot of little nitty gritty things that could show up as a solution. So the idea is that when you're talking about moving resources, um, you know, you're moving them uh, into different regions or to different subscriptions or different resource groups. And generally they're pretty straightforward, but there are some edge cases where uh, things will not work as expected. And that's based on um, some particular services. So when we're looking at app services, DevOps services, classic deployment, network movement guidance, recovery services, virtual machines. So I definitely know that for app services, you're gonna run into issues uh, like if you're moving from uh, one subscription to another and you already have a web app uh, service in the one that you're moving it into, it won't allow you to do it. And so there's a lot of little things like that, okay? Um, and also if you are migrating them, you can go ahead and use the diagnostic tool to uh, debug it and it will tell you some additional information. So you will have to read through all of these. I just can't show you all of that in a follow along. Um, but what we'll do is we'll just go through the basics here of moving things between resource groups. And so what we'll need is a few resource groups. So I'm going to add a new one and we're going to call this one the USS Fed or the Federation of Planets. And we'll put that in uh, East US. And then we will make another resource group and we'll call this the Klingon Empire. And for fun, we will place it in uh, West. So we'll go ahead and create that. So now we just need something we can move around back and forth. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make my way over to disks because that's a great example of something we can move around and change. And so I'm gonna add a new disk and uh, I'm gonna place this in the Federation. And I'm just gonna say um, dilithium. I can never spell that right. Well, let's see if I can get the proper spelling for this thing that is not real. Dilithium here. And so it's gonna be over here. Uh, I don't care about availability zones and stuff like that. Source type, this is fine. And so we have the initial size. I do not need a drive that big. Let's go super small. Uh, we could even do an HDD because those are even cheaper. And we'll just choose the small size down here. Um, and so we'll pick 32. And so this should be all final encryption, networking. We don't really care. We're not doing anything other than moving this around. So we'll go ahead and review and create, right? And so then we'll go create that resource. And we'll just wait a little while here. It shouldn't take too long. All right, so the disk is ready. So we'll go to this resource and here it is. So now let's say we want to move that uh, to our other resource group, which is in another region. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go back to our resource groups here. And if we go into the Federation of Planets, what we can do is uh, go to overview, select the disk, go over here and say, move to another resource group. And I'll just click these other ones to show you. I don't have any other subscriptions to move this to. Um, so I'll just go back there. I thought maybe I could show you some stuff, but I just realized I don't have much in this account or uh, with other subscriptions. So we'll just go back to overview here and just move it to another resource group. And technically we're moving it to another region. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and so we will select um, the Klingon Empire. I understand that the tools and scripts associated with the move will not work, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll hit OK. And that's going to take a little bit of time to move. So while that is going, I'm going to make a new tab so we don't lose that history there. And I just want to talk about some settings you can put on your resource groups. So if we go into the Klingon Empire and we go down below here, we should have the ability to apply locks. And there are a few different types of locks. We have read only and delete. So read only means it's a read only resource and delete means we cannot delete the resource, which makes sense, right? So read only should mean we shouldn't be able to modify this. So I'm going to say, uh, don't touch, do not touch. And I'm going to say, okay here. And so what that means is that I should not be able to modify the resource, uh, whether I can delete it or not is another story. We'll find that out. 
And another question is, can I move that resource outside of this if it's set to those modes? And that's what we're going to find out. So moving back over here, um, has this finished moving? It's still validating. So we're going to have to wait a little bit here, and I'll see you back in a moment. All right, so after waiting a little while here, I believe that it's done moving, so I'm still in my old resource group here. What we'll do is click back into here, go to overview, and we see that it's no longer there. But if we go over to the Klingon Empire, we go up, uh, back over, just click into overview, there it is. So we had no problems moving a disk to another region in another resource group. Now we did apply this lock over here. So what is gonna happen when we try to modify this disk. I think you know the answer, but let's give it a go just to see what happens. So over here, we're going to want to uh, res resize it here. I'm going to pick 64. I'm going to go hit resize and it says fail to update the disk because of that reason. So um, there, you cannot perform a write operation because of the lock. So there you go. Uh, now let's go back and we are going to go apply uh, another lock here. This time I'm going to make it so you can't delete it. And so we say, don't, do not delete me. All right. And so what we'll do is we'll go back uh, and we'll try to delete it. So we'll hit the delete button. We'll say yes. Again, it says you cannot do it. Now, here's the next question. Can you move that resource out or in to a resource group if it has lock or read only on? Uh, and that's what I want you to guess whether you can or not because you are in read-only, so would you be able to move something that's read-only? So we'll go ahead and move it. We're going to move this to another resource group, and I'm going to send it back to the Federation of Planets. I say, I understand, hit OK. And it failed the check, we'll see why. Cannot perform the right operation because there are locks. Please remove some of the locks. So which is it? Is it delete? Is it the read-only? Do I have to remove both? That's what we need to go find out. So back in our resource group, I'm going to go ahead and first remove. Parent resource locks can't be edited here. Okay, that's fine. So we'll go back to here and we will go into the locks and we'll first delete the read only. And then what we'll do is we will attempt to uh, delete this again. See what happens. It looks like it's moving. So it's not that you can't move it uh, out if it's in read only, or sorry, in delete, but you, but you can't if it's read only because it's read only, right? Now, when we're talking about moving resources into a group that's set to read only, I'm almost certain that you can absolutely do that. Um, so uh, we could stage that, I guess, just to make sure. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to set up another resource group just to make sure that we, we know this for certain just in case I am wrong, the star, the Romulan Star Empire, Romulan Star Empire, and I'm gonna just leave it in the same region. And so for this one in particular, what I'm gonna do is apply a read only. I might as well just put both on here, but I'll just, and I'm just gonna do read only. And we'll say, do not delete me. And then what I'll do is I'll go back to the Federation planets and I'm just going to, actually, I'll just go to disks and we'll create a new disk here. Um, and we will place it in the Federation here. And we will just say um, dark matter or antimatter. And we will just change this to HHD as small as we can go. We'll review and create that. And we'll go ahead and create that. And this will not take long. We do not have to wait that long for this. And notice here that um, we could not, uh, this is interesting. So there was an error moving the resource. Moving resources failed because Resource Group Federation has active deployment. So if you are moving stuff uh, and then you do deploy, it's going to uh, cancel that deploy. So that's interesting to know. Um, so I believe that this new one is deployed. I cannot remember. I think we set this one to have read only here on the, um, what do you call it? The, uh, Romulan Star Empire, which isn't showing up. There it is. Just double check there. So the question is, can I move a resource into a read only? 
we'll go here. And uh, I guess we need to actually go to the Federation of Planets. And we'll go to overview, we have antimatter and I want to move that into Romulan, Star Empire, say I understand. It'll either say we can or we can't. And we absolutely can, otherwise it would air it out at this point. So hopefully you can keep that straight. So you can move a resource into a group that has read only. You cannot move it out if it's set. You can absolutely move it out if it's set to delete. Delete just protects against delete. If you are moving a resource from one resource group to another, uh, and then you deploy something, it's going to cause that movement to fail. And then there's those edge cases for uh, moving resources with Azure. And that's something you should spend some time reading up on those use cases, or maybe I'll just uh, pick out the most important ones and put it into a cheat sheet, all right? Uh, and so what I'm gonna do is just go ahead and clean this stuff up. Um, so what I need to do here is go and remove the delete. I think it's only on here. So if I go to my locks, uh, I'm gonna go back to resource groups here. And we will delete the locks here. And so now I can go ahead and delete these groups. I guess I have to do them one by one, which is kind of annoying, but that's just how it goes. Yeah, dun, 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 dun. It says it's locked. It's not locked anymore. Oh, it's still there. Look at that. Okay. Could have swore I definitely uh, did something there. There we go. And we will go ahead and delete the last one. There we are. So yeah, hopefully you know a bit more about moving resources around. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and in this segment, we'll be diving into ARM templates. So what exactly is infrastructure as code? Infrastructure as code is the process of managing and provisioning computer data centers, such as those in Azure using machine readable definition files like JSON files, rather than depending on physical hardware configuration or interactive configuration tools. You write a script that will set up cloud services for you. There are two main approaches to IAC. Declarative, here you describe your desired outcome and the system figures out how to achieve it. Imperative, here you provide specific instructions detailing exactly how to reach the desired state. ARM templates are JSON files that define Azure resources you want to provision and Azure services you want to configure. With ARM templates you can ensure a declarative approach, meaning you merely define your intended setup and the system handles the rest. Build, remove, or share entire architectures in minutes reduce configuration mistakes, and know exactly what you have defined for a stack to establish an architecture baseline for compliance. Moreover, ARM templates empower you to establish an architecture baseline for compliance, achieve modularity, break up your architecture in multiple files and reuse them, ensure extensibility, add PowerShell and Bash scripts to your templates, test using the ARM template toolkit, preview changes before you create infrastructure via template, see what it will create, Built-in validation will only deploy your template if it passes. Track deployments, keep track of changes to architecture over time. Policy as code, apply Azure policies to ensure you remain compliant. Use Microsoft Blueprints which forge a connection between a resource and its template. Integrate with CI, CD pipelines. Utilize exportable code, letting you capture the current state of resource groups and individual resources and benefit from advanced authoring tools. For instance, Visual Studio Code offers sophisticated features tailored for crafting ARM templates. So as you can see, ARM templates has quite a lot of uses. All right, moving forward, let's delve into the structure or the skeleton of ARM templates. Skeleton is a term used to describe the basic framework or structure of an ARM template. Think of it as the blueprint that guides how an ARM template should be organized and what elements it should contain. Schema, this describes the properties that are available within a template. Content version, this denotes the version of your template. You can provide any value for this element. 
API profile, use this value to avoid having to specify API versions for each resource in the template. Parameters, these are the dynamic values you feed into your template when you're deploying or updating resources. It offers flexibility, enabling you to use the same template in different scenarios or environments just by changing the parameter values. Variables. This is where you can process or transform the parameters or resource properties. By using function expressions, you can manipulate input values, making your template more dynamic and adaptable. Functions. Within the ARM template, you can define user-specific functions. This allows for reusable custom logic, reducing redundancy and simplifying the template. Resources. Here, you list out all the Azure resources you intend to deploy or update. It defines what your infrastructure looks like and how each component is configured. Outputs. After a successful deployment, you might want to retrieve specific values or results. The output section is where you define these values, be it the IP address of a newly created VM or the URL of a web app. Overall, an ARM template skeleton provides a structured and consistent approach to define, deploy, and manage Azure resources. Moving forward, let's discuss one of the pivotal components of the ARM template, the resources. Resource. This represents any Azure component or service you wish to provision. It could be a virtual machine, a database, or a network interface, etc. Type. This defines the kind of resource you're provisioning. This typically follows the format of resource provider slash resource type. For instance, if you're looking to create a storage account, you'd use the type Microsoft.Storage slash storage accounts. API version. Each resource type corresponds to an API version, which is essentially the version of the REST API used for that particular resource. It's important to note that each resource provider published has its own API versions, so you need to ensure you're using the correct one for your chosen resource. Name. This attribute specifies the unique name of the resource. For example, if you're setting up a virtual machine, this could be my virtual machine. Location. This is a common attribute for most resources. It determines the Azure region where your resource will be deployed, such as East US or West Europe. Other properties. Beyond the basic attributes, each resource type has its own set of properties that allow for deeper configuration. These properties can vary widely depending on the resource. For a virtual machine, it could be the size or the operating system. For a database, it might be the capacity or replication settings. In this segment, we'll delve into a fundamental component of ARM templates, the parameters. Parameters play a critical role in ARM templates. They allow you to pass specific values into your template, thus allowing you to create more flexible and dynamic infrastructure configurations. Defining a parameter, as shown in the example, to define a parameter named storage name. It's of type string with a minimum length of five characters and a maximum length of 20 characters. Once you've defined a parameter, you can then reference it in various parts of your template, such as type, API version, name, and so forth. Type dictates the expected data type for the input value. Common types include string, secure a string, int, bool, object, secure object, and array. Default value. If no value is provided, it will be set to default value. Allowed values. This is an array of allowed values. Min value. The minimal possible value. Max value, the maximum possible value. Min length, the maximum length of characters or array. Max length, the maximum length of characters or array. Description, the description that will be displayed to the in the Azure portal. In summary, parameters are the gatekeepers of customization in ARM templates. The next topic we'll be covering are the ARM template functions. Functions in ARM templates are powerful tools that allow you to transform and manipulate your ARM variables. Think of them as the building blocks that enable you to create more dynamic and flexible configurations. Template functions, these are built-in functions provided by Azure for a wide range of common tasks. User-defined functions, these are custom functions you can create to cater to specific needs that aren't addressed by the built-in template functions. Functions are called using parentheses eg, such as the example shown here. Categories of template functions. Array functions, tools for handling arrays. Some of these include it. Array, concat, contains, create array, empty, first, etc. Comparison functions for equating or contrasting values. Coalesce equals less, lesser equals, greater and greater or equals. Date functions to manipulate date and time. Date time add UTC now. Deployment functions pertaining to the deployment itself. Deployment, environment, parameters, and variables. Logical functions for logical operations, and or if not.
numeric functions, mathematical and numeric operations, add copy index div float int min max etc. Object functions for object manipulation contains empty intersection, JSON, length, and union. Resource functions related to Azure resources. Extension resource ID, list account SAS, list keys, list secrets, etc. String functions for string manipulation and evaluation. Base64, Base64 to JSON, Base64 to string, concat, contains, etc. We won't go over all of them, but this is just to show you that there are a lot of functions available to you. The next topic we'll cover are the ARM template variables. Template variables are used to simplify your ARM templates. You transform parameters and resource properties using functions, and then assign them into a reusable variable. In this example, the storage name variable is computed by combining a parameter named storage name prefix with a unique string derived from the resource group's ID. To call a variable, you use the variable function, as shown in this example. Sometimes your templates might become more intricate, and you may need a hierarchical structure to your variables. That's where nested variables come in. You can use JSO and object to have nested variables to scope your variables for multiple use cases. Scoping, nesting variables based on environment, consider scenarios where you have configurations that vary based on the environment, like test or prod. You might want to neatly encapsulate variables specific to each environment within a JSON object, as shown in the example. You can use parameters to choose the environment, and then reference nested variables as followed in the example. Variables, parentheses, square brackets, dot, property, Overall, variables in ARM templates are powerful tools that can simplify your template, make it more adaptable, and improve its maintainability. The ARM templates aren't just about defining and provisioning resources, they also offer a way to fetch information about the deployed resources. This is where the output section of your ARM templates comes into play. Outputs returns values from deployed resources, so you can use them programmatically. For example, you might want to know the static IP of a created VM or the connection string of a deployed database. You specify the type and value under outputs. Here, the output name resource it is capturing the ID of a public IP address resource. It's noteworthy that the type is explicitly mentioned, ensuring type safety. Once your resources are deployed, these outputs can be fetched using Azure CLI, PowerShell, or the Azure SDKs. For instance, with Azure CLI, this command retrieves the resource output value from a specific deployment in a resource group. So that's a quick overview of outputs in ARM templates. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at Azure Resource Manager templates, also known as ARM templates. And this helps you uh, deliver infrastructure as code, meaning that when you have a resource such as a virtual machine or a storage account, instead of manually configuring it every single time through um, uh, the portal, what you can do is provide a configuration file that defines all the properties that you want it to be configured with. And the idea is that you can uh, keep this file and share with other, uh, other people so they can easily uh, create the same resources as you. And then you know exactly how your stuff is, is configured. So what we're gonna do is uh, launch a new template. Now you can't go up here and just type in ARM because these ARM templates are managed uh, at different levels. So at one level is the script subscription or the resource groups. So when you have a resource group, you have deployments within them and that's where uh, these templates are deployed. Uh, but just to deploy one from here, what we're gonna do is type in deploy. Why they didn't make it so you can type in ARM, I do not know. But if you go down here, we have deploy a custom template. And so from here, we have some common templates. So if I click into web app and I go edit a template, we already have some stuff pre-filled in. I'm just gonna go back and discard that, go back to select a template, and we're gonna build our own. And by default, we'll have that schema, that content version, which is 1.0.0.0, our parameters and our resources. So today I wanna launch a virtual machine. And uh, what you normally would have to do is go here uh, and look up what it is that you wanna create. So if it's this, uh, Microsoft Compute Virtual Machine, you'd go through here and you'd have to make sure you have all these uh, properties. So you define the resource here, right, the type, um, and then you define the properties that you want. And down below, you can go through here and see them all. That's a lot of work. I don't want to do that. So I'll go to add resource here, drop this down and click. Uh, where is it? Virtual machine. Where are you? There you are. And I'm going to call this one Wharf. 
and then Worf and Worf because it's not just going to create a virtual machine. It's going to create the other things uh, that I need with it as well, such as the storage account, the network interface, and the virtual network. So you can see that we have a bunch of parameters here. So the name, the type, the name, the admin username, the password, and the OS version. Oh, and you know what? I think I chose a Windows one. I do not want a Windows one. I want a Linux one because that is easier for me to work with here. So we choose Ubuntu. So I'll just fill this in again. All right. And so um, back up here, you know, we have the Ubuntu version between some versions here. And then there's the type. So that's for uh, replication. Then we have variables here. So if we go to VM size, this is the VM it will, it will set here. Uh, variables are either you can have string values or you can use functions to transform other parameters into other stuff that you'll reference throughout your template. Then down below, we have those resources here. So what we'll do is um, actually I'm going to copy this because it's, it's very highly likely we're going to want to make some kind of change. And so I have VS Code over here on the, on the left or right hand side. I'm just going to paste that on in there. Um, and what we will do, this is a JSON file, make things a little bit easier here. Great. And what I'll do is just move that off screen and we'll go ahead and we will save this and we'll see if we can deploy this. So I'm going to type in wharf here and we'll launch in Canada East. I'll name this wharf. We will uh, name the username wharf, but lowercase, and then we'll do testing one, two, three, four, five, six, capital on the T. Notice that it is uh, hidden there. And then we will choose 14, which is defaulted here, and LRS. We'll go ahead and do review and create. And we'll hit create here. So this is going to fail. I already know because it has a misconfiguration. It'll tell us how. But while that's going, we'll take a look at our inputs. So this is the values that were inputted. These are the outputs if we had defined any, which we have not. Um, and if we go back to our template, I just wanted to show you that we have that secure string. So when we were typing our password, that's why we didn't see it. Um, so just things like that. So I'll go back up here and our deploy failed. Why? What happened? <laughs> so we open it up here. The requested VM size standard D1 is not available in the current region. So the template we have is not that great. Um, it, it needs some uh, configuration because we can't use D1. I think that doesn't exist anymore. And so what we really want to use is the standard B1 LS. All right. Standard B1 LS. So I'm going to cut that and for the time being I'm going to go back to our original template and this is one big template I'm going to look for those variables oh they're all the way at the bottom here nice and so I'm going to just go ahead and paste that in b1ls just double check making sure I spelled that right standard uh, standard b1ls looks good to me so I'm going to move that off screen and the question is what do we do what do we do when a deploy fails? So let's go take a look at what has happened here. So this all got deployed into a resource group and under here, this is where our deployments are. So when we look at this template, it, we can see that it failed. We can click into here, get the same information. Um, and if we click into here, it just brings us back to where we just were. But if we go look at what was actually deployed uh, under our resource group, under the overview, We'll notice that it created the virtual network, the storage account, and the network interface. So when it fails, it creates what it can, but it doesn't roll back, okay? So the question is, is then how do you do cleanup? So you might think I'll go to deployments, and what I'll do is go ahead and delete that template, and we can go ahead and do that, which by the way, you can't edit this template. All you can do is, um, all we can do here, see, I just wanna show you that you cannot edit it. But we can download it and stuff like that. But uh, so you might think, well, if I go ahead and delete that template, just making sure we're in the right place here, you might think that might roll back those resources, but it doesn't. It just deletes the template. <laughs> so if you really want to get rid of the stuff, what you got to do is go ahead and delete all these resources manually. So um, I wish it kind of had a rollback feature, but that's just how it is. But there are some nice things that uh, Azure does here, which we'll talk about in a moment. So I think we have adjusted it to the correct value now. So hopefully this is going to be all we need to make it work. So what we'll do is go to our deployments here. Uh, and we can't do it here, but so we'll go back to the top here and type in deploy. And we'll go to custom template. 
And what we'll do is build our own template in our editor. And I'm just going to copy the contents here. Okay, and we'll go copy. And I will go oh, paste. And we'll make sure that this is all good. Looks fine to me. We'll go ahead and hit save. And we will choose Wharf. So we don't have to make a new one. And we will fill in uh, the name as Wharf. The username is Wharf. I'll call Wharf 2 just in case. Helps us keep track of what we're doing here. Testing 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 with a capital on the T. 14 L uh, RLS, LRS. And we'll go ahead. Oh, we have one issue here. Cannot deploy resource group Wharf deleting. Um, we'll go back. And we will hit create here. I don't think I deleted the resource group. Let me just go double check. I almost, I'm almost, i almost certain I deleted all the contents of it, right? Oh, so there's already one here, so we're just waiting for that to delete. Just gonna go delete for us, please. Thank you. It failed to delete. We'll go take a look as to why. Resource is not found. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll go back to our resource groups. Let's give this a refresh here. Okay, so you know what? I must have deleted the resource group, which is totally fine. I, I could have sworn I only deleted the contents of it, but we'll just call this wharf regular then. We'll go ahead and hit uh, create here. And so this time, I have better feeling about this. And so we'll just have to wait a little bit. It won't take too long. I'll see you back in a moment. Okay, so after waiting a little bit here, our, uh, our thing seems to be deployed. So if we go to resource groups, we can see that our virtual machine is deployed. So uh, that's pretty much all there is to it. One other thing I'd like to show you is that whatever you have, whatever is in your resource group, you can actually export the template. So uh, if you did configure something manually, all you'd have to do is find the resource. Go up here to, whoop, um, it is export template, and there's your template. So it just has that single resource in there. I can't remember if if I go into here, if I select multiples, um, and I go, exp or where is it? Export template. Look, it's gonna include all that stuff. So if you already have existing resources that you provisioned, and you want to have them, that's what you can do. Notice that some things won't be included in the template when you do that, but you can just go ahead and download them and then you have them for later. So yeah, that's all there really is to um, ARM other than learning the, uh, the nitty gritties of the actual language. That's just how you work with it there. So what I'm gonna do is make my way over to my resource group here and I'm just gonna go ahead and delete this here. And we're all good to go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and in this section, we'll be covering Azure Monitor. So, Azure Monitor is a comprehensive solution for collecting, analyzing, and acting on telemetry from your cloud and on premises environments. It serves as the backbone for gaining insight into the performance and health of your applications, infrastructure, and even the network. He features visual dashboards, a visual representation of your data, smart alerts, intelligent notifications based on specific conditions, automated actions, set automation based on certain triggers, log monitoring, track and analyze event logs. Many Azure services by default are already sending telemetry data to Azure Monitor. What is observability? It's the ability to measure and understand how internal systems work in order to answer questions regarding performance, tolerance, security, and faults with a system or application. To obtain observability, you need to use metrics, logs, and traces. You have to use them together. Using them in isolation does not gain you observability. Metrics, a number that is measured over a period of time. For example, if we measured the CPU usage and aggregated it over a period of time, we could have an average CPU metric. Logs, a text file where each line contains event data about what happened at a certain time. 
traces a history of requests that travels through multiple apps or services so we can pinpoint performance or failure, looks like they should have called it the Triforce of Observability, the sources of common monitoring data to populate data stores order by highest to lowest, application, operating system, Azure resources, Azure subscription, Azure tenant, custom sources. The two fundamental data stores are metrics and logs. Azure monitor functionalities, insights, this can be for applications, containers, VMs, or other monitoring solutions. Visualize using dashboards, views, Power BI, and workbooks, you can create rich visual presentations of your data. Analyze, this involves delving deep into metrics analytics and log analytics. Respond, based on data, Azure Monitor can alert you or even auto-scale resources. Integrate, extend the capabilities by using Logic Apps or export APIs for more flexibility. Overall, Azure Monitor is a comprehensive solution vital for ensuring that your applications and services run optimally and any issues are detected and dealt with promptly. The next topic we'll be covering are the various sources from which Azure Monitor collects data. Application code. Azure Monitor's application insights offers robust metrics about the performance and functionality of your applications and code. You'll get performance traces, application logs, and even user telemetry. You'll need to install instrumentation package in your application to collect data for application insights. Availability tests. Measure your application's responsiveness from different locations on the public internet. This helps in assessing the reliability and uptime of your services. Metrics, descriptive data regarding your application's performance, operation, and custom metrics. Logs store operational data about your application, including page views, application requests, exceptions, and traces. You can send application data to Azure Storage for archiving. View the details of availability tests stored. And debug snapshot data that is captured for a subset of exceptions is stored in Azure Storage. Log Analytics Agent is installed for comprehensive monitoring. Dependency Agent collects discovered data about processes running on the virtual machine and external process dependencies. Agents can be installed on the OS for VMs running in Azure, on-premises, or other cloud providers. Diagnostics Extension collect performance counters and store them in metrics. Application Insights Logs collect logs and performance counters from the compute resources supporting your application, allowing them to be analyzed alongside other application data. The Azure Diagnostics extension always writes to an Azure Storage account, while Azure Monitor for VMs uses the Log Analytics agent to store health state information in a custom location. The Diagnostics extension can also stream data to other locations using event hubs. Resource logs provide insights into the internal operation of an Azure resource and are automatically created. However, you must create a diagnostic setting to specify a destination for each resource. Platform Metrics will write to the Azure Monitor Metrics database with no configuration. You can access Platform Metrics from Metrics Explorer. For trending and other analyzes, use Log Analytics. Copy Platform Metrics to Logs. Send resource logs to Azure Storage for archiving. Stream metrics to other locations using event hubs. Azure Subscription. This includes telemetry related to the health and operation of your Azure subscription. Azure Service Health provides information about the health of the Azure services in your subscription that your application and resources rely on. Telemetry related to your Azure tenant is collected from tenant-wide services such as Azure Active Directory. Azure Active Directory reporting contains the history of sign-in activity and audit trail of changes made within a particular tenant. For resources that cannot be monitored using the other data sources, write this data to either metrics or logs using an Azure Monitor API. This will allow you to collect log data from any REST client and store it in Log Analytics and the Azure Monitor Metrics database. Azure Monitor is integral to maintaining the health and performance of your applications and resources, collecting two fundamental types of data, logs and metrics. Azure Monitor Logs collects and organizes log and performance data from a variety of monitored resources. Data consolidation, logs can be pulled from diverse sources such as platform logs from Azure services, log and performance data from agents on virtual machines, and usage and performance data from applications. Workspaces, all these logs are organized into workspaces, providing a centralized repository for in-depth analysis. Query language, Azure Monitor Logs offers a sophisticated query language, which can quickly analyze millions of records, making it an ideal choice for complex data analytics. Log Analytics, you can interactively work with log queries and their results using Azure's Log Analytics tool. 
In contrast, Azure Monitor Metrics collects numeric data and organizes it into a time series database. Here's why that's important. Numeric data, metrics are numerical values captured at regular intervals. They are a snapshot that describes a particular aspect of a system at a specific moment in time. Lightweight, metrics are designed to be lightweight, allowing for near real-time data analysis. This makes them particularly useful for alerting and the rapid detection of issues. Metrics Explorer, the Metrics Explorer tool allows for interactive analysis of metric data, providing a more immediate understanding of your system's performance and health. The next topic we'll cover are the data retention and archive policies of Azure Monitor logs. This is an important aspect of your monitoring strategy as it allows you to control how long your data remains stored and accessible. By default, in the Azure portal, you can set this retention time anywhere from 30 to 730 days for the whole workspace. If you want, you can also specify different storage durations for certain tables within your workspace, letting you manage different types of data as needed. This gives you the flexibility to meet any business or regulatory rules about data storage. However, note that to tweak these retention settings, you have to be on the paid tier of Azure Monitor logs. To set retention and archive policy by table, widen, navigate to the Azure portal and go to the log analytics workspace where the data is stored. Two, under the settings section, select usage and estimated cost. Three, then select data retention. For in the data retention blade, you can modify the retention period for each table. By default, it is set to 31 days, but you can extend it up to 730 days. 5. For archiving data, you can use Azure Data Explorer, which lets you retain data beyond the two-year limit and gives you a highly scalable analytics service. So, that's an overview of the data retention and archive policies of Azure Monitor Logs. You'll most likely encounter a question related to this on the exam, so be sure to know this. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and in this section, we'll be covering Azure Log Analytics. So, Log Analytics is a tool in the Azure portal used to edit and run log queries with data in Azure Monitor Logs. Log Analytics processes data from various sources and transforms it into actionable insights. It ingests data from Azure Monitor, Windows, and Linux agents, Azure services, and other sources. Once the data is collected, you can use Log Analytics query language to retrieve, consolidate, and analyze the data. Log Analytics uses a query language called KQL. Now, we'll go over some of the benefits of Log Analytics. Centralized log management, collect and analyze data from multiple sources, both on-premises and in the cloud, in a centralized location. Powerful Analytics, utilize the custom query language to run advanced analytics on large amounts of fast streaming data in real time. Custom dashboards, create custom dashboards and visualizations to display real time data and trends. Integration, seamless integration with other Azure services and Microsoft solutions, such as Power BI and Azure Automation. And alerting, set up alerts based on specific criteria to proactively identify and respond to potential issues before they affect your users. Log Analytics Workspace is a unique environment for Azure Monitor log data. Each workspace has its own data repository and configuration, and data sources and solutions are configured to store their data in a particular workspace. So, that's an overview of Azure Log Analytics. The Log Analytics Agent is a lightweight agent that can be installed on Windows and Linux machines to collect and send log data to Azure Monitor. It provides a way to centralize logs from various sources and enables the analysis of the data using tools like Azure Monitor Logs, Azure Dashboards, and Azure Monitor Workbooks. The agent can collect logs from various sources, including Windows event logs, custom logs, performance counters, and syslog. It supports both agent-based and agentless data collection and can be configured to collect data from on-premises and cloud-based environments. The log analytics agent is set up to monitor certain Windows event logs like security, system, or application logs. The data from these logs is then gathered and sent to log analytics for analysis using queries and visualizations. The Log Analytics Agent is set up to monitor syslog servers or network devices. It collects data from these sources and sends it to Log Analytics, allowing for detailed analysis and troubleshooting. Both methods for collecting log data allow for centralized management and analysis of log data from multiple sources, which can help to improve visibility and streamline troubleshooting and issue resolution. You can expect to see a question related to Log Analytics Agents and choosing either Windows Event Logs for a Windows Agent or Syslog for Linux Agent on the exam.
the next topic we'll be covering are application insights. Application Insights is an application performance management service, and it's a subservice of Azure Monitor. APM is all about the monitoring and management of performance and availability of software apps. It strives to detect and diagnose complex application performance problems to maintain an expected level of service. So, why use Application Insights? Automatic detection of performance anomalies. Application Insights automatically identifies performance anomalies in your system. Powerful analytics tools. It comes with robust analytics tools to help you diagnose issues and understand what users do with your app. Continuous improvement. It is designed to help you continuously improve performance and usability of your applications. Platform agnostic. It works for apps on Net, Node.js, Java, and Python hosted on premises, hybrid, or any public cloud. DevOps integration. It can be integrated into your DevOps process. And mobile app monitoring, it can monitor and analyze telemetry from mobile apps by integrating with Visual Studio App Center. To use application insights, you need to instrument your application. This involves installing the instrument package or enabling application insights using the application insights agents where supported. There are many ways to view your telemetry data. Apps can be instrumented from anywhere. When you set up application insights monitoring for your web app, you create an application insights resource in Microsoft Azure. You open this resource in the Azure portal in order to see and analyze the telemetry collected from your app. The resource is identified by an instrumentation key. What does Application Insights monitor? Request rates, response times, and failure rates. Dependency rates, response times, and failure rates. Exceptions, page views and load performance. Ajax calls, user and session counts, performance counters, host diagnostics, diagnostic trace logs, and custom events and metrics. Where do I see my telemetry? Smart detection and manual alerts, application map, profiler, usage analysis, diagnostic search for instance data, metrics explorer for aggregated data, dashboards, live stream metrics, analytics, Visual Studio, etc. Overall, Application Insights is a comprehensive APM service that offers automatic detection of performance anomalies, powerful analytics tools, and is designed to help you continuously improve performance and usability. In this segment, we'll delve into the topic of Application Insights instrumentation. So, what is instrumentation? In simple terms, it's a way to make your application smarter. By adding a few lines of code or, in some cases, none at all, you can monitor how your app performs and where it might be running into issues. You instrument your application by adding the Azure Application Insights SDK and implementing traces. In the case of a Node.js application, you can install the Azure Application Insights SDK using npm with the following command. npm install application insights hyphen save. Application insights, this is the name of the package you are installing, which is Azure's SDK for application insights. Hyphen save, this flag saves the package as a dependency in your package.json file. Here, this piece of code lets you configure what you want to collect. Azure supports the following languages. .NET, Java, Python, Node.js, JavaScript. Auto instrumentation allows you to enable application monitoring with application insights without changing your code. This table shows which Azure services support application insights and in what programming languages. The services range from Azure App Service on Windows and Linux to Azure Functions, Azure Spring Cloud, Azure Kubernetes Service, and more. GA, general availability, meaning it's fully supported and ready to use. Public preview, still being tested, but you can use it. Not supported, you can't use application insights here. Through agent, you need to install a special piece of software to use this service. Oh, and BD, on by default, meaning the feature is automatically enabled. Through extension, available but needs an extension to work. We won't go through the entire table, but we'll give a few examples. For applications written in .NET and hosted on Azure App Service on Windows, application insights is generally available and enabled by default. For applications written in Python and hosted on Azure Functions, Application Insights is available and enabled by default. But for dependencies monitoring, you will need to use an extension. So that's an overview of Application Insights instrumentation. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and in this section, we'll be covering Microsoft Sentinel, formerly known as Azure Sentinel. Microsoft Sentinel is a scalable cloud-native solution that encompasses two key functionalities. 
security information event management. This is all about collecting and analyzing security-related data to provide real-time analysis of security alerts generated by applications and network hardware. Security orchestration automated response. This refers to the collection of tools that enable an organization to define, standardize, measure, and automate responses to security events. Microsoft Sentinel delivers intelligent security analytics and threat intelligence across the enterprise, providing a single solution for alert detection, threat visibility, proactive hunting, and threat response. With Microsoft Sentinel, you can collect data at cloud scale across all users, devices, applications, and infrastructure, both on premises and in multiple clouds. Detect previously undetected threats and minimize false positives using Microsoft's analytics and unparalleled threat intelligence. Investigate threats with artificial intelligence and hunt for suspicious activities at scale, tapping into years of cybersecurity work at Microsoft. Respond to incidents rapidly with built-in orchestration and automation of common tasks. Microsoft Sentinel comes with a number of connectors for Microsoft solutions, such as Microsoft 365 Defender, Office 365, Azure AD or Microsoft Enter ID, Microsoft Defender for Identity, and Microsoft Defender for Cloud Apps. You can use common event formats, Syslog, REST API, Windows Event Logs, Common Event Format, and Trusted Automated Exchange of Indicator Information. One notable feature of Microsoft Sentinel is the ability to create Azure Monitor workbooks. Workbooks provide a flexible canvas for data analysis and the creation of rich visual reports within the Azure portal. They allow you to tap into multiple data sources from across Azure and combine them into unified interactive experiences. It tells a story about the performance and availability about your applications and services. Workbooks are temporary workspaces to define a document-like format with visualization intertwined to help investigate and discuss performance. Microsoft Sentinel uses analytics to correlate alerts into incidents. Incidents are groups of related alerts that together create an actionable possible threat that you can investigate and resolve. Microsoft Sentinel's automation and orchestration solution provides a highly extensible architecture that enables scalable automation as new technologies and threats emerge. Built on the foundation of Azure Logic Apps, it includes 200 plus connectors for services. Microsoft Sentinel also offers deep investigation tools that help you to understand the scope and find the root cause of a potential security threat. You can choose an entity on the interactive graph to ask interesting questions for a specific entity and drill down into that entity and its connections to get to the root cause of the threat. Additionally, Microsoft Sentinel's powerful hunting search and query tools based on the MITRE framework enable you to proactively hunt for security threats across your organization's data sources before an alert is triggered. After you discover which hunting query provides high-value insights into possible attacks, you can also create custom detection rules based on your query and service those insights as alerts to your security incident responders. While hunting, you can create bookmarks for interesting events, enabling you to return to them later, share them with others, and group them with other correlating events to create a compelling incident for investigation. Lastly, let's talk about pricing. Microsoft Sentinel has two different pricing models. Capacity reservations, this involves being billed a fixed fee based on the selected tier, enabling a predictable total cost for Microsoft Sentinel. Pay as you go, with this option, bill per gigabyte for the volume of data ingested for analysis in Microsoft Sentinel and stored in the Azure Monitor Log Analytics workspace. And there you have it, a comprehensive look at Microsoft Sentinel, a robust seam and source solution that can help protect your organization's infrastructure, applications, and data. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and in this section, we'll be covering the identity management best practices. We'll start things off by discussing the principle of least privilege, a term you may have come across before. So the principle of least privilege is a security principle that states that users, applications, and services should be granted only the minimum access necessary to perform their assigned tasks and no more. In Microsoft Azure, the principle of least privilege is a critical aspect of security that helps prevent unauthorized access, data breaches, and other security incidents. The principle of least privilege in Azure involves limiting access to Azure resources such as virtual machines, storage accounts, and databases, as well as Azure services such as Azure Active Directory and Azure Key Vault. Azure role-based access control permits administrators to grant roles to users, groups, and apps based on their access levels. 
Following the principle of least privilege helps minimize unauthorized access risks and potential harm from compromised credentials, thus reducing the Azure environment's attack surface. Following the principle of least privilege can help organizations comply with regulatory requirements and best practices for security. To implement the principle of least privilege in Azure, administrators should follow these best practices. Assign roles based on the least amount of privilege needed to perform the task. Monitor role assignments and permissions regularly to ensure they align with business requirements. Limit the use of shared accounts and use individual user accounts where possible. Implement multi-factor authentication to prevent unauthorized access to user accounts. Use Azure policy to enforce compliance with organizational policies and industry regulations. Implement network security groups and firewalls to control traffic to and from Azure resources. And regularly review access control policies and adjust as necessary to ensure that they remain effective. So that's an overview of the principle of least privilege. The next topic will cover our Privileged Identity Management, or PIM for short, within Azure AD. Now, why should you care about PIM? Because it's like a VIP lounge for your most sensitive resources, controlling who gets in, when, and what they can do once they're inside. So, Privileged Identity Management is an Azure AD service enabling you to manage, control, and monitor access to important resources in your organization. You can manage resources from Azure AD, Azure, Microsoft 365, Microsoft Intune, and more. So what are the key features of PIM? Just in time access, this feature allows you to grant privileged access to Azure AD and Azure resources only when needed. Assign time bound access to resources using start and end dates. Required approval to activate privileged roles. Enforce multi-factor authentication to activate any role. Use justification to understand why users activate. Get notifications when privileged roles are activated. Conduct access reviews to ensure users still need roles. And download audit history for internal or external audit. It's important to note that PIM is part of Azure AD Premium 2, so you'll need that subscription to access these features. By taking advantage of PIM and its features, you can ensure a more secure and controlled environment for your organization. Next, we'll be diving into another critical topic, Azure AD Identity Protection. So what does it do? Identity protection is a feature of Azure AD that enables you to detect, investigate, remediate, and export identity-based risks for future analysis. Microsoft analyzes a staggering 6.5 trillion signals per day to identify and protect customers from threats. Identity protection can notice risky users, risky sign-ins, and risk detections. Let's take a closer look at the types of risks that identity protection can identify. Anonymous IP address, this is a sign in from an anonymous IP address, like those used by the Tor browser or anonymizer VPNs. Atypical travel, this refers to a sign in from a location that is atypical based on the user's recent sign ins. Malware linked IP address, a sign in from an IP address linked to malware. Unfamiliar sign in properties, a sign in with properties that haven't been seen recently for the given user. Leak credentials indicates that the user's valid credentials have been leaked. Password spray. This involves multiple usernames being attacked using common passwords in a unified, brute force manner. Azure AD Threat Intelligence. This is when Microsoft's internal and external threat intelligence sources have identified a known attack pattern. And there are others detected by Microsoft Defender for Cloud Apps, such as new country activity, activity from anonymous IP addresses, and suspicious inbox forwarding. The risk signals can trigger remediation efforts, such as requiring users to use Azure AD multi-factor authentication, reset their password using self-service password reset, or even blocking until an administrator takes action. Identity protection categorizes risk into three tiers, low, medium, and high. And administrators can use key reports for investigations, such as risky users, risky sign-ins, and risk detections reports. In the Risky Users Report, you'll find comprehensive details about detected risks, a complete history of all risky sign-ins, as well as the user's overall risk history to give you a full picture of security concerns. In the Risky Sign-ins Report, you'll see sign-ins categorized as at risk, confirmed compromised, confirmed safe, dismissed, or remediate. This report provides both real-time and aggregate risk levels associated with each sign-in attempt. It also includes the types of risk detections triggered, the conditional access policies applied, multi-factor authentication details, and information about the device, application, and location involved in the sign-in. 
Risk Detections offers filterable data covering up to the past 90 days. It provides detailed information about each type of risk detected, as well as other risks that were triggered simultaneously and the locations of the sign-in attempts. Admin follow-up actions. Admins can take various actions like resetting the user password, confirming a user compromise, dismissing user risk, blocking user sign-ins, and investigate further using Azure App. So with Azure AD Identity Protection, you're not just identifying risks, but you're also given powerful tools to act on them. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. In this segment, we'll delve deep into Azure Key Vault, a pivotal tool to ensure the security of your cloud applications and services. Azure Key Vault helps you safeguard cryptographic keys and other secrets used by cloud apps and services. Azure Key Vault focuses on three things. Certificate management. This feature allows for easy provision, management, and deployment of both public and private SSL certificates. These certificates can be used with Azure and internally connected resources. Key management. This enables the creation and control of encryption keys used to encrypt your data. Secrets management. Here, you have a secure space to store and tightly control access to tokens, passwords, certificates, API keys, and other secrets. Note that certificates contain a key pair, which is a combination of a key and a secret. This should not be confused with key management and secrets management, which are distinct functionalities. Moving forward, let's talk about HSMs, or hardware security modules. These are dedicated hardware devices specifically designed to securely store encryption keys. When it comes to adhering to standards, we reference the Federal Information Processing Standard, or FIPS. This is a guideline recognized by the U.S. and Canadian governments that specifies the security requirements for cryptographic modules that protect sensitive information. In line with FIPS, we have two levels of compliance for HSMs. FIPS 104-2 Level 2 Compliant. This compliance level is for multi-tenant HSMs where multiple customers are virtually isolated on a single HSM. FIPS 104-2 Level 3 Compliant. This level, on the other hand, pertains to single-tenant HSMs where one customer utilizes a dedicated HSM. In essence, Azure Key Vault is an indispensable tool for ensuring that your cloud data remains both accessible and secure. Whether you're working with certificates, encryption keys, or various secrets, Azure Key Vault has you covered. All right, let's dive into the core of Azure Key Vault, the vault itself. A vault is where your secrets and keys reside, safeguarded either by software or by HSMs validated to the standards of FIPS 104-2 Level 2. Azure Key Vaults provides two types of containers. Vaults, these containers support both software and HSM-backed keys. HSM Pools, these are specialized containers solely for HSM-backed keys. To activate your HSM, you will need to provide a minimum of three RSA key pairs up to a maximum of 10, and specify the minimum number of keys required to decrypt the security domain called a quorum. You do not choose the container on creation, you just choose between standard and premium. When you choose premium and create enough RSA key pairs, you will begin to use HSM pools. Diving a bit into technicalities, Azure Key Vault REST API is used for programmatically managing Azure Key Vault resources, allowing you to perform operations such as create a key or secret, import a key or secret, revoke a key or secret, delete a key or secret, authorize user or apps to access its keys or secrets, and monitor and manage key usage. Azure Key Vault REST API supports three different types of authentication, managed identities, and identity managed by Azure AD recommended as best practice, service principle and certificate. This method uses a certificate for authentication, service principle and secret, a combination of a user identity and a secret key, one feature to note is the soft delete functionality. Soft delete allows you to recover or permanently delete a key vault and secrets for the duration of the retention period. This feature is enabled by default on creation. Mandatory retention period prevents the permanent deletion of key vaults or secrets prior to the retention period elapsing. Furthermore, enabling purge protection safeguards your secrets from being prematurely purged, either by users or by Microsoft, bolstering the security of your vault. Next up on our agenda is breaking down the pricing of Azure Key Vault. Knowing how your bill for this service can help you make informed decisions and optimize your costs. Azure Key Vault offers two pricing tiers, standard and premium. The notable distinction between the two is that while both tiers support software protected keys, only the premium tier allows for HSM protected keys. Here's a closer look at the pricing tiers. 
First 250 keys, regardless of whether you're on the standard or premium tier, you'll be billed $5 per key every month. Two five one one five zero zero keys, the price drops to $2.50 per key monthly, again consistent across both tiers. 1501 to 4000 keys, the cost further reduces to 90 cents for each key every month. 4001 plus keys, for larger key volumes beyond this point, you'll be charged at a rate of 40 cents per key per month. Secrets operations, both tiers are priced at 3 cents for every 10,000 transactions involving secrets. Certificate operations, exclusive to the premium tier, each certificate renewal request is billed at $3. Managed Azure Storage Account Key Rotation, this service, only available in the premium tier, is priced at $1 per renewal. HSM Protected Keys, specifically for HSM Protected Keys, the pricing is further broken down based on the key types. For RSA 2048-bit keys, the cost is $1 per key per month, along with an additional charge of $0.03 per 10,000 transactions. For RSA 3072-bit and 4096-bit keys, as well as ECC keys, the first 250 keys are priced at $5 per key per month. So that's an overview of the pricing model for Azure Key Vault. The next topic we'll be covering is double encryption for Azure Key Vault. Before we dive in, let's quickly recap infrastructure encryption for storage accounts. By default, Azure ensures that your storage account data is encrypted when it's at rest. Infrastructure encryption adds a second layer of encryption to your storage account's data. Now, let's jump into Azure Disk's double encryption. Double encryption is precisely what it sounds like. It's where two or more independent layers of encryption are enabled to protect against compromises of any one layer of encryption. This strategy ensures that even if one encryption layer is compromised, the data remains protected by the other. Microsoft has a two-layered approach, both for data at rest and data in transit. For data at rest, disk encryption, this is achieved using customer-managed keys. And infrastructure encryption, this uses platform-managed keys, strengthening the base layer. And for data in transit, transit encryption using transport layer security 1.2 to safeguard data as it travels through networks and an additional layer of encryption provided at the infrastructure layer. So that's a quick overview of double encryption for Azure Key Vault. In this section, we'll go into detail on the keys in Azure Key Vault. When it comes to creating a key in Azure, you have three primary choices. Generate, Azure will generate the key for you. Import, import an existing RSA key that you already possess. And restore backup, restore a key from backup. For keys generated by Azure, you can use either RSA or EC. RSA or Rivest, Shamir, or Adelman, this supports key sizes of 2048, 3072, and 4096 bits. EC or Elliptic Curve Cryptography, here you can select from P256, P384, P521, or P256K. For keys generated by Azure, you can set an activation and expiration date. Additionally, you're not bound to a static version of a key. You can create new versions of keys. You can also download backups of keys, but remember that backups can only be restored within the same Azure subscription and within Azure Key Vault. When you have a premium vault, you'll key options for HSM. You can generate either an RSA or EC specifically for HSM, or import an RSA key for HSM as shown in the example. Now let's talk about key management types. Microsoft Managed Key are keys managed by Microsoft. They do not appear in your vault, and in most cases are used by default for many Azure services. Customer Managed Key are keys you create in Azure Key Vault. You need to select a key from a vault for various services. Sometimes Customer Managed means that the customer has imported cryptographic material, and any generated or imported keys are considered CMK in Azure. In order to use a key, an Azure service needs an identity established with an Azure ID for permission to access the key from the vault. Additionally, you have the option to implement infrastructure encryption. While Azure already encrypts storage account data at rest by default, opting for infrastructure encryption adds a second layer of security, fortifying your storage account's data even further. The next topic we'll be covering are secrets in Azure Key Vault. Azure Key Vault secrets provides secure storage of generic secrets, such as passwords and database connection strings. Key Vault APIs accept and return secret values as strings. Internally, Key Vault stores and manages secrets as sequences of octets, with each secret having a maximum size of 25k bytes. The Key Vault service doesn't provide semantics for secrets. It accepts the data, encrypts it, stores it, and returns a secret identifier. 
For highly sensitive data, clients should consider additional layers of protection for data. For example, encrypting your data using a separate protection key before storing it in the Key Vault. Key Vault also supports a content type field for secrets, allowing clients to specify the content type of a secret to assist in interpreting the secret data when it's retrieved. Note that the maximum length of this field is 255 characters. Every secret stored in your Key Vault is encrypted. Key Vault encrypts secrets at rest with a hierarchy of encryption keys. All keys in that hierarchy are protected by modules that are FIPS 104-2 compliant. The encryption leaf key is unique to each Key Vault, while the root key is unique to the entire security world. The protection level may vary between regions. For example, Chida uses FIPS 104-2 level 1, and all other regions use level 2 or higher. Diving into secret attributes, we have Exp. This is the expiration time, after which the secret data should not be retrieved. NBF, not before, default value is now. This defines the time before which the secret data should not be retrieved. Enable, this tells us whether the secret data can be retrieved or not, with its default set to true. Additionally, there are read-only attributes for created and update. In order to access secrets within your application code, you can would use the Azure SDK for example. We have a .NET example in this image here. Another option is to use tools like Azure CLI. So that about covers the important details of secrets in Azure Key Vault. The next topic we'll be covering are X509 certificates. First, let's unravel what public key infrastructure is. PKI is a set of roles, policies, hardware, software, and procedures needed to create, manage, distribute, use, store, and revoke digital certificates and manage public key encryption. So what exactly is an X509 certificate? It is a standard defined by the International Telecommunication Union for Public Key Certifications. X509 certificates are used in many internet protocols, including SSL, TLS, and HTTPS signed and encrypted email, and code signing and document signing. A certificate contains an identity, which could be a host name, an organization, or an individual, along with a public key built on platforms like RSA, DSA, or ECDA. But who issues these certificates? Here comes the role of the Certificate Authority, a trusted entity that issues digital certificates. A CA acts as a trusted third part, trusted both by the subject of the certificate and by the party relying upon the certificate. A Certificate Authority can issue multiple certificates in the form of tree structure, known as a chain of trust. Root Certificate Authority, this is a self-signed certificate. The private key associated with it signs other certificates. It's important that the private key of root are protected. Intermediate Certificate Authority, these certificates are signed by the root's private key. They protect the root certificate because the root certificate does not have to sign every issued certificate. And Entity Certificate, a certificate issued by the ICA used by the end entity. The entity in the case is an SSL certificate for a website. A certificate contains a metadata about version number, the version of the X509 standard. Serial number, a unique serial number assigned to the certificate by the Certificate Authority. Signature Algorithm ID, the algorithm used to sign the certificate, such as RSA or DSA. Issuer, the name of the certificate authority that issued this certificate. Validity period, the start and end dates during which the certificate is valid. Subject, the identifier for the individual or organization to whom the certificate was issued. Subject public key, the public key that is authenticated by this certificate. This field also names the algorithm used for public key generation. Issuer Unique Identifier allows multiple CAS to operate as a single logical CAG. Subject Unique Identifier allows multiple certificate holders to act as a single logical entity. Extensions allows a CAG to associate additional private information with a certificate. All the metadata is publicly readable, anyone can view it. So that's an overview of X509 certificates. <laughs> Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and in this fall along, we're going to be learning all about Azure Vault. So let's get to it. So what I want you to do is go in the top here and type in Key Vault, and here we'll have to go ahead and create ourselves a new vault. And so from there, we're gonna create a new resource group. I'm gonna call this resource group My Example Vault, and then we will make a vault key here. So I'll just say My Vault Example, which is kind of funny because this one's slightly different. So you've seen I've done this before. So I'm gonna do my example vault as the name here. And for the region, US East is fine. For pricing, we'll keep it at standard. Soft delete is enabled. 
Um, and then there's the option for purge protection. So we are going to enable purge protection. And uh, this is going to play into other follow alongs. We'll explain that as it goes, but purge protection does not allow you to uh, purge things uh, easily once it's enabled. So what we'll do is go ahead and review and create. And we'll go ahead and go review create. And we'll give it a moment here. And we'll just wait till it's done deploying, okay? All right, so after a short little wait, our vault is created. And so what I want you to do is go to the resource and we're gonna be using this vault uh, a little bit in some of the follow alongs and in some cases, not so much, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown. In this follow along, we're gonna be doing some things with uh, keys with an Azure Key Vault. So what I want you to do is make your way over to the keys blade on the left-hand side here. We're gonna generate or slash import a new key. We're going to choose the generate option. In terms of naming, we're gonna call this my disk key. And we are gonna choose RSA 2048. That seems totally fine to me. Everything else seems okay. So we'll go ahead and create that key. So we'll give it a moment to create, doesn't take too long. And then what we're going to do is go on the left hand side to IAM access controls. And what we're, want, we're going to want to do is add a new role assignment so we can go ahead and start using this uh, key. So what I want you to do is go and look for key vault administrator, which is here, and we'll go ahead and hit next. And then for our uh, user, we will choose ourselves. So under user, I'm gonna select the members. I'm looking for the account I'm using. There I am, Andrew Brown. Go ahead and select that there. And so that is all we need to assign it so that we can actually uh, work with that key. So I think a good idea is to use a key uh, to encrypt a disk. So what we'll do is make our way over to disk encryption sets because before you can encrypt a disk, you need to have an encryption set. So we'll go ahead and create ourselves a new encryption set. We'll call, we'll use the, uh, sorry, the same um, a resource group. So it's very easy cleanup afterwards. We'll call this my disk encrypt set here. And in terms of the encryption type, we're gonna use double encryption because that's a much better. You have two keys that encrypt it, so that's a lot better. We are going to choose our vault. So we have my example vault. There's only one option here. And in terms of the key, we'll select my disk key. In terms of the version, uh, we'll select the current version. We'll go ahead and hit review create. And then we will go and create that. And we'll give it a moment to create that encryption set. Shouldn't take too long here. And after a short little wait, uh, our resource should be deployed. It only took about a minute for me. And if we go here, it's gonna have this message up here. It's very small, but it says to associate a disk image snapshot, this disk encryption set, you must grant permissions to Key Vault. So all we have to do is click that uh, alert and we'll grant permissions. And so now we are able uh, to use that key um, or like to, to uh, we're gonna have the permissions issues is solved. So what we'll do is go to type and create a new disk. And so we can apply this key to that encryption. So we'll go ahead and create. We're gonna choose the same resource group here. I'm gonna call this my example vault and, um, or sorry, my example uh, disk, because that's a little bit more clear than uh, that. And for the availability zone, doesn't matter. For the source type, um, it doesn't matter as well. In terms of the size, we want this to be cheap. We're not really using this for real, so we'll use standard HDD. I will say okay. In terms of encryption, this is where things get fun. We go to double encryption, we choose our key here. We'll go ahead, review and create. And we'll just give it a moment for that to, oh, we'll hit create, and we'll have to wait a little while here for that create that resource. So we'll just wait until that is created, okay? And after a very short while, the disk is ready. So we'll go to that resource. We'll go to the encryption tab to see that uh, encryption is applied. So that's all it takes to use a key to encrypt a disk. So we are gonna still use uh, some of these accounts. There's no cleanup yet. I'll go back here and I'll see you in the next one.
Hey, this is Andrew Brown, and in this follow along, we're going to learn about backup and restore keys. So what I want you to do is go back into the uh, resource group that we just recently created, and we're going to make our way over to keys. So I'm just, or sorry, we got to get into the vault first. Then we'll go over to keys, and the idea is that we have this key here. And so um, you can see that we have this current version, so you can add additional versions. But what's going to happen if we try to back this up? So when you back this up, you're going to get this file here. And if you open up this file, it's gonna look like a bunch of gobbledygook. So I'm just gonna to try to open it here. Um, I have it up off screen here. So I'm just trying to open it up within uh, Visual Studio Code. So I'm just gonna open up Visual Studio Code. Again, doing this off screen here. Just give me a moment. All right, and so this is the file um, that we encrypted. Uh, and you take a look here and it's it doesn't look like anything, but the idea is that it is our backup of our key so that we can re-import that. And just taking a look at the key name, this is what it looks like. So this is my example vault, my disk key. Then there's this um, uh, date and that's key backup. So just recognize that's the format and the date is very useful to indicate when you backed it up. So let's go ahead and delete this key because the idea is we want to uh, restore that backup. And so we have deleted that key there. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to attempt a restore. So I'm gonna go ahead and go occurred while restoring the key. The key you're trying uh, to restore already exists. Why would it throw that error? We've clearly deleted it. And the reason why is that we have purge protection on. We did that in the um, first uh, first part when we set up this actual vault here. I'm gonna just see if we can find the settings wherever that purge protection is. I'm trying to remember where it is. Purge protection is enabled, so we can go here. And once you enable it, you cannot turn it off. It's going to retain it for a certain amount of days. Um, and so all you can do is soft delete keys. So this key is not actually deleted yet. If you go to manage deleted keys, you can see the key is over here. And if you try to click on purge, it is disabled because we cannot remove the key because we have purge protection on, but we can recover the key. So we'll go ahead and recover. Uh, and so that will allow us to recover the key. And if we refresh here, it's gonna take a little bit of time for that key to restore. So we'll just have to uh, wait a little bit and then it will show up. There's one other thing I wanted to show you was under policies because you know, um, if you go under, where's policies here? Um, or access policies. If you look under our user here and we look at the key permissions, um, there is an option to purge and we don't actually have that uh, turned on right now. But if we were to save this, and we were to still go to that purge option, it would still say the same thing. So even if you have purge permissions, it does not matter if purge protection is turned on, it still will not let you purge, but you would need a combination of those in order to uh, you know, uh, be able to do things there. So to really show you how to do that recovery, I think what we should do, and I'm just gonna delete our old key here because we don't care about it, but we are going to, well, I guess we could try to import it into the other one. So I'm just gonna undo that for a second but we are going to go ahead and create ourselves another vault. So I'm going to go and type in vault at the top here. Now we're gonna be a little bit more careful when we create this vault. So we'll go here and we will choose um, my example vault. I'm gonna say my vault no protect. And the pricing tier will be standard. One day we're gonna leave it, oh well seven, is the lowest and we'll say disable purge protection because we don't want to have that enabled. And we'll see if we can import the key into another vault. I'm not sure if we can do that. Worst case, we'll make a new key, download the key, re-upload it. But I'm just curious what would happen if we tried to upload the same key as it's still in another vault. I'm not exactly sure. All right, so this deployment is successful. I'm gonna to go to this resource. I'm gonna go ahead to go to create and we're going to restore from backup and we're gonna take this key and see if we can actually import it here. So it looks like we can take a key and it can exist in multiple vaults. I'm gonna go ahead and delete this key. And we're gonna say, are you sure you want to delete this key? I'm gonna say yes. And if we go to manage keys, and we refresh, it takes a little bit of time here. So we'll just wait a moment for this to uh, persist. And after a short little wait, like about two minutes, I refresh and the key is here. So if I go here, you'll notice the purges uh, option is still not available. We can obviously recover. 
um, but we don't have purge um, protection on. So if we go to access policies over here and we'll go ahead and scroll down and select purge and save our changes, we can then go back to keys. We'll give it a moment to save. We go back to keys, we'll refresh it, we'll manage our keys and we'll go ahead and purge it and that will permanently purge it there. So that's all it takes uh, to do that. So there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and in this section, we'll be going over the integration with on-premises solutions with Azure, starting with Azure AD Connect. Azure AD Connect is a tool provided by Microsoft that enables organizations to synchronize on-premises Active Directory with Azure Active Directory. This synchronization enables organizations to extend their on-premises identities and security policies to the cloud and enable seamless access to cloud-based applications. Azure AD Connect allows for seamless single sign-on from your on-premises workstation to Microsoft Azure. Azure AD Connect has the following features. Password hash synchronization. This feature syncs user password hashes from on-premises Active Directory to Azure AD, enabling the same sign-in method for both. Pass-through authentication. This allows users to maintain the same password across on-premises and cloud platforms without needing a separate federated environment setup. Federation integration, an optional feature, it facilitates a hybrid setup using on-premises a DFS infrastructure and provides management tools like certificate renewal and server deployment. Synchronization, this is responsible for creating and aligning users, groups, and other objects between on-premises and cloud, ensuring identity information matches across both. Health monitoring, Azure AD Connect Health offers robust activity monitoring with a dedicated Azure portal section to review this data. Here are the steps for installing, configuring, and synchronizing on-premises Active Directory with Azure AD using Azure AD Connect. Why install Azure AD Connect? Install Azure AD Connect on a server connected to both on-premises AD and Azure AD. Two, configure Azure AD Connect. Use the wizard to set up synchronization settings, source, target directories, and sync frequency. Three, synchronize directories. Azure AD Connect syncs on-premises AD with Azure AD, replicating changes from source to target. For monitor and manage, continuously monitor and manage the synchronization process to ensure accuracy and meet business needs. Overall, Azure AD Connect is your bridge between the on-premises world and Azure. It ensures a synchronized, coherent, and seamless experience. The next topic we'll be covering is Azure AD Application Proxy. Azure AD Application Proxy is a service provided by Microsoft Azure that allows organizations to provide remote access to their on-premises web applications. It allows users to access the applications securely from anywhere using any device without the need for complex network configuration or exposing the applications directly to the internet. Organizations can publish their on-premises applications to the cloud, providing secure remote access for their users. The service allows organizations to use their existing on-premises infrastructure and application architecture while leveraging the benefits of the cloud. It provides advanced security features such as multi-factor authentication and conditional access policies, ensuring that only authorized users can access the applications. The Azure AD Application Proxy service consists of two main components. What an Azure AD Application Proxy Connector, a lightweight agent that is installed on a server within the organization's on-premises environment. The connector establishes a secure outbound connection to the Azure AD Application Proxy service, which enables communication between the on-premises application and the Azure AD service. Two, Azure AD Application Proxy Service, a cloud-based service that manages the authentication and authorization of users who access the on-premises web applications through the Application Proxy Connector. It also routes traffic to the appropriate backend servers and enforces policies set by the organization. Next, let's look at the Azure AD Application Proxy architecture. Here's an image of the process, and we'll go through each step. Wide in user access, the user accesses the application and gets redirected to Azure AD for sign in. Any set conditional access policies are checked. Two, token issuance. After successful sign in, Azure AD sends a token to the user's device. Three, token interpretation. The client sends this token to application proxy, which extracts the user principal name and security principal name. Four, request forwarding. Application proxy forwards the request to the connector installed on premises. 5. Additional authentication. Optionally, the connector may perform additional authentication and then sends the request to the on-premises application. 6. Server response. The application's response is sent back through the connector to the application proxy service. 
7. Response delivery. Finally, the application proxy service delivers the response to the user's device. Next, we'll go over some of the use cases for Azure AD application proxy. Remote access. Azure AD application proxy is commonly used to provide secure remote access to on-premise applications. Employees working from home or other remote locations can securely access their internal applications just as if they were in the office. Single sign-on. Application proxy can integrate with Azure AD to provide single sign-on capabilities. This allows users to authenticate once and then access multiple applications without needing to sign in again. Conditional access. With application proxy, you can leverage Azure AD's conditional access policies for your on-premise applications. This provides granular control over access based on user, location, device status, and other factors. Legacy application modernization. Application proxy can help organizations expose legacy on-premise applications to the internet in a secure manner without changing the application code. This can be a key part of a strategy to modernize legacy applications. Scalability and performance. Azure AD application proxy scales automatically to meet your organization's usage patterns and provides a global reach without needing to open additional firewall ports. This can help improve the performance and availability of your applications. In conclusion, Azure AD application proxy is like a security guard and a bridge, ensuring that your on-premises applications are both accessible and protected. Be sure to know this, as it'll definitely appear on the exam. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and in this section, we'll be going over storage accounts in Azure. Azure Storage offers several types of storage accounts, each with different features and their own pricing models. These storage account types include Standard General Purpose V1, which is now considered legacy, Standard General Purpose V2, Blob Storage, Block Blob Storage, and File Storage. Storage accounts vary with the following features. Supported services. Essentially, this answers the question, what can I put in this storage account? Your options include blob, file, queue, table, disk, and data lake gen 2. Performance tiers. This focuses on the speed of your read and write operations. Azure offers two tiers, standard and premium. Access tiers. How often do I need quick access to files? The tiers are hot, cool, archive. Replication, how many redundant copies should be made and where? Azure provides various replication options, including LRS, GRS, RAWGRS, ZRS, GZRS, RAWGZRS. Deployment model, Azure has two models, Resource Manager and Classic. The table details different types of Azure storage accounts, their capabilities, performance tiers, access tiers, replication methods, and deployment models. Type, this column describes the different types of storage accounts. General Purpose V2, this is the latest version of Azure Storage Accounts and supports various services like Blob, File, Queue, Table, Disk, and Data Lake Gen 2. General Purpose V1, this is the older version and supports Blob, File, Queue, Table, and Disk. Block Blob Storage, designed for storing block blobs and append blobs. File Storage, specifically tailored for Azure File Shares. Blob Storage, meant for storing block and append blobs. Service, these are the storage services each account type can provide. Performance tiers, Azure offers two performance tiers. Standard, backed by hard disk drives and suitable for general purpose storage. Premium, uses solid state drives and is optimized for high performance and low latency workloads. Access tiers, these define the data access frequency. Hot, for frequently accessed data. Tool, optimized for storing infrequently accessed data for a minimum of 30 days. Archive, for rarely accessed data with a minimum of 180 days storage duration. Replication, Azure provides multiple replication options for ensuring data durability and availability. LRS, locally redundant storage, stores multiple copies of your data in a single data center. GRS, geo-redundant storage, replicates your data to a secondary region. Raw GRS, read access geo-redundant storage, offers read-only access to the data in the secondary location, in addition to geo-replication. ZRS, zone-redundant storage, spreads data across multiple availability zones. GZRS, GeoZone Redundant Storage, combines both ZRS and GRS by spreading data across availability zones and replicating to a secondary region. Raw GZRS, like GZRS but with read access to the secondary region. Deployment Models. Resource Manager, this is Azure's modern deployment model. It allows you to group related resources together for easier management. Classic, the older deployment model that existed before the introduction of the Azure Resource Manager. Lastly, let's explore the five core services Azure provides in the storage domain. 
Azure Blob, a massively scalable object store for text and binary data, also includes support for big data analytics through Data Lake Storage Gen 2, Azure Files, managed file shares for cloud or on-premises deployments, Azure Queues, a messaging store for reliable messaging between application components, Azure Tables, a NOSQL store for schema-less storage of structured data, Azure Disks, block-level storage volumes for Azure VNs. So that's an introduction to storage accounts in Azure. The next topic we'll be exploring is Azure Blob Storage in more detail. Blob Storage is an object store that is optimized for storing massive amounts of unstructured data. Unstructured data is data that doesn't adhere to a particular data model or definition, such as text or binary data. Azure Blobs are composed of the following core components. Storage account. This is essentially your unique space or namespace in Azure, and it looks something like this. HTTP colon double slash storage account dot blob dot core dot windows dot net. Container. This component functions similarly to a folder in a file system. Blobs. Here is where the actual data is stored. Azure Storage supports three types of blobs. Why do block blobs? These are ideal for storing text and binary data. It's made up of blocks of data that can be managed individually, and they can store up to about 4.75 TIB of data. 2. Append blobs, specially optimized for append operations. These are ideal for scenarios such as logging data from virtual machine. 3. Page blobs, capable of storing random access files up to 8 terabytes in size, and they are suited for store virtual hard drive files and serve as disks for Azure virtual machines. When it comes to transferring data into Azure Blob Storage, there are multiple methods at your disposal, including as copy, an easy-to-use command-line tool for Windows and Linux, Azure Storage Data Movement Library, a .NET library that uses as copy in the background, Azure Data Factory, an ETL service by Azure, BlobFuse, this virtual file system driver allows for direct data access through the Linux file system, Azure Data Box, a robust physical device designed to transport data to Azure securely, Azure Import, Export Service, a service where you ship your physical disks for data transfer onto Azure. So that's an overview of Azure Blob Storage. The next topic we'll be covering are the performance tiers in Blob Storage in a bit more detail. There are two types of performance tiers for storage accounts, standard and premium. Before we delve into the details, it's essential to understand the term IOPS. IOPS stands for Input, Output Operations Per Second. The higher the IOPS, the faster a drive can read and write. Premium Performance Tier. In this tier, data is stored on solid-state drives. These drives are optimized for low-latency operations, ensuring higher throughput and speed data access. Some of the ideal use cases include interactive workloads, analytics, AI or machine learning processes, and data transformation tasks. An SSD has no moving parts and data is distributed randomly. This is why it can read and write so fast. On the other hand, standard performance. The standard tier stores data on hard disk drives. These drives offer very performance based on the access tier, such as hot, cool, or archive. The standard tier shines in the following use cases, backup and disaster recovery operations, storing media content, and bulk data processing. An HDD has moving parts, an arm that needs to read and write data sequential to a disk. It is very good at writing or reading large amounts of data that is close together. Overall, your choice between premium and standard largely depends on your specific requirements, whether you prioritize lightning fast data access or more budget-friendly, voluminous data storage. Moving on to the next topic, we'll be covering access tiers for blob storage in more detail. So there are three types of access tiers for standard storage, cool, hot, and archive. Hot tier, ideal for data that's accessed frequently. It has the highest storage cost, but you get the lowest access cost. Use cases, data that's in active use or expected to be accessed frequently, and data that's staged for processing and eventual migration to the cool access tier. Cool tier, best for data that's infrequently accessed and stored for at least 30 days. It has lower storage cost, but higher access cost. Use case, great for short-term backup and disaster recovery datasets. Older media content not viewed frequently anymore but is expected to be available immediately when accessed. And large data sets that need to be stored cost-effectively while more data is being gathered for future processing. Archive tier, best for data that's rarely accessed and stored for at least 180 days. It has the lowest storage cost, but the highest access cost. 
use case best suited for long-term backup, secondary backup, and archival data sets, original data that must be preserved even after it has been processed into final usable form, and compliance and archival data that needs to be stored for a long time and is hardly ever accessed. Before we move on, let's touch upon some essential technical aspects. Account level tiering, any blob that doesn't have an explicitly assigned tier infers the tier from the storage account access tier setting, Blob level tiering, you can upload a blob to the tier of your choice. Changing tiers happens instantly with the exception from moving out of archive. Rehydrating a blob, when moving a blob out of archive into another tier it can take several hours. This is known as rehydrating. Blob lifecycle management, here you can create rule-based policies to transition data to different tiers, such as after 30 days, move to cool storage. When a blob is uploaded or moved to another tier, it's charged at the new tier's rate immediately upon tier change. When moving from a cooler tier, the operation is billed as a write operation to the destination tier, where the write operation and data write charges of the destination tier apply. When moving from a hotter tier, the operation is billed as a read from the source tier, where the read operation and data retrieval charges of the source tier apply. Early deletion charges for any blob moved out of the cool or archive tier may apply as well. Cool and archive early deletion, any blob that is moved into the cool tier is subject to a cool early deletion period of 30 days. Any blob that is moved into the archive tier is subject to an archive early deletion period of 180 days. This charge is prorated. So that's a more in-depth look into the access tiers for blob storage. The next topic we'll be covering is the replication and data redundancy for storage accounts. So, when you create a storage account, you need to choose a replication type. Replication stores multiple copies of your data so that it is protected from planned events, transient hardware failures, network or power outages, or even massive natural disasters. Primary region redundancy, these include locally redundant storage and zone redundant storage. Secondary region redundancy, this includes geo-redundant storage and geo-zone redundant storage. Secondary region redundancy with read access, read access geo redundant storage, and read access geo zone redundant storage. As you can expect, the greater level of redundancy, the more expensive the cost of replication. For redundancy in the primary region, data is replicated three times in the primary region. There are two options for storing in the primary region. Locally redundant storage copies data synchronously in primary region, 99.9999999999%. That's 11 nines durability. This is the cheapest option. Zone redundant storage copies data synchronously across three AZs in primary region, 99.9%, 12 nines durability. For redundancy in the secondary region, data is replicated to a secondary region in case of primary regional disaster. The secondary region is determined based on your primary's pair region. Secondary region isn't available for read or write access. Geo-redundant storage copies data synchronously in primary region, copies data asynchronously to another region, 99.9%, that's 16 nines of durability. Geo-zone redundant storage, similar to GRS, but adds synchronous replication across three availability zones in the primary region before asynchronously replicating to another region, maintaining the same 99.9%, that 1699's durability level. Redundancy in the secondary region with read access, data is replicated synchronously to primary region. Your data will be in sync with your primary and you'll have read access. Read access geo-redundant storage ensures synchronous data replication within the primary region and to another region, offering a high durability of 99.9% with 16 nines. Read access geo-zone redundant storage. This goes a step further by replicating data synchronously across three availability zones in the primary region before synchronously replicating to another region, maintaining the same high durability level. So, choosing the right replication strategy depends on your business needs, weighing costs against data durability and accessibility, and that about covers main points for the replication and data redundancy for storage accounts. The next topic we'll be exploring is a Zcopy. So, what is a Zcopy? A Zcopy is a versatile command line tool designed specifically for copying blobs or files to or from Azure storage accounts. It's a go-to utility for many when they think of data transfer with Azure. Why download? First things first, to get started with a Zcopy, you'll need to download the executable file compatible with your operating system, be it Windows, Linux, or Mac OS. Two, before you begin transferring data, ensure you have the necessary level of authorization. You will need to have the level of authorization via attached roles. For downloading, you'll require the storage blob data reader role. 
for uploading the roles necessary or storage blob data contributor and storage blob data owner. Three, you gain access either via a zcopy login. Options for authentication include using Azure Active Directory or a shared access signature known commonly as SAS. This prompts you to sign in. You'll then be guided to use a web browser, open a specific page, and enter a given code to authenticate. For copying data to move data, use the straightforward copy command, az copy copy. Whether you're uploading or downloading, this command is your gateway to data transfer. So that's a quick summary of how to utilize az copy. The next topic we'll be covering is the lifecycle management in Azure Storage. Azure Storage lifecycle management offers a rule-based policy that you can use to transition blob data to the appropriate access tiers or to expire data at the end of the data lifecycle. With the lifecycle management policy, you can transition blobs from cool to hot immediately when they are accessed to optimize for performance. Transition blobs, blob versions, and blob snapshots to a cooler storage tier if the objects have not been accessed or modified for a period of time to optimize for cost. Delete blobs, blob versions, and blob snapshots at the end of their life cycles. Define rules to be run once per day at the storage account level. And apply rules to containers or to a subset of blobs using name prefixes or blob index tags as filters. So, to manage the life cycle of our blobs inside containers, a life cycle management rule must be created. Navigate to your Azure Storage account, go to Lifecycle Management, find and select Blob Service, and click on Add a Rule. From here, decide whether to may apply this rule to all blobs inside the storage account or filter the blobs to have this rule applied in this storage account. For example, if base blobs were last modified for more than one day ago, then delete the blob. For example, if base blobs were last modified from then one day ago, then delete the blob. If base blobs were last modified more than two days ago, then move to Cool Storage. Overall, Azure Storage Lifecycle Management gives you automated tools to handle data efficiently as it progresses through its lifecycle, balancing between performance needs and cost considerations. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and in this section, we'll be covering the Azure SQL offerings. Let's break them down. SQL Server on Azure VMs provides SQL Server and OS level access, supports various SQL Server and OS versions. This is an ideal choice for migrations and applications that need direct interaction with the operating system. Managed Instances Single Instance gives SQL Server and OS access for robust needs, supports various SQL and OS versions, best for isolated SQL workloads needing dedicated resources. Instance Pool enables pre-provisioning of resources for efficient migration, hosts smaller, cost-effective instances. This is a perfect fit if you're looking to migrate several smaller databases and batches, suitable for batch migration of smaller databases. Databases. Single database offers hyperscale storage up to 100 terabytes, features demand-based serverless compute, best for cloud applications needing a fully managed service. Elastic Pool enables resource sharing among databases, simplifies performance management with multiple databases, best for managing and scaling databases with variable usage patterns. So that's an overview of the Azure SQL offerings. Whether you're migrating, scaling, or starting fresh, Azure has a SQL solution tailored for your needs. Let's talk about Azure SQL databases in more detail. Azure SQL Database is a fully managed relational database service provided by Microsoft Azure. It's a cloud-based database service that offers a high level of scalability, availability, and security. Azure SQL Database is based on the latest version of Microsoft SQL Server, and it's designed to handle various workloads ranging from small web applications to large enterprise workloads. Azure SQL Database supports popular relational database engines such as SQL Server, MySQL, and PostgreSQL and offers a variety of deployment options, including single database and elastic pool. Azure SQL Database offers several benefits that make it a popular choice for businesses looking to migrate their on-premises databases to the cloud. Some of the key benefits include Fully managed service, Azure handles administrative tasks like patching and backups, freeing businesses to focus on core tasks. High availability, built-in automatic failover and disaster recovery capabilities ensure data access, even during outages. Scalability, Azure SQL database easily scales resources according to workload, optimizing costs. Security, advanced features like threat protection and data encryption ensure secure data storage. 
integration, Azure SQL database integrates seamlessly with other Azure services, supporting the development of modern data-driven applications. The Azure SQL database service offers various tiers to cater to a range of requirements and workloads. Here's a breakdown. Basic tier. This is the most economical tier, optimized for lighter database workloads. It's best for tasks like testing and development, as well as for other non-critical workloads. You can store data up to 2 gigabytes, and it provides 5 DTUs, which stands for database transaction units, that offer a combined measure of compute, storage, and EO resources. Standard tier. This tier is designed to handle the majority of database workloads. It's ideal for business critical production workloads. The storage capacity is up to one terabyte and it offers a range of 10 to 4,000 DTUs. Premium tier, built for mission critical databases, this tier emphasizes high transactional rates. It's particularly suitable for workloads with high volume transactions, allows data storage up to four terabytes and it provides 125 to 20,000 DTUs. General purpose tier, this tier is designed for customers with demanding database workloads, fits best for moderate to heavy transactional workloads, offers storage up to four terabytes, equipped with five to 80 V cores, providing robust computational capacity. Hyperscale tier, optimized for extremely large data volumes, high transaction rates, and great concurrency. This tier is the best fit for large volume OLTP workloads, provides a massive storage capacity of up to 100 terabytes, provides a compute range of four to 160 V cores. In summary, Azure SQL database offers a comprehensive set of tiers that cater to everything from lightweight development tasks to high demand, mission critical applications, ensuring that organizations can pick the perfect blend of cost, performance, and capacity for their needs. The next topic we'll be covering are Azure SQL database elastic pools. Azure SQL database elastic pools are a simple, cost-effective solution for managing and scaling multiple databases that have varying and unpredictable usage demands. The databases in an elastic pool are on a single server and share a set number of resources at a set price. The concept of elastic pools refers to a shared pool of resources, such as CPU, memory, and storage allocated to a group of databases. This shared set of resources can be automatically adjusted and distributed among the databases based on their varying demand. Azure SQL Database Elastic Pools is ideal for businesses with many databases experiencing varying workloads. Instead of allocating dedicated resources per database, an elastic pool shares resources across databases for efficient use and cost reduction. Benefits of Azure SQL Database Elastic Pools Cost-effective, share resources across databases, pay only for what you use. Performance management, resources are auto-managed across a pool, no manual adjustment required. Flexibility and scalability auto scales to meet demand, handling traffic spikes smoothly. Simplified administration, easier management with shared resources across databases. Use cases for Azure SQL database elastic pools. SaaS providers manage varying customer database activity costs effectively. Development and test environments, efficient, less expensive process for regular database setup and teardown. Businesses with multiple apps optimize resource usage and cost by sharing resources among databases with varying activity. So that's an overview of Azure SQL database elastic pools. Next, we'll be exploring Azure SQL managed instance in more detail. Azure SQL Managed Instance is a fully managed database service offered by Microsoft Azure designed to provide an easy migration path for SQL Server workloads to Azure. It provides a managed instance of SQL Server in the cloud, allowing you to run your existing applications with minimal changes. It's built on top of the latest SQL Server engine and supports all its features, including complex queries and user-defined functions. It offers various deployment options, including standalone automatic failover configurations and cross-region replication for disaster recovery. Azure SQL Managed Instance is ideal for modernizing SQL Server workloads, consolidating multiple SQL Server instances, and building new cloud-native applications. Some of the main benefits of Azure SQL Managed Instance include Easy migration provides a swift, simple migration path for SQL Server workloads to Azure with minimal application changes. Fully managed, Microsoft handles maintenance, backups, and updates, allowing focus on applications. High availability, built-in capabilities for automatic failover and disaster recovery ensure constant application availability. Security offers features like data encryption and threat detection for data protection. 
performance supports large databases, high transaction rates, and low latency queries. Integration seamlessly integrates with other Azure services for easy cloud native application deployment. Azure SQL Managed Instance has two service tiers. General purpose, this tier is for light to medium IO applications using local storage and providing an economical and scalable option. Suitable for small and medium sized businesses needing an affordable cloud option. Business critical, this tier is for high IO applications offering high availability, automatic failover, and premium storage. Ideal for mission critical applications in large enterprises, ensuring high performance, availability, and durability. So that's a brief overview of Azure SQL managed instances. The next topic we'll be covering is database scalability. Both Azure SQL database and Azure SQL managed instance enable you to scale database resources with minimal downtime, adjusting quickly to workload or traffic changes. To dynamically scale database resources, you can use the following options. Horizontal scaling, this involves adding or removing replicas to adjust the capacity of your database. Both Azure SQL Database and Azure SQL Managed Instance support horizontal scaling. Vertical scaling, this involves adjusting the resources allocated to your database, such as CPU or memory. Again, both Azure SQL Database and Azure SQL Managed Instance support vertical scaling. The exact process for scaling your database resources may vary depending on which service you are using, but in general, the steps are as follows. Determine the resource needs of your database, such as the required CPU and memory, and the expected workload or traffic. Decide on the scaling option that best meets your needs, whether that be horizontal or vertical scaling. Use the Azure Portal, PowerShell, or the Azure CLI to configure the scaling settings for your database. Monitor the performance of your database to ensure that the scaling changes are providing the expected improvements. The difference between Azure SQL Database and Azure SQL Managed Instance when it comes to dynamically scaling database resources. Azure SQL Database offers a wide range of service tiers, each with varying levels of performance and capabilities. These service tiers allow you to choose the level of resources that best meets your needs and to easily scale up or down as needed. Azure SQL Managed Instance offers two service tiers, General Purpose and Business Critical. These service tiers are designed to meet different needs, with General Purpose offering a balance of price and performance, and Business Critical offering higher performance and availability for mission-critical workloads. So, that's a quick overview of database scalability, focusing mainly on the commonly used Azure SQL Database and Azure Managed SQL Instance. The next topic we'll be covering is dynamic data masking. Dynamic data masking, or DDM, in Azure is a feature that helps prevent unauthorized access to sensitive data. It is a security feature of Azure SQL Database, Azure Synapse Analytics, and SQL Server that automatically conceals sensitive data in the result set of a query. For example, if you have a credit card number stored as 12345678910111121, a dynamic data masking rule might conceal the numbers with all X's, except for the ending four numbers in the query results, ensuring most of the data stays protected and away from prying eyes. Dynamic data masking is useful for scenarios where you want to provide a level of data security without needing to modify database operations. It's often used in scenarios like reducing the exposure of sensitive data in your database when users are running reports or analytics, and preventing accidental exposure of sensitive data, especially when data is being used for development or testing purposes. Key features. Real-time masking. Data is masked in real time and does not affect the underlying data stored in the database. The actual data remains intact and is not physically changed. Customizable masking patterns, you can define different types of masks depending on the nature of the data. From partially hiding email addresses to fully masking credit card numbers, except the last four digits, the choices are vast and flexible. Role-based access control, unmasking permissions can be granted to users who need to access the actual data. Ease of use, dynamic data masking is simple to set up and doesn't require changes to the database or applications. Common use cases for dynamic data masking include protecting personally identifiable information, financial data, and other sensitive data types in non-production environments or in applications with user roles that require access to a database but not all of its sensitive data. So that's an overview of dynamic data masking. Azure Storage provides several security and encryption features to ensure the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of your data. Here are some of the key features. 
Encryption at rest, Azure Storage automatically encrypts all data at rest using Azure Storage Service Encryption or customer managed keys using Azure Key Vault. Encryption in transit, all data transferred to and from Azure Storage is encrypted using secure SSL, TLS protocols, keeping your data secure during transmissions. Role-based access control, Azure Storage provides RBAC, which enables you to grant permissions to users, groups, and applications at a fine-grained level. Access keys and shared access signatures, Azure Storage provides two types of authentication mechanisms for accessing storage accounts, access keys, and shared access signatures. Access keys are account keys that allow full access to a storage account, while SaaS provides granular access control to specific resources within a storage account. Azure Private Link enables you to access Azure Storage resources over a private endpoint in your virtual network. This ensures that traffic between your virtual network and Azure Storage remains on the Microsoft Azure Backbone network. Azure Virtual Network Service Endpoints Azure Virtual Network Service Endpoints enable you to extend your virtual network to Azure Storage. Similarly to Azure Private Link, this ensures traffic remains within the confines of the Microsoft Azure network. Azure Firewall, this is a managed, cloud-based network security service that protects your Azure virtual network resources. You can use Azure Firewall to secure traffic between your virtual network and Azure Storage. Azure Monitor and Azure Security Center, Azure Monitor and Azure Security Center provide monitoring and security features for Azure Storage. Azure Monitor allows you to monitor storage account metrics and logs. Azure Security Center provides security recommendations and threat detection for Azure Storage. Overall, Azure Storage isn't just a storage solution, it's a fortress designed to protect your data at all levels. From encryption mechanisms and access controls to private networking and threat detection, it's equipped to tackle diverse security challenges. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and in this section, we'll be covering Azure Synapse Analytics. So, Azure Synapse Analytics is a data warehouse and unified analytics platform. It offers a code-free visual environment that streamlines and simplifies the building of ETL, ELT processes. It allows for easy ingestion of data via more than 95 native connectors, ensuring comprehensive access to a wide variety of data sources. The integration of Apache Spark into Azure Synapse Analytics allows for the use of TSQL queries across both the data warehouse and Spark engines. TSQL, short for Transact SQL, is Microsoft's implementation of SQL. It's used to interact with relational databases in Microsoft SQL Server. In addition, it supports a variety of languages including TSQL, Python, Scala, Spark SQL, and NAT, broadening its accessibility to different developers. Azure Synapse Analytics is not limited to data warehousing. It's also seamlessly integrated with both artificial intelligence and business intelligence tools. For instance, it works in harmony with Azure Machine Learning for AI purposes and leverages Azure Cognitive Services for identity and access management. Moreover, it integrates effectively with Microsoft Power BI for efficient data visualization and business intelligence operations. Taking a look at this image, it shows a simple process of Azure Synapse Analytics. You can ingest data from many data sources, such as on-premises data, cloud data, SaaS data, or streaming data. The data is stored in object storage via Data Lake Storage Gen 2. You can manage Azure Synapse Analytics via the Synapse Studio interface. You can output the data to various Azure services, such as Azure Purview, Azure ML, or Power BI. Let's talk a bit about Synapse SQL, a vital component of this platform. Synapse SQL is a distributed version of TSQL designed for data warehouse workloads. It extends TSQL to address streaming and machine learning scenarios. You can use built-in streaming capabilities to land data from cloud data sources into SQL tables. It integrates AI with SQL by using ML models to score data using the TSQL predict function. It offers both serverless and dedicated resource models. For unpredictable workloads that are unplanned or bursty, you can use the always available serverless SQL endpoint. For predictable workloads, create dedicated SQL pools to reserve processing power for data stored in SQL tables. And there you have it, a concise introduction to Azure Synapse Analytics. The next topic we'll be covering is the dedicated SQL pool and serverless SQL pool. Both are crucial components in the Azure Synapse Analytics suite, but they serve distinct purposes. Let's break them down. Dedicated SQL pool is essentially a query service over the data in your data warehouse. The unit of scale is an abstraction of compute power that is known as a data warehouse unit. Think of DWU as a measure of computational power, ensuring your database operations run efficiently. 
Once your dedicated SQL pool is created, you can import big data with simple poly-based TSQL queries, and then use the power of the distributed query engine to run high-performance analytics, ensuring you derive meaningful insights from your data. On the other hand, serverless SQL pool is a query service over the data in your data lake. One of the beauties of the serverless paradigm is its adaptability. Scaling is done automatically to accommodate each query resource requirements. In the world of data, change is the only constant. Whether you're adding nodes, removing them, or managing failovers, the serverless SQL pool is resilient. It constantly adapts to ensure every query receives the resources it needs, guaranteeing successful execution. In essence, if you want power, go with dedicated SQL pool. If you value adaptability, choose serverless SQL pool. Either way, Azure simplifies your data operations, making it easy to manage complex tasks. All right, let's dive into Apache Spark integration within Azure Synapse. Azure Synapse can deeply and seamlessly integrate with Apache Spark, which is one of the most popular open source big data engine used for data preparation, data engineering, ETL, and even machine learning tasks. It offers machine learning models with SparkML algorithms and Azure ML integration for Apache Spark 3.1 with built-in support for Linux Foundation Delta Lake, provides a simplified resource model that frees you from having to worry about managing clusters. It has a rapid startup process along with aggressive auto-scaling capabilities, ensuring your system adapts swiftly to workload demands, offers built-in support for .NET, allowing you to easily incorporate your expertise and existing .NET code within a Spark application, maximizing efficiency and resource utilization. Now, let's talk about Spark in conjunction with Data Lake and Azure Synapse. Azure Synapse removes the traditional technology barriers between using SQL and Spark together. You can seamlessly mix and match based on your needs and expertise. Tables defined on files in the data lake are seamlessly consumed by either Spark or Hive. SQL and Spark can directly explore and analyze Parquet, CSV, TSV, and JSON files stored in the data lake. And you benefit from fast and scalable data loading capabilities between SQL and Spark databases. Overall, Azure Synapse, coupled with Apache Spark, offers a powerhouse of tools and capabilities, making your data operations smoother and more efficient. Azure Synapse Link is a feature in Azure Synapse Analytics that provides seamless integration and real-time analytics capabilities between Azure Synapse Analytics and operational data stored in Azure Cosmos DB. It creates a tight integration between Azure Cosmos DB and Azure Synapse Analytics, allowing users to explore and analyze their data with no extraction, transformation, and loading process required, no data duplication, and no impact on the performance of transactional workloads. Azure Synapse Link forms a connection between Azure Cosmos DB's transactional database and Azure Synapse Analytics analytical capabilities. It accomplishes this by creating a real-time updated, columnar-based analytical store within Cosmos DB. Benefits of Azure Synapse Link for Azure Cosmos DB. Real-time analytics, Azure Synapse Link enables real-time analytics by allowing direct querying of live operational data in Azure Cosmos DB without impacting its performance. Operational and analytical data cohesion, it eliminates the need for complex ETL processes. This simplifies the data architecture as it provides immediate and seamless access to analyze operational data. Cost efficiency, Azure Synapse Link reduces costs by avoiding the need for additional storage and compute resources that are typically required for ETL processes. Increase productivity, by removing the need for manual data extraction or synchronization processes, Azure Synapse Link saves time and increases productivity for data scientists and developers. Improve data freshness, with Azure Synapse Link, the most up-to-date data from Azure Cosmos DB can be accessed for analytics and reporting in real time. This ensures data freshness and accuracy. So, when should you use Azure Synapse Link for Azure Cosmos DB? You should consider using Azure Synapse Link for Azure Cosmos DB when you are an Azure Cosmos DB user wanting to conduct analytics, business intelligence, and machine learning on your operational data. You are currently running analytics or BI on your Azure Cosmos DB operational data using separate connectors, or you are executing ETL processes to transfer operational data into a distinct analytics system. In such cases, Azure Synapse Link offers a seamless analytics experience without impacting the performance of your transactional store. However, it's not ideal if you require traditional data warehouse capabilities like high concurrency, workload management, and persisting aggregates across multiple data sources. <laughs> 
hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and in this section, we'll be covering Azure Data Factory. Azure Data Factory is essentially a cloud-based managed service that plays a pivotal role in ETL, ELT, and data integration processes. It acts like a powerhouse orchestrating data movement and transforming data seamlessly on a large scale. Here's a breakdown. You can create pipelines to schedule data-driven workflows, making data transformation and integration hassle-free. Build complex ETL processes that transform data visually with data flows. This means you can transform data in a more intuitive and visually appealing way. Use compute services such as Azure HD Insight Hadoop, Azure Databricks, and Azure SQL Database, thus offering flexibility and power in how you handle your data. Once your data has undergone transformation, you can publish your transformed data to data stores such as Azure Synapse Analytics, which can store and derive meaningful insights. Azure Data Factory has the ability to turn raw data into organized, meaningful data stores and data lakes ready for further analysis and reporting. So that's a quick introduction to Azure Data Factory. The next topic we'll be covering are the core components. Let's dive into each one and understand their significance. Pipelines, think of these as the assembly lines of your data factory. A pipeline is a logical grouping of activities that performs a unit of work. It orchestrates and automates the flow of data. Activities, these are the specific tasks within a pipeline. An activity is essentially a processing step in a pipeline. The action items are the work stages in your pipeline. Datasets, these represent the data structures or the blueprints within the data store. Linked services, they define the connection information necessary for data factory to access external resources, like your data sources. Data flows, data flows define how data moves through a pipeline or undergoes transformation, offering a visual representation of data's journey and manipulations. Integration runtimes, this is the engine under the hood. The integration runtimes are the compute infrastructure used by Azure Data Factory to facilitate the data movements and compute processes. Control flow. The control flow orchestrates the sequence of activities in a pipeline. It determines how activities are chained, ordered, or branched, ensuring the systematic flow and processing of data. In a nutshell, these seven components are the backbone of Azure Data Factory. They work harmoniously, ensuring your data is efficiently moved, transformed, and processed. The next topic we'll cover in Azure Data Factory is the data orchestration process. Data ingestion, data is ingested from a variety of data sources. This could be on-premises SQL server databases, external data, or any other supported data sources. ADF supports a wide range of connectors that can be used to pull data from these sources. Data can be ingested in batch or real-time modes depending on the requirements. Data storage and transformation. After data ingestion, it's often stored in an intermediate storage for processing. This could be Azure Blob Storage, which is a scalable object storage for unstructured data. For more structured analytics-ready data, Azure Synapse Analytics, which is an analytics service, can be used. At this stage, ADF pipelines can transform data by cleaning, shaping, and enriching it using mapping data flows. Analysis, once the data is ready, it's then loaded into a data model for analysis. This is where Azure Analysis Services come in. It allows you to build semantic models on your data, which provide a consolidated view of your business data and support high-performance reporting and analytics. Visualization, the data model can then be used by reporting tools like Power BI to create visualizations, dashboards, and reports that provide actionable business insights. Security and authentication. Throughout this process, Azure Active Directory is used for authenticating and authorizing users. It provides identity and access management services, ensuring that only authorized users have access to your resources and data. And there you have it. That's an overview of the data orchestration process in Azure Data Factory, from raw data to insightful visualizations, all while being securely guarded. The next topic we'll be covering is Microsoft SQL Server Integration Services, commonly known as SSIS. Microsoft SQL Server Integration Services is a platform for building enterprise-level data integration and data transformation solutions. SSIS can be used to automate SQL Server databases. Additionally, it can be used as an integration runtime within Azure Data Factory. You can perform the following tasks with SSIS. Copy or download files, load data into data warehouses, cleansing data for better accuracy, dive into data mining, and managing SQL server objects and data. SSIS can perform ELT with variety of sources, such as XML, flat files, and relational data sources. 
SSIS's built-in tasks and transformations, graphical tools for building packages, and integration services catalog database where you store, run, and manage packages. You can use the graphical integration services tools to integrate and transform data without having to write code. SSIS Designer is a graphical tool that you can use to create and maintain integration services packages. Picture a canvas where you lay out your data operations, all with simple drag and drop functionalities. Here is an image that outlines the SSIS Designer in action with a data task flow example. SSIS allows you to drag out data transformations with a variety of common tasks, such as aggregate, merge, lookup, and many more. And here you can design different kinds of control or data flows. So that sums up our overview on Microsoft SQL Server Integration Services. Next, we'll quickly go through the pricing tiers of Azure Databricks so you can get a better understanding of which one is best for your workload. Azure Databricks offers two pricing tiers, premium and standard. Here's what each tier brings to the table. Premium SKU, the premium tier offers a full set of advanced Databricks features such as role-based access control, integration with Azure Active Directory for identity management, and Databricks Delta Engine, which is a high-performance engine for large-scale data lakes. It is the most appropriate for big data analytics workloads and organizations requiring advanced security and team-based workflows. Standard SKU, the standard tier offers a subset of the Databricks platform features and is more cost-effective for smaller workloads or development and test environments. It includes the basic Databricks runtime in the collaborative workspace, but does not include role-based access control or Azure AD integration. So that's an overview of the pricing tiers of Azure Databricks. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and in this section, we're delving into Azure Databricks, a game changer in the world of big data and artificial intelligence solutions. Azure Databricks is an Apache Spark-based analytics platform optimized for the Microsoft Azure Cloud Services platform. It's designed to simplify the process of building big data and artificial intelligence solutions by providing a unified analytics platform that accelerates the preparation of data for analytics and machine learning. Key features. Collaborative environment, Azure Databricks provides a shared workspace for collaboration among data professionals. It facilitates dashboard creation and project sharing across various languages. Azure Integration, as a native service, it integrates smoothly with Azure services like Data Factory, Synapse Analytics, Machine Learning, and Power BI, simplifying analytics pipeline creation. Apache Spark Integration, it incorporates an optimized runtime for superior performance, offering a serverless Apache Spark experience with auto configurability and integrated Azure security. Auto Scaling and Performance, it offers auto scaling and speed optimization for faster processing of big data workloads, scaling to thousands of nodes and handling diverse workloads. Robust Security, it delivers enterprise-grade security with data encryption, active directory integration, role-based access control, private network connectivity, and industry standard compliance. Use Cases Big Data Analytics, Azure Databricks can process large volumes of data in parallel, making it suitable for big data processing and analytics. Machine Learning, it provides a platform for preparing data and developing, training, and deploying machine learning models. Real-time Analytics, Azure Databricks supports streaming analytics, allowing for real-time insights from data. ETL Processes, Azure Databricks can be used for building robust ETL pipelines. Data exploration and visualization, the collaborative workspace in Azure Databricks allows for data exploration and visualization, enabling data scientists and analysts to derive insights from data. Just to recap the key differences, Azure Databricks focuses on analytics, big data, and machine learning, while Azure Data Factory primarily handles data integration and pipeline orchestration in the cloud. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and in this, but before we delve into the specifics of Azure Data Lake, let's clarify what a data lake actually is. In simple terms, a data lake is a centralized and scalable repository capable of storing a vast range of data, including raw, unstructured, and semi-structured data. It's designed to accommodate a massive volume of data, commonly utilizing objects, referred to as blobs, or files as its primary mediums for storage. Here is a visual of a lake, with ones and zeros representing the vast amount of data that it can accommodate. The processing of this data can be simplified and broken down into a few pivotal steps. Collect. This step involves gathering data from various sources. 
transform. Here, data undergoes transformations or modifications through the usage of ELT, or ETL. This process converts the raw data into a more organized, semi-structured format ready for further analysis. Distribution. This phase makes the transform data accessible to various programs or APIs. Publish. Finally, datasets are published to metadata catalogs, making it easier for analysts to locate and tap into valuable data resources. So that sums up a quick introduction to data lakes and the foundational process involved. Now that we have a solid grasp on what a data lake is, let's delve into the specifics of Azure Data Lake. Azure Data Lake is a highly scalable and secure data lake that allows you to store and analyze large amounts of data. It is composed of two main components, Azure Data Lake Storage and Azure Data Lake Analytics. Azure Data Lake Storage, this is a massively scalable and secure data lake that allows you to store all types of data. There are two generations of Azure Data Lake Storage. Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 1, it provides a single repository where you can capture data of any size, type, and speed without forcing changes to your application as the data scales. Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2, this is a set of capabilities dedicated to big data analytics built on Azure Blob Storage. It combines the scalability and cost benefits of object storage with the reliability and performance of the big data file system capabilities. 2. Azure Data Lake Analytics, this is an on-demand analytics job service that simplifies big data. Instead of deploying, configuring, and tuning hardware, you write queries to transform your data and extract valuable insights. It includes USQL, a language that unifies the benefits of SQL with the expressive power of your own code. It also allows you to dynamically scale the resources you need for your jobs, making it cost effective. Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 1, the first version of Data Lake Storage and will be retired in 2024. New users should use Gen 2. Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2. Data Lake Storage is Azure Blog Storage, which has been extended to support big data analytics workloads. Designed to handle petabytes of data and hundreds of gigabits of throughput. In order to efficiently access data, Data Lake Storage adds a hierarchical namespace to Azure Blob Storage. And there you have it, a comprehensive overview of Azure Data Lake. Next, we'll be exploring Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2 in more detail, given that the exam will feature questions asking you to identify the most suitable type of storage for specific scenarios. It's essential to have a firm grasp on which option is best suited for different tasks. Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2 plays a vital role in Azure Data Lake by providing a secure, scalable platform to store large data volumes. It is tailored to support high-performance analytics and machine learning operations. Here are some of its core features. Hierarchical namespace enables organizing and managing data in a hierarchical file and folder structure similar to traditional file systems, simplifying data organization and transformations. Scalability designed to handle enormous amounts of data from petabytes to exabytes with high throughput and low latency. It could also manage high volumes of small writes common in big data scenarios. Security incorporates Azure Active Directory for identity and access management, role-based access control, firewall rules, and virtual network service endpoints, along with encryption at rest and in transit. It also supports Azure Private Link, ensuring data travels over a private network. Cost effectiveness offers low-cost storage with lifecycle management policies that automatically move data to cheaper storage tiers or delete it after a specified period, lowering costs. Performance provides the high performance computing needed for big data analytics and allows choosing the best performance characteristics for specific workloads through its performance tiers. Overall, Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2 is an extended version of Azure Blob Storage designed for big data analytics, providing additional capabilities like hierarchical file systems and fine grained access control. The next topic we'll be covering is the second core component to Azure Data Lake, which is Azure Data Lake Analytics. Azure Data Lake Analytics is an on-demand analytics job service, streamlining the complexities of big data operations. Instead of going through the cumbersome processes deploying, configuring, and tuning hardware, all you write queries using USQL to transform your data and extract valuable insights effortlessly. To illustrate its efficiency, exporting approximately 2.8 billion rows of TPCDS store sales data, which is around 500 gigabytes, into a CSV format file took less than 7 minutes. And importing a full 1 terabyte set of source data into Azure Analysis Services by using the Azure Data Lake connector took less than 6 hours. Now, let's talk a bit about USQL. USQL is a structured query language included within Data Lake Analytics to perform queries on your data lake. 
It's versatile, allowing you to query and combine data from a variety of data sources, including Azure Data Lake Storage, Azure Blob Storage, Azure SQL DB, Azure SQL Data Warehouse, and even SQL Server instances running in Azure VMs. For those who like hands-on experiences, you can install Azure Data Lake tools for Visual Studio to perform USQL jobs on your Azure Data Lake. So that's an overview of Azure Data Lake Analytics. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and in this section, we'll be covering is Cosmos DB. But before we talk about Cosmos DB, it's important to understand the key types of NoSQL databases. First up, let's talk about key value stores. Key value stores are simple and fast, but they generally lack features like relationships, indexes, and aggregation. In a key value store, data is stored in pairs where a unique key is stored alongside a corresponding value. A simple key value store will interpret this data resembling a dictionary, also known as associative arrays or hash. Although this kind of data storage can resemble tabular data, it doesn't require consistent columns per row, making it schema less. Due to their simple design, they can scale well beyond a relational database. Next, let's explore what a document store is. A document store is a NoSQL database that stores documents as its primary data structure. These documents can be structured as XML, but are more commonly found in JSON or similar formats. Essentially, document stores are a subclass of key value stores, but have a more intricate structure, allowing for complex queries and operations. Here's a visual that displays the components of a document store compared to a relational database. Now, let's move on to understanding graph databases. A graph database is a database composed of a data structure that uses vertices, also known as nodes or dots, which form relationship to other vertices through edges, arcs, or lines. This type of database is particularly powerful for mapping relationships and identifying patterns. Use cases for graph database fraud detection, real-time recommendation engines, master data management, network and operations, identity and access management, traceability and manufacturing, contact tracing, data lineage for GDPR, customer 360-degree analysis, product recommendations, social media graphing, and feature engineering. The nodes can contain data properties. While the edges can hold relational data, including directional information and other data properties, so that's an overview of three key types of NoSQL databases. Now that we have a better understanding of the key types of NoSQL databases, it's time to delve into the main topic, Cosmos DB. Azure Cosmos DB is a service for fully managed NoSQL databases that are designed to scale and have high performance attributes. Cosmos DB facilitates interaction with different types of NoSQL database engines through distinct APIs, namely, Core SQL, a document data store, Azure Cosmos DB API for MongoDB, another document data store, Azure Table, a key value data store, Gremlin, a graph data store based on Apache Tinkerpop. These NoSQL engines offer two specific capacities, provision throughput, where you pay for a guaranteed capacity, and serverless, where you pay only for what you use. Cosmos DB shines with its incredibly quick response times and solid support for scalability. It's a fully managed service, meaning Azure takes charge of all automatic management, updates, and patches. Main advantages of Azure Cosmos DB integrates with many Azure services, including Azure Functions, Azure Kubernetes Services, and Azure App Services. Integrates with many databases APIs like the native Core SQL, MongoDB, Cassandra, and Gremlin. Support for multiple development SDKs spanning .NET, Java, Python, and Node.js. Offers a schema-less service with automatic indexing of data, ensuring rapid queries. Guaranteed uptime SLA of 99.999% availability. Data replication between Azure regions is automatic. Data protected with encryption at rest and role-based access. And Autoscale is provided to handle a variety of workload sizes. Next, let's talk about Cosmos DB APIs. Different types of APIs are available in Azure Cosmos DB to support a wider range of applications. These APIs allow data to be delivered via documents, key value pairs, Y columns, or graph data. For new projects, the core SQL APIs are strongly recommended, whereas for existing databases, the specific database API is recommended. The APIs are as follows. For SQL API, the default API for utilizing Azure Cosmos DB and enables data querying with a language akin to SQL. MongoDB API facilitates communication with MongoDB databases and document storage. 
Cassandra API allows interaction with Cassandra using the Cassandra query language and supports data storage as a partition row store. Azure Table API, a communication tool for Azure Table storage. It supports indexing in the partition and row keys. Gremlin API helps in creating a graph-based data view that can be queried using graph traversal language. So that's an introduction to Cosmos DB. Next up on our agenda is the Cosmos DB Explorer. Cosmos DB Explorer provides a user-friendly web interface that allows users to delve into and engage with their Cosmos DB accounts. You can readily access this interface by heading to cosmos.azure.com. Here is a Cosmos DB Core SQL within Cosmos DB Explorer, adding a document to the database, which is very straightforward. It's worth noting that when you journey through Azure to access a Cosmos DB account under the Data Explorer section, you're essentially interacting with the same interface as Cosmos DB Explorer. Furthermore, the versatility of Cosmos DB Explorer shines through with its compatibility with other database types. For example, its seamless integration with a graph database using Gremlin. So that's a quick overview of Cosmos DB Explorer. The next topic we'll be covering is partitioning schemas in Cosmos DB. Partitioning in Azure Cosmos DB plays a pivotal role in optimizing performance. Data in Cosmos DB indexes is strategically grouped by partition keys, ensuring quick and efficient data access. Main concepts of partitioning schemas in Azure Cosmos DB. Partition keys, think of these as the backbone of partitioning. They are the keys used to group items together and can be likened to primary keys in relational databases. Essentially, they dictate how data is divided and organized within the system. A logical partition is a group of items that all have the same partition key value. Physical partitions consists of a set of logical partitions. Azure Cosmos DB manages logical partitions, which can have one to many. Replica sets are made up of a group of physical partitions that are materialized as a self-managed, dynamically load-balanced group of replicas that span across multiple fault domains. Each physical partition is not alone, it has a set of clones or replicas. This set of replicas is what we refer to as a replica set. Replicas ensure data durability, availability, and consistency. Logical partitions are mapped to physical partitions, and these physical entities are then spread globally, ensuring data availability and low latency access across regions. To clarify the term in the image, a partition set refers to a collection of physical partitions. These partitions collectively manage the same logical partition keys, and they ensure this consistent management across multiple regions. In essence, Cosmos DB's partitioning architecture is meticulously designed for scalability, fault tolerance, and optimal performance. Whether you're considering logical or physical partitions, replica sets, or partition keys, each plays a crucial role in ensuring that Cosmos DB remains one of the most efficient NoSQL databases on the market. The next topic we'll be covering is choosing a partition key. A partition key has two components, partition key path and the partition key value. For example, you can consider an item user ID, Andrew, works for Microsoft. If you choose user ID as the partition key, the following are the two partition key components. One, partition key path, this would be user ID. This path essentially points to the property in your data item that holds the partition key value. Alphanumeric characters and underscores are accepted, and you can navigate through nested objects using the standard path notation. 2. Partition key value. For our example, this is Andrew. It's the specific value found at the partition key path. This value can be either a string or a number. Your partition key for all containers should be a property that has a value which does not change. You can't change the value of a property if it's your partition key. The partition key should have a wide range of possible values to distribute data and workload uniformly across various logical partitions. Spread request unit consumption and data storage evenly across all logical partitions. This ensures even root consumption and storage distribution across your physical partitions. Let's talk about unique keys. So, unique keys provide developers with the ability to add a layer of data integrity to their database. By creating a unique key policy when a container is created, you ensure the uniqueness of one or more values per partition key. A unique key is scoped to a logical partition. If you partition the container based on the zip code, you end up with duplicated items in each logical partition. It's important to know that you can't update an existing container to use a different unique key. A unique key policy can have a maximum of 16 path values. Each unique key policy can have a maximum of 10 unique key constraints or combination. When a container has a unique key policy, request unit charges to create, update, and delete an item are slightly higher. In addition, unique key names are case sensitive. 
The next topic we'll be covering are containers in Cosmos DB. Azure Cosmos containers are useful for scalability in Azure Cosmos DB, both in terms of storage and throughput. They are beneficial when you need a different set of configurations for each of your Azure Cosmos DBs because they allow you to customize each container individually. Some applications may require robust write capabilities for logging, while others prioritize reading due to data access needs. With Cosmos DB containers, each application could have a customized container that meets its demands, balancing performance and cost. Azure Cosmos Container has some container-specific properties, and those properties, which can be system-generated or user-configurable, vary according on the use API. An Azure Cosmos Container has a set of system-defined properties. Depending on which API you use, some properties might not be directly exposed. The table lists various system-defined properties in Cosmos DB and indicates which ones are system-generated versus user-configurable. Additionally, it also denotes which properties are used by different APIs for NoSQL, Cassandra, Manga, B, Gremlin, and Table. RID, Type, System-Generated, Purpose acts as a unique identifier for a container, supported by only the API for NoSQL. ETag type system generated purpose utilized for optimistic concurrency control. It ensures that only one client can change an item in the database at a time, supported by only the API for NoSQL. TS type system generated purpose represents the timestamp when the container was last updated, supported by only the API for NoSQL. Self type system generated purpose provides an addressable URI of the container. It's essentially a unique reference or link to the container, supported by only the API for NoSQL. ID type user configurable purpose denotes the name of the container, supported by all the APIs listed. There are many more properties, but we won't be able to list them all here. The next topic we'll be covering are the capacity of Cosmos DB containers. So what is capacity? Capacity defines the amount of underlying resources are available to support consumption of resources, such as compute and storage. As we've briefly touched upon before, Cosmos DB has two capacity modes, provision throughput and serverless. Provision throughput. In this mode, you allocate a specific amount of throughput for your containers. This throughput is quantified in terms of request units per second. This mode is suitable for workloads where traffic can be predicted. It offers a high degree of flexibility, letting you match your provision capacity to the expected demand. Serverless, this mode is the opposite in its approach. Instead of provisioning in advance, you simply run database operations without setting any predetermined capacity. This mode is beneficial for smaller workloads or those that might experience unpredictable traffic spikes. While it offers the advantage of simplicity in configuration, there are some inherent limitations to be aware of. When it comes to geo distribution, the provision throughput option in Cosmos DB offers unlimited multi region support. In contrast, the serverless option is restricted to a single region. In terms of storage capacity, while provision throughput allows for unlimited storage per container, serverless is capped at 50 gigabytes. Performance wise, both options deliver less than 10 ms latency for point reads. However, while provision throughput guarantees less than 10 ms latency for writes under its SLA, serverless offers less than 30 ms for writes as covered by its SLO. Regarding billing, provision throughput charges per hour based on the set RUS, irrespective of actual root consumption. On the other hand, serverless charges are based on the actual RUS consumed by your operations, billed on an hourly basis. Next, we'll delve into the consistency levels in Cosmos DB. These levels play a pivotal role, shaping the availability, latency, and accuracy of database operations. Azure Cosmos DB provides five different consistency levels to maintain data availability and querying performance depending on your requirements. The consistency levels in Cosmos DB can be visualized as a spectrum. This ranges from strong to eventual. On the strong side, it has higher latency, lower availability, but has worse read scalability. But as you move towards eventual, you gain lower latency, higher availability, and better read scalability. Strong linearizability. Reads are guaranteed to return the most recent version of an item. Bounded staleness, consistent prefix. Reads lag behind writes by at most k prefixes or t interval. Session, consistent prefix. Monotonic reads, monotonic writes, read your writes, write follows reads. Consistent prefix, updates returned are some prefix of all the updates with no gaps. Eventual, out of order reads. You set default consistently at the Cosmo B account level under default consistency blade. 
Strong consistency, this level guarantees that read operations return the most recent data. While its read costs align with bounded stale lists, they are higher than those of session and eventual consistencies. Furthermore, data written can only be read once the majority of replicas have successfully replicated it. Bounded staleness causes read operations to lag behind writes due to time or version disparities. Despite having the same read cost as strong consistency, it's pricier than session and eventual consistencies. It stands out as the most consistent when compared to session, consistent prefix, and eventual. This level is ideal for globally distributed applications that prioritize high availability and minimal latency. Session. Session consistency ensures that data read within a session matches the most recent write in that session. However, other sessions might see outdated or dirty data from recent writes in different sessions. It's the default consistency for new databases. Its read costs fall between those of bounded staleness, strong, and eventual consistencies. With consistent prefix, read operations fetch the latest data replicated among replicas, although it may not be the absolute latest. Situations can arise where dirty data appears due to changes in one replica that haven't propagated to others. Its consistency is superior to eventual but trails behind other levels. Eventual consistency offers the least assurance with no guarantees on immediate data accuracy. However, it boasts the lowest latency, optimal performance, and the most cost-effective read operations among all levels. So, that's an overview of the consistency levels in Cosmos DB. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and in this section, we'll be covering Azure Redis Cache. But before we talk about Azure Redis Cache, we'll need to know what Redis is. So, Redis is an open source and memory database store. Redis acts as caching layer or a very fast database. Since all data is stored in memory, it's highly volatile, meaning data loss is possible under certain conditions. Redis is very fast that it can deliver content from its store with single to double digit milliseconds, such as 10ms. Despite its in-memory nature, Redis provides options for data persistence, allowing you to balance performance with durability. It can periodically save data snapshots to disk or append each command to a log. Redis is a key value store, and it supports the following data structures. Sets and sorted sets, collections of strings in which every item is unique. Lists, a collection of strings sorted according to the order they were inserted. Hashes, perfect for story objects, these are maps between string fields and string values. Bitmaps and bit fields allow for operations at the bit level, providing extremely efficient storage. Hyperlog log, a sophisticated algorithm to count unique values. Geospatial indexes, grant the ability to manage spatial items and query by position. Streams, new in Redis, it offers a way to log in real-time stream data. So, that's an introduction of Redis. The next topic we'll be covering is Azure Cache for Redis. Azure Redis Cache is based on the popular open source Redis Cache. It gives you access to a secure, dedicated Redis Cache that Microsoft manages and that you can access from any Azure application. Azure Redis Cache is an in-memory database that caches data in key value pairs. It helps your application become more responsive even as the customer load increases. It takes advantage of the Redis engine's low latency, high throughput capabilities. This distributed cache layer allows your data tier to scale independently, allowing for more efficient use of your application layer's compute resources. Azure Redis Cache perfectly complements Azure database services such as Cosmos DB and Azure SQL. It provides a cost-effective solution to scale read and write throughput of your data tier. Using the cache aside pattern, you can store and share database query results, session states, static content, and more. Azure Cache for Redis stores session state and other data that needs low latency access. Diagram of cache aside pattern on Azure Storage. First, we'll need to check the Redis cache to see if your item is available. If the item is found, we'll retrieve it. If the item is not found, we'll pull the item from the table storage, recache it in Redis, and then return the results. On the right, we have an image that should clearly explain the workflow overview. Check if cache exists. If true, go to step two and obtain the data. If cache could not be found, go to step three and recache the item and return the results. So that's a summary of Azure Cache Redis and how it works. The next topic we'll be covering are caching expiration policies for Azure Redis Cache. Azure Redis Cache's expiration policies are configured per each request, so we could have an expiration policy different for each cache key. For Redis distributed cache, those expiration policies are as follows. 
absolute expiration relative to now, this policy sets the duration for the cash to live, counting from the moment the item is added to the cash. For example, if you set this to 10 minutes, the cash item will expire 10 minutes after it has been added. Absolute expiration, this policy sets a specific date and time when the cash item will expire. Once that date and time are reached, the cash item is evicted, regardless of when it was added. Sliding expiration, this policy defines an expiration time relative to the last access time of the particular cash item. If an item has a sliding expiration of 10 minutes, it will expire if it hasn't been accessed in those 10 minutes. Every time the item is accessed, its expiration timer is reset. So that's a brief summary of the Azure Ready's Caches expiration policies. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and in this section, we'll be covering non-relational data storage solutions in Azure, starting with Azure Table Storage. Azure Table Storage isn't your regular relational database. Instead, it's a NoSQL data store for semi-structured data neatly housed within Azure Storage accounts. What makes it particularly appealing, especially in today's fast-paced tech world, is its ability to handle vast amounts of unstructured or semi-structured data without being tied down by a fixed schema. There are two ways to interact with Azure Tables. The first is Azure Table Storage API, a robust tool for developers to seamlessly integrate, query, and manage their data. It provides you the flexibility to interact programmatically and customize according to your application's needs. On the other hand, we have Microsoft Azure Storage Explorer. It offers a user-friendly interface to browse, manipulate, and manage your data without writing a single line of code. Think of it as your visual window into the world of Azure Tables. Here is a visual of Azure Storage Explorer, a standalone app that makes it easy to work with Azure Storage data on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. You can create blob containers, upload files, create snapshots of disk, and more. So when should you use Azure Table Storage? Large amounts of semi-structured data, if you have massive volumes of semi-structured or unstructured data, but don't need the complexities of a relational database, Cost-effective storage, Azure Table Storage is a budget-friendly solution, especially when compared to full-fledged databases. It's suitable for projects where low-cost storage is a priority. Schema flexibility, if your application has evolving data structures where the schema can change over time, the schema-less design of Azure Table Storage offers flexibility. Scalability requirements for applications that need to scale out by adding more data entities but don't require complex joins, stored procedures, or secondary indexes. And fast access and high throughput if you need a storage solution with low latency and high availability characteristics for quick access to data. So that's an overview of Azure Table Storage. The next topic we'll be covering is adding entries in Azure Table Storage. When you enter data, you must provide a Partition key, this is a unique identifier for each partition within a table. This key enables Azure to distribute table data across multiple nodes for improved data access and load balancing. For instance, you might use the date and time as a partition key for log data, ensuring entries are evenly distributed and easily sorted. Row key, this key is a unique identifier within a partition, allowing you to pinpoint a specific entity. It's like the address of your data within the partition. For instance, in a list of customers, a customer ID could serve as a row key. Azure Table supports a diverse set of data types. String, textual data, such as names or addresses. Boolean, true or false values. Binary, data such as file or image. Date time, specific date and time information. Double, floating point numbers. Git, global unique identifiers. Int32 and Int64, whole numbers, both small and large. When you need to retrieve data, you can perform queries using both partition and row keys. This dual key system allows for robust and flexible data retrieval operations. For example, if you're looking for a specific transaction in a financial database, you can use the partition key to narrow down the date and the row key to find the exact transaction. Azure Table Storage allows you to apply additional filters to your queries. If you need to find all entries from a specific location or all entries falling under a particular category, you can easily set up filters to refine your search. So that's a quick overview of adding entries in Azure Table Storage. The next topic we'll be covering is Azure Queue Storage. Azure Queue Storage is a robust and straightforward messaging broker that facilitates smooth and secure message exchange between various applications and services within the Azure environment. Key features. Simple message broker, Azure Queue Storage allows services running on cloud infrastructure to communicate with each other asynchronously. It can handle large numbers of messages simultaneously, ensuring your services remain highly responsive. 
Security, Azure Queue Storage uses authenticated HTTPS protocols, ensuring that data transmission is secure and reliable. Message size, it can hold messages up to 64 kilobytes in size, accommodating a wide range of data types and sizes. For storage and access, storage account, Queue Storage is stored within an Azure storage account, ensuring a secure and unified setting for all storage needs. Access keys and connection strings utilize the same access keys and connection strings for queue storage as with other resources in the storage account, ensuring streamlined and consistent access management. Azure Queue Storage offers three ways of handling messages on the queue. Peak, this option allows you to preview a message in the queue without deleting or locking it. It's useful for determining the next message to process. Delete, after successfully processing a message, an application will typically delete the message to ensure it isn't processed again. Receive and lock. By locking a message, it ensures that other parts of the system can't process the message simultaneously. After processing, the lock is either renewed or the message is deleted. Azure Portal. Easily create a queue and send messages through the user-friendly interface of the Azure Portal. Azure SDK or CLI for more programmatic control. Most interactions with the queue, including sending, peaking, and deleting messages, can be performed using the Azure SDK or command line interface. Here is a Python example to help you understand what this looks like. Developers can create queues, add messages, and process them with just a few lines of code. So that's an overview of Azure Queue Storage. The next topic we'll be covering are the key concepts in Azure Queue Storage. Queues can be accessed by using the following URL format. HTTPS storage account slash queue. The following URL addresses a queue in the diagram. HTTPS by account slash images to download. Here's a breakdown of the components. Storage account. A storage account is required for all Azure storage access. Think of it as your gateway to Azure storage services. Queue. A queue contains a set of messages. Keep in mind, the queue name must be all lowercase. Message. You can store any format of data in a message, but it must not exceed 64 kilobytes. Before version 2017-0729, the maximum time to live allowed is 7 days. For version 2017-0729 or later, the maximum time to live can be any positive number or minus 1, indicating that the message doesn't expire. In addition, the default time to live is 7 days if this parameter is not specified. You can interact with the queue via the Azure CLI subcommand, a Z storage message action. Clear, deletes all messages from the specified queue. Delete, deletes the specified message. Get, retrieves one or more messages from the front of the queue. Peek, retrieves one or more messages from the front of the queue, but does not alter the visibility of the message. Put, adds a new message to the back of the message queue. Update, updates the visibility timeout of a message. So that's an overview of the key concepts in Azure Queue Storage. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and in this segment, we'll be covering Azure Files. Azure Files is a fully managed file share in the cloud. A file share is a centralized server for storage that allows multiple connections. It's like having one big shared drive that everyone, or in this example, multiple virtual machines can work on at the same time. To connect to the file share, you can use network protocols like the server message block or network file system. When a connection is established, the file share's file system will be accessible in the specific directory within your own directory tree. This process is known as mounting. Backups, use shared snapshots to back up your file share. These snapshots are read only and incremental, meaning they only contain data that has changed since the last snapshot. You could have a maximum of 200 snapshots per file share, and these can be retained for a whopping 10 years. Remember, backups are stored within your file share. If you delete the share, you say goodbye to the backups as well. Soft delete, you can prevent accidental deletion by turning on soft delete. With soft delete, your data isn't immediately removed. Instead, it's marked for deletion and held for a certain period before it's permanently erased. Advanced threat protection, an additional layer of security intelligence that provides alerts when it detects suspicious activity on your storage account. Store tiers, premium, store onto SSD with single digit milliseconds for most EO operations. Transaction optimized, store on HDD with transaction heavy workloads that don't need the latency offered by premium file shares. Hot, optimized for general purpose file sharing scenarios such as team shares and Azure File Sync. Cool, stored on HDD for cost efficient storage optimized for online archive storage scenarios. Types of storage, general purpose version 2, deployed onto HDD. File storage, deployed onto SSD. 
identity on-premises. Azure Storage can integrate with an on-premises Active Directory domain service. Managed Azure Storage can be joined to Microsoft Managed Active Directory domain service. Store account key. Use a combination of storage account name as the username and the account key as the password for mounting. Networking, a Azure files can be accessed from anywhere, both inside and outside your Azure account through the storage account's public endpoint. Remember, SMB uses port 445. If you face connection issues, check if this port is open in your organization to mount your file share. Encryption, Azure Files is encrypted at rest using Azure Storage Service Encryption. Azure Files is encrypted in transit with SMB 3.0 plus with encryption or HTTPS. And there we have it, a comprehensive look into Azure Files and its noteworthy features. Continuing from our discussion on Azure Files, let's now explore its main use cases. Use cases for Azure Files. Completely replace or supplement on-premises file servers network attached storage devices. Lift and shift your on-premises storage to the cloud via classic lift or hybrid lift. Lift and shift means when you move workloads without rear chidecting. For example, you can directly import your local VMs to the cloud. Classic lift, both the application and its data are moved to Azure. Hybrid lift, here only the application data gets moved to Azure files while the application remains operational on-premises. Simplify cloud development, shared application settings, multiple VMs and developer workstations need to access the same configuration files. Diagnostic share, all VMs log to the file share, developers can mount and debug all logs in a centralized place. Dev, test, debug, developers can quickly share essential tools needed for local environments. Containerization, you can use Azure files to persist volumes for stateful containers. Why use Azure files instead of setting up your own file share server? Shared access, Azure Files is pre-configured to function with standard networking protocols like SMB and NFS. Fully managed, Azure manages maintenance and security patches to ensure your file storage is secure and updated. Scripting and tooling, you can automate the management and creation of files shared with Azure API and PowerShell. Resiliency, Azure Files is built for durability, ensuring that your data is always safe and accessible. So, these are the main reasons and scenarios for incorporating Azure Files into your infrastructure. The next topic we'll be covering is Azure File Sync. Azure File Sync is a service that allows you to cache Azure File shares on an on-premises Windows server or cloud VM. How does it work? Caching, Azure File Sync transforms your Windows server into a quick cache of your Azure File share. This means that you can access the data you need faster than ever without having to rely on the cloud. Multiple protocols, regardless of the protocol you're comfortable with, be it SMB, NFS, or FTPS, Azure File Sync lets you access your data locally, granting greater flexibility. Global caches, for businesses operating globally, Azure File Sync allows setting up caches in multiple locations for faster data access. Key benefits. Centralized storage, with Azure File Sync, you get centralized file services in Azure, allowing multiple locations to use cloud tiering and direct cloud access to store and access data. Integrated with Azure Backup, Azure File Sync integrates seamlessly with Azure Backup, offering unified and streamlined backup services. Cloud tiering, as your storage needs change, older or rarely used files can be moved to Azure, saving space on your local servers. Easy integration, it's designed to integrate smoothly with your existing infrastructure, meaning less learning curve and disruption. So that's a brief overview of Azure File Sync. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and in this follow along, I'm going to show you how to set up a file share uh, and mount it to a virtual machine. So let's get to it. So the first thing we're going to do is go all the way to the top, and we're going to type in uh, storage accounts, because if you type in files uh, or um, Azure files, you're just not going to get anything because it is a subservice uh, within a storage account. So we'll go ahead and hit add. And I think I will name, uh, I'll make a new resource group as I always do. I'm going to name this one as Kivas. Okay, and then we'll name the account as such. Now I wanna show you something here. So under the account kind, uh, if you remember from our lecture content, you can create a, uh, a file share under general purpose two. Um, but if you go to premium two, you'll have just a file storage type. That means only your, this storage account is only for creating a file storage. And that's if you want to use the premium tier for uh, um, access. And we don't today, um, but I will show you uh, when we get to that in a moment here. 
uh, just to point that out to you. So what we'll do is go ahead and hit review create. Actually, before we do that, let's just double check if there's anything interesting here. Sometimes there is. So under Azure files for large file shares, um, provides file share support up to 100 terabytes. So right now it's, it's disabled, but if you wanted larger files, you could go ahead and enable that, but we're just gonna leave it off. I'm gonna go ahead and hit review and create. Now, as this is creating, and this goes pretty darn quick, uh, what I'm gonna do is launch a new virtual machine because we need something uh, to mount the file share to. So make your way over to virtual machines. And what we're going to do is launch a, a Linux one just because that's a lot easier for me to do here. And they're generally more inexpensive. So we'll choose Kivas. I'm also gonna name the virtual machine Kivas and we'll choose Ubuntu as our uh, image. So just go down here, make sure you choose 18 LTS generation two. And under the sizes, we'll expand it. Make sure you choose B1LS because that costs around $6 a month. Under your password, we will choose Azure user as the name. And then for the password itself, testing one, two, three, capital on that T. So capital T, testing one, two, three, four, five, six. Sorry, <laughs> it's always uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. We should probably open up port four, four, five, um, but uh, we'll get to that when um, we get to the, uh, actually we have to recreate it here. So I'll hit review and create. And we will go ahead and just give it a moment. Just takes a little bit of time and we'll just go and create that there. So as that is creating, we'll go back to our storage account. We'll go into it. And uh, as, as you notice, these are the services, the, the things that we can launch in our storage account. What we want is a file share, that's Azure files. Um, and notice here that the capacity is set to five terabytes and it has a soft delete for seven days. It's not configured with Azure, Azure Active Directory as of yet, if we wanted to use that to authenticate. But what we'll do is click on file share on the right hand side. I'm going to name our file share as Kivas. I'm going to set the total to uh, three gigabytes because we don't need a lot of data. And remember that tier I talked about? Well, here it is. It's disabled. But if we had created it a, a, a premium storage account and a file, file storage, we could have chosen that all right. So we'll go ahead and hit create. And this doesn't take too long. As that's going, let's make our way back to our virtual machine. It looks like it's deployed, so we'll go to that resource. And then on the left-hand side, we'll go to networking because I want to open up that port port, uh, port 445. That's what SSMB, SMB communicates on. And so uh, down below, all this is fine. But if we were to go here, there isn't one for SMB. So what we'll do is just put in 445 and we'll say TCP, and I'll just write down here SMB, and we'll go ahead and hit add, and that only takes a moment there. We'll make our way back to our storage account. We'll click in, or sorry, into our files. Yeah, storage account in our files. Notice we have connect and upload, and so what we're going to do is click uh, connect, and it's going to give us some instructions here that we can run, and this is gonna be the mount point. So I'm gonna go make my way back to here, and I see that that uh, record has been created, and I'm gonna open up our uh, cloud shell, and so if you've never opened up Cloud Shell before, it'll ask you to make it a storage account that is specific just for it. Just say yes, make sure you're in bash mode. We cannot do this in PowerShell. And uh, within your virtual machine, if you're on the right tab here, you'll go to overview and we're gonna grab that public IP address, type SSH, Azure user at sign, paste in the IP address, we'll hit enter, type in yes to accept the fingerprint and then type your password capital T, testing one, two, three, four, five, six, okay and it'll let us in. And what we're gonna to need to do is do a sudo uh, apt update, and I'm gonna do ampersand ampersand, just so we can run this in one line. We're gonna type in sudo apt install CIFS utils. This is the utility that we're gonna to use to do um, this part of the mounting. So we need to make sure that is installed. And so we'll let that go. Um, up, apt update can take a lot of time or a, a very little amount of time. It just depends on how many updates there are, but it shouldn't take too long. Um, and so what we're gonna do is prepare this because this is not the easiest to work with. And so what we'll do, I already have it open here because I was giving this a go earlier. This is the exact same thing, but I'm gonna delete it out. So it's one to one, because I think it might've changed a little bit here, whoops. And so I will copy this here and paste it in and we'll just give it a quick read. So what it's gonna do, um, I don't know if it would color so if I went to bash here, shell script. There we go, it's a bit easier. So it's going to uh, create a directory called Mount Kivas, um, and then it's going to create another directory for the SMB credentials. It's going to store the username and then the password in these credentials. We're gonna chmod it so we have our permissions. 
Uh, and then we have this bash script here, um, which is a little bit hard to read, but it is using CIFS. So it's doing some something there and setting that stuff up. And then it's using CIFS, it's actually mounting this case. So that's what we're going to do. So um, just going back over here and back to this other tab, um, what I'm gonna do here is, um, oh, sorry, now this is ready. We're gonna just type in clear and I'm going to run each of these commands. So I'm gonna grab the make directory here and I'm gonna paste that in. If you paste all this in, half the time it messes up when you have multi-line like that. So it's not even worth trying. Uh, so we'll do copy, we'll make that other directory here. And then uh, we have this pseudo bash line here. So we'll copy that. Okay, hit enter. And then we'll grab this next line here. We'll copy that, paste that in, hit enter. It did not like the space in front of it, I think. It's just a really long line. So what I'll do is I'll just grab that line and move it to the wall, make my life a little bit easier. And we'll paste that in like that. Um, it's saying the credentials does not exist. Hold on here. So we'll just write clear. It's okay if it happens. So this directory should exist, right? So if I do um, um, pwd, et cetera, or we should just be able to autocomplete it. So a CD, et cetera. I'm hitting tab to autocomplete and then we want SMB. And this says credential. So it's missing the S. <laughs> so there's my mistake. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and remove that because if we don't have it named right, it's just not gonna work, right? So we'll go ahead here and make sure we copy the entire line. That was my mistake. And we'll paste that in there. We'll go to the next line, copy that, paste that in, copy the next line here, paste that in. And uh, we will, we, what we'll do is we'll chmod the file Okay, so if we want to check to make sure it's the correct permissions, what we can do is um, do an ls, paste in the, or just write in the path, uh, which is SMB credentials here. And here we can see the file. If we do a hyphen LA, it will show us that it has the correct permission. So it's really locked down there. That's what the Chabad did. If we wanna see the contents of that file to make sure that those things are in there, uh, what we can do is type in um, cat and just grab that whole link here. We might have to give it sudo. It might complain for that. It does, so we'll put sudo in front of that. And so we just wanna make sure there's one username and one password um, and everything looks okay there. We'll type clear. We'll make our way back here. And so now we'll run these commands. So that's the first one. And then this is the second one. We'll make sure that that N matches up, I-N-O, yep, I-N-O, hit enter. And so now it should work. So if we were to upload a file, uh, that should be in good shape. But if we want to get to that directory, we'll just type in mount. If we keep on hitting tab, it'll show us there's Kivas. Okay, and so, you know, this is where we're gonna create some files. So I actually don't have a file prepared. So give me a moment, I'll be back in a moment with a file. All right, I'm back and I've uh, prepared an image for us to upload. So going back to our uh, file share in here, we have the upload button. Just go ahead and click that. And on the right hand side, it's going to give you a pop up. And uh, within that pop up there, um, just go find your image. I'm just off screen grabbing it. So this is uh, my image, <laughs> what I'm uploading, which is Kivas, uh, Kivas Fajo. It's who we named it after. He's the collector in Star Trek Next Generation. And so what I'll do is go ahead and hit upload, right? And so that file is supposedly there. If we go back here and do uh, an LS, there's the file, right? Um, and so probably it should be reflective. So if we were to go and uh, delete this file, so we'd say remove, or maybe if we made a new directory, let's see what happens if we say, um, you know, uh, the episode's called The Most Toys in Star Trek. Just see if it actually reflects back and forth. So we do a refresh, there it is. Can I drag? No, I can't drag, but I could probably move this file over there. So we'd say move uh, Kivas Fajo into the most toys episode. And if we go back here and refresh, you get the idea, right? So yeah, uh, I mean, that's as simple as it is uh, with the file share there, okay? 
So now that we're all done here with Azure File Share, we can't or we can't use this to make a file sync because we would have to use Windows for that. So this is all pretty much done. So what I want you to do is go to your resource groups. We'll find Kivas and we'll go ahead and delete this and we'll call this uh, part of our follow along 100% done here. Okay, so see you in the next one. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are going to take a look at using Azure File Sync. So uh, previously we set up a file uh, share with just Linux, but we're gonna take it a bit further and set up a sync. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna do two things. We're gonna need to set up a new storage account, and we'll also have to launch a virtual machine. Since virtual machines take longer to launch than a storage account, what I want you to do, I saw the old tab here from the last uh, follow along, but what I want you to do is make your way over to virtual machines, open that a new tab, and we'll go ahead and launch ourselves a Windows Server. So up in the top left corner, hit uh, Add, Virtual Machine, we'll give it a moment. I'm gonna call this new one, uh, well, we, we can use Kivas again, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that. We'll say this is Kivas, and I'm gonna choose this time Windows 2019 Server, so we have a Windows Server, and I want uh, 2019. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be, let me just double check here. Um, yeah, we'll just do 2019 Generation 2 here. And we'll scroll on down here and I'm going to put in Azure user and then we'll do um, uh, capital T testing one, two, three, four, five, six, capital T testing one, two, three, four, five, six, scroll on down. We are definitely going to want port three, three, eight, nine open. Um, we'll open up these two ports as well. I think that's okay. And we'll go ahead and hit review and create. Well, actually, before we do that, <laughs> I don't think I choose the right size. So um, we'll just wait a moment here as it's complaining and we'll change this because you can't have a B1LS. We're gonna have to go with um, uh, DSV, uh, SV, uh, DSV3, okay? Because it has two v vCPUs at the minimum. Actually, we can go with this one here because it just has to be two and four. So I think we can get away with a B2, which is 50, 50 bucks a month, which we're not gonna keep that around for very long. We'll go ahead and hit create. Um, we might need, actually before that, I'm just gonna add another disk just in case because I really don't wanna have to do this if I have to make another one. And so we're just going to say an empty disk here, I suppose. Yeah, that seems fine to me. And I'm gonna go ahead and hit, uh, yeah, we should enable disk now. We'll do nothing there and we'll say okay. And go ahead and hit review create. And we'll just give it a moment. It takes a little bit of time. We'll go ahead and hit create there. And while that's creating, now we'll go over and make ourselves a storage account. So we'll make a new one here. And we'll call it, uh, we'll put it in our key boss and we'll call it key boss. We'll stick with standard general two. That's totally fine for our use case. We'll go ahead and hit create. And this will not take long. It's very fast at making storage accounts. Virtual uh, Windows virtual machines, not as fast. <laughs> so we'll just give it a moment here. And it looks like it's created. So we'll go to the resource and then under file shares, we'll click on that. We'll create a new file share and this will be called Kivas. And we'll set five gigabytes because we really don't need a large one. We'll create it. And so this can be used for Windows or Linux. Uh, and in this case, we're gonna be using it for um, uh, Windows. So what we can do, uh, we'll just have to wait for that to finish deploy, but we're gonna have to set up Azure files. So if we go files, I think we type it in here, will it show up? No. So if the thing is we need to get file sync and it's in a kind of a weird spot. So if we go to uh, all services and then we type in files, whoops, <laughs> it was a little bit too quick there. Uh, I'm just looking for it here. Uh, what if we type in sync? There we go. So what I'm looking for is storage sync services. Can we type it up here, sync? Yeah, so that would have been the way I would have gone gone, gone and uh, found it there. But we need to find uh, Azure Files. I'm just trying to remember how to get to there. So I could have swore we could type in File Sync. Yeah, here it is, Azure File Sync. And so this is how we get to it. I know it's quite a, let me just double check to make sure if that's somewhat, if we could actually type that up here, File Sync. No, 
Okay, so what we would want to do is go ahead and uh, create this. If we want to take a look, we can check the plans. This seems okay. So we'll go ahead and hit create. And under here, we're gonna put it into Kivos. And then for the provider name, it will be the storage sync service name will just be Kivos as well. Um, and I guess we'll stick with central US. I guess it just really depends on where our virtual machine storage account is. I hope everything's launching in the same place. I don't think it matters, but I'm just gonna double check here. So this one is in Canada East. And then our storage account, let's just go take a look where it is. It is in um, Canada East. So maybe we could launch this in Canada East. If it doesn't give us any grief, it doesn't. So that's great. We'll go ahead and hit create. And we'll give that a little bit of time there. And if our instance is ready, we should go ahead and connect to it because there's gonna be a couple things we need to install, okay? So I'm gonna go over to RDP here and we're going to uh, download the RTP file, and that's gonna open up that. So we'll just double click it. We'll say connect. If you're on a Mac, you gotta download the client. If you're on Windows, it's already, it should be pre-installed. If, you, if you're on a Chromebook, you'll have to use a Bastion, but I'm gonna type in Azure user, and that password capital T, testing one, two, three, four, five, six. We'll hit okay. I'll say yes, I'll connect. And we'll just give it a moment there to load. We are gonna need uh, two things we need to install, but just give me a moment here and I'll go fetch them. All right, so now that we uh, have our Windows machine, we're uh, inside of it here, what I want you to do is open up um, uh, PowerShell. So if you type in PowerShell, we do need to run this in administrator mode. So just type it in. It's a little bit slow when you're RDPing, which is totally fine. And what I want you to do is right click and run as an administrator. Uh, and what we're going to do is install Azure RM because we need it in order to use um, the Azure File Sync agent, okay? So type in install hyphen module, and then uh, type in name, Azure RM, and then we'll say allow clobber. Don't ask me what clobber does, I have no idea, <laughs> but that's what Microsoft or Azure tells us that we should, uh, whoops, uh, did I spell it right? No, it's all correct, okay, that we should do. This thing is pretty darn slow, so uh, we'll just have to wait here a little while. Um, and once that's done, we'll continue on to the next part, okay? Okay, so after waiting a little bit, it asks us a question. So we're just gonna hit Y to everything. All right, and uh, as that's going here, um, it, it can take a little bit of time. So what I'm gonna do, if I can even minimize this here, um, and I did not mean to uh, minimize Azure uh, or this here. Oh, the other one already prompted. That was pretty fast, actually. It's going really fast as of today. Um, but as that's going, um, what we'll do is we'll make our way back over uh, to sync storage here, because or storage sync, we were waiting for this to get set up uh, because we're gonna have to go uh, set up a sync group. So I'm gonna just call this uh, Kivos, make everything easy. We'll stick with that Azure subscription. We'll drop this down and we'll choose Kivos in here. Uh, and then for the Azure file share, we'll choose Kivos. And once that's created, we'll click into that. And what we are trying to do is we're adding a cloud uh, endpoint here. So we would choose our storage account and we would choose uh, this here and hit create. Okay, and so now we have a cloud endpoint, but we still have to uh, continue on with our, uh, our virtual machine here. So just wait until this is done. This will take a little bit of time, okay? All right, so now that uh, we, um, uh, we have uh, that installed, the, the PowerShell for uh, Resource Manager. What we're gonna need installed is, is the Azure File Sync Agent. In order to do that, we're gonna have to go to the internet. But before we do that, we really want to uh, uh, turn off a particular feature. Um, so turn back on protected mode. I was <laughs> fiddling with it earlier, but if we were to go, and it doesn't matter where we go, we say Azure File uh, Sync Agent, okay? And if we were to go see, we started getting this pop up and drives us crazy. So what we can do, because this isn't a big deal, it's just for uh, testing here, we're gonna turn that off. So um, go to your local server and where it says IE Enhanced Security Configuration, click on that and just turn it off, you know, cause it'll drive you crazy. And then we'll go back to Inner Explorer, completely close it, reopen it. And now uh, what we can do is look for that Azure File Sync. So we'll type in Azure File Sync uh, Agent Download. And that's just azuremicrosoft.com, maybe later for that experience. It's easier if you go to the Microsoft site, 
And uh, if you go here, just give it a moment, scroll on down, click on the download button. And we want uh, 2019 because that's the server we launched, right? And, that's, and we're trying to uh, sync with storage sync. So we'll go ahead and hit next. This is 50 megabytes, so it shouldn't take too long. Um, and we're going to wait for it to download. If it doesn't, uh, well, we'll say allow once for the site here. So maybe it was trying to download. Yeah, but there it goes. And we will save it. And we will always allow for Microsoft here. It's totally fine. And it's already finished downloading. So we'll go ahead and run that. And just give it a moment here. We'll hit next. We'll accept the terms. Uh, we'll install it there. That's totally fine. We'll use the existing proxy uh, configuration. Uh, custom configure proxy. Well, we don't have any custom, so we'll leave it alone. We'll leave Microsoft updates on. Uh, it'd probably be good to checkbox that on, but I'm just going to go install next here. All right, and so we'll let the agent install. Usually doesn't take too long. Anyway, I'll see you back here in a moment. All right, so now that we have our storage sync agent set up, we'll just hit finish here. Uh, and I don't know why it <laughs> opened a bunch of windows, but that's just what it does. And so we're just gonna wait for it to pop back up here. And then we'll say, okay. And then what it'll wanna do is connect. So it says Azure environment. Uh, so it is Azure cloud, right? And I'm just going to sign into my account and I'm going to try and log in here. So let me just go grab my credentials. All right, so I entered my credentials in here. So we'll go ahead and, ahead and hit sign in and we'll give it a moment there. We're gonna choose our subscription. We will choose our resource group, which is Keyboss and our storage sync there. Hit register. And I'll see you back here in a moment. All right, so it looks like our registration was successful. So that means that we should be able to create a server endpoint uh, and go from there, okay? So I'm gonna just go ahead and hit close and uh, I'll come back here to you in a moment. All right, so now what we're gonna do is set up a folder for uh, that, we're, that we're going to want to uh, uh, be synced, okay? Because the idea is to back up or sync that directory there. So uh, what's gonna happen here is we're gonna make our way down to uh, File Explorer and from this PC, I'm just gonna go to the C drive. I made that other drive because I assumed we were just gonna throw it on there, but honestly, I'm just gonna put it in the window or the C drive here. We'll make a new folder called Kivas. We'll make it all lowercase. And inside of here, I'm just gonna make a new file here called hello.txt. Nothing super exciting. Um, and so uh, probably we need to turn on sharing. So that's just a habit of mine. So we'll go to properties here, sharing, share, and we'll just make sure that Azure, Azure user has both that. And it'll ask us to turn network discovery on. We'll say, okay, Kivas, Kivas, okay. I can't remember if we have to turn that on or not, but <laughs> uh, you know, as long as we get this working, that's the most important part here. So now that we have that going, what we want to do is make our way back to um, Azure here. And so we had our, uh, what was the sync? Sync storages. And what we'll need to do is go into our sync storage once it ever lets us uh, get there. We'll click on key boss and we'll go into sync groups. We'll click into our key boss sync group. We have a cloud endpoint, but we'll need to create an add server endpoint. Drop down here, we have a registered server. So you know how we typed in our, we typed in, we typed in our, we at, logged into the uh, Azure File Sync agent. That's how this registered server is showing up. We're gonna give it a path. So this is gonna be C backslash key boss, right? Um, so this all looks okay. And what we'll do is we will say, oh, let's just check this here. This is all okay. And we'll go ahead and hit uh, connect. All right. And so this takes a little bit of time to provision. It's gonna show up here in a moment. If I hit, hit refresh, it's provisioning. So I'll see you back here in a bit. You know, I just remembered is that uh, we do actually have to turn on cloud tiering or it's gonna stay in pending forever. So I'm gonna to go to enable here and uh, always preserve specific percentage of free space and the volume. Uh, sure, we can do 20% here. We don't need a date policy here. And this all looks okay. So we'll go ahead and hit save. Uh, because if we don't do that, it's not gonna actually, <laughs> it's not gonna move it to the cloud, right? So we'll give that a go. Oh, the health is good. Um, and But we'll just give it a moment here, okay? 
So we gave it a little bit of time here. It says the endpoint failed, which I really don't believe it because I just checked and it was working totally fine. But what I want to do is show you if I go over to Microsoft Azure here and we go over to uh, storage accounts and we go to Kivos and we go into file shares and we click into this one, we can actually see the files here. So it clearly is syncing. Uh, I'm not sure why we got that error. I've never seen that error before. Uh, Cloud Turing is not supported for the specified path. Well, that's fine. Okay, so if the server path didn't work, maybe it's the cloud, cloud endpoint, but generally that is the workflow to uh, get uh, syncing working. So you pretty much have all the working knowledge you need. Um, but uh, what we'll do is go ahead and tear all this stuff down because we are 100% done. So I'm gonna go to our resource groups here. And uh, what we'll do is go into Kivas and we'll just make sure that everything is there. Even the storage sync service, I just wanted to make sure it was all there. And what we'll do is go ahead and write in Kivas and go ahead and delete. And that should take everything down, no problem. All right, so there you go. All right, so just one more thing. Uh, I was doing that cleanup and then uh, today I woke up the next morning and when I checked my resource groups, the Kivas was still here. So I went in here and we still had uh, the storage sync service. So what you're gonna wanna do is go in here and I think what it wants you to do, it'll actually tell us the message here if we go delete resource group. We type in key boss. And uh, it will complain that uh, it still need you have to get rid of the um, of the resources within it. So I already know that's going to uh, fail. Um, but what it wants you to do is delete the sync group, eh? So if you select the sync group here and go ahead and delete that. We might also have to delete the endpoints first. Usually, uh, usually Azure is really great about tearing everything down, but in this case, uh, it's not giving us a lot of help here. So we'll just say, um, yeah, we wanna delete this endpoint too. Let's delete all the server endpoints. So you gotta first delete the server endpoints to delete the cloud endpoint, to delete the group, then to delete the actual uh, service. So it's a little bit, um, convoluted, but uh, you know, I, I guess for whatever reason, this one is not uh, automated like the other one. So just go through those processes, make sure that you get everything deleted out okay. Um, and then you should be in good shape, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, And in this section, we'll be covering the core backup and disaster recovery solutions in Azure, starting with Azure Site Recovery. Azure Site Recovery is a hybrid backup solution that facilitates site-to-site -site recovery from on-premises to the cloud. ASR is a critical component for your business continuity and disaster recovery strategy. Site Recovery replicates workloads from a primary site to a secondary site. In the event the primary site encounters a failure, Site Recovery will fail over to the secondary site to ensure continuity of services. Azure Site Recovery can replicate Azure VMs between different regions, also known as cross-region replication. Various OS, such as Windows and Linux, on-premises to Azure seamlessly transition from your local servers to the cloud. Between other cloud service providers, such as Oz to Azure, different machines, including VMware, Hyper-V, or physical machines. Recovery time objectives. This is the amount of time your business can afford to have its systems unavailable or offline before it significantly impacts your business. Recovery point objectives. This is the maximum amount of data loss your business can tolerate measured in time before a disaster occurs. This overview highlights Azure Site Recovery, a key tool for protecting business operations against unexpected disruptions. The next topic we'll be covering is recovery solution for Azure Site Recovery. A recovery solution for Azure, hybrid, and on-premises workloads should be designed to meet specific recovery objectives, including recovery time objective, recovery point objective, and recovery level objective. Recovery time objective, RTO, is the maximum amount of time that an application can be down before it starts causing significant business disruption. A recovery solution should be able to restore the system and data within the specified RTO timeframe. For example, if the RTO is one hour, then the recovery solution should be able to restore the system and data within one hour of an outage. Recovery point objective, RPO, is the amount of data loss that is acceptable after an outage. The recovery solution should be able to restore the system and data to the required RPO level. For example, if the RPO is one hour, then the recovery solution should be able to restore the data to the most recent point in time within one hour of the outage. 
recovery level objective. RLO is the level of recovery that is required after an outage. The RLO can vary depending on the type of data or application being recovered. A recovery solution should be able to restore the data or application to the required RLO level. For example, if the RLO requires a point in time restore, the recovery solution should be able to restore the data to the specific point in time. When recommending a recovery solution for Azure, hybrid, and on-premises workloads, the following factors should be considered. Business requirements, the recovery solution should align with the business requirements, including the RTO, RLO, and RPO objectives. These objectives should be identified during the planning phase. Workload types, different types of workloads may have different RTO, RLO, and RPO requirements. The recovery solution should be able to accommodate the requirements of each workload type. Hybrid or on-premises, the recovery solution should be able to handle hybrid or on-premises workloads depending on the specific requirements of the organization. Data protection, the recovery solution should provide data protection, including backups and replication, to ensure that the data can be recovered in case of an outage. Testing, the recovery solution should be tested regularly to ensure that it meets the RTO, RLO, and RPO objectives. Testing should be conducted in a controlled environment to avoid any negative impact on production systems. By considering these factors, you can enhance your Azure Site recovery solutions, ensuring swift and efficient data recovery to maintain business continuity. In this section, we're going to explore an example of Azure Site recovery architecture. This disaster recovery solution utilizes Azure Site Recovery alongside other managed services like Traffic Manager and Virtual Network. This combination provides a cost-effective and high-availability environment suitable for small to medium businesses. This allows companies to focus more on their core solutions, benefiting various industries including healthcare, travel and hospitality, and manufacturing. For example, it can be used in portable healthcare clinics, restaurant chains, and local logistics and supply chains. Here is a breakdown of the architecture. Traffic Manager, this Azure service routes DNS traffic, enabling easy redirection from one site to another based on policies set by your organization. Azure Site Recovery, this service handles the orchestration of machine replication and manages the setup of failback procedures. Virtual Network, this is the location where the failover site is established when a disaster happens. Blob Storage, this is where the replica images of all machines protected by Site Recovery are stored. So that's an overview of the example Azure Site Recovery architecture shown. The next topic we'll be covering is the Azure Backup Service, another crucial tool for backup and disaster recovery solutions. Azure Backup Service is a cloud solution from Microsoft that offers secure, scalable, and simple data backup and recovery across various Azure services. You won't find it by searching based on the service name. However, Azure Backup is seamlessly integrated within numerous Azure services, making its operation quite intuitive. The five core components of Azure Backup. Mars Agent helps in backing up files, folders, and system state data from on-premises machines and Azure VMs to a backup recovery services vault in Azure. Recovery Services Vault manages and organizes your backups in a cost-effective, secure, and scalable manner. Azure Backup Server, MBS, used to back up on-premises data to Azure for hybrid protection. VM extension allows the backup of Azure VMs without the need to deploy any additional agents. Backup policy defines when and how your data is backed up. What can be backed up? On-premises, Azure VMs, Azure Managed Disks, Azure File Shares, SQL Server, SAP HANA databases, Azure Database for PostgreSQL servers, and Azure Blobs. Why use Azure Backup? Offload on-premises backups, safeguard your data by moving backups to Azure. Backup Azure iOS VMs, ensure your Azure VM data is protected. Scale easily, adjust your backup storage size based on your needs. Get unlimited data transfer, no limits or charges for data transfer. Keep data secure, ensure your data is secure both at rest and in transit. Centralize monitoring and management, have a unified view and manage your backups easily. App consistent backups, restore applications back to a precise state. Automatic storage management, no need to manage backup storage explicitly. Multiple storage options, choose between different storage options based on your needs. So that's an overview of Azure Backup Service. The next topic we'll be covering is Azure Recovery Services Vault. Azure Recovery Services Vault is a storage entity in Azure that stores backup copies of data and configuration information over time. This data can be related to various Azure resources like virtual machines, workloads, servers, or workstations. 
backup for Azure services, Ars Vault protects data from various Azure services, including iOS VMs, Azure SQL databases, Azure Blob Storage, Azure File Shares, and Azure Functions. Recovery Services Vault supports various platforms, including System Center Data Protection Manager, Windows Server, integrates with Azure Backup Server for application protection, and other platforms. Recovery Services Vault has the following features. Enhanced security, Azure Recovery Services Vault encrypts data in transit and at rest for secure backup and restore processes. Central monitoring, the Azure portal allows centralized monitoring of all backup and restore tasks across hybrid environments. Azure Role-Based Access Control, Azure RBAC enables granular access control and management of recovery services vaults. Soft Delete, this feature retains backup data for an additional 14 days after deletion, protecting against accidental or malicious data loss. Cross-Region Restore, CRR enables data restoration in a secondary region during a disaster in the primary region, ensuring business continuity. So that's an overview of Azure Recovery Services Vault. Next, let's explore the Microsoft Azure Recovery Services Agent. The Mars Agent plays an important role in backing up files, folders, and the system state from Windows based on premises machines and Azure VMs. All backups facilitated by the Mars Agent are securely stored in a Recovery Services Vault in Azure. Mars Agent is also known as the Azure Backup Agent. Note that the Mars Agent does not support Linux operating systems. To get started with utilizing the Mars Agent for backup purposes, follow these steps. Create an Azure Recovery Services Vault. This vault will store all the backups. Create a backup policy within the vault. Set the terms and conditions for backups, ensuring they align with your requirements. Configure Secure Rub for backup. Depending on your security and performance needs, you might opt for pathways like express routes or private endpoints. Download the Mars Agent. Download the agent from Azure. Install and register the agent to your Windows machine. Once installed, register it for activation and functionality. Overall, the Mars Agent streamlines the backup process for Windows-based systems, ensuring that data is both safely stored in Azure and swiftly recoverable when needed. Next, let's explore the Azure Backup Policy. Azure Backup Policy allows users to define and configure how data backups are managed on the Azure platform. It lets you set the frequency, retention duration, and type of backups to ensure data protection and meet organizational requirements. Creating a backup policy in Azure involves a few essential steps. Select a data source type. Choose the type of data you want to backup, such as Azure Virtual Machines or PostgreSQL database. Determine the frequency. Decide how often you want the backups to occur. This could be daily, weekly, or any other frequency that suits your needs. Set the retention details. Determine how many snapshots or backup copies you wish to retain and for how long. Choose the time range for retention. Specify the time range during which you want to retain the backups. This setting helps in managing the lifecycle of the backup data efficiently. In summary, Azure Backup Policy allows you to set customized backup and retention settings for reliable and consistent data protection. The next topic we'll be covering is Azure VM Backup. Azure VM Backup is a solution for backing up and restoring virtual machines running on Azure. It allows organizations to protect their virtual machines and their data against various issues such as accidental deletion, hardware failure, ransomware, and other forms of data loss. How it works? Azure VM Backup utilizes Azure Backup to offer a centralized backup solution manageable through the Azure portal, PowerShell, or REST APIs. It supports both Windows and Linux virtual machines, allowing for backup and restore operations at both the disk and VM levels. Multiple backup options are available, including full backups, incremental backups, and differential backups. Backup retention policies enable organizations to retain backups for specified durations, enhancing data management and compliance. Key features. The solution employs the robust infrastructure of Azure Backup, ensuring encryption at rest and support for backing up VMs across different regions and availability zones. The integration with Recovery Services Vaults further strengthens the protection and management of backup data. Disaster Recovery Beyond Backup, Azure VM Backup bolsters disaster recovery strategies by enabling the replication of virtual machines to a secondary region. This redundancy is vital in mitigating the impact of outages or disasters. Organizations can seamlessly fail over and fail back virtual machines, ensuring minimal downtime and enhanced business continuity. In conclusion, Azure VM Backup stands out as a resilient and dependable backup and recovery solution for Azure hosted virtual machines. <laughs> 
Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and in this follow along, we're gonna be looking at backup solutions for Azure. So let's make our way all the way to the top here and launch ourselves a virtual machine that we are going to be using uh, as a means to backup. So what I'll do is create a new group here, um, and we will call it Picard, uh, and we'll call this virtual machine Picard. And scrolling on down here, uh, yeah, I want to stick with a Windows Server 2019 Gen 2. So go over here, select it uh, as Generation 2 there. And for the machine, you want to make sure it's a B2S because you need at least a two VPCUs and four gigabytes of RAM to launch a Windows uh, Server there. For the user, it's going to be Azure User. For the password, capital T, testing one two three four five six. Capital T, testing one two three four five six. Uh, we'll have RDP. Uh, I'm not sure if we'll end up using it, uh, but if we do, we have that open. We'll go ahead and go to the review page, wait for it to allow us to hit create, give it a moment. Great, we'll hit create. And then we'll give it a moment to see that it is deploying. And if it's deploying, I'll see you back here in a moment. Great, so it looks like our virtual machine is ready to go here. So what we'll do is go all the way to the top here and type in backups. We go to vaults directly, but let's take a look here at the backup center uh, where we can kind of have a, a bit of an overview of stuff. So the idea is we have vaults where we're gonna store our backups. We can create backup jobs, backup policies. So let's get to it and, and first create ourselves a vault. So we'll go ahead here and create ourselves a new vault. And we have two options. We have recovery services vault or a backup vault. So uh, the difference here is that one is just for backing up things like databases, disks, and et cetera, where recovery services is more like a, like a site-wide recovery. So you're gonna notice it includes virtual machines and all these other stuff. Uh, generally, you'll probably want to go with recovery services vault because it is just basically a new version of the backup vault. So let's go ahead and do that. And uh, we'll place this in our uh, Picard um, uh, resource group there. And we'll just say Picard backup or vault, <laughs> vault, there we go. And we'll go ahead and hit review and create and we'll go and hit create there. And we'll just give it a moment there to deploy. All right, so our recovery services vault is ready and we'll go ahead and click backup and down below it'll ask us what kind we are running. So we have Azure stack and on-premise. It's just Azure and we have a virtual machine. So we'll go ahead and hit uh, backup and notice that we'll have to set up a backup policy and here we have a default one, but let's actually go make a new one so we can kind of learn some of the settings that we can set. So we can say the frequency, the time, etc. Probably want to set this to my time zone. So I'm in Toronto, if I can find it here which I believe is negative uh, five. I was trying to type to see if I could do that, but I wasn't uh, getting uh, getting there too well. Um, we'll just say Central Canada there, that's okay. It's off by an hour, but that's close enough. Um, and you can have weekly, monthly, and yearly backups, but we're gonna just stick with the daily backup for 30 days. Um, and this is okay, we don't have to enter that in. We'll hit all right, okay. And now we can add our virtual machine. So we'll go here and select Picard, hit OK, enable backups. Please select at least one that has backups enabled. So what we'll do is open up our Azure tab here, make our way over to our virtual machine, and just make sure that that stuff is enabled. So we'll go over here um, and we'll go to backups. And here we can actually even set it from here. So I guess we'll select our existing vault here. It will say enable backups. But that set it up with a default one, right? So I'm a bit surprised we couldn't do it that way, but we'll make our way back here. As long as it works. <laughs> That's the thing with Azure. It's just, you know, you'll do something and then you'll find that uh, you have to do it slightly different. Uh, but we'll just, we'll just wait until that's done there. So after waiting a very short while, uh, it looks like our backups are turned on. So if we were to go to our overview and go to backups, we can see we have one backed up item. If we go over to our backup items, we'll see under virtual machines, we have the card. Um, we did set the default policy. So I guess if we wanted to switch that out, we probably could if we just go back and let's just go create a policy of our own just so that we are familiar with that there. Um, and we'll say an Azure virtual machine one. So my special policy. Okay, and um, this is for 180 days. We can go ahead and hit create. And once that policy is deployed, we'll be able to associate. I can't remember if this will be super fast, but we'll give it a moment here. Yep, it is super fast. And then once uh, we have that policy, we can go into it and then start assigning things to it. 
I actually, I think when I made the lecture content, I don't even remember there being a backup center. So to me, this is all a little bit new. Um, so maybe I'll go back and up to the slides because I, I usually say there is no centralized service, but they have one now. So um, that's uh, pretty darn good. Um, so for associated items, we don't fetching data for services completed. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out how we can change that policy there. If we go to backups, maybe we can just change it over here. Uh, I'm not sure how to switch out the policy, but I know at least if we want to do a backup now, we just press that there. It's really not that important to know how to swap out a policy. It's just more so the fact that you know what a backup policy is and you can apply it to machines and things like that. Yeah, so there we go. We just uh, had our own backup there. And uh, yeah, there's not much more else here to look at, but uh, yeah, there you go. So that's backup policies. So I guess what we'll do is go ahead and tear all this down. And so that was our book card there. We'll go ahead and delete this resource group. And there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. In this section, we're diving into an introduction to Azure Kubernetes Service or AKS. Azure Kubernetes Service simplifies the process of deploying a managed Kubernetes cluster in Azure. One of the main benefits of using a KS is that Azure will take over the management of the Kubernetes master nodes for you, including health monitoring and routine maintenance. Your responsibility lies only in maintaining the agent nodes. An additional benefit is the cost-effectiveness of a KS. The service itself is free. You only incur charges for the agent nodes within the cluster, not the masters. When you deploy in a KS cluster, both the Kubernetes master and all nodes are deployed and configured for you. During the deployment process, you can also configure additional features such as advanced networking, Azure Active Directory integration to use Kubernetes role-based access control, monitoring capabilities, and Windows Server containers are supported in a KS. So when should one opt for a KS? Well, a KS is ideal in scenarios where you need full container orchestration. This includes situations demanding seamless service discovery across multiple containers, automatic scalability to handle varying loads, and coordinated and smooth application upgrades. In summary, a KS offers a streamlined, managed solution for container orchestration in Azure, simplifying the setup and maintenance of a Kubernetes cluster. <laughs> The next topic we'll be covering is called Bridge to Kubernetes. Bridge to Kubernetes is an extension available for both Visual Studio and Visual Studio code that allows developers to write, test, and debug microservice code directly on their local development workstations. With Bridge to Kubernetes, you can integrate a service running locally with your AKS cluster. This bypasses the need to create Docker and Kubernetes configurations. For the lifetime of this connection, a proxy is added to your cluster in place of your Kubernetes deployment that redirects requests to the service to your development computer. When you disconnect, the application deployment will revert to using the original version of the deployment running on the cluster. It's important to note that Azure Dev Spaces will be retired on October 31st, 2023. Existing users are encouraged to transition to using Bridge to Kubernetes as their client development tool, ensuring a streamlined and integrated development experience on their local machines while interacting with the KS clusters. So that's a brief overview Bridge to Kubernetes, a very useful tool to streamline development and debugging for developers. <laughs> The next topic we'll be covering are the recovery solutions for Azure Kubernetes Service. Best practices for business continuity and disaster recovery in Azure Kubernetes Service. Use multiple availability zones. Azure AKS supports multiple availability zones, which distribute your application across different data centers. This ensures high availability and resiliency in the event of a data center failure. When you create a new AKS cluster, you can choose to create it across multiple availability zones. Implement backup and restore. Backing up your AKS cluster ensures that you have a copy of your application and data in case of data loss or corruption. Azure AKS supports backing up your application data and Kubernetes resources, such as deployments and services, using the Valero Backup and Restore tool. Use Azure Site Recovery. Azure Site Recovery is a disaster recovery solution that replicates your AKS cluster to a secondary location. This can be useful in the event of a disaster or outage, as you can fail over to the secondary location and resume operations. 
for monitor your AKS cluster, it is important to monitor your AKS cluster for any potential issues or failures. Azure provides a range of monitoring and alerting solutions, such as Azure Monitor and Azure Service Health, which can help you proactively detect and respond to issues. 5. Test your disaster recovery plan. To ensure that your disaster recovery plan is effective, it is important to test it regularly. You can use tools like Azure Site Recovery to perform failover tests and ensure that your AKS cluster can be recovered in the event of a disaster. 6. Use Azure Kubernetes Service with Azure Arc. Azure Arc enables you to manage your AKS cluster and other Kubernetes clusters across multiple clouds and on-premises environments from a single control plane. This provides greater flexibility and resilience in the event of a disaster or outage. By following these best practices, you can ensure that your Azure Kubernetes Service cluster is resilient, highly available, and recoverable in the event of a disaster or outage. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and in this section, we'll be covering Azure Regions and Availability Zones, starting with Azure Regions. Azure Regions are physical locations around the world where Microsoft has data centers to provide cloud services. Each region is composed of multiple data centers that are geographically dispersed to provide redundancy, resilience, and high availability to customers. Key facts about Azure Regions. Multiple data centers, each region is made up of at least one data center, but many regions have multiple data centers for added redundancy and availability. Global presence, Azure regions are distributed around the world, covering almost every major continent and country. Unique identifiers, each Azure region is designated by a distinct name, such as East US or West Europe, which indicates its geographical location. Resource deployment. When creating resources in Azure, you can choose which region to deploy them to based on factors such as proximity to users, data sovereignty requirements, and service availability. Data residency. Data in a region stays within that region unless explicitly copied or replicated to another region for redundancy or disaster recovery purposes. Continuous expansion. Microsoft continually expands its Azure footprint, adding new regions to cater to emerging markets and customer needs. In essence, Azure regions are the cornerstone of Azure's global infrastructure, guaranteeing high availability, redundancy, and adherence to regional data norms. The next topic we'll be covering are Azure Availability Zones. Azure Availability Zones are physical data center locations within an Azure region that are typically located in separate buildings or regions, but still close enough to provide low latency network connectivity, these zones help protect applications and data from data center level failures by providing redundant power, cooling, and networking. An Azure region is a geographic location that contains one or more data centers. An availability zone is a unique physical location within an Azure region. Key points of Azure availability zones. Each availability zone is composed of one or more data centers with independent power, cooling, and networking. Each data center within an availability zone is connected through a high-speed, low-latency network. Availability zones are designed to provide high availability for critical applications by distributing them across different zones. By deploying applications across multiple zones, it is possible to achieve a higher level of redundancy and fault tolerance. Virtual machines, storage accounts, and other Azure resources can be deployed to specific availability zones within a region to ensure high availability. Azure Traffic Manager can be used to route traffic between different zones based on various criteria such as geographic location, latency, and performance. So that's an overview of Azure Availability Zones. The next topic we'll be covering are the availability options for Azure Virtual Machines. While we've briefly mentioned these terms in the past, we'll now explore them in detail, specifically in the context of VMs. Azure Virtual Machines provide several options for achieving high availability and ensuring business continuity. Here are the primary strategies. Availability sets. An availability set is a logical grouping that informs Azure about application redundancy and availability requirements. Ideally, to ensure high availability and meet Azure's 99.95% .95 SLA, place at least two VMs within an availability set. There are no charges for the availability set itself. Costs arise only for the individual VM instances created within. Virtual machine scale sets. These sets enable the automatic deployment and scalability of identical VMs. VMs can auto-adjust their capacity as per demand, facilitating auto-scaling for applications. VM scale sets are built to integrate with Azure Load Balancer and Application Gateway, ensuring traffic is evenly distributed across VM instances. VM distribution across fault domains and update domains further fortifies high availability. Azure Site Recovery This service delivers disaster recovery capabilities for VMs. 
it facilitates VM replication to a secondary location, which could be another Azure region, a different data center, or an on-premises site. Both physical servers and virtual ones, including those on Hyper-V and VMware, can be replicated using Site Recovery, Azure Backup. Azure Backup offers backup solutions for VMs, their applications, and data. You can back up to the cloud, ensuring backups are application consistent, meaning they're usable and can be restored as needed. These backups can either be retained in the originating region or transferred to another for disaster recovery. Additionally, Azure Backup provides extensive retention periods and backup archiving, aligning with regulatory compliance needs. Overall, these are the main options for availability options for Azure Virtual Machines. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and in this section, we'll be going over Azure Virtual Machines. Azure Virtual Machines offer a highly configurable server experience. Through virtualization, you can run a server without the hassles and expenses of maintaining physical hardware. However, it's important to note that VMs are not entirely maintenance-free. They still require OS patch applications and package installations and configurations. Key points about Azure VMs. Configuration and size. The size of the VM is determined by its image. This image defines the combination of vCPUs, memory, and storage capacity. Subscription limits. As of now, there's a limit of 20 VMs per region on a per subscription basis. Billing. Azure VMs are billed at an hourly rate. Availability. A single instance VM offers 99.9% .9 availability when all its storage disks are of premium quality. To achieve a 99.95% availability, deploy two instances in an availability set. Storage. You can attach multiple managed disks to your Azure VMs. Networking components. When you launch an Azure Virtual Machine, other networking components will be either created or associated to your virtual machine, including Network Security Group, a virtual firewall with rules concerning ports and protocols. This is attached to the NIC. Network Interface, a device that handles IP protocols and network communication. Virtual Machine Instance, the actual server that's running. Public IP Address, the address that you will use publicly access your VM. Virtual network, the network in which your VM is located. Overall, Azure Virtual Machines offer a versatile and strong cloud computing space, allowing easy and seamless deployment of robust applications and systems. The next topic we'll be covering are operation systems in Azure VMs. So, what is an operation system? Well, I'm sure you already know this, but the OS is the program that manages all other programs in a computer. The most commonly known operation systems are Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. When you launch a virtual machine, you need to choose an image which has a specific operation system. Microsoft works closely with partners to ensure the images available are updated and optimized for an Azure runtime. You can find most of these images in the Azure Marketplace, including SUSE Linux Enterprise Server, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, Ubuntu Server, Debian, FreeBSD, Azure Marketplace, Flatcar Container Linux, Rancher OS, Bitnami Library for Azure, Mesosphere DC OS on Azure, Docker Images, CloudBees Jenkins Platform. If the available options do not meet your requirements, you can bring your own Linux by creating a Linux virtual hard disk. Note that in Azure, only the fixed VHD format is supported, not the Hyper-V virtual hard disk format. So, that's an overview of the operating systems in Azure VMs. The next topic we'll be covering are the sizes of Azure VMs. Azure VMs come in a variety of sizes that are also optimized for specific use cases. Azure VMs are grouped into types, such as general purposes and compute optimized, and sizes, such as B and DSV3, also called series or SKU family. General Purpose Balanced, CPU to Memory Ratio, Testing and Development, Small to Medium Databases, and Low to Medium Traffic Web Servers, SKUs, B, DSV3, DV3, DAS4, DAV4, DSV2, and so on. Compute Optimized, High CPU to Memory Ratio, Good for Medium Traffic Web Servers, Network Appliances, Batch Processes, and App Servers, SKUs, F, FS, FSV2. Memory optimized, high memory to CPU ratio, best for relational database servers, medium to large caches, and in memory analytics. SKUs, S3, F3, ES4, E4, F4, S4, and so on. Storage optimized, offers high disk throughput and I.O., ideal for big data, SQL, and OSQL databases, data warehousing, and large transactional databases. SKUs, LSV2. 
GPU, specialized VMs for heavy graphic rendering and video editing, model training and inferencing with deep learning, available with single or multiple GPUs, SKUs, NC, NCV2, NCV3, and CAS T4 V3, ND, and so on. High Performance Compute features the fastest and most powerful CPU virtual machines with optional high throughput network interfaces, SKUs, HB, HBV2, HC, H. There are previous series of virtual machine sizes not shown here like Basic A. The type of image may limit you to specific VM sizes. Use Azure sorting and filtering options to explore sizes based on various parameters such as cost. Azure Compute Unit provides a way of comparing compute performance across Azure SKUs. ACU is standardized on a small VM, assigned a value of 100. All other SKUs then represent approximately how much faster that SKU can run a standard benchmark. Let's break down the provided information. A1, A4 SKU family. A CU, VCPU, 100. ACU stands for Azure Compute Unit, which is a measure of the relative computational performance of different Azure SKUs. In this family, each virtual CPU is rated at 100 ACUs. VCPU, core 1 to 1. This means for every virtual CPU you allocate, it corresponds to one physical core. D1, D14 SKU family. SCU, VCPU, ranges between 160 to 250. This indicates that VMs in this family have a higher computational performance per VCPU compared to the A series. VCPU, core 1 to 1. Similar to the A series, each virtual CPU corresponds to one physical core. In summary, knowing Azure VM sizes helps pick the best option for your needs, ensuring efficiency and cost effectiveness. The upcoming topic explores Hyper-V, focusing on the distinctions between Generation 1 and Generation 2. Hyper-V is a hardware virtualization product from Microsoft, enabling the creation and management of virtual machines. Each VM functions as a separate computer equipped with its own operating system and software applications. In many ways, Hyper-V mirrors the functionalities of VirtualBox. There are two generations of Hyper-V VMs. Generation 1 supports a wide range of guest operating systems. Generation 2 primarily supports 64-bit versions of Windows alongside more recent versions of Linux and FreeBSD operating systems. Azure offers both Generation 1 and Generation 2 VMs, aligning with Hyper-V in structure but bearing distinct characteristics. Key differences between Azure Gen 1 and Gen 2 Gen 1, based on BIOS architecture. Gen 2, utilizes UEFI-based boot architecture, enhancing boot and installation times. Only Gen 2 VMs employ secure boot, ensuring the bootloader is authenticated by a trustworthy source. Gen 2 VMs support a substantially larger boot volume of up to 64 terabytes. Hyper-V VMs are packaged as either VHD or VHDX files, consolidating their structural components for efficient management and deployment. In conclusion, understanding Hyper-V generations aids in optimizing virtualization and ensuring OS compatibility. The next topic we'll be covering is SSH, RDP, and Bastion. Azure Virtual Machines offer multiple methods to connect, including SSH, RDP, and Bastion. Let's dive into each. Secure Shell is a protocol to establish a secure connection between a client and server. This is used to remotely connect to your Azure VM via the terminal. SSH operates on port 22 via TCP. RSA key pairs are commonly used to authorize access. Remote Desktop Protocol is a proprietary protocol developed by Microsoft which provides a user with a graphical interface to connect to another computer over a network connection. This is how you can remotely connect to Windows Server via virtual desktop. RDP operates on port 3389, utilizing both TCP and UDP. Bastion. Azure Bastion is a service you deploy that lets you connect to a virtual machine using your browser and the Azure portal. It provides secure and seamless RDP SSH connectivity to your virtual machines directly from the Azure portal over TLS. A Bastion is a hardened instance that is monitored. Users connect to this VM which then establishes a connection to the target instance, sometimes known as jump. So, to ensure optimized security and connectivity, it's important to understand these methods. We'll delve deeper into each in subsequent sections. Let's go into a bit more detail with SSH. Secure Shell, or SSH, is a cryptographic network protocol commonly employed to securely access and manage servers remotely. It is very common to use SSH key pairs as a means to authenticate to your VMs. SSH key pairs is when you generate out two keys. 
a private key. This is the key that remains confidential and should never be shared or exposed. It is stored securely on your local system and is used to initiate a connection to the VM. A public key. As the name suggests, this key can be shared publicly. It is added to the server's or VM's authorized keys list. How does SSH key authentication work? When you attempt to SSH into a server, your system uses the private key to send a cryptographic proof. The server, which has the corresponding public key, verifies the authenticity of the cryptographic proof. If the proof is verified, meaning the keys have matched, you're authenticated and granted access. Advantages of using SSH key pairs. Security, SSH keys provide a more secure method of authentication than traditional passwords. Without the correct private key, unauthorized access attempts are effectively thwarted. Convenience, once set up, users can connect without needing to remember and input a password each time. Automation, automated scripts and services can use key pairs to establish connections without human intervention. So that's a more in-depth look into SSH. Let's dive into the Remote Desktop Protocol, commonly known as RDP. RDP is a protocol developed by Microsoft that allows users to remotely connect to Windows systems. When you want to use RDP to access your Windows server, you'll first need to download the RDP file. For Windows 10 users, the Remote Desktop Client is pre-installed, so there's no additional software to download. However, if you're using Mac OS, you can easily get the Microsoft Remote Desktop app from the Apple Store. Once you've got the necessary tools, simply open the downloaded RDP file. During this process, you'll be prompted to enter the username and password that you set up during the creation of your VM on the Azure portal. RDP uses encryption to secure communications, ensuring confidentiality. It also supports features like audio redirection, clipboard sharing, and printer redirection for a seamless remote experience. In conclusion, RDP provides an efficient way to remotely access Windows systems. The next topic we'll be covering is Azure Bastion. Azure Bastion serves as a secure bridge, enabling you to connect to your server via SSH or RDP without exposing it to the public. It will provision a web-based interface for both RDP and SSH, eliminating the need for external clients. This can be especially useful for devices like Google Chromebooks, which might not support traditional RDP clients. When setting up Azure Bastion, you'll need to add a dedicated submit to your virtual network named Azure Bastion Submit. This submit should have at least a 27 size, equating to 32 addresses. If you have a Windows server which requires RDP and have a Bastion in the same VNet, you simply enter in your username and password as you normally would. If you have a Linux server, you can SSH with the Bastion. You can use SSH private key or password that you set when you created your VM. Key benefits. Single-click access, RDP and SSH sessions available directly through the Azure portal. Secure session, Azure Bastion offers RDP, SSH over TLS with support for TLS 1.2+. No public IP needed, RDP, SSH connects via the VM's private IP. Simplified NSG management, no need for NSGs on the Azure Bastion subnet, allows RDP, SSH solely from Azure Bastion. Managed Service Azure Bastion is a fully managed, secure platform for RDP SSH. Protection from scans VMs aren't exposed to the internet, preventing port scanning. Centralized hardening Bastion at the VNet perimeter eliminates individual VM hardening. So that's an overview of Azure Bastion. Let's take a look at a comparison between Windows versus Linux servers. Azure VMs offer the flexibility to run both Windows and Linux-based servers. Windows. Licensing. To run Windows, you'll need a valid license. If you don't activate it, certain features may be restricted. Azure does offer a way to leverage existing licenses through its hybrid benefit program. Authentication. Typically, you set up a username and password during the VM creation. Instance size. To smoothly operate Windows, you typically need a larger VM size, starting at least with a B2 due to its comprehensive desktop environment. Environment, Windows provides a full desktop environment, complete with a graphical user interface, making it more intuitive for those familiar with the Windows ecosystem. Linux, licensing, most Linux distributions are open source and don't require any licensing fees. Authentication, Linux offers flexible authentication. You can set up a username and password, or more commonly, use SSH key pairs for a more secure connection. Instance size, Linux servers, especially those without a graphical user interface, have minimal system requirements. This means you can run them on smaller VM sizes, conserving resources and cost. 
environment. Traditionally, Linux systems operate with a terminal-based environment, although there are distributions with graphical interfaces. Overall, your choice between Windows and Linux will largely depend on the specific needs of your project, familiarity with the operating system, licensing costs, and desired system resources. The next topic we'll be covering is update management in Azure. Update management allows you to manage and install operating system updates and patches for both Windows and Linux virtual machines that are deployed in Azure on premises or with other cloud providers. When you launch an Azure VM, you can go to Operations and turn on Guest Plus Host Updates. This will install the Microsoft Monitoring Agent that will be used to monitor your instances. Azure Automations is the underlying service that is installed the agent. Update Management will perform a scan for update compliance. By default, a compliance scan is performed every 12 hours on Windows and every 3 hours on Linux. It can take between 30 minutes and 6 hours for the dashboard to display updated data from managed computers. In Azure Automation, you can enable the update management, change tracking and inventory, and start or stop VMs during off-hours features for your servers and virtual machines. These features have a dependency on a log analytics workspace and therefore require linking the workspace with an automation account. So, Azure's update management offers a comprehensive solution for ensuring your virtual machines are always up to date with the latest patches and updates. All right, let's take a look at Azure Virtual Desktop, formerly known as Windows Virtual Desktop. Azure Virtual Desktop on Microsoft Azure is a desktop and app virtualization service that runs on the cloud. Azure Virtual Desktop works across devices like Windows, Mac, iOS, Android, and Linux with apps that you can use to access remote desktops and apps. You can use most modern browsers to access Azure Virtual Desktop hosted experiences. Use Azure Virtual Desktop for specific needs like when security is a concern because all data is saved on the server and cannot be left on the device of a user. Key features and benefits. Enable secure and productive remote work on any device. Azure Virtual Desktop provides full Windows 10 and Windows Server Desktop and application virtualization on any personal device. Seamless integration with Microsoft 365 apps for enterprise and Microsoft Teams. Reduce costs of licensing and infrastructure. Use eligible Windows or Microsoft 365 licenses to access Windows Virtual Desktop and pay only for what you use. Protect against outages to stay productive. Help keep your team running during outages by leveraging built-in Azure Site Recovery and Azure Backup Technologies. Simplify IT Management. Windows Virtual Desktop manages the virtual desktop infrastructure for you, so you can focus on users, apps, and OS images instead of hardware and maintenance. Keep application and user data secure. Easily apply the right access controls to users and devices with Azure Active Directory conditional access. So, that's an overview of Azure Virtual Desktop. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and we're going to be launching our own Bastion using Azure Bastion services. So there's two ways to set this up. We can go to Bastions over here uh, and create a Bastion this way, or we can create one uh, after we've created a virtual machine. I prefer the latter, so let's go ahead and do that and launch ourselves a new virtual machine. And so we could either use a, launch a Windows server or a Linux server. Today I'm going to be launching a Windows server. And uh, what we'll do is go down here. I'll make a new group. We'll call it the Enterprise. And uh, as we do that, we'll just name this uh, Enterprise D. And we'll launch that in Canada cent or US or <laughs> Central US. That's fine with me. Uh, 2019 Data Center Gen 2 is totally fine. If you go here, you're trying to find it, you go hit select and we'll choose Gen 2 data center. It is expensive, but uh, we're not gonna be using this for very long. Uh, for the username, I'm gonna put uh, data. And for the, well, we'll just make it Azure user to make our lives a bit easier. And then we'll put testing, capital T, one, two, three, four, five, six. Testing, one, two, three, four, five, six. And we will go down below. We're fine with the settings here. We're gonna go next to disk. We're gonna leave the disk to premium, that's fine. Uh, we'll let it create a new network, that's totally fine. Management is okay, and we'll just actually go hit review and create. And now we'll just hit create so that it will go ahead and do that. It'll tell us that it's in progress. And we'll just wait a little bit here. I'll see you back in a moment. 
All right, so our instance is ready. So let's go ahead and go to this resource here. And then on the left-hand side, you'll have connect. And so I'm gonna show you, and you don't, it's not necessary for you to do uh, this step because you're gonna, I'm gonna show you how to connect via the Bastion. But I'm gonna go ahead and download this file, the RDP file. And this will only work if you're on Windows, by the way. Well, I guess it'll work on Mac, but you'd have to install the, um, uh, the uh, RDP uh, service for that uses with Windows there. And so here, this is Azure user. We're gonna type in testing with a capital T, just double check that there. I'm gonna log in, make sure that this works. Uh, do, we'll do that one more time. Oh, you know, it's testing one, two, three, four, five, six. There we go. We'll say yes. And we'll just make sure that we can uh, remote desktop into this just before anything else. And there we go, so that's all good to me. I don't need to see any more. We'll go over to Bastion, we'll say use Bastion. And this is gonna set up a Bastion service. In order to use Bastion, you need to have another um, uh, address space uh, defined for it. It makes it really easy to uh, make it here. So I'm just gonna go 10.0.1.0 forward slash 24. And we'll go ahead and hit okay. And so down below, it's gonna choose an address space. Uh, we have a security group. Um, I'm just gonna put it for none. I don't think I want one on that. And uh, if we scroll on down here, we have the resource group. So we're gonna put it in the same resource group and we'll go ahead and create that. So now before this, they didn't have this really nice wizard you used to have to go and, and create all those things individually in your virtual network, but this is really nice. It does take a bit of time for this to provision, so I'll see you back here in a bit. That took a bit of time for that to create that bastion, but it is ready to go. And so now that we have it, we can go ahead and utilize uh, this connection here. And so right away, it, I think it's setting up for RDP here. So what we'll do is type in Azure user uh, and then capital T testing one, two, three, four, five, six. We'll go ahead and hit connect. And so notice that I didn't have to use an external application. I could just uh, run it in right here. It's all in the web browser. So that's pretty much how uh, the Bastion works. Uh, I can't remember the pricing on Bastion. I think it's a little bit of money, so I, I don't want to keep this uh, laying around here. But this is great if, you, let's say, you're on a Chromebook, which are becoming really popular, where you can't install native applications. Uh, or you're just having issues because you're on like Linux or something like that. So there you go. That's all there is to it. We'll go ahead and clean this up. And so I'm just going to go here, find the resource group, and we'll go ahead and delete. I'm just making sure that Bastion's within there. So it is good. And there we go. So we just launched a virtual machine for Linux. Now let's go ahead and launch one for Windows. So I'm gonna to go to the top here and type in virtual machines. We'll go to the first link. I'm gonna hit add, add virtual machine. And uh, what we'll do is we'll create a new group. The last one I had was called Bajor. I'm gonna call this one Cardassia, Cardassia. And I'm gonna name this uh, machine also named Cardassia. And this time what we wanna do is, is we want to move over to a Windows server. I find the easiest one to learn with is the Windows 10 Pro server, uh, just because I find these ones a little bit daunting. So I'm gonna go Windows 10 Pro. Uh, and then what we're gonna do is go choose a larger size. This is not gonna work. We cannot run a Windows server on a B1 LS. So we're gonna to have to go a little bit larger and uh, we don't have to go too much larger here, but the idea here is that there's gonna be a, a, a more expensive spend here. So we're not gonna be running to keep this running for long, but here we have the B2S, that is the appropriate size to run this. Anything smaller I don't think is going to work. And we are going to put in a password here. So I'm just gonna put in Cardassia. And we'll do Cardassia123. Uh, put a capital on it, I guess. We'll just do this here. And I'm just gonna go back and lowercase this one. 
And uh, we're gonna allow the inbound port of 3389 because that is what RDP needs. I'm gonna confirm that I have a Windows license. I actually don't, but the thing is you can still launch one for uh, your test purposes. It'll, it'll just complain saying you're not activated. Uh, so there are some limitations, but it's uh, good enough for us to uh, learn, okay? And so now that that is all great, we'll go next to disks. We're gonna go with uh, pre or standard SSD this time. Uh, we are gonna go ahead and hit uh, next and go to networking. It's going to create us a new VNet, which is a great idea. We're gonna let it create a, uh, a network security group on the NIC, just like before. We'll go ahead and hit next. Uh, we'll leave all these options alone. This all seems fine to me. Uh, and we'll hit next, review and create. And we'll go ahead and create this server. All right, and so that's gonna go ahead and create it. So I'll just see you back here in a moment when that's uh, done deploying. All right, and so after a short little while here, it looks like our Windows server is now deployed. So what we can do is go to that resource. And if you wanted to see what it's deployed, it's the same stuff as always. You have your network interface card, your virtual network uh, NSG, the IP address. But let's actually go to that resource now. And so let's see how we can gain access to this virtual machine. And so what we can do is use RDP. Luckily, I am on a Windows machine. And so um, I already have the RDB client uh, that I can use. So all I got to do is download the RDB file. And then once we have that file, I can just double click it. And I can open this up. If you're on a Mac, uh, you can download uh, the app in the App Store. And so I'll go ahead and type in my password. So my username was Cardassia. And then my password was capital C A R D A S S I A one two three. We'll hit OK, and then it'll give us another warning. We'll say yes, and now we are in our virtual machine. So there you go. How cool is that? I will just give it a moment to load up, but this is a full uh, Windows 10 Pro. Uh, and as I said before, you know, we don't actually have a license. So if you're afraid of spinning it up because you think you're going to get charged a, a license fee uh, for Windows, you do not have to worry. That's not going to happen. You have to do some manual intervention uh, for that to happen. So we'll just wait a little while here for this to load. Um, it is not, we're not using the most powerful machine, so it does take a little bit of time. And so we just hit accept here. And here we are. So we are on, uh, <laughs> we have our nice Windows machine here. Whoops. I don't know if it has any games. Let's go take a look. Maybe we'll play Minesweeper. Um, no, maybe maybe you have to download it in the store. I'm not that familiar with Windows machines, but um, so there you go. So we'll go ahead and close that. And you know, if we were using the Bastion, it's the same process. You saw how we used it with SSH, but if we had the Bastion and it's so much work to set one up, we already did that before. Uh, but all you do is enter your credentials in on the page, just as we did, and, it, and it's just a lot easier that way. Uh, so let's go ahead and just tear down this machine. We're all done with it. So I'm just gonna hit um, uh, delete. And uh, if we find that resource group, we should be able to easily delete them all. I find the easiest ways to go up here, go to all resources, and then there's the resource group there, and then hit delete resource group, and then I'll type in the name of it, which is Cardassia, and I'll delete all those resources. But after that's done, always just take a double check uh, on your all resources tab and just make sure that those resources are gone because sometimes they stick around. But there you go. That's as simple as it was to launch a Windows machine. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and let's take a look here at virtual machines, which I consider the backbone of most cloud service providers. And Azure keeps it really simple by calling it um, virtual machine. So we can go up here and type in virtual machine and make our way over here. Uh, but right now I don't have any options because I'm using a tenant uh, that doesn't have a subscription applied to it. So what I'm gonna do is go switch back to my original tenant. Uh, and this one has a su subscription applied to it. And so what I'll do is just click back up here and now we'll just type in virtual machines. And I can now see uh, I have options of creating a virtual machine. So let's go ahead and go create a Linux one first, and then we'll go ahead and create a Windows one and then we'll see how we can connect to it, all right? So first we'll go to the top here and hit add. We'll click on virtual machine. And we're gonna be presented with a lot of options. So we'll have to choose a subscription. And so there is mine. I want to probably create a new resource group here. I'm gonna call this one Bejor. And uh, we'll name this uh, Bejor again. 
and I'm going to launch this in US East. Uh, I'll just set it to one availability zone for the time being. Uh, then here we have what we can choose as an image. I can click on see all images and choose from a variety of them. So if I didn't want to use Ubuntu, I could launch something else like Debian or something like that. Uh, but really, I just want to uh, stick with uh, uh, Ubuntu because I'm fine with that version with 18. Uh, then here's what, what really matters is the size because that's going to affect our cost. So if we click on see all sizes, uh, we have this uh, nifty um, table where we can sort the cost. It's just loading the cost here. It's dynamic. This is going to be based on uh, what your base subscription is. So if you're in Canada, you're going to see Canadian prices. If you're in the U.S., you're going to see U.S. prices, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And I care a lot about cost here, so I'm just going to uh, sort this by cost. And here we have the B1LS, which is very cost effective. We have a RAM of 0.5 gigabytes and some other options there. So we'll go ahead and select that there. And we have a couple options. We can use SSH public key or we can uh, utilize a password. And so I think what we'll do is use an SSH public key because that's uh, pretty much the standard there. We're going to name the uh, username Bejor if it lets us. Probably won't. Probably want some additional options there. No, oh, but it's okay. Oh, great. And uh, we'll go ahead and generate a new key pair. And I'm just going to name that one Bejor. And uh, we have some options here for inbound rules. Uh, so you could set to none. This is just setting up the uh, NSG for you. Uh, but we're probably going to want to have that port open uh, for SSH because that's how we're gonna make our way back in here. If we're running a, um, a like an Apache server, we'd want to have port 80 open, so we can go ahead and do that. We'll take a look at now disks. So here we have an options between premium, um, standard, and standard HHD. Um, I just want this to be cost effective, so I'm just gonna go with standard HDD, uh, but generally you, you want to have um, at least a standard or premium SSD when you're running uh, real web development workloads. Uh, then there's encryption here. And so it's always turned on by default, which is great. They also have this option of double encryption with the platform managing customer managed key. Uh, we're just gonna leave that as default. Enable Ultra Disk compatibility. That's not something we need to do here because we are not using Ultra Disk. And here you can see that you can attach multiple uh, disks here. Um, so I can go and do that, but that's not something I need to do today. And some other advanced options, which we do not care about. We'll go over to networking. And so it's gonna end up creating us a new VNet for us. And we'll create a new subnet for us and assign it a uh, IP address. Uh, it will also uh, set up a NICS uh, network security group. So the network security group is not going to be applied at the subnet level. It's going to be applied at the NIC, which is attached to the um, DC2 there. And so we'll just leave it to basic. We're going to allow inbound ports for port 80 um, and 22. That was carried over uh, from earlier. We can put this behind a load balancer, but I don't think we're going to do that right now. We'll go over to management. Uh, we have some additional options here for monitoring. Uh, this is all okay here. We can set it to auto shutdown. Actually, I'll leave that alone. You can also enable backups here. We'll go advanced. And now we have this option here for custom data. Uh, I covered a section on Cloud Init, and uh, they don't call this user data, but most other providers will call this user data. So we could provide a bash script or uh, additional information here if we wanted to. Then down below, uh, there's some host group options. We're not gonna worry about that in proximity placement group. This is really important if you need to have um, instances nearby. Uh, I think this is pretty common with, um, what's it called? High capacity workloads, H HFC. I can't remember the initialism right now, but we covered in the core content. Then we can tag our resource here. Uh, we'll just leave that alone. I don't care about tagging too much, but generally it's good to tag in practice. And then we will get to review and create our server here. We'll go ahead and hit create. And then we'll have to download our private key so we can utilize it later. And so that's downloaded there. And now we're just waiting for it to deploy this and I'll see you back here in a moment. So we had to wait a little bit there and finally um, our deployment is complete. And we can go ahead and just review all the things that it created. So notice that it created the virtual machine. It created a network interface, a NIC for us, the NSG, the network security group, the um, virtual network, and also a public IP address. Um, when I do cleanup, a lot of things I always miss are these IP addresses. And I know that um, Azure gave me a warning that said, hey, you're about to spend uh, $700 yearly on IP addresses because you weren't releasing them. 
So when we do the cleanup step, I'll definitely uh, emphasize about deleting those IP addresses and how to go about that. But let's go take a look at the actual resource now. So here we are, and uh, you can see we have a lot of options on the left-hand side, such as the disk. Um, so we can see the disk options there, and there's other additional security options. But let's go take a look at how we can go ahead and connect to the server. And so uh, there's d different options here. So we have RDP, SSH, and Bastion. Since we are using a Linux machine, we're not going to be using RDP. That's really for Windows. Um, but the trick here is that um, I would need to have a client on my computer to connect like, um, I think it's called Putty. If you're on a Linux-based machine, it's a lot easier. Uh, and certainly I have the uh, Linux subsystem installed, so I could probably um, connect that way. But I figured let's just go ahead and connect via Bastion because I think this is a pretty darn cool feature. So let's go ahead and create ourselves a, a Bastion. And this will take a little bit of time here. But we'll go ahead here and just set up a subnet. So to associate a virtual uh, network to a Bastion, it must contain a subnet with the Azure Bastion subnet. So they actually have a special subnet for it. So what we'll do is we'll just go back to our, um, our server here, uh, which we called Bajor. And I think we can find the subnet through here. So on the left-hand side, if we go to networking, we probably could find it that way. Um, so I'm just looking for that security group um, in there. It should be, um, maybe it's not there. If it's not there, um, well, you know, we could just go over, make our way over to subnets. It's not a big deal. Because it's called Bajor. It's pretty darn easy to find to begin with. And so under subnets here, uh, what we need to do is add a, a special one here. And I just got to remember how this works. Um, so you need to create a, a subnet called Azure Bastion subnet with a prefix of at least 27. So we'll go ahead and add a new subnet and we'll call it that. Uh, we'll take out the space there. And the range is 10, 0, 1, 0, et cetera. So we'll just do it on two. 0 um, 0.2.0 forward slash 27. Uh, 10, 0, 0, 2 is not contained. Yeah, it overlaps, so we'll do 2. It's not contained in the virtual network address space. Oh, right, so we have to add the address space first. Oops, we'll just hit cancel here. That's okay, we'll discard that. We'll make our way over to address space, and we'll go ahead and add 10.0.2. Uh, 2.0 forward slash 24. So that'll give us a pretty darn uh, large range there. And so now what we'll do is go back to our subnet and we'll go ahead and create that there. And it said it only needed 27, so we'll just give it only 27. We don't need to go bigger than we need. And that should be okay. We'll go ahead and hit save. And it shouldn't take too long. So now that we have that, we can go back here and we'll give, give this another go here. Uh, it's there, so it shouldn't be complaining. Maybe what we'll do is just start from the, uh, the, the start here again. Yeah, there you go. The, the Azure portal is like that a lot where you'll have something set up and it has the old state of it. And so you just have to trust yourself that you know what you're doing and you have to go back. But if you don't have a lot of confidence, a lot of times you'll get stuck and you'll think, okay, I don't have it right. But I always just try again and hit refresh um, because the Azure portal is very inconsistent. So we're just gonna have to wait for this to create. This does take uh, a little while to create. So I'll see you back in a moment. So after waiting five minutes, our Bastion is now created. And so what we can do is without even using a Putty client or having to use uh, Linux directly, uh, we can just uh, connect through via the Bastion. Uh, so here uh, we'll see we have some options here. So we want to do SSH uh, private key from local file. Okay. And what we can do is go ahead and select our Bajor key. And then I'll just scroll down here and hit connect. Oh, um, and I think we made the username Bajor. And we'll go ahead and connect now. And it's complaining about a pop-up here. So we'll go up here and say, always allow. And we'll try that again. And then we'll say allow again. 
And so now that we're into our server here, let's go ahead and try to install Apache and see if we can get at least the default page running. Um, so this is using Ubuntu, if my memory serves me correctly, it should be app get install Apache 2. And we'll just hit Y for continue. And we'll just wait for this to install, it doesn't take too darn long. And after a short little wait there, uh, it finally did install. Also, if you notice this little icon here, we have a, a little clipboard here. Um, I don't seem to ever use that there, so that's fine. Um, now, when you install Apache, we might have to go ahead and start it up. Um, so let's just take a look to see if it actually is in the running directory here. So we'll go to cdvar www. And so that's where the default directory is, right? Um, but we can just check to see if uh, it's running by doing a psox. I think it's HTTPD, or we can say Apache here. And so it looks like it's already running, so uh, that's pretty great for us. And since it's running on port 80 and we've opened up port 80, we should probably be able to access that um, here. So let's go back to our actual virtual machine. So we'll go to virtual machines. And uh, we have that virtual machine running. I'm just gonna click into it because I just wanna find out its public IP address. So here it is there. And for Lucky, this will just work. Just a copy to clipboard button right there. And look at that, we have the default page. Isn't that cool? Um, so that's all there really is to it. And uh, I could even update this page. You don't have to do it, but I'm just gonna update it for fun. Actually, I probably have to restart the server, so maybe I won't do that. Um, but yeah, so we connected through the Bastion. So that was pretty darn easy. We probably could have also used um, the Cloud Shell to connect. Um, but maybe we should we could give that a go as well. Since we're all done here, let's go ahead and do some cleanup. The first thing I want to do is, uh, the easiest way is actually to go to all resources here on the left-hand side. And this really gives you an idea of everything that's running in your account. So I actually have other stuff in here uh, that's not relevant. Um, but the idea is that all of our stuff is running within a resource group. Um, and so I'm just taking a look there. I'm not seeing this is all resources here. Um, let's see if we see resource group here. Yeah, they're all there right there. So I can go ahead and click that. And so everything more or less should be self-contained within here. See all that stuff? Um, you can even see the VNet is part of it as well. And so if I go ahead and delete this resource group, it should delete all this stuff. So I'm just gonna type Bajor to confirm. And we'll go ahead and delete. And that should do a good job of cleaning up all those files. I'm not sure if it'll delete the IP. It should right there, but if it does it, what I recommend is after everything is deleted, just go back here to all resources and just double check to make sure they all vanish. Because when this is done, they're all going to uh, start to vanish from this list. And if there's anything remaining, you'll know because it's still here, right? So just be careful about that. That's all I want you to know. Um, and so that's the Linux part. And so let's go ahead and actually now set up a Windows server. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. And in this section, we'll be covering Azure App Service. Azure App Service is an HTTP-based platform for web apps, REST full APIs, and mobile backend services. You can choose your programming language in Python, Java, or any other language and run it in either a Windows or Linux environment. It is a platform as service, so it's the Heroku equivalent for Azure. Azure App Service takes care of the following underlying infrastructure, OS and language security patches, load balancing, auto scaling, and infrastructure management. Azure App Service makes it easy to implement common integrations and features such as Azure DevOps for deployments, GitHub and Docker Hub, package management systems, easy to set up staging environments, custom domains, and attaching TLS or SSL certificates. You pay based on an Azure App Service plan. Shared tier includes free and shared options. Linux isn't supported here. Dedicated tier includes basic, standard, premium, premium two, premium three, and there's isolated tier. Azure App Service is versatile. You can deploy single or multi-container Docker applications. When you create your app, you have to choose a unique name since it becomes a fully qualified domain. Overall, Azure App Service simplifies your web hosting needs, ensuring you can focus on coding and let Azure do the heavy lifting. Let's delve into runtimes in Azure App Service. So what is a runtime environment? A runtime environment refers to the software and settings needed for a program to run in a defined way at runtime. 
A runtime generally means what programming language and libraries and framework you are using. A runtime for Azure App Services will be a predefined container that has your programming language and commonly used library for that language installed. With Azure App Services, you're presented with a range of runtimes to choose from, including .NET, .NET Core, Java, Ruby, Node.js, PHP, and Python. Moreover, Azure App Services generally supports multiple versions of each programming language. For example, for Ruby, you might find versions 2.6 and 2.7. It's worth noting that cloud providers, including Azure, may phase out support for older versions over time. This not only ensures that they're offering the latest and most efficient tools, but also promotes better security practices among users, pushing them to keep up with the latest patches. So that's an overview of runtimes in Azure App Service. The next thing we'll be covering are custom containers in Azure App Service. Azure App Service gives you the flexibility to use custom containers for both Windows and Linux. The primary reason you might opt for a custom container is to use a distinct runtime that isn't natively supported or to incorporate specific packages and software. Here's a straightforward process to get started with custom containers in Azure App Service. Design your container, begin by creating a Docker container tailored to your needs on your local machine. Push to Azure. Once your container is ready, push it to the Azure Container Registry. This centralized repository ensures that your container is easily accessible within Azure. Deploy and go live. Finally, deploy your container image directly to the Azure App Service. Once deployed, Azure takes care of scaling, maintenance, and updates. Another advantage of custom containers in Azure App Service is that they offer more granular control over your environment. You can fine tune performance, security, and other aspects of your application environment to suit your needs. The next topic we'll be covering are deployment slots in Azure App Service. Deployment slots allow you to create different environments of your web application associated to a different host name. This is useful when you require a testing, staging, or QA environment alongside your production setup. Deployment slots let you swiftly replicate your production setting for various purposes, ensuring consistent testing environments. You could also swap environments. This is useful for executing blue-green deployments. By using Swap, you can promote your staging environment to production with ease. You can promote our staging to production by swapping. If something goes wrong, you could swap them back. This capability ensures minimal downtime and enhances the user experience since you can introduce changes in a controlled manner, rolling them back if necessary. In addition, Azure ensures that when swapping, the instances are warmed up before traffic is routed, resulting in zero downtime. So that's a quick overview of deployment slots. The next topic we'll be covering is the App Service Environment in Azure App Service. App Service Environment is an Azure App Service feature that provides a fully isolated and dedicated environment for securely running App Service apps at high scale. This allows you to host Windows and Linux web apps, Docker containers, mobile apps, and functions. App Service Environments are appropriate for application workloads that require very high scale isolation and secure network access and high memory utilization. Customers can create multiple ASCs within a single Azure region or across multiple Azure regions, making ASCs ideal for horizontally scaling stateless application tiers in support of high requests per second workloads. ASCs comes with its own pricing tier called the isolated tier. ASCs can be used to configure security architecture. Apps running on ASCs can have their access gated by upstream devices, such as web application firewalls. App service environments can be deployed into availability zones using zone pinning. There are two deployment types for an app service environment, external ass and ILBS. External ass exposes the ass hosted apps on an internet accessible IP address. If the VNet is connected to your on-premises network, apps in your ass also have access to resources there without additional configuration. Because the ass is within the VNet, it can also access resources within the VNet without any additional configuration. ILBS exposes the ass hosted apps on an IP address inside your VNet. The internal endpoint is an internal load balancer. So that's an overview of App Service Environment in Azure App Service. The next thing we'll be going over is deployment in Azure App Service. So what is deployment? Well, it's the action of pushing changes or updates from a local environment or repository into a remote environment. Azure App Services provides many ways to deploy your applications, including 
run from package, deploy zip or war, deploy via FTP, deploy via cloud sync such as Dropbox or OneDrive, deploy continuously with GitHub, Bitbucket, and Azure repos, which using Kudu and Azure pipelines, deploy using a custom container CI CD pipeline, deploy from local Git, deploy using GitHub Actions, deploy using GitHub Actions containers, and deploy with template, Run from a package is when the files in the package are not copied to the WW root directory. Instead, the zip package itself gets mounted directly as the read only WW root directory. All other deployment methods in app service have deployed to the following directory. For Windows, D colon, we use backslashes home site WW root. For Linux, we use forward slashes home site WW root. Since the same directory is used by your app at runtime, it's possible for deployment to fail because of file lock conflicts, and for the app to behave unpredictably because some of the files are not yet updated. Zip and WAR file deployment uses the same Kudu service that powers continuous integration-based deployments. Kudu is the engine behind Git deployments in Azure App Service. It's an open source project that can also run outside of Azure. Kudu supports the following functionality for zip file deployment. Deletion of files left over from a previous deployment. Option to turn on the default build process, which includes package restore. Deployment customization, including running deployment scripts. Deployment logs. And a file size limit of 2048 megabytes. You can deploy using Azure CLI, Azure API via REST, and Azure Portal. You can use file transfer protocol to upload files. You will need your own FTP client. You just drag and upload your files. Go to the deployment center. Get the FTP credentials for your FTP client. You can use Dropbox or OneDrive to deploy using a cloud sync. Dropbox is a third-party cloud storage service. OneDrive is Microsoft's cloud storage service. You go to Deployment Center, configure for Dropbox or OneDrive. When you turn on sync, it will create a folder in your Dropbox cloud drive. OneDrive apps, Azure Web Apps. Dropbox apps, Azure. This will sync with your home site, WW root, so you just update files in that folder. In summary, Azure App Service offers a range of deployment methods, ensuring flexibility and ease for developers. The next topic we'll be covering is auto-scale in Azure App Service. Auto-scaling is the process of adjusting a server infrastructure capability to fulfill incoming requests from your web application. It usually takes seconds for the changes to take effect and can be done automatically according to pre-configured metrics. It does not need any new deployment or coding changes. Scaling options in Azure App Service Horizontal scaling, this involves adding or removing servers from your infrastructure. For example, during high traffic periods, you might scale up from one to three virtual machines. When demand decreases, you can reduce the count to minimize costs. Vertical scaling, this adjusts the resources of an existing server, such as CPU, memory, or storage. For example, if you find that your application is processing a large amount of data and needs more storage for logs, you might opt to increase the storage capacity of your existing server, Overall, Azure App Service auto-scaling dynamically adjusts resources to meet real-time application demands. The next thing we'll be covering is the Azure App Service Plan. Azure App Service Plan determines the region of the physical server where your web application will be hosted and defines the amount of storage, RAM, and CPU your application will use. It offers several pricing tiers. Shared tiers. There are two shared tiers, free and shared. Free tier provides, this tier offers one gigabyte of disk space, supports up to 10 apps on a single shared instance, provides no availability SLA, and allows each app a compute quota of 60 minutes per day. Shared tier provides, hosting multiple apps up to 100 on a single shared instance. No availability SLA is offered, and each app gets a compute quota of 240 minutes per day. It's worth noting that Linux-based instances aren't supported in this tier. Dedicated tiers, basic, standard, premium, premium 2, premium 3. Basic offers more disk space, unlimited apps, three levels in this tier that offer varying amounts of compute power, memory, and disk storage. Standard allows scaling out to three dedicated instances, guarantees 99.95% availability, and also has three levels with varying resources. Premium provides the ability to scale up to 10 dedicated instances and ensures 99.95% availability, and it includes multiple hardware level options. Isolated tier, dedicated Azure virtual network, full network and compute isolation, scale out to 100 instances, and availability SLA of 99.95%. So the Azure App Service Plan lets you tailor your hosting environment and budget to fit your application needs. 
The next topic we'll be going over is enabling diagnostic logging in Azure App Service. Azure provides built-in diagnostics to assist with debugging an App Service app. Diagnostics logging is an important part of any web application's operation. It allows you to troubleshoot exceptions, not exception errors, alerts, and warnings, as well as track and improve the user experience. With Azure Diagnostics logging, you may log application events generated by your application, web server logging with a raw version of requests made to your app, only available for the Windows platform, detailed error pages, saving copies of the error pages presented to your user, only available for the Windows platform, fail request tracing with detailed information regarding failed requests, deployment logging, logging detailed information about the deployment process in order to troubleshoot when a deployment fails, to enable application logging for Windows apps in the Azure portal, navigate to your app and select App Service Logs. Select on for either application logging or application logging, or both. The file system option is for temporary debugging purposes and turns itself off in 12 hours. The blob option is for long-term logging and needs a blob storage container to write logs to. You can also set the level of details included in the log as shown in the table below. Disabled, this level doesn't capture any logs. Error, at this level, only error and critical logs are captured. Warning, this level captures logs that are warning, error, and critical. Information, this level encompasses a broader range of logs, capturing info, warning, error, and critical categories. Verbose, this is the most detailed level, capturing all categories, trace, debug, info, warning, error, and critical. In essence, as you move from disabled to verbose, the range of logs captured increases, with verbose capturing the most comprehensive set of logs. Enable application logging for Linux, container. In app service logs, set the application logging option to file system. In quota, specify the disk quota for the application logs. In retention period, set the number of days the logs should be retained. When finished, select save it. So, Azure App Services diagnostic logging is essential for optimizing, troubleshooting, and monitoring your application. Let's take a look at configuring Azure Web App Settings. Azure Web App Settings can be configured through the Azure Portal or the Azure CLI. The Azure Portal also offers a bulk editing option. The main settings that may be configured for your Azure Web App are the following. TSL, SSL settings to have a secure and encrypted communication channel. API settings such as technology stack or platform settings. App settings, you can override your configuration stored on the web. Config. Connection strings in order to do not have it written on the web. Config. Default documents displays default web pages when accessing the root of your website URL. Path mappings configure settings according to the user OS. Overall, Azure Web App settings offer a simplified way to optimize and secure your Azure Web application. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are going to be learning about Azure App Services in this follow along. Uh, and it's a service that's supposed to make it easy for you to deploy web applications. I say supposed to because it really depends on your stack. Azure has more synergies with other stacks than others. So, like if you're like me and you like Ruby on Rails, you're going to find a lot of friction with Rails and Linux. But if you're using something like Windows Servers or Python or .NET, you're going to have a much easier time. Still, a really great service. Just wish they'd make it a bit more broad there, but let's hop into it. So before we can go use that service, let's make sure that it's activated. And so we'll go over here and we'll go to Azure subscription. And then down below, we're going to go to resource provider. Now you'd think what you could do is just type in app services uh, and you'd be wrong because the, the service is under a particular provider. So if you want to figure out what provider it is, we can go um, Azure resource providers. And they have a page on documentation here that lists them all. So if I search for Azure App Services, it's under web and domain registration. So we're going to make sure this is registered. If we're using a custom domain, which we are not today, we need this one activated. So going back here, I will type in web and you can see it's registered. So if yours is not registered, go ahead and hit that. I believe this by default is generally registered with new Azure accounts. So I don't think that is an issue for you, but we'll go back up here, close these additional tabs and we will type in Azure app services and we will look for that service. So there it is. And we'll go ahead and hit add. Um, 
And so I'm going to give it a new name. I just made it a moment ago, but I'm going to try again and try to use the same name. So we're going to call this Voyager. Great. And then I'm going to go ahead and name this Voyager. And I already know that that is taken. So I'm going to type in Delta Flyer. And these are fully qualified domains. So they are unique with Azure App Services. You can run a Docker container. We're doing code this time around. And what I like to use is Ruby. Um, but again, you know, if I want to use the CI CD, I'm not going to be able to use the deployment center with Ruby. So that is not possible. Um, and so we're going to go with Python and run either a Flask or a Django app. I haven't decided yet. I am in Canada. So let's go to Canada East. And uh, down below here, we have the plans. Generally, the plans will tell you the cost underneath. Look, you'll notice that it's loading, but I just want to show you that there are some discrepancies in terms of pricing. So if I was to go to Azure App Services pricing and we were to pull this up here, we can kind of see the pricing here. Okay. And if we scroll on down right now, we're looking at a premium V2 uh, and oh no, I don't need help. I'm okay. <laughs> you'll notice that it's 20 cents per hour. So if I go here and do that times 730, because there's 730 hours in the year. That's $146, I believe this is showing me in USD dollars, yeah. And in here, it's showing me 103 Canadian, which is lower. Um, so it could be that because I'm running in a Canada East region, it's the price is different, but you could imagine that if I had this at this cost at, uh, what did we say here, um, at 146 USD, to CAD, I'd actually be paying $182. So you gotta watch out for that kind of stuff, but I'm pretty sure this is what the cost is. So just be aware that if you look stuff up in here, it's not necessarily reflective. So you gotta do a little bit more work to figure that out. Uh, if we wanted to go here, uh, we cannot choose the free tier when we're using Linux. If we're using Windows, I believe we can use it. We're working with Linux today, so that's just how it's gonna be. Um, for the B1, this is totally fine, but we want to utilize deployment slots. Deployment slots is an advanced feature of uh, the production version, and that's the only way we're going to be able to use it here. This is 20 cents per hour again, so I don't want to be doing this for too long. But I think what we'll do is before we do that, we can just do an upgrade to dev to prod so we can experience that. I'm going to go and just choose B1, okay? So we'll go next. Um, we do not need any application insights for the time being, and it will not let us, so it's okay. We'll go next, review and create. And we'll go ahead and create this resource here. And I will see you back when this is done. So um, our uh, resource is now set up. We'll go to resource. And now that we're in here, you'll notice if we hit browse, we're not gonna see anything because we do not have anything deployed, which makes sense, right? Uh, so we're going to actually have to go ahead and deploy something. So we are going to make our way over to the deployment center. And uh, it's just going to tell us that we have yet to configure anything, and that's totally fine. We're going to go to settings. It'll give it a moment. And so the thing is, is that we're going to need something to deploy. Um, I did not create an app, but the great thing uh, is in the Azure documentation, they have a bunch of quick starts here. All right, and apparently they have one for Ruby as well, but today we are looking at Python. Uh, and so they actually have an example repository for us here, which is github.com, Azure samples, Python docs, hello world. And I mean, I could go make a repo for you, but we might as well just use the one that is already provided to us. So I'm just gonna pull this up to show you what's in it. It's a very, very simple application. Even if you don't know anything about building web apps, I'm gonna walk you through it really easily here, okay? So we're gonna open up app.py. So we are using Flask. If you've never heard of Flask, it is a very minimal Python framework for creating web apps. Uh, very uninspiring uh, homepage here, but it gets the job done. It's gonna create a default route for us, which uh, we have there. We, we're gonna call hello here, and we're gonna have hello world. So that's all that's going on here. Very, very simple. And we have a requirements. This is our package manager. I, I don't know why Python uses DXT files. It's very outdated to me, but that's what they use. And here we have Flask. All right, so we're gonna use that repo it's a public repo, so it should be very easy for us to connect. So we'll drop down, go to GitHub. And uh, the next thing we need to do is authorize GitHub. 
All right, so I ran into a bit of trouble there because I could not uh, authenticate my uh, uh, GitHub account, but you know what? I just made another GitHub account, so that made it a lot easier. I'm gonna go ahead here, hit GitHub, and we're gonna try to authorize it. And so now I'm logged into this new one called ExamPro Dev, and we'll go ahead and authorize this application. And we're now in good shape. This repository doesn't have anything in it, so um, if I want to clone something, I guess I'll probably have to fork that repo. Uh, so we'll give it a moment to authorize, and while that's going, I think that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go and uh, fork the example repo if I can find the link again here uh, myself. Uh, I believe it is. So that's still authorizing over there. I'm still looking for it. So it was like examples or something, samples or examples. All right, so I found a way around the problem. I just made a new uh, GitHub account. So that's all I had to do. Um, and I just won't be using my primary account until I get my phone back. But um, so what we'll do is go hit connect. I'll hit authorize. And it didn't prompt me because it already connected to this new one called exam pro dev. You might have to put your credentials in here and it's gonna ask me to select some things. It's a new account, so there are no organizations, there are no repositories, there are no branches, totally brand new. So what I'm gonna to need to do is get a repo in there. So we'll just go ahead and fork the Azure Samples one. So that is Azure Samples, Python, Docs, Hello World. And if I type that right, we're in good shape. I'm gonna go ahead and fork this repository. I'll say, got it. And then I'll move this off screen here. This is now cloned, you should see it cloned here. And uh, we'll go back here. And this probably isn't live, so there's no refresh button here. So we'll have to hit discard and we will give this another go here. And we will select our organization, which is our name. There is the repository. Uh, should be main branch, it's kind of outdated. I'm sorry, but it's called master, that's what it is. Not my fault, that's Azure's fault, okay. Um, and I think that's it. I don't know if we need a workflow configuration file. I don't think so. I'm just gonna double check here. No, I don't think so. And uh, what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and save that. And so now we are set up for deployment. All right, so now that that's all hooked up, if we were to go to browse, we're actually still seeing the default page. A deployment hasn't been triggered just yet. Uh, so the way it works is it's using GitHub Actions. So if we click into our, I'm gonna call it main branch. I know they got the wrong name, but uh, we're gonna click into our GitHub workflows. And then below here, we can see we have a YAML file uh, and this is for GitHub Actions integration here. And so what it's doing is it's specifying the branch. Uh, what how it's going to uh, build it's going to run on Ubuntu latest the steps it's going to do it's going to check it out It's going to set up the Python version. It's going to build it. It's going to do that stuff and so in order for this to um, Take action. We'd actually have to go ahead and make some kind of manual change Which we have yet to do so eh? so what we'll do is we'll go back to our main here and uh, It should be as simple as uh, just changing something here so it's not, I'm not sure how it's supposed to know that it's supposed to be doing the hello and we, oh, I guess, yeah, sorry. So this means it's gonna route over to here. Um, so I'm just going to make any kind of change here. doesn't matter what it is, just one space. We'll go ahead and give it a commit. And um, if I go back to my latest commits, we should see that I made that change. There it is. We'll go back over here and this should be deploying. Um, so if we go over to logs, here you can see one's in progress right now, okay? And so that's what we're waiting. We're just gonna see that finish there. We could probably open the logs and, and get some more information there. And so it just brings you back over to GitHub Actions. And so here's GitHub Actions and it's performing the stuff here. So we're just gonna give it time here and I'll see you back in a moment. So we didn't have to wait too long. It only took one minute and 29 seconds. If we go back over here, um, we might need to do a refresh. And so we can see this is reflected over here. And so if we go back to, it doesn't really matter if we go to settings or logs here, but I'm gonna hit browse and see if my page is deployed. It still is not. So we do have a small little problem here and it's really gonna just have to do with how the app is served. So that's what we need to figure out next. 
All right, so our app is not currently working and uh, there's a few approaches we can take. And the thing I can think right away is we should go and SSH into that instance. If you scroll on down here from developer tools, you can go to SSH and click this button and that's gonna SSH you right into that machine right away. You can also uh, access SSH via the um, CLI command. So I believe it's like, it's like AZ web app. Um, SSH, it'll do the exact same thing. You do that from the cloud shell, but that's not what we're doing today. If I give this an LS in here and we're in Linux, we can see we have our app here. And uh, what I would do is I would see what's running. So I'd, I would do a Puma, uh, or sorry, not Puma, <laughs> PS aux grep uh, Python. And you can notice that we have a G unicorn that's running. So that is where our Python instances are running. So you're not looking for Flask, you're looking for Python here. And if we wanted to make sure that was working, we just type in curl localhost. Um, and so that is gonna return a port 80. So that tells me that, cause like curl just means like, let's go look at that page. Um, it should return some HTML, like print out the HTML to us. So that means the app is not running. Um, so what you could do is run flask run and it's going to start on port 5,000, right? So what I can do is I can go up uh, back to my deployment center here and I'm gonna go get that link here and just ignore the fact that it's working. Uh, it's it's not working right now, I know for certain it's not, uh, but if we do 5,000, that won't resolve because port 5,000 isn't open. So we can't really just uh, put 5,000 in there and the default server here would be 5,000. So if I stop this and I specify port 80, right? then this will start up the app on port 80. And so now when you go here, okay, it will work. Uh, this is not a great way because uh, of course, as soon as you kill it here, uh, technically the site should stop running. Um, and so you'll run into that step. Uh, so what we need to do is provide a configuration to G Unicorn, which is a Python thing. Again, it's not so important that you know how, like what these things are, but the idea is that you understand as an administrator, you want to make sure you have an app that runs after you do a deploy. And so in this particular one, we need a startup.txt. Uh, and interestingly enough, there is a uh, example code by the same author of the other one we were looking at here. I believe it's the same person, or it might not be, but uh, they have a startup.txt, right? And so in here, you can see that it binds on port 000, it starts up four workers, starts up the app. All right, um, and so that's something that we can go ahead and do. So uh, what I will do is I will go back to my GitHub repository that we have here, and I can just go ahead and add a new file. So I'm gonna say, um, add a file, create a new file here, We'll call it startup.txt. I'm going to copy this command here and paste it in there. So G Unicorn will bind the workers and start up on the app. Um, startup app is being ran by uh, something here. So if I go back here, I think they have a startup pie here and that's all that it is doing. Um, I think I want to, I could do it this way, I suppose. Let me just see here. There's just a slightly different name. Eh? So they actually have like a full app going on here. And I just want a very simple Flask app. So I think what I can do is put Flask run here. Port 80. And that should start up the app there. I'm gonna go ahead and commit that file. Okay. And as soon as I commit that, if I go back to my actions, it created that startup file there. So it should trigger a build it's queued up um, and I'll just put this tab up here. So we'll be back here in two seconds. And if I give this a nice refresh, yeah, you can see it deploys in progress. So uh, this doesn't take too long. We'll just wait, close that there. We'll just we'll wait a few minutes. If we click logs, it just opens it back up here and we'll see how that goes. All right, so uh, your deploy may have finished there, but the thing is, is that we're not gonna really know if uh, a change has taken effect unless we actually go ahead and update our code. So what I want you to do is go to your code tab, go to your app.py, we'll hit edit, and I'm gonna go ahead and change this to Vulkan. And then we'll scroll on down, hit commit changes, and we'll make our way back over to our deployment center, and we'll give it a refresh here, 
and we're just going to wait until this one is complete and we will double check to make sure that that has changed. If it is not, we will take action to fix that, okay? All right, so we just waited a little while there for that deploy to happen. And if we go to our website here, it is taking effect. So that's all we had to do to get it working. So that's pretty good. Um, so that is uh, deployments. So now let's talk about deployment slots. In order to utilize this feature, we're gonna actually have to upgrade our account because we cannot utilize them at this, uh, the basic plan here. We gotta go to standard or premium. So let's go ahead and give that an upgrade. Uh, so here's the B1. We're going to go to production here. Um, and I think, yeah, we're going to have to choose this one here. Uh, very expensive. So the thing is, we're going to just upgrade it temporarily. Unless there's more options down below that are cheaper. Yeah, these are the standard tiers. Let's go with this one here because it's only $80. Again, we're not going to be doing this for long, but I want to show you how to do staging slots and auto scaling, okay? So we'll go ahead and apply that there. And now it says that it's applied. So if I go back to our app here and we click on deployment slots, sometimes it doesn't show up right away. If it doesn't, that's not a big deal. You just wait a bit, but today it's super fast. So we're going to go ahead and add a new slot. We're going to call it uh, staging. We're going to deploy from our production branch here, and I'm going to go ahead and create that there. And we'll just wait until that's done, okay? Great, so we waited a little bit there, and uh, our slot is created, so I'm going to just hit close there. And so now let's go take a look and see if we can actually see the application here. So I just clicked into it, I click browse, and we're getting the default page, so nothing is actually really deployed to it. Uh, so how are we going to do that? That's the, the main question here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make my way over to the deployment center. And uh, you can see that it's not configured for the slot. So we are going to have to set it up all over again, even though it copied over configuration settings. It didn't copy over the code. So we go to GitHub. We'll choose our organization again. I'm going to choose the repository. We're going to choose that main branch again there. We're gonna let it add a workflow and notice that this time it's gonna call it staging.yaml so there'll be a separate workflow that gets created. We're gonna go ahead and save that there. And what we can do is again, click onto our branch name there. And if we click into our workflows, we'll no now notice that we have a staging example. It's the same thing. Um, but it should be able to now deploy. So the whole purpose of um, these deployment branches is that it helps us, uh, we can deploy different versions of our apps, but it also um, it's just a place where we can uh, uh, view things before we actually roll them out. So we wanna make sure 100% that they are working correctly. Um, I don't think this will automatically push out. Let me just go to my actions to see if this is deploying. Notice that we have two workflows now, we have staging here. Uh, and yeah, it looks like it's going to deploy here. So we'll just wait a little bit. Um, but maybe what we can do is try to have a, a slightly different version uh, for each one here, okay? Uh, but we'll just let that finish and I'll see you back in a moment. All right, so our deploy finished there. So now if we go back to our website here, we go browse, we should see that application. It says, hello, Vulcan. And if we go and take out this, we still have Hello Vulcan. So how can we have a, a, a variant of this so that we can push out to that? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to my application here. I'm gonna go to code and I'm just gonna make a minor change. Um, I don't say also, is that spelled right? Startup? Doesn't look correct to me. Um, <laughs> so maybe I'll go ahead and adjust that file, but it doesn't seem to be affecting anything, which is, I'm a bit surprised there. So what I'll do is I'm gonna go and edit that file and give it the proper name. Can I rename this file? Yes, I can. So we'll call that startup file. I thought we needed that for deploying. I guess it just works without it, which is nice. Uh, if we go back here, I'm gonna go and I actually just want to edit my um, app here again. And I'm gonna go and edit this. And we'll say, um, hello, Andoria or hello Andorians maybe. And so if I go back to my actions, the question, what is it deploying? Is it gonna deploy the production or the staging? And it looks like it's going to do both. Looks like it's doing both here. But one way we could tell is we can go to our logs here 
and we can see that, um, so we did two deploys. So there's one change here. Uh, if we go back to our main application and our deployment center here, and we go over to our logs, you can see that they're both deploying. So it doesn't seem like it's a great thing that that's how it works. So the question is, is then how would we um, facilitate that deploy, right? How could we do that? I suppose what we could do is just make a separate staging branch. Um, so if I go over to code here, um, I don't think we can just make branches through here. So what I'm gonna have to do is go ahead and, oh, I can create a branch right here. So we'll just type in staging and we'll go create ourselves a new branch. And now we are in this branch and what I'm gonna do is go ahead and modify this and we're just gonna call this, um, hello Klingons. Okay, we'll go ahead and update that. And so this should be a separate branch. So you think what we could do is go in and just change our settings so that it deploys from that one. Uh, we'll go back to our deployment slots. We'll click into staging here. And we need to change our configuration settings. Um, I think we could just do it from here. Hold on here. I, I could have swore it specified the branch. If we go to deployment center here, I think it's set up on the, that other branch there. I think we just adjust it here. So yeah, I think we could just um, adjust these settings. Mm, we can't discard them, but maybe what we can do is just go in and modify that file. So we will go into our code here and uh, we will go ahead and click into here, go into staging and we'll just change what the branch is called. So we'll just say staging. And we'll hit start commit and we will save that. And we'll see if it actually reflects those changes there. So we will go here and hit refresh. We'll see if it picks up staging now, if we go to settings. It's not picking it up. So um, I'm not sure, I don't think, perform a redeploy operation. We don't wanna redeploy. So maybe what we'll do is just, we'll have to do a disconnect here because it's collect, it has the wrong one here. So save workflow file. Um, okay, we'll just go ahead and delete it. It's not a big deal. We'll just have to make a new one here. We'll go to GitHub. We'll choose our uh, organization again, our repository, our staging branch this time around. We'll let it add one. See, it says we can use an available workflow. So we could have kept it there and added it there. Um, and we'll go ahead and save that. So now we'll have two separate branches there and we'll give that some time to deploy because that will now trigger a deploy off the bat. And so I'll see you back here in a moment. All right, so after a short little wait here, it looks like our app is done deploying. So we'll go over here. We'll make sure that this is our staging server. It is good. And we wanna see that our production is different. Perfect. So we now have a way to deploy to each one, but imagine that we want to swap our traffic. So we're happy with our staging server and we wanna roll that out to production. And that's where we can uh, do some swapping. So what we'll do is click the swap button and we're gonna say the source is the staging and this is our target production and we're gonna perform that swap. Uh, right now we can't do uh, a preview because we don't have a particular setting set, that's okay. And it's kind of showing if there are any changes. So set of configuration changes, we don't have any, so that's totally fine as well. We'll go ahead and hit swap. And that's going to swap those two. I believe it's had, had, had zero downtime, so we'll be in good shape if that happens there. And we'll just give it a moment to do that. Great. And so after a short little wait there, the swap is complete. And so uh, if we remember clearly, this was our production, right? And so if I was to hit refresh, it's to now say Klingons. And if I go to my staging server, it should be the other way around, right? Good, so now imagine that I want to just split the traffic. Uh, that's something else that we can do. Um, so notice over here, we have these percentages here. Uh, I'm not sure why it won't let me change those. So maybe I'll have to look into that. So I'll be back in two. So I'm not sure why it's not showing us that traffic slot there, but what I'm gonna do is just maybe try to trigger a deploy back into our staging and maybe that's what it wants to see. Um, so what I'm gonna do is go back to my code here. We would be in our staging branch here. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, edit this file here and we will just change this to Bajorans. 
and we will hit update. And we will let that go ahead and deploy. So if we go to actions here, we can see that it is deploying um, and we'll just give it some time, okay? So we'll see you back here in a bit. I mean, the other reason could be that we're just not at the main level, hold on here. Uh, if we go back here to deployment slots, you know what? I think it's just because I was clicked into here and then I was clicked into deployment slots that they're both grayed out. Yeah, it is. So we can actually do it at that top level there. It doesn't hurt to do another deploy though. So um, we'll just wait for, I'll wait for that deploy to finish and then we'll come here and uh, adjust that there, okay? All right, so let's take a look at uh, doing some traffic switching here. So right now, if we were to go to our production, we have Klingons. And if we were to uh, go to our staging, we have Bajoran. So imagine that we only want 50% of that traffic to show up. So what we can do is put in 50%. And uh, what I'm gonna do is, um, do I hit enter here or, oh, sorry, save up here, there we go. Um, and so what's going to happen is this should take effect, I think, right away. Yep. Uh, and so now we have 50 50 50 percent chance of getting something else here. Um, so I'm just going to keep on hitting enter here. If that doesn't work, we can try an incognito tab. And there we go. We got the opposite there. And so this is serving up staging, right? Uh, and this is serving up production, but they're both on the production URL. So that's a way you can split the traffic. So. Uh, that's pretty much all I wanted to show you for deployment slots. Let's now talk about scaling. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and in this section, we'll be covering Azure Container Instances. Azure Container Instances allow you to launch containers without the need to worry about configuring or managing the underlying virtual machine. Azure Container Instances is designed for isolated containers. They are tailored for simple applications, task automation, and tasks like build jobs. Containers can be provisioned within seconds, whereas VMs can take several minutes. Containers are built per second, whereas VMs are built per hour, providing potential cost savings. Containers have granular and custom sizing of vCPUs, memory, and GPUs, whereas VM sizes are predetermined. ACI can deploy both Windows and Linux containers. You can persist storage with Azure files for your ACI containers. Once deployed, ACIs are accessible via a fully qualified domain name like custom label .azure region .azure container .io. Azure provides quick start images to start launching example applications, but you can also source containers from Azure Container Registry, Docker Hub, or even privately hosted Container Registry. Container groups are a collection of containers that get scheduled on the same host machine. The containers in a container group share lifecycle resources, local network, and storage volumes. Container groups are similar to a Kubernetes pod. Multi-container groups currently support only Linux containers. There are two ways to deploy a multi-container group to deploy a multi-container group. You can use either a resource manager template if deploying additional Azure service resources or a YAML file for deployments involving only container instances. Overall, Azure Container Instances simplify container deployment and scaling, removing the complexities of infrastructure management. The next topic we'll be going over are container restart policies. A container restart policy specifies what a container should do when their process has completed. These policies ensure that the container instances can handle different scenarios effectively based on the specific requirements of the application or task. Azure Container Instances has three restart policy options. Always, this policy ensures that the containers restart continuously regardless of whether they exit successfully or not. It's useful for applications that need to be constantly available, such as web servers. Never, with this policy, containers do not restart once they've completed their execution. This is ideal for tasks that are designed to run once and then terminate, such as batch jobs or scheduled tasks. On failure, containers will only restart if they stop due to an error or unexpected termination. This ensures that if a container crashes or faces an unexpected error, it will try to restart and continue its operations. Overall, choosing the appropriate restart policy is vital for the stability and responsiveness of your applications. The next topic we'll be covering are container environment variables. Environment variables are key value pairs that can be used to configure and manage the behavior of applications running inside containers. Environment variables allow you to pass configuration details to your containers, which can be critical in guiding applications on how to connect to databases, where to find certain resources, or how to adjust their behavior based on the environment they're running in. 
In Azure, you can easily set up these environment variables for your containers using the Azure portal, CLI, or PowerShell. Secured environment variables. By default, environment variables are stored in plain text. To address this, Azure offers the option to secure your environment variables instead of storing them in plain text, which could expose sensitive information if breached. You can leverage the secure environment variables flag. So that's a quick overview of container environment variables. The next topic we'll be covering is container troubleshooting. Troubleshooting containers in Azure involves a series of commands that help diagnose and resolve issues. As container logs, this command lets you fetch logs from your container. These logs can provide insights into application behavior and possible errors. As container attach, if you need diagnostic data during container startup, use this command. It helps in understanding issues that might arise during the initialization phase of a container. As container exec, for a deeper dive into the container, this command starts an interactive session. This is useful for live debugging and to inspect the container's current state. As monitor metrics list, this command gives you metrics related to your container, such as CPU usage, which can be essential for performance tuning or identifying bottlenecks. So these are the commonly used commands for container troubleshooting. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we're going to take a look at Azure Container Instances. So here it is. So all we got to do is go to Container Instances. We'll hit Add. And the nice thing is that Azure provides us with a Hello World one, so it's very easy for us to get started. Um, it's a Linux machine, and it looks like it's pretty inexpensive there, so we'll stick with that. I'm going to create a new group here. We're going to call it Banana, um, and we'll name the Container Instance Banana. And East US 2 seems fine to me. You'll notice we're on a quick start image. If we wanted, we could use something from the Docker Hub and provide our own link, but we'll just stick with the quick uh, start image for today. We're gonna go ahead and hit next to networking just to see what we have as options. You can make it public or private. We'll go to advanced, hold on here. Yep, those are just the ports you can expose. We'll go to advanced and for the restart policy, we can set on failure always or never. We can pass in environment variables and I've covered this a lot more in detail in the lecture content, so we don't need to really dive deep into this. Um, and we'll go ahead and create this instance. And so we'll have to wait a little while here and I'll see you back in a moment. Okay, and so after a short wait, our uh, container instance is ready. We'll go to that resource there and take a look around. So on the left-hand side, we can go to our containers and there we can see it running. We can see the events down below of what's going on. So you can see that it's pulled the image. It successfully pulled it and then it started the container. Some properties, nothing interesting there. The logs, if we wanted to see stuff. And if we wanted to connect to the instance, we could also go here and hit connect, which is kind of nice. Um, I don't have any purpose to do that right now. So, and it's also not gonna work the way we're doing it, but I just wanted to show you, you had those opportunities. Uh, you can do identity, so that, that means manage it with role-based access controls. But what I wanna see is actually this uh, Hello World working. I'm assuming it must be a, a Hello page. I've never looked at it before. So we're gonna go here, grab the public IP address and paste it on in the top. And there we go. So we have deployed a instance onto Azure Container Instances, or a container, I should say. So nothing super exciting to talk about here, um, but we do need to know the basics uh, there. Um, if we wanted to deploy other containers, it's just the one there, so that's all you really need to do. Um, but yeah, so yeah, hopefully that uh, gives you an idea there. I'll just go back to the list here so we can see it, and we'll go ahead and just uh, delete that. Probably do it via the, via the resources on the left-hand side, like I always like to do. Uh, and we will go into banana here, and we will delete banana, and there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. In this section, we're diving into the Azure Container Registry. Azure Container Registry is a managed Docker registry service based on the open source Docker Registry 2.0. It's designed for building, storing, and managing containerized applications and images. Use Azure Container Registries with your existing container development and deployment pipelines. Use Azure Container Registry tasks to automate image builds directly in Azure when you commit code. You can seamlessly pull images from ACR for deployment to various orchestrators such as Kubernetes, DC, OS, and Docker Swarm. 
Many Azure services, including Azure Kubernetes Service, Azure App Service, Azure Batch, and Azure Service Fabric offer direct support to interface with ACR. This ensures a cohesive workflow for deploying applications. Developers can also push container images to a container registry as part of a container development workflow with delivery tools such as Azure Pipelines and Jenkins. ACR offers various interfaces for interaction. You can manage and configure it using the Azure CLI, Azure PowerShell, Azure Portal, Azure SDK, or even the Docker extension for Visual Studio Code. In conclusion, Azure Container Registry securely and efficiently manages your Docker images, streamlining build, storage, and deployment. The next topic we'll be covering are Azure Container Registry tasks. ACR tasks are designed to automate the process of patching the operating system and frameworks within your Docker containers. For quick tasks, ACR tasks let you instantly push a specific container image to Azure's container registry without needing a local Docker engine installation. ACR tasks offer automation flexibility. You can set up automated builds that are triggered by different events, such as updates made to the source code, updates to a container's base image, or predetermined schedules or timers. With ACR tasks, multi-step workflows become easier. For example, you could build a web application image, run the web application container, build a web application test image, and deploy the container that will run tests on the web application. Each ACR task has an associated source code context, the location of a set of source files used to build a container image or other artifact. Furthermore, ACR tasks support the use of run variables, making it possible to repurpose task definitions and enforce consistent image and artifact tagging standards. In summary, ACR tasks amplify the automation, efficiency, and consistency of container management in Azure. The next topic we'll be going over is Docker. Docker is a powerful platform designed for automating the deployment, scaling, and management of applications using containerization. Docker abstracts infrastructure and environment variables, allowing you to create a controlled environment within your Docker container. We can install Docker images into those Docker containers, with each Docker image representing one or a group of common software. The machine on which Docker is installed and running is usually referred to as a Docker host or host. When you deploy an application on the host, it will create a logical entity to host where the application called a container or Docker container. A Docker container does not have any OS installed and running on it. It has a virtual copy of the process table, network interface, and the file system map point which have been inherited from the OS of the host on which the container is hosted and running. The kernel of the host's OS is shared across all the containers that are running on it. This allows each container to be isolated from the other present on the same host. It supports multiple containers with different application requirements and dependencies to run on the same host if the OS requirements are the same. Docker Key Benefits Docker supports multiple applications with different requirements and dependencies to be hosted on the same host if the OS requirements are the same. Storage Optimized Containers are typically a few megabytes in size and consume very little disk space, allowing a large number of applications to be hosted on the same host. Robustness Robustness Containers don't contain a full OS, making them more lightweight than virtual machines. As a result, they use significantly less memory and can boot up in mere seconds, whereas a VM might take several minutes. Reduces Cost Docker is less demanding when it comes to the hardware required to run it. Better Disaster Recovery You can back up a Docker image of the state of the container at a specific point in time and restore it later if serious issues arise. Faster configuration with consistency. You can just put your configurations into code and deploy it. Saves a lot of time from preparing the setup and deployment documentation. Overall, Docker provides a robust, efficient, and cost-effective solution for application deployment and management through containerization. The next topic we'll be going over is a Docker file in Docker. A Docker file is a text document that contains all the commands a user could call on the command line to assemble an image. By using the docker build command, users could automate the image creation process by executing the instructions laid out in the docker file. Here are some essential points to understand about docker files. The docker file is a text file that contains the instructions that you would execute on the command line to create an image. A docker file is a step-by-step -step set of instructions. Docker offers standard commands for use within the docker file, such as from specifies the base image to start with. Copy copies files from the host system into the image. Run executes a command. env sets environment variables. 
Expose informs Docker that the container will listen on a specified network port at runtime. CMD provides defaults for the executing container. Docker will build a Docker image automatically by reading these instructions from the Docker file. Overall, a Docker file provides a reproducible and consistent method to build Docker container images. Hey, it's Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and in this section, we'll delve into Azure Functions. But first, it's essential to understand the concepts of serverless and functions as a service. So, what is serverless? Serverless architecture generally describes fully managed cloud services. The classification of a cloud service being serverless is not a Boolean answer, but an answer on a scale where a cloud service has a degree of serverless. A serverless service could have all or most of the following characteristics. High elasticity and scalability, high availability, high durability, and secure by default. Abstracts away the underlying infrastructure and are built based on the execution of your business task. Serverless can scale to zero, meaning when not in use, the serverless resources cost nothing. Pay for value model, where you only pay for actual usage, eliminating costs for idle resources. An analogy of serverless could be similar to an energy rating labels which allows consumers to compare the energy efficiency of a product. Some services are more serverless than others. What is function as a service? FIAS empowers developers to concentrate on crafting specific pieces of code known as functions. These functions can be event-driven, meaning they either trigger based on events or produce event data. Typically, several functions are interwoven to form a serverless application, and these functions are activated only when called upon. Function as a service is not serverless on its own. FIAS is only serverless if it's fully managed and scales to zero. In conclusion, serverless and FIAS represent transformative approaches in cloud computing, emphasizing efficiency, scalability, and cost-effective means. The next topic we'll be covering is Azure Functions. Azure Functions is a function as a service offering that allows developers to focus on writing code and not worry about maintaining the underlying computing infrastructure. A function app defines the underlying compute for a collection of functions. A function app defines the hosting, runtime, and other global configurations. A function represents code along with application runtime configuration. A trigger is the chosen event data that will cause function to execute. You can only have one trigger. Input bindings are one or multiple data sources that will be passed to the function when a trigger occurs. Output bindings are one more data sinks that will receive output of data from the function on successful execution. There are four versions of Azure Functions 1, X, 2, X, 3, X, and 4, X. We are currently using 4, X. Azure Functions Storage Considerations Every function app requires a storage account to operate. If that account is deleted, your functions won't work. Azure Functions uses the following storage types in the storage account. Blob storage, maintain binding state and function keys. Azure Files, file share used to store and run your function app code in a consumption plan and premium plan. Azure Files is set up by default, but you can create an app without Azure Files under certain conditions. Queue storage, used by task hubs and durable functions. And table storage, also used by task hubs and durable functions. Azure Functions, Anatomy of a Function, Function.json, Configuration of a Single Function Defining Bindings, Code, the code for your function, .funcignore, Files to Ignore, Host.json, Global Configuration of All Functions at the Function App Level, Local Project, a place to locally store code. In conclusion, Azure Functions offers developers an effortless way to build event-driven solutions without managing infrastructure. The next topic we'll be overgoing is the authorization levels for Azure Functions HTTP triggers. Authorization level determines what keys, if any, need to be present on the request in order to invoke the function. The authorization level can be one of the following values, anonymous, no API key is required, function, a specific API key for that function is needed, admin, the master key for all functions within that function app is required. In this example, we're creating an HTTP trigger, the desired authorization level can be selected. Note that the authorization level can usually be changed after creation in the portal and is set on the trigger. Azure Functions Debugging You can enable streaming logs for Azure Functions to see near real-time logging when an error occurs. There are two ways to view a stream of log files being generated by your function executions. Built-in Log Streaming The app service platform provides an inbuilt feature to stream application log files, allowing developers to trace function executions live. 
live metric stream. When your function app is connected to application insights, you can view log data and other metrics in near real time in the Azure portal using live metric stream. It's worth highlighting that these log streams can be viewed both in the portal and in most local development environments. Overall, Azure Functions provide adaptable HTTP trigger authorization and robust debugging tools, enhancing security and developer troubleshooting. The next, let's break them down. Lightweight and serverless, Azure Functions are compact and potentially serverless, removing the need for heavy infrastructure. Efficiency and speed, easy to write, deploy, and upgrade without affecting other website components. Azure functions are fast to execute because there is no large application, startup time, initialization, and other events fired before the code is executed. Event-driven execution ensures they run only when an event triggers them. Zero maintenance, no need for active infrastructure management or associated costs. They scale automatically to meet traffic demands, even scaling to zero costs when idle. Development ease, Azure Functions can be built, tested, and deployed directly from the Azure portal. They provide built-in CI, CD through Azure DevOps, and monitoring with Azure Monitor streamline the development process. Cost-effective, you pay only for the actual runtime, eliminating costs when functions are idle. Interoperability, using industry standard protocols, Azure Functions can seamlessly communicate with various APIs, databases, and libraries. Azure Functions, use cases. For business use cases, Azure Functions are great for scheduled tasks, reminders and notifications, lightweight web API, sending background emails, running background backup tasks, and performing backend calculations. For technical use cases, Azure Functions are ideal in sending emails, starting backup, order processing, and task scheduling, such as database cleanup, sending notifications, messages, and IoT data processing. Azure Functions are best suited for smaller apps have events that can work independently of other websites. In conclusion, Azure Functions are serverless and efficient, streamlining development for both business and technical tasks in event-driven compact applications. The next topic we'll be covering is our Azure Function Templates. Azure provides function templates to get you started with common function scenarios. In Visual Studio Code, the selection of a function template occurs exclusively during the project creation phase, HTTP, triggered by an HTTP request and returns HTTP. Timer, triggered based on a predefined schedule. Blob storage, triggered when files are either uploaded or updated in a blob storage container. Cosmos DB, executes in response to the addition or modification of documents in Cosmos DB. Queue storage, triggered by Azure Storage Queue messages. Event Grid, triggered by event from Event Grid. Many Azure services can trigger a function through Event Grid. Essentially, Event Grid operates as a serverless event bus that is deeply integrated with various Azure services. Event Hub, triggered by Event Hub event and is particularly effective for streaming scenarios. Service Bus Queue, triggered when there's a new message in a Service Bus Queue, making it optimal for messaging systems. Service Bus Topics, triggered by an event from Bus Topic, aligning it with the Pub submodel. SendGrid, specifically designed to be triggered by an email event within the third-party service, SendGrid. Overall, Azure Function templates offer developers a structured foundation for common scenarios, enabling quicker deployment and integration within Azure. The next topic we'll be going over are the functions configuration for Azure Functions. Each function comes with a specific configuration file named function.json. This file serves an important role, outlining the trigger, bindings, and additional configuration settings for the function. The essential elements of this file include type, specifies the binding type. Direction, indicates whether the binding is for receiving data into the function or sending data from the function. Name, represents the data binding in the function. In c -sharp, this would be an argument name, whereas in JavaScript, it would manifest as a key in a key value pair. Let's take a look at the host configuration for Azure Functions. Every function app has a host configuration file named host.json. This configuration file contains global configurations options and parameters for all the functions within the function app. The host has a lot of configuration options. These include aggregator, application insights, blobs, console, Cosmos DB, custom handler, durable task, event hub, extensions, extension bundle, functions, function timeout, health monitor, HTTP, logging, manage dependency, queues, retry, send grid, service bus, singleton, version, watch directories, and watch file settings.
Essentially, these configurations offer developers a framework to adapt functions, respond to event triggers, and ensure consistency across the function app. The next thing we'll be covering are the plan services in Azure Functions. Azure Functions offers three distinct plan services, each tailored to different needs. Consumption plan cold starts. You only pay for the time your code or application is running. Billing is based on the number of executions, the duration of each execution, and the amount of memory used. Just pay while you have functions running and scale out automatically, even through long loading times. Premium plan pre-warmed. The user has designated a set of pre-warmed cases, which are already online and ready to react instantly. Azure provides any additional computing services that are required when your function is running. You pay for the constantly pre-warmed instances, including any additional instances needed to scale the Azure app in, out. Azure Functions host instances are added and removed based on the number of incoming events. Dedicated Plan VM Sharing when you use app service for other apps, your functions will run on the same plan at no extra cost. You may scale it up manually by adding more VM instances for an app service plan. You may have autoscale enabled. Optimal when you have existing, underutilized VMs, which also operate other instances of the app service. In summary, when choosing an Azure Functions plan, weigh your budget, responsiveness needs, and current infrastructure for optimal performance and value. The next thing we'll be covering are triggers and bindings in Azure Functions. Triggers and bindings let you avoid hard-coding access to other services and abstracting away boilerplate code keeping your functions lean. What is a trigger? A trigger is a specific type of event which causes the function to run. It defines how a function is invoked and a function must only have one trigger. Triggers can have associated data which is often provided as the payload of the function. What is a binding? Bindings define if your function is connected to another service. The data from bindings is provided to the function as parameters. Bindings are optional, and a function can have multiple input and output bindings. Azure functions support a wide range of bindings to facilitate integration and data processing. These include storage solutions like Blob Storage, Azure Cosmos DB, and Azure SQL, Dapper, Event Grid, and Event Hub cater to event-driven architectures, with IoT Hub focusing on event data from hardware devices. HTTP and webhooks facilitate real-time data interaction, while Kafka processes stream data. Mobile apps helps in mobile development, and notification hubs are for push notifications. Hue Storage, RabbitMQ, a messaging broker, and Service Bus ensure seamless data transfer and messaging. SendGrid optimizes email delivery. SignalR, an open-source.NET library, provides asynchronous notifications to web apps. Table Storage is a NOSQL key value store. Timer triggers are based on scheduled rejects expressions, and Twilio offers a cloud platform for voice and text messaging systems. The table provides a breakdown of various Azure Functions integrations and their support across versions 1, X and 2, X and higher. Both Blob Storage and Azure Cosmos DB are fully supported across all categories for both versions. Azure Data Explorer, Azure SQL, Dapper, Kafka, and Signal are supported from version 2, X onwards. Some integrations, such as mobile apps, notification hubs, and SendGrid, have limited support across the versions, specifically with triggers, inputs, or outputs. Others, like Event Grid, Event Hub, HTTP and webhooks, IoT Hub, Q Storage, Service Bus, and Table Storage have broad support but may lack in one or two categories. Overall, Azure Functions offer serverless computation and seamless service integration. Using triggers and bindings, they eliminate redundant code. The platform supports diverse bindings, but some integrations have limits. The next topic we'll be covering into is the binding direction in Azure Functions. All triggers and bindings have a direction property in the function.json file. The direction of triggers is always in. Input and output bindings use in, out, or both. Some bindings support a special direction in out. The trigger is defined alongside the input and output bindings. Trigger will have the same as the input type but with trigger appended. For example, an input binding named blob would have a trigger named blob trigger. If you use an out, only the advanced editor is available via the integrate tab in the portal. If you use an out, only the advanced editor is available via the integrate tab in the portal. In scenarios requiring periodic data processing, Azure Functions offers tailored solutions. Suppose every hour you want to read new log files delivered by your application, and you need to transform the data to be ingested in your NoSQL database that resides in Cosmos DB. You'll use the trigger type timer because it's a scheduled job that will run at a specific time. 
the blob storage would be in unbinding as the function reads the data from it. The Cosmos DB would be in outbinding, enabling the function to write the process data into the database. In essence, by understanding and effectively leveraging these binding directions, developers can architect efficient, event-driven solutions that seamlessly integrate various Azure services. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and in this section, we'll be covering Azure Front Door. Azure Front Door is a traffic manager, traffic accelerator, global load balancer, and content distribution network. Azure Front Door is a modern application delivery network platform providing a secure, scalable CDN, dynamic site acceleration, and global HTTP load balancing for your global web applications. Azure Front Door features Caching, similar to traditional CDNs, Azure Front Door offers caching with specified rules and expiration policies. Resiliency, by distributing incoming traffic across multiple or different Azure regions. Cookie-based session affinity for RESTful applications when traffic needs to be redirected back to the same backend. Health probe to determine the healthiest and closest backend to the client request. Web application firewall, a crucial security measure protecting your backends from malicious attacks and vulnerabilities. URL redirect, redirecting traffic based on protocol, HTTP or HTTPS, hostname, path, and query string. URL rewrite with a powerful engine for rewriting income requests to a different backend request. And Azure front door is made up of front ends domains. These front ends domains are connected to backend pools where those connections are filtered by routing rules. Azure front door core components. Profile containers all front door components. Endpoint acts as the pathway or bridge connecting the front end to the back end. Origin groups a grouping of origins. Origin defining the route to back end. Rule sets, a grouping of rules, rules, routing rules. Overall, Azure Front Door optimizes web application delivery within the Azure ecosystem. By utilizing its features, businesses can enhance web traffic management efficiency. The next topic we'll be covering are the tiers for Azure Front Door. Azure Front Door offers two distinct tiers tailored for different needs. First, we have standard. This option optimizes content delivery, offers both static and dynamic content acceleration, offering global load balancing, SSL offload, domain and certificate management, enhanced traffic analytics, and basic security capabilities. And we have premium. This option includes all of the features of the standard tier. Azure Front Door's premium tier offers extensive security capabilities with WAF, bot protection, private link support, and integration with Microsoft Threat Intelligence and Security Analytics. In conclusion, Azure Front Door provides standard for content delivery and premium with added security, ensuring global application performance and protection. The next topic we'll be going over is routing in Azure Front Door. Routing in Azure Front Door determines the path an HTTP request from a user takes to reach a configured backend service. Here's how it works. An HTTP request from a user is directed to the nearest edge location. It then matches with an Azure Front Door profile and evaluates any web application firewall rules. Following this, it matches with an Azure Front Door route, evaluates engine rules, and either returns cached content or selects the appropriate origin group. Finally, the request is directed to the selected origin, which then sends it to the corresponding backend. Azure Front Door offers four distinct traffic routing methods. Latency routes requests to the backends with the lowest latency within a specified sensitivity range. Priority directs requests based on a user defined priority number. Weighted distributes requests to backends proportionally based on assigned weight coefficients. Session affinity ensures requests from the same end user are directed to the same backend, ideal for stateful backends. In summary, Azure Front Door enhances user experience and backend performance through its efficient routing capabilities. The next topic we'll be covering is origin and origin groups in Azure Front Door. The origin is what Azure Front Door will point it to the end user. Origin is the endpoint that points to your backend. Azure Front Door provides robust support for a variety of origins to seamlessly integrate with its application delivery network. Among the supported origins are Azure Blob Storage, which offers vast storage capabilities, and Azure Storage with static website hosting, catering to web hosting needs. Additionally, Azure supports cloud services, app services, and static web apps for diverse application deployments. For comprehensive API management, Azure Front Door integrates with API management. Furthermore, Application Gateway, Public IP Address, Azure Traffic 
Traffic Manager, Azure Spring Cloud, and Azure Container instances are also supported. Notably, there's flexibility for users as they can also add custom origins by providing a host name. Priority in Azure Front Door determines who is the primary recipient of traffic or who, who to send traffic to first. You select a value ranging from 1 to 5. A lower value signifies a higher priority and multiple backends can share this number. Weights allow you to determine the split of traffic distribution between origins of the same priority, a number between 1 to 1000. The default value is 50. Origin groups in Azure Front Door are collections of origins. Every origin must be part of an origin group. By default, Azure Front Door profiles contain an origin group named Default Origin Group. Origin groups facilitate the application of health probes to assess the condition of your origins and load balancing settings to manage the distribution among them. To direct inbound traffic to a particular origin group, an endpoint must link to the origin group through a designated route. Overall, Azure Front Door optimizes web traffic management with diverse origins, prioritization, and weight mechanisms. Using origin groups, it leverages health probes and load balancing for efficient application delivery. The next topic we'll be covering are health checks in Azure Front Door. Azure Front Door uses origin group health probes to periodically ping a backend, verifying whether it returns a healthy response. Typically, a healthy response is determined by status 200. If a backend fails to produce a healthy response, Azure Front Door will redirect the traffic to other available and healthy backends, assuming other origins are configured. What is a HTTP response code? When a user sends an HTTP request, a HTTP response is returned, and HTTP responses will have a response code to communicate how a backend server interpreted the request. A response code is number that coordinates to what happened. For example, 200 signifies OK, 403 means forbidden, 404 indicates not found, 500 represents internal server error. Azure Front Door Load Balancing Settings Origin Group Load Balancing Settings in Azure Front Door enable you to specify the criteria determining the health of a backend. Essentially, these settings define which sample set should be used to classify a backend as either healthy or unhealthy. When the latency sensitivity is set to zero, Azure Front Door prioritizes and routes traffic to the quickest available backend. If it's set to any other value, the system adopts a round-robin approach, distributing traffic between the fastest backend and subsequent ones, all within the bounds of the pre-configured latency sensitivity. The next topic we'll be covering are routes in Azure Front Door. Routes in Azure Front Door serve as mapping tools, linking your domains and corresponding URL path patterns to specific origin groups. Routes of caching and compression features applied. Rules from rule sets can be associated to routes to apply intelligent routing. One of the standout features of Azure Front Door is its capability for traffic acceleration. This feature ensures faster global delivery of your application without necessitating any changes to your existing application code. Azure achieves this traffic acceleration by directing traffic to the nearest edge location to on-ramp into the Azure network. Traffic that is following within the internal Azure network travels at accelerated speed while also taking the most direct path. Think of it as an expressway. In essence, Azure Front Door routes link domains to origin groups, incorporating caching, compression, and intelligent routing. The next topic we'll be covering are rule sets in Azure Front Door. Azure Front Door Rules Engine allows you to customize how HTTP requests gets handled at the edge and provides a more controlled behavior to your web application. This interface is a configuration screen for defining rules in Azure Front Door, a content delivery and application acceleration service. Let's break down what's presented. Rule name, by rule this is the name assigned to the current rule. Condition, if represents the conditions under which the rules action should be executed. Request header, the rule is triggered based on an HTTP header present in the incoming request. Header name, my header the rule looks for this specific header in the incoming request. Operator equal specifies the comparison type. Here, it checks if the header's value exactly matches the defined value. Header value, my value the value that my header should have to meet the condition. String transform, to lowercase before checking the value, it will convert the header's value to lowercase. Action then represents the action to be taken if the condition is met. URL redirect, the action taken will be a URL redirect. Redirect type, found specifies the type of HTTP redirect. 302 means a temporary redirect. Redirect protocol, match request the protocol of the redirected URL will match that of the original request. 
destination host not specified in the image, which means it'll redirect to the same host or domain. Destination path, go here, this is the path to which the user will be redirected if the condition is met. Some of the available conditions include device type, HTTP version, and request cookies. It also examines post args, the query string, and the remote address of the requester. Details like the request body, request file name, request file extension, and request header are scrutinized. Furthermore, the request method, request path, request protocol, and request URL are taken into account during processing. Azure Front Door utilizes rule sets to manage its operations, offering a range of operators for precise control. These operators include equal, contains less than, greater than, less than or equal, greater than or equal, begins with, ends with, and regex. Additionally, each of these operators has a corresponding not variant, providing enhanced flexibility and specificity in defining rule conditions. Action, cache expiration, cache behavior, bypass, override, set if missing, Cache key query string behavior include cache every unique URL, exclude ignore query string, modify request header, modify response header, operator append, overwrite, delete. URL redirect, redirect type, found, moved, temporary redirect, permanent redirect, redirect protocol, match request, HTTP, HTTPS. URL rewrite, source pattern and destination, and origin group override. So that's an overview of rule sets for Azure Front Door. Hey, this is Andrew Brown, and this fall along, we're going to be utilizing Azure Front Door. So before we do that, we're going to need ourselves a storage account to set up some static website uh, storage. So what I want you to do is go to Storage Accounts. And there is a static web app host uh, hosting that we could use, but we're gonna do it the old school way because it's always great to learn a few different ways to do things in Azure. And so uh, there's probably another follow along where we, we use uh, the static, static site thing there. Um, so what we're gonna do is create a new, uh, we're gonna create a new um, uh, resource group. I'm gonna call this one uh, My uh, Azure Front Door and we'll say okay. And from here, we'll have to name it something. So we'll just say my Azure front door, or sorry, we'll do uh, static storage, storage 8888. If you can't get the four eights because I'm using it, then just give it a different um, number sequence because these are treated like fully qualified domains. Choose like a, a US region so that we're all doing the same thing. For performance, we're gonna stick with standard. It doesn't matter if it's on geo redundant, we're not doing anything fancy there. So what I want you to do is go ahead and hit review and create and then give it a moment and hit create. And we're gonna wait for that to uh, finish deployment. And from there, we'll then have to enable st uh, static website. So it doesn't take too long to deploy. So we'll just give it a moment. And while that's going, uh, we do need to create ourselves a um, index HTML file. So you're gonna need some kind of editor. So I'm just opening up Visual Studio Code on my computer. Just give it a moment there. And I'm just creating a new file here. This is taking it taking a moment to load. Okay, so, and what we need to do is just create uh, an index.html file. These are really basic. You can find them anywhere online, but this one's gonna say, hello Mars, hello Mars. Very, very simple. So I'm gonna go ahead and save this to my desktop. So save as, and um, show local maybe. There we go. That's a little bit more sane. And we'll just say index.html. And we will now go to the resource and we're gonna to go to website static is a blade on the left-hand side. So we can do a stack website stuff. We're gonna say index HTML. I think we have to set that for it to work. I cannot remember if that's the case. We have a primary endpoint. This is, uh, these matter for later, but we'll come back to that. And we're gonna go over to our containers and we're gonna to have to create a new container. So I'm just gonna call that, actually we don't because we're gonna put it in web. So when we turned on static website hosting, it already gave us a blob or container a container for us to uh, add, our, add our, or upload our files there. So we'll go to upload here, and then I'm gonna go ahead and select that index.html file and upload it in place. Um, we need to change our access level for this, uh, this uh, container to, um, I think, just blob. So I'm just double checking here. Yeah, I think it's blob access. Uh, it can only be anonymous request container. Data is not available. So we'll say, okay, I believe that is correct. Okay, uh, it, sometimes you can, like we're clicked into it, 
but I think like in the, my instructions, I do it a little bit different. So I'm just gonna double check to see what the settings are there, just so you can see it if you're following my instructions. So change access, private blob. Yeah, okay, so that's fine. Um, so blob access should be okay. And so now what we wanna do is just test that our, our page is working. So if we go back to static website here, on the left-hand side, we can grab this primary endpoint and we should be able to post it anywhere here. See, so I have the old tutorial here. This is a moment ago, so that's why it's a bit confusing. But um, so Hello Mars is working, but this is on static storage. This isn't in front of or behind Azure front door, uh, which is what we'll want to do next. So what I want you to do is just close a couple of these tabs out. And we're gonna type in Azure front door, or front door should be enough front. There we go. And we have a whole bunch of options. We'll just hit create. That's a front door we actually do use for the uh, platform. We have Azure front door, we have quick create. I always go custom. I don't think I've ever done quick create. I just, I just have more trust in custom. And from here, we will choose front door. And East US is fine. I'm just wondering where our storage account is. That's why we should always just kind of set them to be the same place. So let's we'll go to storage account. I don't think it will matter, but I'm just gonna double check. Storage account. And this one is in East US, so we're gonna be okay. Just make sure they match, just so we have less problems. And I'm gonna call this one my Azure front door. Now there are more functionalities in the premium, but standard is fine for us. We'll go next to secrets. Um, this is if we want to add a uh, certificate, um, like you could bring your own certificate, um, but uh, we're not too worried about that. We're gonna have to add a new endpoint. So we're gonna just say my endpoint here. There's a lot of small steps in here, so this should be fun. Hopefully we don't configure anything wrong here. And then we need to add a route. We'll say my route. And it's gonna use the default domain, that's totally fine. Uh, we don't have to do anything, it's gonna just be on the forward slash asterisk there. We do need to create an origin group, so we'll go here and create a new origin group. So my origin group. And then from there, we need to add an origin. Yes, it is very squirrely going through all this. My origin, the origin type is gonna be Azure, or sorry, storage uh, static website. And from here, we need to choose the uh, right one. We call it static storage. Uh, this is fine, this is all fine. We'll go ahead and hit add. And down below, we have some load balancing. We don't care about any of that. Uh, so you can see status is enabled. All this should be okay. The protocol here for the health probe should be HTTP. Um, actually, let me double check because remember this is where I ran into some trouble. I believe, yeah, HTTP, I think it's HTTPS. Okay, I think I read somewhere that it's like um, stack storage doesn't use HTTP, but clearly it does because when we went to the link earlier, it was HTTPS. So I might have the screenshots wrong, but I've corrected them in the actual instructions on my site. We'll go ahead and save that. I think it's HTTPS. And then the, the, the protocol here, um, we'll just leave it matching. It's totally fine. Origin path is fine. We'll go ahead and add that there. And we'll go review create. We'll give it a moment and we'll create. All right, so after waiting um, about a few minutes, like two, three minutes, it looks like uh, Azure Front Door set up. So we'll go to the resource and I'm just hoping this works. Sometimes you have to play around with the settings, but if you see the endpoint host name, we'll go ahead and grab that there, paste it on in. And um, we get a 404. So something's not working just right. So we'll have to go do some debugging, which I was hoping we didn't have to do. So we go to the Front Door Manager. This is the same setup we have here before. There are like different ways to get to it. Um, but we'll have to just kind of go through and debug it. So we do have my route, my origin group. So we can click into our origin group. And then from here, we'll expand it. And we have our route. So there's something that is not correct. And that's what we have to figure out. So I'm just gonna double check my instructions because this was a bit tricky to figure out. Um, and it really came down to like these protocols here. So, Let me keep checking. And I mean, I think the probe is working correctly. So if we go in the origin, if this wasn't working correctly, then it wouldn't it wouldn't show green. So go back up a step here. You know what, maybe we should just wait a little bit because sometimes it takes time to propagate. 
and I don't I don't 100% trust that it's not working because I feel like we configured it exactly right. So I'll open up a new tab here. It says 404 still. My origin group. That that's fine. We'll go here. Yeah, so what I'm going to do is go back to our storage account. I just want to double check uh, what that uh, string was for the static website. I'm pretty sure it was HTTPS. It is HTTPS. So there's no reason that should not work. This is what I was trying to uh, spare you, the, uh, the debugging of this. And it's very common, it's not just Azure, anything that has a CDN, sometimes it's it's difficult to uh, figure that stuff out. But we'll go ahead and edit that route, and we'll just carefully look at what we have here. So, patterns and match, that is fine. It's the correct endpoint. Both protocols are accepted, that's totally fine. Redirect HTTPS, that's totally fine. Match, that doesn't matter. So it should just work. The only thing we didn't do was enable caching, which I think wouldn't hurt to do. Um, because it is a CDN, we don't take advantage of it if we don't turn it on. So we'll do that and say ignore that query string. I mean, that's not going to fix this problem if the routing's messed up. Again, I'm just hoping that maybe it just has to do with propagation. We'll go back to the overview here. And we will open this again. Whoops, grab this. Let's just make sure it's doing HPS. We're working to res uh, restore all services as possible right now. What do you mean our services aren't available right now? Let's go look at Azure status uh, page here. And we'll take a look at front door. Azure front door, it's saying that it's fine. US East. There's no green beside it. Good. So we go down here. I guess it's a it's a non-regional service. So if it's green, it's green. So you know what? I'm gonna play around with this for a little. Oh, 404 web. So this is better, right? It's just saying it can't find the content. Well, I mean, I guess that makes sense because that was there. So we'll just clear that out. Oh, now it's loading. So I think it what the issue uh, is there was no issue. It's just propagating to all the servers and it took some time. So. Uh, I think that's what really threw me for a loop um, when I was originally doing it. So just give it some patience and it will work eventually. So we are all done here. So we can go ahead and clean this up. And I'm just looking for the resource group here. We'll go ahead and delete it. And there you go. That's Azure front door. And I'll see you in the next one, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and in this section, we'll be covering Azure CDN. Azure Content Delivery Network is an Azure service that provides your applications with a distributed network of servers. With Azure CDN, you can improve your application's load time, save bandwidth with caching strategies, and speed up responsiveness with compressed files. Azure CDN centralizes requests from your origin into a single location, making it easier to manage your inbound and outbound traffic with features such as Caching strategies, these outline which requests are cached and specify their expiration timelines. File compression, by minimizing static file sizes, Azure CDN ensures bandwidth efficiency during requests. Geofiltering, this allows or denies requests based on geographical regions. Global distribution, Azure's regions span across the globe, ensuring widespread reach. Integration, Azure CDN seamlessly integrates with other Azure services. Robust security, advanced security measures are in place without any extra cost. Scalability and load balancing, Azure CDN makes application scalability straightforward thanks to its built-in load balancing. Azure CDN can help you reduce load times, save bandwidth, and improve responsiveness. It's used to cache static content such as images, CSS, or HTML. 
Azure CDN is ideal when you're developing or managing websites or mobile apps, encoding and distributing streaming media, gaming software, firmware updates, and IoT endpoints. In essence, Azure CDN provides a robust framework to enhance the delivery and performance of your digital assets. The next topic we'll delve into are the different tiers available for Azure CDN. Azure CDN is available in the following tiers. Microsoft CDN, Standard Verizon, Standard Akamai, Premium Verizon. Akamai is one of the world's largest CDN provider with a large distributed network of servers around the world. On the other hand, Verizon Media operates a global CDN platform with a focus on media streaming, delivery, and security. The CDN features greatly vary based on the chosen option, and it requires exploring a large feature table comparison. Keep in mind that Azure CDN from Akamai is scheduled to be retired on October 31st, 2023. So that's a quick overview of Azure CDN tiers. Next, we'll explore the purge feature in Azure CDN. The purge function in Azure CDN serves as an essential tool when you want to refresh cache content. It enables the removal of cache content from all edge points of presence, ensuring that the latest assets are fetched directly from the origin when requested. When you're looking to purge specific files within a directory, wildcards, represented by an asterisk, can be employed. For example, to clear all files in a directory, you'd utilize this wildcard feature. However, note that the capabilities like Purge All and Wildcard Purge aren't available for Azure CDN when sourced from Akamai. Overall, the Purge feature in Azure CDN provides administrators with granular control over the content caching, ensuring that users always have access to the most updated assets. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from ExamPro, and in this section, we're diving into Azure Service Bus. Service Bus is a fully managed enterprise message broker that allows you to publish or subscribe to topics and queue messages. It can scale your applications with asynchronous messages and built-in integration with Azure services. Azure Service Bus allows for single or batch messaging, message load balancing, topic subscriptions, message sessions, and transactions, ensuring compliance with industry standards. This includes protocols such as AMQP 1.0, with JMS 2.0 available for premium SKU and JMS 1.1 for standard SKU. Service Bus Key Concepts The namespace works like a server with end queues and topics. Queue contains the messages. Sender is who sends the message. Receiver is who receives the message. Topic is a queue with multiple receivers that works like a queue. Subscription is a receiver in a topic. A batch is a group of messages. Safe batch validates if each message can be included the batch. Session allows you to use FIFO and group your messages in a queue. Keek returns a message to the queue without removing it. Dead letter queue, a queue for messages that were unable to be delivered through the normal queue. Keek and lock retrieves a message from the queue without removing it and locks it so other receivers cannot receive it. Receive and delete retrieves and delete a message from the queue. Auto delete on idle sets a time span to delete the queue if it is not used. Duplicate detection history checks if the message was not sent earlier before sending a message it. Overall, this gives you a comprehensive overview of Azure Service Bus and its various components and features. The next topic we'll be covering is a namespace in Azure Service Bus. An Azure Service Bus namespace serves as a container for all messaging components, including both queues and topics. Container for messaging components, one namespace can house multiple queues and topics, making them versatile structures within the Azure Service Bus. They're commonly used as application containers. Capacity slice, think of a service bus namespace as a segment of a large scale cluster. This cluster comprises numerous all active virtual machines that fall under your control. Azure Availability Zones, a namespace can potentially span up to three Azure Availability Zones, offering enhanced availability and resilience. Benefits at scale, using Azure Service Bus means you're using a messaging system built for large-scale operations, offering high reliability and strength. Serverless Messaging, with Azure Service Bus, it is serverless messaging. This means you get to use the messaging service without getting bogged down by the intricacies of the underlying infrastructure. So, that's a quick overview of a namespace in Azure Service Bus. Next, let's talk about queues in Azure Service Bus. Queues are used to send and receive messages. Messages are stored in queues until the receiving application is ready to accept and process them. 
Messages and cues are ordered and timestamped on arrival. Once accepted by the broker, the message is always held durably in triple redundant storage, spread across availability zones if the namespace is zone enabled. Service bus never leaves messages in memory or volatile storage after they've been reported to the client is accepted. Messages are delivered in pull mode, only delivering messages when requested. Configuration aspects of Azure Service Bus queues include Time to live. This determines the duration a message remains in the queue. If it isn't processed within this time frame, it either gets removed or is transferred to the dead letter queue. Lock duration. This represents the period during which a message is locked. By locking messages, Service Bus ensures that no two users can read or process the same message simultaneously. To sum it up, queues in Azure Service Bus are efficient tools to handle message sending and receiving in a structured and reliable manner. So that's an overview of queues in Azure Service Bus. The next topic we'll be covering are topics in Azure Service Bus. Topics can be used to send and receive messages. A queue is often used for point-to-point -point or one-to-one -one communication, whereas topics are useful in publish, subscribe, or one-to-many communication. It's important to end note that topics are not available at the basic pricing tier. You'd need to opt for either the standard or premium tier. A unique feature of topics is their support for multiple independent subscriptions. Multiple independent subscriptions can be attached to a topic and work in the same way as queues from the receiver's side. A subscriber to a topic can receive a copy of each message sent to that topic. It's also worth noting that subscriptions are named entities providing an organizational structure. You can define rules on a subscription. A subscription rule has a filter that specifies a condition for a message to be copied into the subscription, as well as an optional action that modifies message metadata. When creating a topic, consider the following configuration settings. Max topic size, you can specify a size ranging from 1 to 5 gigabytes. Time to live, the setting determines the duration after which a message is removed from the topic. Duplicate message avoidance, this ensures that duplicate messages are processed. Partitioning, useful for efficiently managing a large influx of events. A subscription in Azure Service Bus is a named entity associated with a topic that allows subscribers to receive copies of messages sent to that topic. In a publish, subscribe model of Azure Service Bus, topics can be thought of as the channels to send messages, subscriptions are like the virtual queues to receive those messages. There are also additional configuration settings for subscriptions. Max delivery count, this setting can be adjusted between 1 to 2,000, defining the number of delivery attempts for a particular message. Message sessions, when sessions are activated, a subscription can ensure that messages are delivered in a first-in, first-out sequence. So that's an overview of topics in Azure. So that's an overview of topics in Azure. The next topic we'll be covering is the different pricing tiers in Azure Service Bus. Azure Service Bus has three different pricing tiers, basic, standard, and premium. The more expensive the tiers, the more functionality it provides. Let's break down the features and their availability across these tiers. Queues, this is the foundational messaging structure in Service Bus, allowing messages to be sent and received. All three tiers offer support for queues. Schedule messages, this feature allows users to set messages to be dispatched at a future specified time. It's available across all three tiers. Topics, topics support the publish, subscribe messaging pattern. This feature isn't available in the basic tier but is offered in both the standard and premium tiers. Transactions, ensuring a set of operations are completed successfully and in order, transactions are not available in the basic tier. However, both the standard and premium tiers support this feature. The duplication, this ensures that duplicate messages are processed more than once. Only the standard and premium tiers offer this feature with the basic tier lacking it. Sessions, ensuring ordered and related sets of messages are processed in the correct sequence. This feature is excluded in the basic tier but is available in the standard and premium tiers. Forward to send via, this facilitates forwarding a message or routing it via a specific path. It's not supported in the basic tier but is available in the standard and premium tiers. Message size dictates the maximum allowable size for an individual message. The basic and standard tiers support messages up to 256 kilobytes, while the premium tier significantly extends this limit to 100 megabytes. Resource isolation, this provides isolated computational resources to ensure better performance and reliability. It's a feature exclusive to the premium tier. Geo disaster recovery, in the event of significant geographical or infrastructure disruptions, this recovery feature helps maintain service integrity. It's denoted with an asterisk, suggesting there might be additional details or conditions. This feature is reserved for the premium tier. 
Java Messaging Service supporting JMS, a standard messaging protocol for Java. This feature is only available in the premium tier. Availability zone support. This ensures high resilience and availability by distributing services across multiple isolated data centers or zones. It's exclusive to the premium tier. The next topic we'll be going over is a dead letter queue in Azure Service Bus. The dead letter queue in Azure Service Bus is a specialized queue that stores messages that couldn't be delivered or processed successfully. These messages might fail due to various reasons. Message that is sent to a queue that does not exist. Queue length limit exceeded. Message length limit exceeded. Message is rejected by another queue exchange. Message reaches a threshold read counter number because it is not consumed. Sometimes this is called a backout queue. The message expires due to per message TTL or the message is not processed successfully. Dead letter queues provide several benefits, including monitoring failed message deliveries to understand and address the underlying issues, requeuing messages for another attempt at processing, especially after resolving the reason for the initial failure, initiating follow-up actions, such as alerting, remediation, or alternative processing paths when specific failure patterns are detected, in essence, dead letter queues are vital for ensuring the reliability and resilience of a messaging system. The next topic we'll be covering are the Azure CLI commands for Azure Service Bus. Azure CLI offers various subcommands specifically tailored for Azure Service Bus. These subcommands enable efficient management and configuration as Service Bus Geo Recovery Alias, as Service Bus Migration, as Service Bus Namespace, as service bus queue, as service bus topic. Notably, unlike Azure Storage Queue, Azure Service Bus does not have direct CLI commands to send messages to queues or topics. For sending messages to a queue, you'd need to use the Azure SDK. For example, using the node.js SDK, you can install the necessary package with npm install at Azure slash service bus. This will allow you to integrate Azure Service Bus functionalities directly into your applications and send messages programmatically so that's an overview of the key Azure CLI commands for Azure Service Bus. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are going to take a look at Service Bus. So what I want you to do is type in Service Bus at the top here. What's interesting is that this is the old icon. They have a new icon. So just realize that there's some inconsistencies there, and that's not my fault, that's Azure's fault. Um, but the first thing we need to do is create a namespace because a service bus is kind of like, you know, a storage account where you can have uh, a variety of different kinds of storages. Well, you can have uh, more than one type of messaging system. And so we have our traditional one, uh, like event messaging, similar to storage queue, but with first in first out functionality. And we have pub sub via topic. So what you'll do is create a new service bus namespace. And I'm going to create a new resource group and call this the AZ204 um, service bus. And we'll say message, or sorry, queue, because we're going to do a queue and then we're going to do a topic separately. And for this, I'm going to call the namespace um, service bus queue to keep it simple. We'll let it launch wherever it wants to launch. And notice there are multiple pricing tiers. The, depending on the tier affects the functionality. So if we do basic, we're only gonna have access to queue. We're not gonna have access to um, uh, topics. And so this is totally safe and fine to do. Um, like even if we did premium, it's fine because it's based on your consumption. It's not based on, um, you know, you just having holding around. So we'll get the basic one here and we'll go to networking. I don't think there's anything interesting there. We'll go ahead and review and create. And we'll let that create, click create again. And it's deploying as that is deploying, which will not take too long. What I've done is set up a private repository here. You'll probably see me use this throughout the course. It's literally an empty repository because I already have the code done. I've been doing the follow alongs and documenting them here in the free Azure Developer Associate. But when you're doing follow alongs with me, you should do them, with, uh, do them from scratch. And then if you need to, you can reference the stuff here. So um, I have this uh, separate repository. I have a Gitpod account, which has a free tier. You can totally do this in your own Visual Studio code on your own local machine. The reason I'm doing a Gitpod is because I always want to show you how to set up the CLI and those other tools. Um, and when you launch Gitpod, it gives you a blank environment. So I'm just going to launch that up there. As that's going, we'll go back here and take a look and see if this is ready. Just hit refresh here. It is still going. But we already have our environment. And while that is going in the background, I want to go install the Azure CLI. So 
We don't even have a single file here. I'm just gonna say readme.md so I can see what is going on here. Maybe we'll just dump things in here as we go. I'm gonna go get the Azure CLI uh, Linux because this is running Linux Ubuntu uh, here. So something you should always check is like, uh, what Linux version am I running? If you're on Windows, of course, this is gonna be different, but even Windows using the Windows subsystem Linux is using Ubuntu as well. So what I'll do here, I'll go to the first link. Nope, that's not the one I want. Maybe the second one. There's usually like a command here I can run. Uh, which Linux version am I running? Let's try this one here. It's usually like, so maybe it's this here, cat proc version. It really does vary based on what you're using. And so here I'm gonna go file, uh, or sorry, terminal, new terminal. We'll paste that in there, hit enter. And so here it says Linux 5.13, Ubuntu 11, uh, 18. So I know that this is Ubuntu. Yeah, I don't really like that one there. Um, let's try this instead because this just doesn't read very well. There we go. We're running Ubuntu 2004. I already knew that, um, but uh, I just wanted to double check. And the reason that matters is that when you're installing the CLI, it might matter what version you're using. So we're gonna go here and I'm gonna go to Linux and the instructions might vary. This one says 16, 18, 20. So they're all the same here. And we have this one liner here that we'll install. And what I'll do here is drop it in here and hit enter. I'm not sure if this font is too small. So while that's going, I'm gonna see if I can bump up our font here. I'm looking for the terminal font size here, terminal. Let's just say 20 here. There we go. And so the Azure CLI should be installed. So I'll just type in clear. So let's say Azure or AZ to run it. Looks good to me. So we'll type in Azure login. Um, I don't want to log in with um, that way. I want to log in with device. So we'll do AZ login device because if you're on your regular computer, you can just cl click a button and go to the browser, but I'm not going to be able to do that. So I'm going to have to do a device login device. Well, I'll have to do it the wrong way first to do it the right way. So I'll hit enter because the problem is if I go here, it's gonna to go to localhost because it's trying to launch in my local machine. So it does that and that's no good. And so here it says, do the AZ login use device code. Okay, so that's the one I really wanted to use. So hyphen hyphen use device code, enter. And that will give us a code. So what we do is we will need uh, this link here. So I'll have to expand that to here. And then I'm going to go ahead and grab that code. Continue. And so now I go back, this will authenticate. It'll just take a second here. Close the tab here. There we go, maybe I have to close the tab. Uh, and so now I'm authenticated, so I should be able to uh, do whatever I want. Um, what I need to do next is create ourselves a message queue. So we'll go to the resource here and notice here in entities, it only says queue. Now, if we had uh, other than the basic, the standard plan, then we would see topics here. We'll go click into queue, click create a new queue. I'm gonna call it my queue. We have some options here. The queue size can go up to five gigabytes, the max delivery count. So this is the maximum deliveries uh, time to live. That is how long they live in the queue before they are dropped out or they are dropped into uh, a dead letter uh, a system there. We have lock duration. So the set the amount of time a message is locked for other receivers. You can enable partitioning. Uh, that's pretty complicated, but we'll go ahead and create our queue. And so this should be pretty darn quick. There is our queue, we'll click into it. And you'll notice that there isn't really a way to view messages. There's not a way to add messages. Uh, here we have the service bus explorer, uh, which I guess technically you can send and receive here. I had not noticed this before, at least it was not working for me. So I suppose we could send a message here saying like, hello world. 
This literally wasn't here last time I checked here. Um, and we can go ahead and just hit send. Okay, and notice here it says there's one active message and we can receive it, say yes. And so it says it received the message, it's not showing us the answer. So I guess there kind of is something here. I guess they're still working on it, but uh, mostly what we're gonna have to do is uh, do things programmatically. So that is why we have this account. So what I want you to do is open a new tab here and we're gonna type in Azure Service Bus documentation because we're gonna grab some code there, modify it, make it our own. So it's a bit easier to work with. So here I'm in the Service Bus, we'll go to tutorials. Um, I'm not sure if this one is the right one. Azure Service Bus Documentation Queue. Mm, it's the same thing here, but this is, doesn't look right. What is Service Bus? I mean, it is the right page, but it had a couple tutorials here uh, that I had here. So we'll type in like Azure Service Bus uh, tutorial topics. Sometimes things aren't where you think they're supposed to be. Okay, we'll type in Service Bus. Seems like the same page again. Ah, oh, it was quick starts, sorry. So we have tutorials here and then we have quick starts. So under the quick starts, this is where I was finding uh, the example code that I thought was okay. Notice that we could do everything via the CLI. Um, that is not that fun. But I mean, this only uh, does the creation of it, doesn't necessarily do sending and receiving messages. Notice so that we only can use code. So we'll use JavaScript because I think that will be the easiest to use. Uh, so I already have Node. Node comes pre-installed on Gitpod. You'll have to figure that out for yourself on your own machine. Or you can just use Gitpod as well because it does have a generous free tier. What I'll do is go ahead and paste on in this command. It doesn't seem to want to paste today, so I'll hit copy. And then we'll go back here and go right click, enter paste, hit enter. And so what that will do is, is install that library. If you're not very familiar with Node.js, package.json is the package manager and this is showing that this requirement is there. I want to install one other thing uh, called .env. This will make our lives a lot easier um, for Node. It comes for different things, but I just want it for um, JavaScript here. So then we'll do npm install .env hyphen save. That's just a safe way for us to pass along our environment variables. And so now both of these are installed. So what we'll do is we'll go back over to this code and we'll scroll on down and they have one called send and they have one called receive. So what I'll do is create myself a couple files here. So we'll have send.js and we'll have receive.js. And then what we'll do is go ahead and copy, this is the send code. So we'll put this in the send.js file. And then down below we have the receive code and we will paste that on in there. So I'll just make this bigger and we'll take a quick look here at what it's doing. So what this does is it imports the SDK for service bus. We need to set a connection string. We need to set the queue name. Here is a bunch of messages that we are going to be passing along. Here we establish a service bus client, very common in all SDKs to set up a client first. Then we are creating a um, sender. And then here we are doing uh, create batch messages. So it's a way of sending messages in batch very efficiently. So we have a for loop here. And uh, so it says there's a batch. And then it says, try to add the message to the batch. If it's not, wait until it's ready, then send the message. Okay, so pretty straightforward for that code. Receive is gonna be similar. So connection string, queue name, create that client, create a receiver. And then from there, we will set up a handler for the receiver, an error, and so then we'll subscribe and we will listen for the message and handler. So even though we are doing queues, it's called a subscription still. So just don't get too mixed up with that. What I want to do is just make sure that we're passing our environment variables in safely, our configuration. So 
This is pretty standard or uh, good uh, best practices when working with any language. But the idea is you don't want to hard code your values. So I'm going to do process env. Uh, and we'll do connection string here. And then we'll do process env q name. This is the way you grab environment variables in JavaScript for every language. It's a little bit different. Okay. And I believe these are the same. So I'm just going to go ahead and grab that there like this. And I'll paste that on in here. And I want to load environment variable. So I'll make a new file here called .env. This is all part of that env dot thing that we're looking at, env dot. I'm just pulling that up again here, or dot env. You got to get the right one. Because we need this line here, require dot E, uh, dot env config that will load the environment variables. Uh, it'll load it from that env file. So we will go above here and hit paste. And then we'll go to the receive here and do this as well. And in here, we need to define these. So I'm just going to copy this so I don't have to type it out by hand. We will paste that on in here. And so I just need the Q, Q name. and connection string, we'll just say equals and then equals. So our queue was called my queue. And then we need to go grab the connection string. So I'm just thinking here, this is probably, yeah, it's at the namespace level. And we'll go to shared access policies. Notice it's called shared access policies. And remember when we were doing the storage key, it was like called key access. So it's totally different interface. This is what I'm talking about where um, Azure is inconsistent. We're clicking on the root managed shared access key. Probably could create your own so it doesn't have full privileges, but for this purpose, we're just going to use this one. On the left-hand side, we have a primary and secondary. We're gonna use the primary one. And we will go back here and we will paste on that value in. So I'll paste that in there. Notice we don't have to do double quotations here. It should. Uh, already escape in double quotations, but when we were doing the CLI, when we did in the storage accounts, that wasn't something that we could do. Um, so we have these two values here, so they should get loaded when we use them. And this should all be good, so we'll type in node, send JS, and hopefully it just works. Fingers crossed. And so it sent a batch of messages to the queue. So we'll go back over to our queue here and see if we can see anything. And we'll click into here. I'm just trying to see. So there's 10 active messages that are here right now. And so what we'll do is we'll receive all those messages. So we'll go up and hit node receive JS. And so this code is now receiving those messages from the service bus queue. And we're just going to wait here because it takes time for whatever reason to uh, finish here, but we'll give it a little bit of time here to figure out that it's done. Still waiting. There we go. And so that's all there really is to it. So that is Q and we will do this again, but next time with topics. So what I want you to do is make your way over back to your resource groups. We'll find the one that we just created, which was uh, this one here, AZ204 service bus Q. We'll delete this service group. Hit delete, delete. And there you go. And as always, double check to make sure that you've uh, for sure deleted that stuff. And that's it for Service Bus Q. We'll do topics next, okay? Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and we are looking at Service Bus, and this time we're looking at topics. So what I want you to do, just like before, is go to the top, we'll type in Service Bus, and we'll go to the service bus uh, service. You can still see the old one is there. It should be deleting. That's how slow this thing is. But we'll create a new one and we will create a new resource group and we will call it AZ204 uh, service bus topic. We'll say OK. We'll name this service bus topic. And this time it already exists. And if it does, just dump a bunch of numbers here on the end because it's unique based on that. So it's like having a domain name of somebody who has it, you're gonna have a problem. 
And so here I'm going to go to standard because in order for us to use those additional features, we will need to be on the standard plan. So we'll go ahead and hit review and create. And that'll take a little bit of time to create, but while that's going, I'm going to uh, launch my environment here. So this was the one I was just using a moment ago with uh, GitHub. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go back to our repo here. I'm just doing it off screen because I don't wanna expose all my stuff here. And again, if you want to, you can do this in your local Visual Studio Code. I just wanna show everything from scratch every time. So here's my empty repo with git pod. And so I'll just close this one and it will vanish. All that code is now gone. I'll hit git pod, this will launch a new environment. It's trying to tell me to open the last one. Nope, I'm gonna make a new one for this workspace here and we'll get going here in a moment. So this namespace has been created. So we'll go ahead and hit create. And uh, I guess it's still making, I, I thought I already deployed it there, but I guess I didn't. <laughs> okay, while that's going, we'll go ahead and install the Azure CLI. So we'll type in Azure CLI Linux, cause that is what we're using here today. We'll go to Linux here, we'll scroll on down, grab this one liner here to install it. I'm gonna open up my terminal. Your terminal might be somewhere else. Allow, I'm gonna go ahead and paste that on in there. That's gonna install our Azure CLI. As that's installing, it'll be done here in a moment. Let's see if this is done. This is still creating the uh, namespace, I think. And this is still installing, shouldn't take too long. While this is going, we can start grabbing the code for this. So for this, we'll type in Azure, um, Azure Service Bus Documentation. And this, I found it under the Quick Start. So we will go to Quick Start, ser Topics and Services, because there's some code here that I want under the JavaScript. And we have one for Send to Topic. So we'll just grab that name there make a new file, send to topic.js. And we will go down here to this other one. This is receive from subscription. You're gonna notice this is very similar to doing a queue. The difference is that you can have multiple subscriptions consume the same stuff. Uh, our CLI is done, so we'll type in az login. Um, I can't remember what it is, so we'll hit enter here. I know this is the wrong way, but I just can't remember what it is. I want use device code, that's what it is. So I'll go ahead and grab this and I'll just hit control C to exit out of that and then paste that in there. And then we'll do it the way that we actually wanna do it. So then we will go ahead and grab this for device login. We will provide the code as suggested here. We will hit continue, we will close this and it will say that we are authenticated. So we are now authenticated. We can use uh, AZ or the Azure CLI. Um, I don't know if we need the CLI. Well, we have it anyway. At least we had to authenticate. So at least that was out of the way. I'm not sure if we're actually gonna use the CLI in this one. Um, but what we'll do is go to the resource here. And we want to create a topic this time around. And I'm gonna call this my topic. We have a topic size between one to five. You have a TTL. You can do uh, uh, make sure there aren't duplicates. We're gonna go ahead and create this topic. Okay, so just like last time, we need to install a couple things. So if we go to the top here, there should be like an NPM install. Here it is, NPM install service bus. So we'll paste that on in there. We'll need our .env, so look up .env again, and we will just install it, npm install .env for environment variables, hit enter. We will create ourselves a new .env file, and we will need to look at what environment variables we are going to need. So uh, it looks like we didn't copy the send to topic content, at least I didn't. So we will go back over to here and go up here and get send to topic, paste that on in there, We'll go all the way to the top and I'm looking for what we need here. So here we have one which is connection string, whoops. Did not mean to delete all that. So we'll hit process, env, connection string. And we have to spell it right or it's gonna have a problem. And then we have process, env, topic name. 
And I think in this one, it actually also has subscription. So we'll have to have a third one. So I'm just going to copy these two over. So I have to type it a hundred times. And this one will be process env subscription name. You're noticing I'm not having the um, semicolon. That is optional in JavaScript. So it won't break anything if I don't have them there. Subscription name. And so these are the three that we'll need. I'm going to just split this to make my life a little bit easier. And I'm just going to copy this here, paste. Not exactly how I wanted to paste it, but that's totally fine. I'm going to copy this. I don't think we made a subscription yet, but I know we're going to call it my subscription to make our lives easy. So we'll say my topic, my subscription. And we'll grab this in a moment. So we'll go back over to Azure. We got too many tabs open here. While we're here, we might as well go grab this code um, before we go back to Azure. So we can grab, grab this .env config. That is going to load our configure, con, uh, configuration environments. So we go to the top here, paste that on in there for both files. Again, best practice never to hard code your values. Always pass it in like that with environment variables. We'll go back to our service bus. The first thing we need, well, we made a topic, but we're going to need a subscription. So if we go to topic here and click into it. We can create ourselves a subscription. So we'll go here. We'll say my subscription. Notice we have max delivery count. We have to set this between a value of 1 and 2,000. I'm going to say 12 for fun. We can set the idle. Notice here, if we want to um, have first in, first out, we would checkbox enable sessions. We're going to leave that alone. Does not matter too much for our demo. So we'll go ahead and create that subscription. It is created. Now what I need you to do is go back to the service bus topic namespace. And from there on the left-hand side, we're going to shared access policies. We're going to click into the root manage shared access. We're going to grab the primary connection string key. The secondary would work too. It's just a second optional one because they always give you a two. We'll paste that on in there. And if this is all correct, these should just work. So now what we'll do is type in node um, actually, we did want the CLI installed because I wanted to show you uh, that there was stuff in the queue, whereas with um, storage queue, uh, when we're doing Azure storage queue, I couldn't show you because um, I just didn't know of a command, I believe. At least I think that was the case. But well, anyway, we'll take a look and see what we can see, okay? Um, so actually, we didn't do it at any time. I wonder which one I did that for. Let's just double check here. I have um, off screen here somewhere my instructions, because I wrote it for one of these. Maybe it was for the queue that we did it. Yeah, I didn't do the last one, but I did an Azure service bus queue show. And the idea was to show you that there was a message count 10 so you could see the queue. But I think that since we saw it in the UI, I just wasn't too worried about it. Now, did I do it for this one? I'm not sure. Yeah, we do a topic show. So we'll do that for fun. But first, we need to insert our messages, which are part of the topic send. I don't think we read through these. So let's just quickly read. They look very, very similar to the last one. So you have your messages that you want to send. You create yourself a client. Uh, you create yourself a sender. You create a batch message, send message. Like, it's basically identical. Like, I can't even tell the difference here, except here we're supplying a topic name. So... Um, I mean, I see it here. Ah, here, create sender. The topic name is specified there. So I just imagine that instead of providing a topic name, you provide the queue name, and that's how it knows the difference. But anyway, what we'll do is go ahead and execute this code. We'll say node send to topic uh, JS. Okay, so it sent the stuff. Now, we didn't do this last time, so let's do it this time around. So we'll type in Azure Service Bus topic show. Um, and here we'll need to set the resource group. So this was called, I don't know, let's go take a look here. What is our service group called? It is called AZ204. Bring that down a bit here. AZ204 service bus topic. We need to specify the namespace name. So that's just called service bus topic hyphen seven, two, three, eight, four, nine, because we couldn't get the number we want. And then we need to specify the name. So uh, I assume it's the name of the topic. So the top is my topic and I'll hit enter. And it says service bus name is misspelled 
or not recognized by the service. Did you mean service bus? Yeah, I gotta spell that right. Hit enter. And that looks fine, but I just wanna specify it as output YAML. Just hit up on your keyboard if you wanna go back to those previous commands. Let enter. So this is a little bit easier to read. And so what we're looking for here is just kind of like the message count. Does it show us here? We subscription count. I don't see it. So I guess it's not visible in the same way as uh, the queue is. Like if we did this and we didn't do it in the last one, it would we just saw like that message count there. But let's take a look at what we can see in the CLI to just see what information or a UI that uh, or portal so we can see some information here. So we have one subscription here. We'll click into here. Um, we have max size, incoming request 12. Um, yeah, I don't really see it. Message count 10, max delivery count 12. Okay, so I guess there was 10 and that's the 12. So I guess that's where it's being counted. Let's go run the other one, the receive. And I'm gonna just double check to make sure that we set those. We did, that's all good. So we'll type in node receive. If you're wondering how I'm auto-completing without typing that, I just hit tab on my keyboard. So it's receiving those. Good, and that finish. I'm gonna go ahead and refresh, see if there's any difference here. Notice that the message count is zero. So when the topics were there, it was held in the subscription saying 10 is here and they've yet to be delivered. When we ran it, they were received, and so that number cleared out. That's all we really need to learn for um, uh, topics. So we are done with topics. So let's make our way over to resource groups, and we'll go over to our service bus topic. We'll go ahead and delete this here. Delete. There, it is deleting. We are all good to go. Um, and, you know, just as always, don't ever trust Azure to delete these things. Go back and check in three, four minutes. Make sure it's deleted so you just don't have things lingering around. Um, but, uh, yeah, there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro. In this section, we're diving into Azure Event Grid. Azure Event Grid is a service that allows you to manage event routing from any source to any destination. Event Grid provides a simple and strong customizable event delivery process that allows you to manage at a minimum level which types of events will be received as well as which subscribers will receive those events. One of Event Grid's strengths is its event fan-out capability combined with 24-hour retry reliability, ensuring your events are consistently delivered. It's a cost-effective serverless solution with dynamic scalability, making it an excellent choice for businesses of all sizes. Azure Event Grid is ideal in event-driven architectures. You can subscribe to events from Azure resources and then route them to an event handler or webhook. Furthermore, with custom topics, you have the flexibility to craft and publish your own events within your Event Grid. So that's an overview of Azure Event Grid. The next topic will be covering our event sources and handlers in Azure Event Grid. Azure Event Grid is divided into two categories, event sources and event handlers. Azure's Event Grid operates as a central hub, coordinating between various event sources and event handlers. On the side of event sources, which are services that emit data, we have Blob Storage, Signal R, Resource Groups, Azure App Configuration, Subscription, Azure Machine Learning, Event Hub, Azure Communication Services, Media Service, Azure Cache Forwardies, IoT Hub, Cloud Events, Service Bus, Azure Policy, Azure Maps, Custom Events, and Azure Container Registry. These sources send their data to the event grid. On the other end, we have event handlers, which are the services that receive and act upon this data. The serverless code category involves functions. For workflow and integration, the services use our service bus and logic apps. Buffering and competing consumers handle the influx of data through Event Hub and Storage Queue. Additionally, there are other services and applications which encompass hybrid connections, web sockets, webhooks, automation, and essentially any service or application. These handlers effectively process or route the data sent by the event sources through Event Grid, enabling a seamless flow of information across Azure services. The next topic we'll be going over are the key concepts of Azure Event Grid. Domains are used to group Event Grid topics that are related to the same application for easier management. Topics, these serve as the destinations to which events are dispatched. 
System Topics, Azure services offer these built-in topics. In contrast, Custom Topics pertain to individual applications and third-party topics. Additionally, Partner Events enable third-party software as a service providers to broadcast events. Events, these encapsulate specific occurrences within a service. Publishers is the service that published the event. Event sources are where the event took place. Event subscriptions are the mechanism that routes the events. Event subscription expiration, this allows users to designate a lifespan for their event subscriptions, after which they become invalid. Event handlers, these are the applications or services tailored to process or act upon the received events. Event delivery is the delivery of events in batches or as single events. Batching is the sending of a group of events in a single request. Overall, these are the key concepts of Azure Event Grid. Hey, this is Andy Brown from Exam Pro, and we're going to take a look at Event Grid Basics. So let's get to it. So the first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to search up subscriptions. Because we're going to need to make sure that in, uh, like in order for us to use Event Grid that we have it turned on. And so we'll go into our subscription and we're going to go under um, Resource Providers, Resource Providers, Ah, uh, there it is. And this is all the stuff that is registered, all the providers that are registered. So what we're doing is just make, making sure that Event Grid is turned on because that one's not always turned on by default and just make sure that it's registered, okay? So you'll know that it's registered because it'll have a green uh, uh, check mark here and it'll say registered. And so once that is done, we can proceed to create a storage account because we're going to integrate a storage account into our Event Grid. So what we'll do is create a new storage account and we're going to create a new resource group. I'm going to call this resource group Event Grid Basics. And we're going to name our storage account Event, Event Grid Basics. All right. And uh, yes, you can have hyphens. You can't have anything else. Um, and we'll just make sure we spelt that right. Event. Event Grid Basics. I can't remember if these are fully qualified domains. If they are, you might have to uh, add some numbers on the end there, but it, it is what it is. We're doing uh, USC. I mean, it just randomizes every time, but this is where you should probably set it to. We have Standard Premium. We'll leave it as Standard, and everything else seems fine. So we'll go ahead and Create, Review, and Create, and then it's going to allow us to review. We'll go ahead and hit Create, and it's going to create the resource group here. We'll just wait for it finish uh, deploying, and then we'll go into the resource. All right, looks like it is finished deploying. So we're gonna go ahead and go to that resource. We're gonna go to containers, and we're gonna have to create a couple containers. The first is the first one is gonna be called basic. We're gonna leave it as uh, private, just make sure it's basic, not basics. And we'll create another container called basic alt. The idea is that we're going to use an event grid in order to move one file from one storage account to another. Uh, and that's going to be facilitated by log uh, via a logic app because that's going to be the easiest way to use Event Grid. Um, so what I want you to do is search for logic apps up here, and we're going to go ahead and add a new logic app. And what we want to do is choose our resource group, and we'll just go Event Grid Basics here. Uh, we are going to name uh, this Event Grid Basics. Um, maybe we'll do LG to indicate that it is uh, a logic app or LG, maybe uh, L, yeah, LG is fine, like short for logic. And from here we have a workflow or a Docker container. We're gonna stick with a, a workflow. Um, just to knock on wood, we're gonna just put in the same region as our um, storage account. So uh, East US, we have standard consumption. I'd rather do consumption for this. Um, so you pay only as much as you use because we don't need enterprise level serverless application here. We just need a consumption model. We're gonna leave this uh, to disable, so that is totally fine. There's nothing else to do here, so we'll go review plus create. And we'll go ahead and create this logic app. And we just have to wait for this to finish deploying. All right, so that should have been very, very quick, like under uh, 10 seconds there. So we've gone into the resource. I just click go to the resource. And so we have this uh, very fun interface. And so what we need to do is start with a common trigger. There's a few different ways to get to it, but there should be something on the front here. Uh, I don't know if they redesigned this recently. So I'm just gonna search start with a common trigger. Oh yeah, it's up here, <laughs> okay. 
I'm being silly. Um, and so what we want to do is, because uh, this is an event grid uh, follow along, we want to click on when an event grid occurs. And so this is the designer where we can make things a lot easier for ourselves. And so we're going to have to first sign in to authenticate. So I'm, this is my tenant, Example Training Inc. So we'll go ahead and get connected there. Just give it a moment. We'll select Andrew Brown, which is totally fine. And now that is connected, so that is great. So once we are signed in, we can click continue and we're gonna go ahead and add, uh, uh, select our subscription here. Um, and we need to choose a uh, resource here. So um, I guess in this case, it's gonna be event grid. Event grid or, hmm. I swore, yeah, yeah, I think that's what we wanna do. Let me just double check here. Oh, you know what, it's just not, sh it, for some reason I'm I'm searching, it's not auto-completing properly. Okay, I just wasn't sure there. And as far as I can remember, this would be probably an event grid topic. And then we need to give this a resource name. So, um, let me just think about this for a moment, okay? All right, so I think I understand where my confusion was. It was because we click continue and I never, I didn't see event grid anymore. So I thought we had to configure it when it was already configured, right? So this is where we were. So we're not, we, at this stage, like event grid's already hooked up. So it's ready to be triggered. So this is the step that follows into it, which is where we want to do our storage account. So that's where I was getting confused. So we'll choose our subscription here. It's okay, you know, if you ever get confused, just step uh, step back a couple steps and just double check what you're doing. Happens to me all the time. So um, what we wanna do is actually um, connect storage uh, storage accounts. So if we type in storage accounts here, great. Uh, we'll have that selected and then we need to select our storage account. So this one's called Event Grid Basics. And then we're gonna have to enter in um, some additional information event type. So we want to have it happen when we add something to the container. So the basic container. So we'll do blob created. Um, and then from there, we need to actually filter out the information. So we need to add a new parameter and I think we'll have to do it on the prefix filter. So a filter like whatever. Yeah, so that's probably a good idea because then we could uh, place it into a particular place. And I believe that um, there are very specific uh, filters that you can do for this because if I recall there's like standardized ones yeah see here like it's always going to be forward slash blob services default containers etc and you'll know that because you know if you read the documentation and you have to do that stuff you'll figure that out so I'm just going to type it by hand here blob services default containers and then we can put our container name so basic uh, I, and I believe we have it without the s there so uh, services, see, I don't trust my writing here. So I'm just gonna copy paste it in, okay? And that looks good to me. Um, so I think that is what it needs to be. So we'll go ahead and hit the next step. And so the idea is anything in that folder, uh, like when something's added to that folder, then follow up with this operation, right? Um, and maybe before we do that, we should probably, um, you know, observe that this stuff works. That's probably be a good idea. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to make my way back over to our storage account. So we'll just close this tab here. I'm going to open a new tab. And we're going to make our way over to storage accounts. And we'll go to event grid basics. And we will go to containers. And we'll click into our basic container because I want to just see that this is working. Um, and I'm going to need a file to upload. So let me just go grab an image really quick. All right, so I just grabbed an image off the internet. So I just have data here. Uh, but before we upload, we probably should save what we have because if we don't save it, we're not going to be able to observe it. So I went back to Logic App and we just hit save in the top left corner. So we'll give it a moment to save. And it looks like it's saved now. I'm just going to go back over to here if we can um, look at some of the code that gets executed. I'm just trying to remember uh, where it is because once it executes, we want to um, see what happened, right? So what I'll do is I'm gonna go all the way back over here and I'm just gonna go and drag, or well, actually I'll hit the upload button. 
So I don't trust that, that there and I'll drag it onto here. Nope, I still don't trust it. So what I'm gonna do is just click the files and I'm just gonna grab it this way and say open and we'll do upload. And so that is now uploaded. And so there is somewhere where we can observe um, where stuff has happened. So I'm just trying to remember where it is. Um, hmm. I mean, we could run the trigger. But we, yeah, we probably should run the trigger, right? Run. I think it's running, so we'll just give it a moment, okay? You know, I was thinking about it. It doesn't make sense. We shouldn't have to run it because it should just happen automatically. I think it's on the overview page. Ah, okay. So if we look here, we can see the run history. And so, and there's also trigger history of when the things are triggered. So we could, we could manually fire it, but it doesn't make sense. So I think this is the run that we just did. Now if we click into here, yes, this is what it is. So here we can see what, what has happened. So if we expand it, we can see the inputs, right? So it's, we have a blob created. Um, it might show some information. So here we can see data. Yep, and it's a WebP file. And so it's gotten this far through. And so that's a great way to kind of like debug. So you can, uh, Logic Run App, you can do it each step. But right now we are using um, Event Grid to do that integration, right? It, we're just doing it through Logic, uh, Logic App because it's a lot easier. So uh, now that we have that, what we should do is go back to our designer and we're gonna have to add the follow-up step. Um, so we have this. Oh uh, yeah, okay, so that's the first step. But Event Grid doesn't show up there, which is weird. But um, so we have this step here from our storage account. And so the next step, what we wanna do is put it into another uh, container. So that will be the tricky part. Um, so I'm just trying to remember what we do. So we'll hit next step. And um, I think what we need to do is initialize a variable first because we're gonna have to get some way to grab uh, the name of the string because if we go back to our run over here Just give it a moment here And we go into a run again here We're, We need to extract some data to pass along because there are some limitations in terms of how JSON gets passed along or data gets passed along and so uh, What we want is we just want this part of the name. We want to say take this name as the identifier so that when, when we're copying stuff over, it will work. And so what we'll have to do is store that into an intermediate variable. So um, we'll just type in variables here. And I'm just seeing, oh uh, yeah, so they look like this, because I can remember, they might be in the built-in. Yeah, th that looks a lot better. Um, and so we need a variable and it's initialized variable and we're gonna name this file name. And this is a string of course, and now we need to insert the value. So in here, what we need to do is write an expression in order to extract that information out. Um, so what we'll do is go to the expression tab and over here you can see we have all sorts of expressions that we can use. So I'm gonna type in last parentheses, and then in there we'll do split parentheses. And then what we're looking for is trigger body. And then we'll do question mark, square braces, single quotations, subject. How did I know how to do that? I uh, looked it up, <laughs> I looked it up somewhere. And you know, I just don't feel like there's much uh, reason to, to teach this part because uh, you mean, if you really need to know, you can go here um, and learn all about it. But a lot of times, like if you need something, you can just say, I need this kind of function. Somebody's already done it, right? Because there's so many common use cases. So I probably searched something like, how do I get the name out of the, the thing, you know, like for the, the blob and somebody had that there. But it makes sense to me. So let's hit OK here and it should turn purple because it is a dime expression. If you type it in here, it probably won't work correctly. You have to type it in here and then hit OK. So it shows up like that. Uh, but you notice we typed in like trigger body. So if we go back over to our run here, um, it, it, this is the body here. So when they say trigger body, they're talking about here. And then it was just grabbing that subject line there. All right. 
Um, so that would be the second step, and that gets it into a, a variable. But the next part is we need to actually um, get the blob content and then insert it and then create a new blob. So what we'll do is hit next step and we'll type in blob and see if we can find anything here. And from here, we need to get the get blob content using path version two. So I'm just gonna scroll down here and take a look for it. There it is based on the path. And we'll go down here and um, I guess it would be access key. Oh, because we're setting up a connection for the first time. So enter name for connection. Um, I know what the storage account is, <laughs> but what is the connection uh, connection name? I do not remember. Give me two seconds, okay? There wasn't much to help me here because what I remember before was that you click it and you'd authenticate it like the event grid, but it's not doing that. So maybe we just have to name it something. So I don't know, we'll just say Azure storage account. Maybe it just wants a name. Maybe it doesn't really matter. Oh yeah, like there's sign in. That's what I want. So connection name, yeah. So we'll say, uh, you know, storage account event grid. Okay. Because if we can just single sign on, let's do that. That's super easy. And we'll click that there. Okay, so this is starting to look how I expect it to look. And so we need the storage account name. I don't know why it's not showing me any names here, but that's okay. We'll just go over back to our storage account here and it's called Event Grid Basics. So we'll type in Event Grid Basics. Event Grid Basics. Uh, that's custom value, sure. I mean, that's what its name is. I'm not sure why it's not auto-completing. Um, but here, what we need to do is we need to provide the path. So it's gonna be forward slash basic. Ah, and so now there's our environment vari or that variable. So we'll just click that there. So that will make it super, super easy. Now notice that it is showing basic now. So I just clicked here the folder. We typed it in manually, but we could have clicked uh, here and then put the environment variable in or uh, the uh, this, this initialized variable in here. But I did type that manually and it still did work correctly. So we are okay here. Infer the content type. Sure, why not? Um, it doesn't matter if they do. Um, so this gets the content. So now this gets the path. And so the next thing is actually to create the blob. You can't like do an easy clone. You have to do it this um, intermediate step. That's just how it works. Um, and so what we'll need to do is go to our built-in ones here. We'll type in blob again, maybe standard. And this time we want to create a blob. So there it is, uh, block blob, no, we just want a blob. And so what we'll do is, um, I guess we have to connect again. I'm surprised it's not showing the name. Yeah, it's just the name, that's fine. So we'll go back over here. I just don't want to type it wrong, so we'll just copy paste it in. Event grid basics, event grid basics, enter custom value because it's giving us so much trouble for no particular reason. Make sure there's no space on the end there. There, now it works fine. Um, and in this case, what we want is basic alt. And the blob name can be the file name, which is totally fine. And the blob content will be the file content. And I don't think we need anything else. So what we'll do is go ahead and click off and we will save. All right, so that's just the way we're gonna have to do it. Um, so what we can do is go back to our overview and we'll go back to our basic folder and we'll delete data. Say, okay. And we'll go upload. We'll select our file again. We'll grab it. We will upload and then we will make our way back over to our Logic app. Close this tab here so we don't get too mixed up. Refresh the page and it failed. So it failed for some reason. So something has not been configured correctly. It failed on the initialized variable. So 
something's wrong there. So unable to process the template language expression in the actions initialized variable, uh, inputs at line zero, column zero, the template function split is not defined, is not valid. So it's possible I just spelt it wrong. So what we'll do is go back to our event grid. We'll go back to our uh, logic app designer here, initialize variable, we will click it. And we probably just spelt it wrong. Spilt. Spilt. What if we do LIT? Spilt? Split? <laughs> um, so if that's wrong, we'll just scroll on down and we'll just take a look. I could have swore that it auto completed for us. Oh, you know what? It is spelled wrong. It should be S P I L I T. Split. All right. And I'm just double checking to see if there's any other problems here. No, nope, it looks fine to me. So we'll go ahead and say update. We will save it in the top left corner. We'll go back, we'll delete our file here. We'll say, okay. And we'll have to select a new file. We will click open, we'll just double check, make sure that's been saved. It looks like it's been saved. We'll hit upload. We'll go back to our overview page. It's already running super fast, by the way. And we'll click into it. And we'll see if we get any other failure. So there's another failure. That's totally okay. So we'll just expand it. This request is not authorized to perform this operation using the permissions. Um, so it does not like the permissions I gave it. Totally fine. So we will go back to our app designer. We will go to this second step here. Even though it did select this properly. So we'll change the connection. Uh, I guess we'll add a new one. So we did 80 integrated. Oh, let's do managed identity. You, you must enable managed identities in the Logic app to use managed identities authentication. You must grant required access to the identity in the target resource. Okay. Uh, there is an identity tab, so we can go over there and take a look there quickly. I don't remember it being that hard to do. Uh, system assigned managed identities restricted to one person. One person resource is tied to lifecycle. You can grant permissions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, can we just turn that on and hit save? Well, it can be granted access per, uh, resources protected by AZ. Sure, let's give it a go. All right, so um, it seems like we have to assign some role stuff. So we can try and assign a role. Um, can we do it at the subscription level? Contributor. Okay. Clearly there's a few different ways you can authenticate, so hopefully this will be the easiest way to do it. Uh, we'll refresh here, did it assign it? And I don't think it said it. All right, so give me a moment and let me see what I can figure out, okay? You know what, just to make this easier, I think what we should do is just do the access key because that seems like the easiest way to do it. I was just hoping that we could have, you know, just did a simple sign in here, but it's not a big deal. So we'll hit change connection. We're gonna add a new connection. We'll just say storage account um, event event grid um, key. And so this is gonna want the Azure storage account name. So this one will be the name of the storage account, if we can find it, it's called event grid basics. And then we need the Azure storage account access key. So there's probably a tab called keys, yep. And we will show the key and we will copy the key If I don't have to pass along keys, I like to not do that. Please check your account info. Again, uh, storage account access keys should be a correct base 64 encoded string. Come on, give me a break here. I am doing what you asked me to do. So we will try this again. This thing just hates me today. Give me a second, okay?
You know what? It, it was really short, so I really don't trust it. So let's just do, I just cleared it out there. I didn't do anything else. What we're gonna do is go back here, click the copy, and then right click and paste. That's so much longer. Okay, that has to be the right key. We'll hit create. And we'll give it a moment. Okay, great. So that's for that one. Um, but this has to have the right connection as well. So what we'll do is just change the connection. <laughs> you have a few here, eh? Um, and the one we want is the one that's valid. So we'll go to this one down below. As you can see, a few attempts here. And we'll save it. And we'll go back to our overview here. I'm just gonna close that tab out. We're gonna close this out. We're gonna go back into here. We're gonna go into our containers. We're gonna go into our basic. We're gonna go ahead and delete this. We'll say okay. And we will upload a new file. We will choose the new file. We'll choose data, upload it. We'll go back over here. And I wanna see the latest run here. We'll give this a refresh. Is it running? It looks like it's running. It's hard because this one looks like it just failed. And and now the, the messaging is getting really muddy here. What is it doing? So we'll click off here. Sometimes the portal is a bit funny. Is it just triggering over and over again? Did we make an infinite loop? Uh-oh. Okay, I think we have a problem here. Well, if we go here, is it basic or ba it's basic alt? And this one's basic. So what's the problem? We'll refresh. Failed. Why did it fail? Conflict. Another active upload session exists. Please retry after some time. Okay. Uh, well, let's just go take a look here. Go back. It's here, so it's it's here. Uh, so it clearly ha has worked. Why it's triggering multiple times, I don't know. Um, don't particularly like that. There we go. I'm gonna just go ahead and delete this one here. And it's just it's just going over and over and over again. So there's something wrong with my workflow. So this looks fine to me. That looks fine to me. Maybe it's triggering, oh, you know what? The the parameter's out of here. So this is supposed to have a prefix here. So what's happening is that it's triggering on any time a basic one is set up or a basic alt one, and it's just stuck in an infinite loop, which is really, really bad. Um, so we did do this earlier, but for whatever reason, um, the changes still are not here. So what we'll need to do is set up that prefix. So what we'll do is type in blob services default containers basic because we really don't want to trigger it on any but that that uh, container there. And uh, did it save it? It doesn't look. Yeah, I mean it should be there. So what we'll do is go ahead. Like, why is it not filtering? Oh, um, I guess it wants to filter based on name. But we gave it its name, so I'm not sure what else we would have to type there. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna put um, dot, it's the prefix filter, so data, I guess, I don't know, like, <laughs> it's not letting me save. Okay, there we go, so we'll save that. I just wanna stop the infinite loop there for a moment. So we'll go back over to the overview and we'll just make sure we're not uh, we're running up our bill here. And I'm just refreshing, I just wanna see that's not triggering anymore. So it stopped triggering, which is good. And we'll go back over to here and we'll look at this prefix filter because I, I don't remember having to do this. So a filter like sample, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll type it in again, I guess. 
blob services default containers basic. It's very odd because like we typed it. Oh, you know what I probably did? I typed in the, the filter parameter here and we're supposed to add it, then put it in there. So it's just me getting confused by the UI. Silly me. Okay, so what we'll do is go back to the overview and this time we just wanna see it trigger once. So we'll go back to basic alt. We'll go ahead and delete this. We'll say, okay. And we'll go back to our event grid. We'll go in or our event grid, our basic, our basic container. We're gonna go ahead and delete uh, data here again. And we're gonna go upload one more time. It's actually good that we had that problem because I got to show you uh, why filters are so important um, when we're dealing with uh, the app logic there um, or logic apps. So we'll go ahead and hit upload. We'll go make our way back over here. We're gonna give this a refresh. And now we have a new one and it only happened once. And that's what we wanted to happen. So we'll go back over to here and we go to basic vault. There it is. So that's a means to which we can use event grid to integrate stuff. You can see logic app is extremely useful for developers uh, building uh, all sorts of tools, uh, but we are all done here. And what we'll do is make our way over to our resource group and we are going to just go ahead and clean up. So we'll go into event grid basics and we'll go ahead and delete this resource group. There we go. And it's gonna go ahead and delete there. Uh, yeah, and there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and in this section, we'll be covering Azure Event Hub. Azure Event Hub serves as a critical component for event ingestion, capable of consuming millions of events from myriad sources and processing them in real time or via micro batching. Its potent auto inflate feature automatically scales throughput units to accommodate varying demands, ensuring seamless processing even during traffic spikes. Notably, Azure Event Hub offers seamless integration with Apache Kafka applications and clients, bridging the capabilities of both platforms. Azure Event Hub helps you build your big data pipeline to analyze logging, anomalies, user, and device telemetry where you only pay for what you use. Breaking down the key concepts of Azure Event Hub. Namespace is an endpoint for receiving and distributing events to Event Hubs. Event Hub is where your events will be delivered. Event Hub Cluster is a dedicated Event Hub with a 99.99% SLA. Event Hub Capture allows you to automatically capture and save streaming events. Events Hubs for Apache Kafka. Event Hub endpoints are compatible with Apache Kafka. Event Publishers are applications or services that publish events to an Event Hub. Publisher Policy is a unique ID used to identify publishers. Partitions are used to organize the sequence of events in an Event Hub. Event consumers are applications or services that read events from an event hub. Consumer group enable consuming applications to each have a separate view of the event stream. Stream offset holds the position of an event inside a partition. Checkpointing is the process of distinguishing between read and unread events. Diving into scaling with Azure Event Hub. Auto inflate, a dynamic feature that enables automatic scaling up to the pinnacle of TUs predicated on traffic exigencies. However, it's worth noting that this feature is not accessible within the basic pricing tier. The image showcases various configuration options related to Azure Event Hub. Pricing tier, the standard tier is selected, priced at approximately $22 USD per throughput unit monthly. Other plans can be browsed for more features. Throughput units, the selected number is one. In Azure Event Hub, throughput units dictate the events process per second and related data volume. Auto inflate maximum throughput units, the maximum number of throughput units that can be scaled to using the auto inflate feature is set to 12. The next topic we'll be covering are the pricing tiers for Azure Event Hub. Plans and their key features. Basic plan. Cost, one cent divided by hour for every throughput unit. Data input, charges two cents for every million events. Storage, holds up to 84 gigabytes of data. Data hold time, keeps data for only one day. Does not offer capture, Apache Kafka, schema registry, or extended retention. Standard plan, 
Cost, three cents divided by hour per two. Data input, same cost as basic, two cents per million events. Capture, available at an additional $73 divided by month for each two. Storage, same as basic, 84 gigabytes. Data hold time, keeps data for seven days. Offers Apache Kafka and schema registry. However, it lacks extended retention. Premium plan, Cost, a bit pricier at $1.23 divided by hour, but now it's for every processing unit. Data input, included in the plan, no extra cost. Capture, included as well. Storage, a lot more space with one terabyte for each poo. Data hold time, retains data for a longer 90 days. Offers Apache Kafka, schema registry, and also has extended retention at 12 cents, GB month with one terabyte already included. Dedicated plan, Cost, the highest at $6.84 divided by hour for each capacity unit. Data input, included in the plan, no extra cost. Capture, also included. Storage, huge space with 10 terabytes for each CU. Data hold time, holds data for 90 days, same as premium. Offers all the features of premium, and its extended retention is also at 12 cents GB month, but generously includes 10 terabytes. Terms, capacity unit, a measure of capacity for the dedicated plan. Processing unit, a measure of capacity for the premium plan. Throughput unit, a measure of capacity for both basic and standard plans. The next thing we'll be going over is the producer in Azure Event Hub, also known as the publisher. The producer is responsible for sending data to the stream. Publishers can publish events using the following protocols. HTTPS, the majority of Azure SDKs prefer HTTPs. AMQP 1.0 Advanced Message Queuing Protocol Kafka Protocol, compatible with the Apache Kafka ecosystem Generally, developers use the Azure SDK for publishing events. You can publish an event either one at a time, events can be published individually, or batches, multiple events can be grouped and published together. However, there's a size limit of one megabyte for both individual and batched events. Any event or batch exceeding this limit will be rejected. For authorization, publishers use either Azure Ad with OAuth2 issued JWT tokens or shared access signature. Comparison HTTPS versus AMQP for publishing events. AMQP requires the establishment of a persistent bidirectional socket in addition to transport level security or SSL TLS. AMQP has higher network costs when initializing the session. AMQP has higher performance for frequent publishers and can achieve much lower latencies when used with a synchronous publishing code. HTTPS requires additional TLS overhead for every request. Publisher policies. Event hubs enables granular control over event publishers through publisher policies. Publisher policies are runtime features designed to facilitate large numbers of independent event publishers. With publisher policies, each publisher uses its own unique identifier when publishing events to an event hub, ensuring that events are properly segregated, authenticated, and managed for each individual source, enhancing security and traceability within the system. The next topic we'll be covering is a consumer in Azure Event Hub. The Azure Event Hub consumer, also commonly referred to as a reader, is responsible for receiving and processing data from the stream. Connection protocol, all Event Hub's consumers connect using the AMQP 1.0 protocol. As events become available, they are delivered through the session. This eliminates the need for the client to continuously check or pull for the availability of new data. A consumer group represents a particular view, like a state, position, or offset of an entire Event Hub. Consumer groups enable multiple consuming applications to each have a separate view of the event stream and to read the stream independently at their own pace and with their own offsets. Typically, in a stream processing architecture, each downstream application equates to a consumer group. There's always a default consumer group in an event hub, and you can create up to the maximum number of consumer groups for the corresponding pricing tier. There can be at most five concurrent readers on a partition per consumer group. However, it's recommended that there's only one active receiver on a partition per consumer group. Some clients offered by the Azure SDKs are intelligent consumer agents that automatically manage the details of ensuring that each partition has a single reader and that all partitions for an event hub are being read from. This allows your code to focus on processing the events being read from the event hub so it can ignore many of the details of the partitions. So that's an overview of a consumer in Azure Event Hub. Next, let's talk about offsets in Azure Event Hub. In the realm of Azure Event Hub, the term offset refers to the position of an event within a specific partition. Offsets enables a consumer to specify a point in the event stream from which they want to begin reading events. 
you have the option to specify the offset either as a distinct timestamp or as a numerical offset value. Consumers are responsible for storing their own offset values outside of the Event Hub service. Every event situated within a partition comes equipped with an offset. Azure Event Hub Checkpointing Checkpointing is a process by which readers mark or commit their position within a partition event sequence. Checkpointing is the responsibility of the consumer and occurs on a per-partition basis within a consumer group. The consumer is fully responsible for checkpointing. This means that for each consumer group, every individual partition reader must monitor its ongoing position within the event stream and notify the Event Hub service once it recognizes the data stream to be complete or processed. So that's an overview of offsets in Azure Event Hub. The next topic we'll be covering is the event retention for Azure Event Hub. Published events are removed from an Event Hub based on a configurable, time-based retention policy. The default value in shortest possible retention period is one hour. For Event Hub standard, the maximum retention period is seven days. For Event Hub's premium and dedicated, the maximum retention period is 90 days. If you change the retention period, it applies to all messages, including messages that are already in the Event Hub. It's important to note that individual events cannot be explicitly deleted. The reason for Event Hub's limit on data retention based on time is to prevent large volumes of historic customer data getting trapped in a deep store that is only indexed by a timestamp and only allows for sequential access. If you need to archive events beyond the allowed retention period, you can have them automatically stored in Azure Storage or Azure Data Lake by turning on the Event Hub's capture feature. If you need to search or analyze such deep archives, you can easily import them into Azure Synapse or other similar stores and analytics platforms. So that's an overview of event retention for Azure Event Hub. Let's break down a comparison between Event Grid, Event Hub, and Service Bus. Event Grid, Event Hub, and Service Bus all are event-driven services for application integration and use an event bus as means to work with event data. Azure Event Grid provides the backbone for event-driven architectures without the need for infrastructure management. Azure Service-to-Service -service Communication, primarily designed for communication between various Azure services, dynamically scalable, cost-efficient, and guarantees at least once delivery of an event. Azure Event Hub, streaming data, ideal for ingesting massive amounts of streaming data. Low latency, processes events with minimal delay. High throughput, capable of receiving and processing millions of events every second and guarantees at least once delivery of an event. Azure Service Bus supports both queues and publish subscribe patterns, making it suitable for a range of web applications. Reliable asynchronous message delivery that requires polling. Advanced messaging features like first in and first out, batching, sessions, transactions, dead lettering, temporal control, routing and filtering, and duplicate detection. Guarantees at least once delivery of a message and offers an optional feature to ensure messages are delivered in sequence. The breakdown highlights the differences between Azure's Event Grid, Event Hub, and Service Bus, showcasing their unique strengths tailored to different scenarios. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and this fall along, we are going to learn all about Azure Event Hub. Uh, so what I want you to do is go to the top here and type in Event Hub, and we are gonna create ourselves a new Event Hub uh, namespace. So we'll go here and hit Create. And we'll create a new resource group as we always do and call it My Event Hub. And then for the namespace name, we'll say um, My Event Hub. If it doesn't let you do that, you'll have to put some numbers on the end. I'm just putting some numbers here because often these are taken up. Doesn't matter what location it is, just choose whichever one. We're going with basic because there's not a huge difference between the pricing terms in terms of feature sets that we want to use today. So we'll go ahead and create this namespace. So we'll give it a moment. And we'll go ahead and hit create. And then we'll just wait for this namespace to provision. All right, so after waiting about a couple of minutes there, our namespace is deployed. We're gonna go ahead and create ourselves an event hub. I'm gonna call this one my hub. We'll go ahead and hit review and create. And we'll create. And these create very, very quickly. So we're not gonna have to wait too long. We need to set some shared access policies here. So I'm gonna go into the hub here. We're gonna hit manage, I'm gonna call this my SAS, SAS, Shared Access Policy. And there we will now have the ability to have a primary key and connection key so we can actually connect uh, to it. So what we're gonna do is go to GitHub and I want to create a new repository. And we'll go ahead here. 
And we'll go down below, go to exam pro, we'll say my event hub. And it's already taken because I've done this before. So for mine, I'm gonna call it new. And we'll go down to private. We're gonna use Node.js, so we'll just type in Node.js so that it ignores the Node modules. You're gonna to wanna to have Gitpod or a Visual Studio code installed on your computer. The easiest way is honestly to Gitpod because these environments are temporary and it's free to uh, utilize it. So if you can, go get the Chrome extension or uh, if you don't wanna install the Chrome extension, all you gotta do is attach this to the end of the repo to launch a GitHub or Gitpod environment. So I'll give that a moment to launch. And there we go. So I do have some code uh, for this. So I'm just looking for it off screen here. And uh, we're gonna need to have a couple files here. We're gonna need a new file called send.js. And we're gonna need a new file here called receive.js. I'm not typing the full word receive because I'm always really bad at spelling it. So I'm just trying to save myself some trouble. And uh, we're also gonna have to initialize a new package JSON file, so there we go. And we're gonna have to get um, a couple things installed. Yeah, so we'll need npm install Azure event, event hubs, Azure storage blob, Azure event hubs checkpoint, store blob, save dev. And to make our lives a bit easier, it looks, seems like I typed something wrong here, I'll just hit up. I forgot the forward slash here. And so we'll just go event hub, um, Azure JavaScript. Because I believe, yeah, I kind of use this one, but I modified it to make it a little bit easier. I think this is the one I was doing. No, I don't think so. Tutorial might be this one. Yeah, it looks like this. Um, so this is just the JavaScript there. So for send, we will grab this code here. We're not gonna do exactly the way they do it, but pretty close. And then there is a receive code. So we'll go down below and we'll grab this. As you can see, there's a lot going on here. That will be our receive. Couple things we need to properly set. So these will be all environment variables. So what we'll do is go to the top here and we'll just do constant process requires process. That's gonna allow us to import our environment variables. So we'll just say copy, let's just save that. We'll paste that in there as well. And then this is where we need to replace all our environment variables. As you can see, I always have things pinging up on me here. So I'll just close my teams out. And just lining these to make this a little bit faster. So default will be what we'll keep here. Um, this will be our storage connection string. Say process env uh, storage connection string. Then this one will be process env container name. Then we need process env event hub name. And up here we'll have process env um, event hub connection string. And then we'll go over to our send here. We'll do something very similar. So process env event hub connection string. And then we'll have process env event hub name. So we need to set all of these. So I'm just gonna copy this for a moment here. I'm gonna make a new file file, new file. Sure, it doesn't really matter. We're just using this as a quick scratch pad. And so uh, what I wanna do here is just delete out this part. And we're gonna do export on the end here. We'll take out this one here. And the idea is that we'll just set them all here and then we will make our lives a little bit easier when we have to mass set these. Mass set, uh, set these. So we do have the connection string because we saw it over here. So we will grab the primary one, doesn't matter which one, primary, secondary. And that is for the uh, event hub. We called the, the event hub was called my hub, I believe. We'll just double check what the hub was called. Yeah, it's called my hub up there. 
we'll need a storage account. So what I'm gonna do, wish this thing would get out of here, get out of here. I'm not, I'm not trying to save a freaking file. There we go, hit escape a bunch of times. And we'll go back here and we'll create ourselves a new storage account. I'm gonna actually make this in a new tab so we can see what we're doing. So we'll go over to storage accounts. And we'll create ourselves a new storage account. We'll create this uh, storage account in the same namespace. So we'll go down to my event hub. We'll just say my, um, or we'll just say my event hub 8888. Again, you might have to change it based on your standards, but, um, or like what is available to you. We'll go ahead and go review, create. And for the container name, uh, we'll probably just call it container. Maybe container one. We just have to wait for this to create to grab that connection string. So this usually doesn't take too long, just a couple seconds. Okay, so there we are. Um, we'll go over to uh, access keys and we'll grab the connection string from here. I believe this one should work. Uh, let me just double check. Yeah, I think this will work. So what we'll do is go back over here. If it doesn't, we'll find out pretty soon and we'll just generate out a, a shared policy. Uh, we'll go ahead and paste that on in here. And just double checking that this is the correct one. This looks identical to that one. That can't be correct. So we'll go back here. This is the storage account. So we'll go, oh, I have to actually hit the copy button. That's what I didn't do. We'll go ahead and paste that in. And so theoretically this should work. So we'll go ahead and copy these. We'll drag our terminal up a bit. We'll paste these in here. And uh, what I'll do is just double check that they're here. So we'll say env grep event hub. So those are both set and then we'll do storage. That one is set and we'll do container. That one is set. So these are all in good shape. For our storage account, we still have to create the container. So we'll go here and create a new container. Say container one. We'll go ahead and create that. We'll make our way back over here. And then instead of just having export, we'll do GP env. This is just in case we have to restart the environment for any reason so that these environment variables get exported twice. So we'll paste that in there. I believe those are all set. Go ahead and hit enter on the last one there. And let's see if our code works. So we'll do a send. Um, actually, we have to set up two scripts here so that we can actually call them. The one called here is called send. This will be node send.js and we'll have receive. So REC, just cause I always spell receive wrong and I just don't wanna have to type it a thousand times. We'll have that there. So now what we'll do is do npm run send. See if that works. It says a batch of three events have been sent. We'll go and confirm that over an event hub if it worked. If we go to the overview, it should show us some messages were received. Sometimes there's a bit of a delay so we'll just give it a, a teeny tiny amount of time. We'll hit refresh here because we know we sent them. But while we're waiting for those to kind of propagate, what we'll go back here is just kind of look at the code because we didn't really look at it. So the way it works is you are defining a client and it will be the producer client. Um, and then down below, so we say, okay, a producer is someone that produces events. It's very common in a messaging system to have a producer and a consumer. We're going to create a batch job and we're gonna add them all to the batch job then we're gonna send them all at once and it's going to close and it'll, t and it'll complete. And if there are any errors, it will alert us about it. So we'll go back over here and we'll do a refresh. So I want to see messages. Messages would normally show up here. So since I don't trust it, I'm just gonna run it again. I mean, clearly worked because there was no errors. And we'll go back over here and um, not here, but we'll go back here, we'll refresh. And I'm just waiting to see something here. Processing data, this is like something that's really powerful with um, Event Hub here. So still don't see the messages. Just give me a second to debug this. I've done this lab like four times, so it should work, but uh, you know, sometimes, sometimes there's trouble. So just a moment. All right, so I literally did nothing and now it's actually showing up in the uh, messaging queue. So, you know, or the hub, the funnel. 
Uh, so that's just something you have to consider is that sometimes you just have to be a little bit patient. Let's see if we can go receive those messages now by running the other uh, script. So what I'm gonna do here is do npm run receive and it should receive the messages as long as something isn't typed incorrectly. So we'll go back over here. We've seemed to introduce a little mistake. So I'll go ahead and save that. We'll hit up and it should receive the events. So it should print the three out. So there we go. And so we are streaming this or the consumer is technically um, storage, storage accounts, but if we go to the storage account. There's nothing really uh, um, intelligible in terms of what's in here. So like there are stuff in here, checkpoints, I guess it's saved a checkpoint. I personally don't know what I'm looking at, so I'm not exactly sure what the point of doing that. I guess it's just saying the checkpoint is like the last point it, it wrote. But if we just take a look at the code here quickly, you can see that it's called consumer. So we hit a consumer client. There's a blob checkpoint store. Then we have the consumer client. We are subscribing. So it's saying, hey, are there any events? Let's consume them. If there are no events, throw a console log. So tell us about it iterate through them, then update the checkpoint. So move it to the next point um, to say, hey, this is where it is now. And that's pretty much all I wanted you to do. We can go ahead and save this code. We'll, so we'll say um, event hub code, doesn't matter what you name it there. We'll sync the changes and we'll go ahead and clean up. So we'll go back to our resource groups. We'll go to event hub and we will then go and delete this resource group. And we'll go here and there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and in this section, we'll be covering the Azure Cloud Adoption Framework. Cloud Adoption Framework is a white paper that is a step-by-step -step process to help organizations plan and migrate their workloads to Azure. The image outlines the Microsoft Cloud Adoption Framework for Azure, a systematic approach to transitioning to the Azure Cloud. The process is categorized into stages, Define strategy here, the focus is on understanding motivations, grasping the reasons for cloud adoption, business outcomes, identifying the desired results, business justification, validating the move's reasons, first adoption project, kickstarting the cloud journey, plan, this stage includes rationalizing digital estate, evaluating current digital assets, initial organization alignment, ensuring everyone is aligned with the migration's goals. Skills Readiness Plan, Equipping Teams with Necessary Cloud Skills. Cloud Adoption Plan, Laying Out a Roadmap for the Cloud Transition. Ready, this phase ensures preparedness. Azure Readiness Guide, Preparing the Environment for Azure. First Landing Zone, Setting up an Initial Secure Azure Environment. Expanding the Blueprint, Broadening the Azure Setup as per Requirements. Best Practice Validation, Ensuring Adherence to Azure Best Practices. Adopt, the Actionable Phase Where, Migrate, existing workloads are moved to Azure. This entails the first workload migration, understanding expanded scenarios, validating best practices, and making process improvements. Innovate, transform services in the Azure environment using innovation guides, exploring new scenarios, validating best practices, and furthering process improvements. Govern, this is about oversight and management. Establish a methodology and benchmark for governance. Implement initial best practices, standards for Azure use. Measure governance maturity, how well governance rules are followed. Manage, this deals with ongoing operations. Ensure business commitments are met during the transition. Set and assess the operations baseline. Determine operations maturity, gauge the efficiency of cloud operations. Now, let's take a look at the security roles and responsibilities of the Azure Cloud Adoption Framework. Business and technology outcomes. Goals and results expected from security functions. Security outcomes, results an organization aims for, including governance, prevention, and response. Role types, security leadership provides security direction and strategy. Security architect designs and implements security blueprints. Platform, app security engineers ensures security of platforms and applications. Security operations manages real time security threats. Responsibilities, security leadership sets security strategy. Security architecture designs secure systems. Security compliance ensures adherence to regulations. Policy and standards set security policies. Posture management manages overall security stance. Phases of security implementation. Plan identifies security needs. Build implements strategies, including access control and asset protection. Run manages ongoing operations, including prevention and response. Feedback loop. 
continuous improvement cycle in security operations. In summary, the framework offers a structured way to transition to Azure, ensuring strategy alignment, preparation, adoption, governance, and effective management. Let's talk about the Azure Well-Architected Framework. Azure Well-Architected Framework provides best practices for designing and implementing solutions on Azure. It is structured around five key pillars. Cost optimization, this pillar focuses on maximizing the value delivered by managing and controlling costs. Proper cost management can lead to significant savings without compromising function or performance. Operational excellence, this emphasizes implementing and maintaining system processes to ensure smooth and efficient operations in a production environment. It involves routine operations, deployment practices, monitoring, and iterative improvement. Performance efficiency refers to ensuring that systems can scale appropriately and adapt to varying loads, both expected and unexpected. It's not just about speed, but ensuring resources are used efficiently to meet performance requirements. Reliability concerns the system's ability to recover from interruptions, such as failures or outages, and continue to operate without significant degradation. This pillar stresses designing for high availability and disaster recovery. Security, central to the Azure Well-Architected Framework, this pillar emphasizes the protection of data and applications from potential threats. It covers a broad spectrum, from access controls and encryption to threat detection and response strategies. So, that's an overview of the Azure Well-Architected Framework. The next topic we'll be covering is Azure Migrate. Azure Migrate offers a streamlined service for migration, modernization, and optimization on Azure. It simplifies the pre-migration processes like discovering, assessing, and appropriately sizing on-premises resources for infrastructure, data, and applications. With an extensible framework, Azure Migrate easily integrates with third-party tools, broadening its range of supported scenarios. Here's what it offers. Unified Migration Platform, a centralized portal to initiate, execute, and monitor your Azure Migration journey. Diverse Toolset, Azure Migrate provides a suite of tools for both assessment and migration. It features tools such as Azure Migrate, Discovery and Assessment and Migration and Modernization. Furthermore, it seamlessly integrates with other Azure services, tools, and third-party offerings from independent software vendors. Comprehensive migration and modernization capabilities in the Azure Migrate Hub, you can assess, migrate, and modernize. Servers, databases, and web apps assess and migrate on-premises servers, web apps, and SQL Server instances to Azure. Databases analyze on-premises SQL Server instances and databases and migrate them to Azure SQL on a VM, Azure SQL Managed Instance, or Azure SQL Database. Web applications evaluate on-premises web applications and transition them to the Azure App Service or Azure Kubernetes Service. Virtual desktops review your on-site virtual desktop infrastructure and move it to Azure Virtual Desktop. Data transfer efficiently and affordably transfer vast data volumes to Azure using Azure Data Box products. By using Azure Migrate, organizations can streamline and simplify their migration process, reduce downtime, and improve the overall efficiency and cost-effectiveness of their cloud migration. The next thing we'll be covering are the integrated tools in Azure Migrate. The Azure Migrate Hub includes these tools. Azure Migrate, Discovery and Assessment. Discover and assess servers including SQL and web apps. Discover and assess on-premises servers running on VMware, Hyper-V, and physical servers in preparation for migration to Azure. Migration and modernization. Migrate servers. Migrate VMware VMs, Hyper-V VMs, physical servers, other virtualized servers, and public cloud VMs to Azure. Data Migration Assistant. Assess SQL Server Databases for Migration to Azure SQL Database, Azure SQL Managed Instance, or Azure VMs Running SQL Server. Data Migration Assistant assesses SQL servers, identifies potential migration problems, unsupported features, and suggests the best path for database migration. Azure Database Migration Service. Migrate on-premises databases to Azure VMs Running SQL Server, Azure SQL Database, or SQL Managed Instances. Azure Database Migration Service is a managed service for seamless migrations to Azure data platforms with minimal downtime. Mover, assess servers. Mover is a SaaS platform that enhances business intelligence by accurately depicting it environments within a day. Web App Migration Assistant, assess on-premises web apps and migrate them to Azure. Azure App Service Migration Assistant is a standalone tool to assess on-premises websites for migration to Azure App Service. Azure Data Box, migrate offline data. 
use Azure Data Box products to move large amounts of offline data to Azure. So that's an overview of the integrated tools in Azure Migrate. The next type of migration solution we'll be going over is Azure Database Migration Service. Azure Database Migration Service is a fully managed service that enables seamless migrations from various database sources to Azure data platforms with minimal downtime. It simplifies the process of moving databases to the cloud and reduces the risks associated with migration. The service supports various source database engines, such as SQL Server, MySQL, Oracle, and PostgreSQL, and targets Azure database platforms, such as Azure SQL Database, Azure SQL Managed Instance, and Azure Database for PostgreSQL and MySQL. Azure Database Migration Service currently offers two versions. Database Migration Service via Azure SQL Migration Extension for Azure Data Studio, Azure Portal, PowerShell, and Azure CLI. Database Migration Service via Azure Portal, PowerShell, and Azure CLI. Use Cases Migrations of on-premises databases to Azure SQL Services. Database Consolidation and Migration to a Single Platform in Azure. Cloud Bursting and Disaster Recovery Solutions. Features Support for a wide range of source and target database platforms. Automated Schema and Data Migration with Minimal Downtime. Migration assessment to identify potential issues and guidance for a successful migration. Real-time migration monitoring and error notifications. Pre- and post-migration validation and cleanup tools. Integration with Azure services such as Azure Security Center and Azure Monitor for enhanced security and monitoring capabilities. How it works. Set up the migration project, create a new migration project in Azure DMS, define the source and target environments, and specify the database objects to migrate. Configure the source and target, configure the network connectivity and security settings for the source and target environments, and install the Azure DMS extension on the source database server. Start the migration, start the migration and monitor the progress in the Azure DMS portal. The service automatically replicates the source database to the target environment and tracks the changes that occur during the migration. Perform queued over and post migration tasks after replication. Initiate the queued over to transition the application to the target environment. Azure DMS offers validation and cleanup tools post migration. The next migration tool we'll be covering is Storage Migration Service. The Storage Migration Service simplifies the process of migrating storage to Windows Server or Azure. It comes with a user-friendly graphical tool that takes stock of data on Windows, Linux, and NetApp CIFS servers and facilitates its transfer to newer servers or Azure virtual machines. The service also enables the migration of a server's identity to the destination server, ensuring that applications and users can access their data without any changes to links or paths. Why use Storage Migration Service? Use Storage Migration Service because you've got a server or multiple servers that you want to migrate to newer hardware or virtual machines. Storage Migration Service is designed to help by doing the following tasks. Inventory multiple servers and their data. Rapidly transfer files, file shares, and security configuration from the source servers. Optionally take over the identity of the source servers, also known as cutting over, so that users and apps don't have to change anything to access existing data. Manage one or multiple migrations from the Windows Admin Center user interface. Migration is a three-step process. Why do inventory servers to gather info about their files and configuration, shown in the following figure. 2. Transfer data from the source servers to the destination servers. 3. Cut over to the new servers. The destination servers assume the source server's former identity so that apps and users don't have to change anything. Although the source servers retain their files, they enter a maintenance mode and become inaccessible. At a suitable time, these servers can be decommissioned. So, that's an overview of storage migration service. The next migration solution we'll be covering is Azure Data Box. The Microsoft Azure Data Box cloud solution lets you send terabytes of data into and out of Azure in a quick, inexpensive, and reliable way. Each storage device has a maximum usable storage capacity of 80 terabytes and is transported to your data center through a regional carrier. It is designed to help customers with slow or limited internet connectivity to move large volumes of data to the cloud. Let's take a look at some of Azure Data Box's use cases. Data box is used to import data to Azure for one-time migrations, moving large on-premises data, transitioning offline tapes, relocating VMs, SQL servers, applications, and transferring historical data for Azure-based analysis. 
initial bulk transfers, large scale transfers using Databox, followed by incremental network transfers. For example, moving vast backups with partners like Convault. Periodic uploads, transferring large volumes of data generated periodically, like video content from oil rigs or windmill farms. For exporting from Azure, Databox is used for disaster recovery, restoring Azure data on premises quickly. Security requirements, meeting mandates that require data extraction from Azure storage tiers like US Secret. Migration, moving data back to on-premises or to a different cloud provider. Here's how Azure Databox works. Customers order a data box from the Azure portal. When the data box arrives, customers connect it to their network and configure it using the Azure portal. Customers copy data to the data box using standard file transfer protocols, such as SMB or NFS. Once the data transfer is complete, customers ship the data box back to Azure. Azure copies the data from the data box to the customer's Azure storage account. So that's an overview of Azure data box, its use cases, and workflow. Let's talk about networking for Azure. And so everything kind of revolves around the virtual network, also known as the VNet. And this is a logically isolated section of your Azure network where you launch your Azure resources. And here's a very simple uh, diagram of using VNet, but there's a lot of networking components uh, that you're going to be utilizing. And we're not going to go through the exhaustive list here, but let's just go through some of them uh, just to give you an idea of like all the things you can do within uh, Azure networking. So you have Azure DNS, this manages your, uh, your DNS domain, then you have the VNet itself. And so underneath that, it'll have like address spaces, route tables, subnets, then you have network security groups, this acts as a virtual firewall at the subnet or NIC level, you have express route, this helps you create a very fast connection between your on prem to your VNet, then you have virtual WAN, this is a centralized network to route different network connections. Then you have virtual network gateway. This is a site to site VPN connection between VNets and local networks. Then you have your NICs, or your network interfaces. And these are virtual network devices to allow VMs to communicate using IP protocols. And then you have like all your load balancers and other things like that. So again, not an exhaustive list, uh, but just shows you that there's a lot you can do uh, with the networking on Azure. <laughs> So Azure Private Links allows you to establish secure connections between Azure resources so traffic remains within your Azure network. And so I got this big old graphic here. Uh, and so let's just uh, define a few things. I'm gonna pull out my pen here. And so imagine you have workloads on your on-prem or you have your own virtual network on Azure. Uh, and so you have some VMs doing some stuff. And the idea is that you want to connect them to some other services over here. Uh, but the thing is, is that if you wanted to connect them, they might try to transverse the internet. So if you're on-prem, it's going out here, and it's going over here. And so the issue with this is that um, it, it's not necessarily secure. Uh, another issue could be, um, you know, it's just faster if it would just stay within the actual uh, network because if you're already connected, you, you know, you're stuffed over here, then why wouldn't it just go through uh, the actual network? Another thing is like data transfer costs. So it's always going out the internet and coming back in, and that's not a great scenario. Uh, so I'm just gonna erase all that stuff there. Uh, the idea with private link is that it's just keeping everything within the Azure network. Um, and so that's what it's doing. So if you want to, uh, you know, um, connect your workloads in your VNet or your on-prem that connects to a specific VNet, the idea is that you can launch a private link endpoint, which is a network interface, and this is what's establishing that connection. And you're gonna to have to give that private endpoint a private IP address from your VNet. And so then the idea is that on the right-hand side, that's what you wanna to connect to. There's a lot of Azure services by default works with private link. So there's no additional configuration. You'll just be able to uh, say use private link and they will. Uh, same thing with some third-party providers um, in the marketplace, uh, they might be powered by private link. And then there's a third case where let's say you have like a private subnet and you have some VMs there. Uh, so what you could do is um, if you have a load balancer and you need to have an internal load balancer there, well, you can uh, launch the private link service. And this is going to basically make your, uh, your workload in that VNet become compatible or powered by private link. So there you go. <laughs> Let's take a look at subnets. And a subnet is a logical division of an address space. So we just looked at address spaces. So we're cutting up 
one step further, and subnets help you define different kinds of workloads and allows you to apply virtual isol isolation within your network. So when you launch an Azure resource, you choose the subnet you wanna launch with within, and an IP from that subnet is assigned to your resource. So uh, the thing is, is that uh, when you create route tables, that's how you are associating uh, the subnet so it can access uh, the internet or access anything. Uh, and then there's public and private subnets, but this thing is interesting because like, again, if, you, if you're using AWS, uh, those are very clearly defined things, but in Azure, uh, they don't have this concept of public and private. You have to define it yourself. So really a public or private subnet is just a subnet that doesn't have access to the internet. And so we saw that when we had the route table and we over over uh, uh, rode, um the access to the internet to none, that may, uh, essentially made it a private subnet. Uh, another thing you can do with subnets is you, you can associate a network security group, and this is gonna help protect, uh, protect your traffic entering and leaving the subnet. So you're making rules based on the IP address, port, and protocol. Uh, and then there's a special thing called a gateway subnet. So uh, it's a specialized uh, type of subnet, and it's just for Azure virtual network gateways. Uh, and so um, it's interesting, you'll go in and there'll be a, a, a separate section just for it, and so you'll create it. It's just for that service. <laughs> So uh, virtual private networks, also known as VPNs, what they do is they extend a private network across a public network and enables your users to send and receive data across shared or public networks as if their computing devices were directly connected to the private network. All right, uh, and so now we have to talk about what is a virtual network gateway. And so a virtual network gateway is the software a VPN device uh, for your Azure virtual network. So that's how these uh, devices are going to connect to your network. So when you deploy a virtual network gateway, it will deploy two or uh, two or more specialized uh, VMs in specific subnets. You need to create a gateway subnet. And these deployed VMs contain routing tables and run specific gateway services. You can uh, choose the type of gateway you want it to be. And this is gonna determine whether you'd use something like VPN gateway or express route gateway. So it's as simple as an option like that. But to really understand uh, these virtual network gateways, we should just look at some VPN gateway design so you understand why you're creating these things. <laughs> So to understand VPN Gateway, we need to understand the utility uh, of this service. And so we'll look at some different topologies. And the first one is site to site. This is when you connect an, uh, Azure uh, to on-premise data center or vice versa. And the idea is you create a VPN Gateway that's, that's gonna establish connection to your on-premise environment, creating an IPsec tunnel, which is a secure connection, IP uh, connection there. But you might be asking, well, isn't that what ExpressRoute is for? Well, ExpressRoute goes through a, par um, a edge partner uh, so there's a lot more work involved in that setup. This one just goes over the internet, so it's not gonna be as fast. Um, and there's some other uh, downsides, but the idea is it's the easiest way to get connected from your, uh, your on-premise to uh, Azure. The next one is multi-site. This is when you connect Azure to multiple on-premise data centers. Um, so it's just like the same model, except there's more than one uh, tunnel here to more than one uh, uh, site. Then you have point to site. This is when you connect Azure to multiple individual computers. So imagine you have a bunch of uh, employees around the world and they have laptops and they just need to connect uh, securely to, the, um, to the, the private VNet or just the VNet in general. And so that's where we're gonna need a VPN gateway. And the last one is VNet to VNet. This is where you're gonna connect two VNets in two different regions and subscriptions uh, or have different deployment models. Uh, and so uh, that's, again, those are transversing the internet. Uh, in all these cases here, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, and I guess I think that if you were to set up ExpressRoute, I think you'd have to set up VPN gateways anyway. Uh, but anyway, that's what that is there. So hopefully that now makes sense. So Azure Express Routes creates private connections between Azure data centers and infrastructure on your premises or in co-location environments. And so uh, connections don't go over the public internet and as a result offer more reliability, faster speeds, consistent latencies, and higher security. So here's a big old graphic here kind of representing what's going on here. And the idea is that you're gonna have connectivity from uh, different things like from any to any, so that's IP VPN network, a point to point ethernet network, a virtual cross connection. And this is all gonna be going through a connectivity pro provider at a co-location facility. So this example would be a, uh, an edge partner. 
Uh, and so you would be the customer network. That'd be your on-premise or whatever you want to connect so that you can make it all the way to your Azure services. And the way you would establish a connection is you create these express route circuits. Uh, it's pretty common to have uh, more than one because uh, you want to have high availability just in case the other one goes out. Uh, the idea is that you can route them, uh, route this traffic to a couple different places. So the first one would be things like peering to Office 3, uh, 365, Dynamics 365, or even your Azure Public Services. So when we say public services, imagine you just launch a, um, a virtual machine that is in a public subnet that has a, a, an IP that's reachable from the internet. Uh, that could just be to that, or maybe you're using like Cosmo DB, or like you have fully qualified domains for other services. Uh, so it's just a way that you can get there. And then let's talk about the other side, which is uh, um, doing private peering for uh, VNet. So the idea is that you have a private VNet, so the subnets are private, and so the only way is going to be access it. Uh, you want a direct way to access it that way. So uh, that's the two ways there. Uh, and just to note, there is Express Route Direct. And so this is like Express Route with an additional benefit that has greater bandwidth connections from 50 megabytes per second up to uh, 10 gigabytes per second. And this is really ideal if you have hybrid solutions where you're, uh, you're moving massive amounts of uh, data or where latency matters because you, you want... Uh, to feel like these uh, cloud services are right there with your on-premise environment. You're going to need a lot of speed for that. Azure Firewall is a managed cloud-based network security service that protects Azure VNet's resources, and it's a fully stateful firewall as a service. So you're going to get built-in high availability and unrestricted cloud scalability. And what you can do is uh, essentially create, enforce, and log application network connectivity policies across subscription and virtual networks. So Azure Firewall uses a static public IP address for your VNet resources, allowing outside firewalls to identify uh, or, or, uh, originating from your virtual network. And the service is fully integrated with Azure Monitor for logging and analytics. So here is a representation of Azure Firewall. And so the idea is that you're gonna launch an Azure Firewall into its own VNet, and then other VNets and your on-premise or other things are gonna pass through that central VNet onto wherever they wanna go. And the idea is that uh, we're gonna be able to uh, do things like uh, utilize Microsoft Threat Intelligence. This is gonna block known malicious IPs in FQDNS, that it stands for fully qualified domain names. And by default, the traffic is uh, set to deny, uh, but you can set connectivity policies to filter out traffic in a variety of ways to make sure that you are protected uh, there. So yeah, that's all there is to it. So network security groups filter network traffic to and from the Azure resource in a VNet. Uh, and so an NSG is composed of many security rules. And so here's an example of setting an inbound security rule. And each security rule has the following properties. So you can give it a unique name, which is all the way at the bottom there. Uh, you can set the source or destination. So you're gonna set an IP address, CIDR block, service tag, application group, things like that. Uh, then you set the port range. So it could just be port 80, it could be all ports where it shows an asterisk, it could be a range of ports. You're gonna set the protocol. So you got TCP, UDP, ICMP. You set the action, whether it's allowed or denied, and then you set the priority, which is a number between 100 and 4096. And we have two types of security rules. We got inbound rules, which applies to traffic entering the NSG, and outbound rules that apply to traffic leaving the NSG. Let's take a look at some of the default security rules that NSG sets for you. So when you create an NSG, you're gonna have some created for you by default, uh, and that's gonna be for outbound rules and inbound rules. So uh, for inbound rules, uh, you're going to be able to uh, accept any virtual networks into your um, uh, through the uh, NSG. Uh, it's going to allow Azure Load Balancer to make its way in, and it's going to deny uh, everything else. All right. Then for your outbound rules, uh, it's allowed to uh, go to any other virtual network. It's allowed to make its way out to the internet, and then everything else is denied. So there you go. Let's take a look here at the logic for security rules. And there's a lot of logic here, so we'll work our way through it. And unfortunately, there's no fun way to visualize this. So we just got to work through the text. 
So you may not create two security rules with the same priority and direction. You can have 5,000 NSGs per subscription and 1,000 NSGs rules per NSG. For priority, rules are processed in priority order with lowest number uh, processed before the higher number. And network security groups uh, rules are evaluated by priority using a five tuple information to allow or deny traffic based on source, source ports, destination, destination ports, and protocol. Honestly, I don't know what they mean by that. Uh, and I couldn't uh, make any sense. It's in the documentation, so I'm just showing it to you here. Uh, then there's flow records. They don't exactly explain what they are, but I assume the idea is that uh, when a request throws uh, uh, flows through the NSG, they're attaching additional information to it. Uh, so the flow record allows a network security group to be stateful. A flow record is created for existing connections. Uh, communication is allowed or denied based on the connection state of the flow record. And so let's talk about statefulness. So if you specify an outbound security port, you don't need to set the inbound port since it will be set for you. You only need to sp specify an inbound uh, security rule if the communication is init initially externally, uh, initiated externally. And the opposite is also true if inbound traffic is allowed over a port, it's not necessary to specify an outbound security rule to respond to traffic over the port. Uh, and the reason I know this, when a, when another port is set with another one, that's when it's stateful. If it didn't do that, then it would be considered stateless, but it's stateful. Uh, let's talk about interruption. So existing connections may not be interrupted when you remove a security rule that uh, enabled the flow and traffic flows are interrupted when connections are stopped and no traffic is flowing in either direction for at least a few minutes. So there's the rules. Uh, <laughs> there are a lot of stuff there. Honestly, I won't even remember 90% uh, of this stuff, but I just wanted to go uh, through it with you. So there you go. Hey, this is Andrew Brown from Exam Pro, and in this section, we'll be covering Azure DDoS protection. What is a DDoS attack? A malicious attempt to disrupt normal traffic by flooding a website with large amounts of fake traffic. DDoS attacks are big worries for people moving their apps to the cloud. These attacks try to use up all of an app's resources so real users can't access it. Any online point can be a target for these attacks. Azure DDoS Protection offers advanced features to counteract DDoS attacks when integrated with recommended application design practices. This service is specifically designed for Azure resources within a virtual network. Enabling this protection on both new and established virtual networks is simple and doesn't require any changes to apps or resources. Most frequent types of DDoS attack. Volumetric attacks. These are volume-driven attacks that deluge the network with seemingly legitimate traffic. By doing so, they exhaust available bandwidth, leaving legitimate users unable to access the website. These are typically measured in bits per second. Protocol attacks. These attacks exhaust server resources by sending fake protocol requests that exploit vulnerabilities. Examples include UDP and TCP flooding at layers three and four. These are measured in packets per second. Application layer attacks. These attacks target the application layer. Examples include HTTP floods, SQL injections, cross-site scripting, parameter tampering, and slowerous attacks. To defend against these, web application firewalls are often employed. Azure offers two tiers of DDoS protection. DDoS Network Protection, when combined with best practices in application design, Azure DDoS Network Protection offers advanced DDoS mitigation tools. It's automatically configured to safeguard specific Azure resources in a virtual network. DDoS IP Protection, this is a paper-protected IP model. While it shares core features with DDoS Network Protection, it provides additional services like rapid DDoS response support, cost protection, and discounts on WAF. So that's an overview of Azure DDoS protection. So Azure has uh, a few different kinds of load balancers and one in particular is the application gateway. And this is for application level routing and load balancing service. So application gateway operates at the OSI uh, layer seven, uh, which is also known as the application layer. And the idea here is that when you're working about applications, you're working with HTTP requests. That's what it is. Uh, and so the idea is that it can look at the contents of the HTTP request and do some interesting things. So maybe it's looking at the path and saying, okay, you're, uh, if you have a path um, and it's payments, go to the VM that has our payment system. And then if it's forward slash admin, go to the VM that does that. Uh, maybe it has to do something with cookies or um, maybe you want to apply uh, a WAF 
a policy to it. And so it, you can look at those HTTP requests and determine if it is malicious traffic and filter it out. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's all about the application, which has to be with HTTP requests. To configure this thing, you need to set up a front end, uh, routing rules, and back end pools. And there are two configurations for the front end. You can either have it with a private IP, which makes it now an internal load balancer, or a public IP, which makes it either we would call a public or external load balancer. Uh, and there's a both. I've never used that option before. Um, but I mean, you just really need to know the public and private. For the back ends, you create back end pools. And a back end pool is just a collection of resources to which your application gateway sends traffic. Uh, and so a backend pool can contain virtual machines, virtual machine scale sets, IP addresses, domain names, app service. Uh, and I think you can also send it to like on-prem. Uh, so let's just talk about routing rules, which connects the front end and the back end together. And so uh, here is a more complex example, it gives you a better idea of the service uh, uh, at full. Uh, and so the idea is that you have your application gateway, it's gonna send uh, traffic or sorry, like your DNS is gonna send it to application gateway. And then you have these listeners and they, they listen for incoming traffic. Uh, and then what it will do, it will pass on that to a rule and a rule just really says, who should we pass the data to? Uh, and then if you are defining a backend pool, then you need to have um, an HTTP setting that says, how do we handle the HTTP requests? Okay, and so now we'll just look at, e at more granular de detail about request or routing rules. <laughs> Let's take a closer look at routing rules. This is where all the magic happens. So a listener listens on a specified port and IP address for traffic that uses a specified protocol. If the listener criteria are met, the application gateway will apply the routing rule. And these come in two flavors. We got basic, which forwards all requests for any domain to backend pools, and multi-site forward requests to different backend pools based on host header and host name. So the thing is, is that uh, you, uh, you can have multiple listeners and you can have an order of them. And the idea is that you really want the basic to be on the uh, be in last in priority because if it's a first, it's gonna capture everything because that's its job, it's like a catch-all. Uh, so just make sure that um, if you're using multiple listeners, you put basic last. Uh, so that's just something you need to know. Then for those backend targets, this is where we either define a backend pool or redirection. Redirection is just an HTTP redirection like uh, 403 or whatever. You have their temporary or permanent, very simple. Uh, but for backend pools, you have to create HTTP settings. Uh, and this tells us a little bit more about how we want to handle HTTP, you know, cookies, cookie, uh, connection draining, port requests, etc. Let's talk about that a little bit more. So here are the actual options that we can configure for HTTP settings. So you have your backend port. Uh, so generally it's either port 80 or 443. It just depends on where you're doing your SSL termination. Uh, but generally, um, if you need end-to-end -end encryption, it'll be uh, 443. Or, uh, and then if you are doing connect, or if you're doing SSL termination at the load balancer, then it's 80. Um, then you have cookie-based affinity. This allows you to keep a user session on the same server. So if you need to persist cookies and use them for authentication, you'll want to enable that. You got connection draining. This gracefully uh, removes backend pool members during planned service updates. So the idea is that you know when there is an update, it's not just going to abruptly cut over. It's going to wait until a connection disconnects from a server before uh, not no longer sending more requests there. Because you don't want a, a connection dropping in the middle of an update. It's not great for a user. Then you have request timeouts. This is the number of seconds the application gateway will, will wait to receive a response from the backend pool before it returns a connection timeout error message. And last, our, um, oh, sorry, uh, we still have override backend path. These allow you to override the path in the URL so the request for a, specif a specific path can be routed to another path. The idea is imagine you want to send it to um, bananas and you want bananas to actually internally route to oranges. I don't know why you want to do that. Or maybe to plantains, that'd make a lot more sense. So that's something you can do. Uh, and the last one is the override the host name. So application gateway normally leaves the host name alone. Uh, but you know, if you're using multi-tenant services like apps, uh, like app service or API management, it needs very specific host header set. So this is where you can override them and change them for those services. So hopefully that really gives you a good picture of application gateway, but I feel that that's all you really need to know. <laughs> 
So let's take a look here at Azure scale sets, and these are used to automatically increase or decrease your virtual machine capacity. So imagine uh, you have a web application behind an application load balancer, and you have an increase in traffic, you want to be able to quickly add more capacity by adding another identical virtual machine, uh, or when uh, the, there's a decrease in traffic, remove it to save costs. And that is what Azure scale sets do. Um, so you are creating uh, scale policies to automatically uh, add or remove based on host metrics. Host metrics could be like CPU utilization or uh, networking. Uh, you're going to create health checks, and you can also uh, set a repair policy to replace unhealthy instances. You can associate a load balancer to distribute uh, virtual machines across uh, availability zones, and you can scale to 100 or even 1,000 VMs using scale sets. <laughs> So one thing you're going to probably want to do with your scale set is associate with a load balancer. And in honest, I don't run any kind of application workload uh, unless it is in a scale set and behind a load balancer because it's just good practice to do that. And the reason why you're going to want a load balancer is that it's going to help you evenly distribute your VMs across multiple availability zones. And that's going to give you high availability uh, because you definitely want to try to run uh, three VMs across three AZs to get that uh, high availability. Uh, you can also use a load balancer probe checks, and these are more robust health checks than what scale set provides you. Uh, so that is just an added benefit there. Uh, and when we're talking about um, load balancers, we have two different choices here. We have the application gateway, and so this is for HTTP, HTTPS web traffic load balancer. Uh, and then you also have Azure load balancer, and this is going to support TCP and UDP network traffic and things like that. So depending on what OSI layer you need to operate on, is going to determine what kind of load balancer you need to use. <laughs> So let's take a look at scaling policies, and these determine when a virtual machine should be added or removed to meet the current requirements. And you have this uh, little wizard here. This is what the what wizard you see or form you see when you're creating a scale set initially with very simple features. But let's just focus on two things, scaling out and scaling in. So scaling it out is when an instance should be added to a scale set to increase capacity. So you choose your metric, uh, which is hard coded in this case, uh, to a CPU threshold. So you choose your metric, the duration, how many VMs you want to add. And then the scale in is the opposite. That's when you're removing uh, 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 something from the scale set to decrease your capacity. And again, that interface is very simple. Uh, when you actually go ahead and create a scale set, after you go and update it, you're going to end up with a lot more options. And here are the options. You can see they're extremely robust. And so uh, you have the option to choose one of the built-in host metrics that are already be being collected on your virtual machine. So uh, the most popular here, and there's more than this, but uh, the most popular here is CPU, network in, network out, disk read and write. Uh, then you have your aggregates. So you can decide how you want to group or uh, collect that data uh, before you apply your final operations on it. Uh, then you have your operators. So you can say greater than or greater than or equal to. Then you have your actions. You can say increase the count. of So add uh, X amount of servers. Or you can say uh, increase by percentage. So imagine you had um, uh, 10 servers and you want to increase the load by 30%, that would add three additional servers. If you want more metrics than just the built-in host metrics, you can absolutely get more, uh, but you're gonna have to install a couple things. Uh, for app. Uh, if you want more app-specific metrics, like page performance or page load performance and session count, you would uh, install a small instrumentation package for app insights. And uh, if you want to have more detailed host metrics, so you might have host metrics, but you want them in more detail or more available host metrics, you'd install the Azure Diagnostic extension within your VM. Um, there are a few other uh, scaling policy options that are, well, they're not exactly in that form, but they are around or are associated with them. One is the scale in policy, not to be confused with the scale in option. Um, and this determines what virtual machine should be removed when you decrease capacity. So it's just a simple drop down, and you have a few different options. So there's the default option. This is where it deletes the VM with the highest instance ID, and it's going to do that uh, uh, in taking consideration uh, the balancing across AZs and ADs. Or it can delete the newest virtual machine, so delete the newest VM. Again, uh, this one's only across uh, virt or availability zones. Or delete the oldest VM. So this is going to delete the oldest VM and balance across availability zones. Then you have an update policy, 
And this determines how, uh, how VM instances are brought up to date with the latest scale set model. So again, it's another dropdown and you have a, a, a few options here. So you have automatic, so increasing the start upgrade immediately in random over. Uh, order or or manual, so existing or existing instances must be manually upgraded or rolling, and so this update upgrades roll out uh, in batches with optional pause. Uh, and just one other note here is that if you want to do automatic OS upgrades, you can enable uh, this to help ease update management by safely and automatically upgrading the OS disk for all instances. So there you go. <laughs> Health monitoring is a feature with scale sets you're absolutely going to want to turn on. Uh, and what it does is it determines whether your instance, your virtual machine instance, is healthy or unhealthy. So you have that option to disable or enable it. And it comes in two different modes. We're going to have the application health extension, which is what we're seeing on the right hand side here. And this is where you ping an HTTP or HTTPS request with a specific path. Uh, and expect a, back a, a specific status. So the status here would be 200. So the idea is that you could say ping the home page, and if the home page appears, then therefore the server must be healthy, or you can make it your own custom uh, page. That's what I like to do. I have like a health check page. The other mode is load balancer probe. Uh, this is only going to work if you have an associated load balancer. And uh, here you can check based on TCP, UDP, and HTTP requests. So this is a little bit more robust. Um, um, so I generally would recommend using this mode over um, the, the first mode, because generally when you have a scale set, you're going to also want to have a load balancer. Uh, now, if you want to uh, replace unhealthy instances, they have an automatic repair policy. So this is an automatic. I mean, like it's not turned on by default, so you have to uh, explicitly say you want to turn it on. And what that will do is that if it finds an instance that is unhealthy, it's just going to uh, terminate it and then launch a new instance. All right, and so there you go. All right, so now that we have our scale set, we're gonna continue on learning more about availability by creating an application gateway. So this is actually a type of load balancer, even though it has gateway in the name. Then there's Azure load balancers, and the difference between these two is this one's layer seven for the applications, and this is layer four. Uh, so TCP, UDP, like at a lower layer. So, uh, you know, since we have a web application, which is a simple Apache page, we're gonna wanna serve it up via the application gateway, all right? So make your way over to the top here and we'll click on application gateway or just type that in. And we'll go ahead and add ourselves a new application gateway. We'll choose Wolf here. I'm gonna name this Wolf um, uh, application AGW. And then we do not, uh, we don't need any uh, auto scaling right now. So we'll just leave that alone. I'm gonna set that to one. We're gonna choose two, one, and three because the rule of three counts here. We always want three. And then down below, make sure you choose the correct virtual network. If you're not confident, make sure you go over to your scale set and just double check to make sure uh, where it resides. So if I go over here into my scale set and check, it's in WolfNet, uh, WolfVNet 499. How I ended up with more than one, I don't know. I just had the tutorial, I've done this a few revisions, so I've ended up with an additional one there. Notice it's complaining because it's trying to uh, put this in the default, but it needs its own uh, subnet. So here under subnets, we're gonna create one just for the VGW, so VGW. And we're gonna need a range first, so go over to address uh, space ranges, and we'll pick out the next number. So 10.0.2.0 dot, uh, dot dot forward slash 24. We'll hit save. And once that has created, we'll make our way over to the subnet. And when we hit subnet, it will automatically select the next one for us. I'm gonna put VGW in here, we'll hit save. And then once that's saved, we'll make our way back to the wizard. Notice up here, the bread comes. If we click one back, we can make our way uh, back to where we are and then choose that VGW subnet. We'll go to the front to the front end uh, section here. We got public, private, or both. We want public today and we will need a new IP address. So I'm gonna call this uh, wolf. VGW, we'll go ahead and hit OK. We'll go to backends here, add a backend pool. I'm just gonna call this backend and we'll drop down and choose a virtual machine scale set. If you do not see it here, it's because they're not in the same VNet, make sure that's the case. And then we'll go to configuration. So we got a front end, a back end. Now we got to glue them together with routing rules. We'll just say my rules. We have listeners and backend targets. So we'll name our listener name, my listener, <laughs> if you can spell it. That's a hard one for me. So I'm just gonna copy paste that in, take out the space there. Uh, we, the front end IP is, it's gonna be public. We're gonna have HTTP on port 80. We'll have basic. If we had multi-site, 
So if you have more than one destination, but we do not. We'll go to backend targets and we will choose the backend pool that we created. And then we have to choose or add um, HTTP settings. This is all kind of crammed together. It doesn't really line up very well. So I get a bit confused here. So I think what we want to do is hit add new here. And then we'll say my HTTP settings. Uh, port 80 is good. We do not have cookies. We do not care about connection draining. All these options are not important to us uh, for our very simple application. Um, but if you were creating a real web application that, uh, that has a session, you probably would want to turn these both on. Okay. We'll go ahead and hit add. And we do have path-based routing, but this is not something we uh, need to worry about right now. This is where you could say, you could have multiple targets. So you could say, okay, anytime it is a uh, cookie, then go to this virtual machine. And then if it's another one, you could say go somewhere else or even do a redirect. That's a great way of attaching things to your um, uh, virtual machine there. We'll go ahead and hit add. And so now we have all of our information. We'll hit tags and we will go hit create. And I'll see you back here uh, when this is done deploying, okay? All right, so I've been waiting a while here for uh, this to complete, but uh, it looks like that we're still having a bit of trouble uh, so what I'm going to do is make my way over to the actual uh, load balancer here because I just remembered and this happens because I don't normally make a scale set separately. I usually make it with the load balancer. But if we make our way over to the back end pool and we're to click into here, it actually has a, a, a thing that says down here, virtual machine scale set was added to this back end pool. Upgrade all instances of Wolf scale set for this change to work. So uh, those, the scale set needs to get updated is the, is the problem here. So what I'm going to do is make my way over to the scale set and we'll see if we can do an upgrade here. So if we just checkbox them all on there, I'm going to go hit upgrade. And then this will perform an upgrade on the instances. And we'll just give that some time and I'll see you back here in a moment. Okay, so that didn't take too long for the upgrade. And if you just hit the refresh here, you're going to wait for the status goes running. And now they're all healthy. So if we make our way back to um, our load balancer tab here, if you still have something open, just go to back end pools. You should see three targets. If we go up to our overview over here, we'll go grab whoops our IP address. Now, why the uh, they copy the text there, I have no idea. But if we go paste that up into here and take that out, we get our page. So there you go. That's all it took to get the availability um, or the actual server running. If we go on the left-hand side and we go over to help probes, this is interesting to look at. We're not gonna set it up, but I just wanna show you that you'd write in your uh, health check here and then you could specify um, a different path. So if you had like a page called, and this is pretty common for a lot of places, they'll have a page called health check. And so that's a just a kind of like a way to configure a custom health check uh, for your instances. But this is all I really wanted to accomplish here today. Um, I don't think there's really much of anything else that I'd like to do here. Um, so what we'll do is we'll go and make our way back to all of our resources and we'll try to find our original uh, resource group here. If we can uh, find, it's probably easier if we just go to resource groups. Great, and I'll just go ahead and delete this one here. There we go, it's gonna delete a whole lot of stuff. Uh, but yeah, there we go.